From Hollywood, it's time now for... Dollar. This is Ed Porter, Mr. Dollar. You called my office? Yes, I'd like to see you as soon as I can, Mr. Porter. Well, of course. How long have you been in town? About a half an hour. Are you all squared away? I've got a room and I've had a bath, if that's what you mean. Well, then I guess you're ready to go to work. I will be as soon as I put on some pants. You sound in a rush. I'm always in a rush when I think somebody might be chipping us out of $100,000. Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Western Life and Trust Company, 826 Spear Boulevard, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Markham matter. Expense account item one, $143.69, air transportation from Hartford to San Francisco. Item two, $17 for incidentals along the way, including transportation from the airport to the St. Francis Hotel. I walked the eight blocks to the Commodore building where Ed Porter had his office on the fourth floor. He was a short, thin insurance broker with a face like a tight drum. He apologized for the clammy weather as though it were his fault. He asked me how things were out on the East Coast and invited me to sit down and looked as uncomfortable as he was. I uh, got the telegram you were coming last night. Investigator. I've never met one in all my years in the business. Must be very interesting work. Yeah, yeah. Look, I don't want to take up too much of your time, Mr. Porter, but I would like to get some information from you. Oh, certainly, Mr. Dollar. What can you tell me about a man named Floyd Markham? Markham? Well, he's the husband of a client of mine. I've met him, but I really can't tell you too much about him. My dealings have always been with Mrs. Markham. She's my customer. Then tell me about Mrs. Markham. Oh, certainly. I, uh, I'm not going to ask why. I'm sure you have a good reason for coming all the way to San Francisco. The home office thinks I have an excellent reason. Uh, Yes. Uh, Mrs. Markham. Well, uh, I've known her for 20 years as a customer. She's wealthy, always has been, and she handles her money well, and she lives rather well. Mrs. Markham's the one who has the money, huh? Uh, Mr. Markham is a salaried man, an industrial engineer. Frankly, I think he depends on Mrs. Markham for his livelihood. Oh, yeah. These two checks were issued to Mrs. Markham this year. Recognize them? Mm, Yes, yes. Uh, Full payments on two endowment policies, $50,000 apiece. And they've cleared the bank. Anything wrong with them? Nothing wrong with the checks. On payoffs like this, I always take it in person. It's a custom, of course, to call and make an appointment and deliver the check to the client. Mm -hmm. And try to sell a little more insurance in the bargain. Well, that's about the idea, yes. Anything strange about Mrs. Markham when you delivered either one of these checks? No. Before I left Hartford, I looked up her insurance records. Her premiums are always paid right on the button. Mrs. Markham doesn't have a business office or a business manager handling her affairs. The checks are always personal checks on her personal account. Now, can you explain why someone like that might forget a third endowment policy? Why, no. Well, there is a third endowment policy. It matured this month. I have the check with me for $50,000. Well, yes, but this business of forgetting... Floyd Markham called Hartford and spoke to the head of the endowment division... He explained that Mrs. Markham was ill and didn't know whether or not a third policy existed. He said he was checking for her. Uh Uh-huh. Now, you say you've known Mrs. Markham over a period of 20 years. Well, is she the kind of person who'd forget $50,000? No one forgets $50,000. Did you notice that both of those checks were deposited in the Markham's joint account? No. Hmm. So they were. 
Maybe Mrs. Markham's feeling generous these days. Why do you say that? Well, they have a rather strange relationship as far as I've been able to perceive. I mean, what money he makes is his and what she has is hers. Oh, yeah. I always like to get out of that house because they never seem to me to be a very close couple in, in any way. But this seems to make sense now. How's that, Mr. Porter? Well, now, I called up and made an appointment to deliver both of these checks. The first time I went over, Mrs. Markham was ill. And the second time, she had just stepped out for a few minutes. Well, who accepted the checks? Mr. Markham. Both times? Yes. As a matter of fact, now that I think of it, he made the appointment on the phone both times. When was the last time you saw Mrs. Markham? Last spring. A check with the bank revealed that Mrs. Markham had not personally made a deposit since June the 18th. The deposit slips were initialed by Floyd Markham. The checks were endorsed by Leslie Markham. There had been no unusual withdrawals. Expense account item three thirty dollars stenographic and notary services for the attached statements. Mrs. Markham has been having her hair done here for nearly ten years now. Once a week, every Thursday morning. Then she just stopped. I called her home, and Mr. Markham informed me that she was away on an extended trip. Mr. Markham called us, uh, it was last June, and informed us that Mrs. Markham was resigning her membership in the bridge club. I telephoned the house twice to see what was the matter. Mr. Markham answered both times and said Mrs. Markham was out. Well, she used to come in here two or three times a month. Made us go over the car from top to bottom. She hasn't been around now for seven or eight months. I don't know who's taking care of the car. Expense account item 430 cents, three phone calls to the Markham residence. I didn't state any particular business. I simply asked to speak to Mrs. Markham. Each time I called, a male voice answered. Each time, the male voice told me Mrs. Markham was out, she was ill, and she was away on a short trip. Industrial Management Limited, Floyd B. Markham President, has a three-room office suite near the Embarcadero. Ten years ago, it had been sensationally new and glassy. When I got there, the carpet was a little too thin and the varnish a little too thin, too. The whole place smelled faintly of mildew. Yes? I'd like to see Mr. Markham, please. Do you have an appointment? No, no, not exactly. My name is Harris. I'm with the Cleveland Pump Company. Pump company? Yes, we're setting in 38 of our installations at the new plant in Valparaiso. Didn't you get my letter? Well, I'm sorry. I'm afraid... May I ask your name again? Harris. Stephen B. Harris. Cleveland Pump Company. Oh, yes. Well, Mr. Harris, I'm afraid Mr. Markham never received your letter. When did you mail it? Uh, 30 days ago. Maybe it was two weeks. Well, tell Mr. Markham I'm here and I'll... I'm sorry, Mr. Harris. Mr. Markham isn't in the office just now. Oh. Well, I'll wait. Uh, well... Well? Uh, he won't be in today. As a matter of fact, he won't be in the rest of the week. Where can I call him? Well, I'm afraid that's impossible. Can't I call him at home? No. Now, look, is he in business or isn't he? Mr. Harris, Mr. Markham hasn't been in the office for six months or more. He's... he's tied up on a rather long-range project. What's your name? I'm Miss Beidler. Why didn't you say that in the first place, Miss Beidler? Well, Who else uh, can I talk to here? No one, I'm afraid. You mean that's all there is in this office? Just you and him? When he feels like coming in? I'll tell Mr. Markham you were here. The Markham house was on Fiera Della Street, about six blocks from the Fairmont Hotel. Stone walls, iron grill work, tangling ivy. An old house that had been built by rich people for rich people to live in. The kind of shabby-looking place that only New Yorkers and San Franciscans can get by with and still be called wealthy. I used Ed Porter's car with the Western Life and Trust Company emblem on the door, parked it in the driveway as close as I could to the entrance. It was exactly one o'clock when the door opened. He was tall and pretty with black hair and broad shoulders. Yes, what is it? I'd like to see Mrs. Markham, please. I'm Mr. Markham. Can I help you? My name's Dollar. I'm with Western Life and Trust Company. Mr. Porter called you? No, he didn't. Oh, well, I must have slipped his mind. He said he was going to call. What's it about? I brought a check from Mrs. Markham on her third endowment policy. Oh. Well, I'll give it to her. She isn't in right now. Well, I'm supposed to deliver it to her. 
I'll come back another time when she's in. No, you can give it to me. I'll see that she gets it. I'm sorry, Mr. Markham, but I have Look, to Look, I it. know you want to give her the check and try to sell her some more insurance. She's just not in the market. And you can save your little spiel where it'll do some good. Oh, you misunderstand me, Mr. Markham. I have to deliver this to her in person. What's your name again? Dollar. Johnny Dollar. Come in. I'll wait till she comes back and make an appointment. Mr. Porter told me he'd made it for three today, She's so... here, she's here. Just come in. Why the runaround? Mrs. Markham is desperately ill. I don't want to disturb her with things like, like this. Oh, well, I'm sorry to hear that. What's the trouble? Very serious anemia. So if, uh, if you'll just give me the I have check, a report I... to make out when I deliver this. I just Only take told... a minute to hand her the check... Then it'll be off my mind and off your mind. Now, look here, Mr... Didn't you call the company's home office about this check? I... I called because Mrs. Markham requested me to call. Oh, yes. Just, uh, Wait here. In the little swirl of his exit, I smelled shaving lotion and guessed at the brand name. I also guessed that his suit cost $300, even if I didn't know what San Francisco tailor had made it. The shirt, the tie, the shoes were expensive, too. Yeah. Mr. Floyd Markham liked expensive things. I wondered if he dyed his hair to keep it all black. I wondered if he was 45 or 50. I also wondered why, in a house of that size, on that kind of street, a servant hadn't answered the door. This way, Mr. Dollar. He led me up a flight of stairs and finally into a high-ceiling room with a fireplace at one end. A gray-haired woman with a sharp, angular face was seated near the window, looking out over the city and the bay. She didn't turn her head when we came into the room, but I could see that her eyes were watery and slightly glazed. Please, don't take too long and don't upset her. Leslie. Leslie, dear. Yes, Floyd? This is Mr. Dollar from the insurance company. He has something for you. Be a good girl, Leslie, and speak to Mr. Dollar. How do you do? And, and ask him... Yes. How is Mr. Porter? Oh, he's uh, fine, Mrs. Markham, fine. He'll be sorry to hear that you've been ill. I really would rather that you didn't tell Mr. Porter. Oh. I'm satisfied to make my own slow recovery and not worry any of my friends. We'd like some sherry, Floyd. Now you know what the doctor said, Leslie. Mr. Dollar, you'd like some sherry, wouldn't you? Why, yes, I'd like that very much. Floyd? No, I'm sorry, Mr. Dollar. It's absolutely forbidden. And you know that, dear. Uh, do you have the check, Mr. Dollar? <sighs> yes, right here. Here you are, Mrs. Markham. Thank you. Is there anything else? Mr. Dollar? Well, uh... Mr. Dollar, I... Now, Leslie... Yes? yes? What is it, Mrs. Markham? I'm very tired. Excuse me if I seem impolite. Good day. Good day, Mrs. Markham. Expense account item five ten cents phone call to Ed Porter at his office. Uh, yes, Mr. Dollar. Look, Mrs. Markham's five five, about one twenty, black hair, gray streak to the right of the part, blue eyes, looks about forty years old, a good forty. Why, yes, that sounds like her. You mean you've seen her? I've seen what's left of her, Mr. Porter. Oh, good lord, she's not dead. Almost. What? He's killing her, Mr. Porter. My guess is he's been at it for about six months. <laughs> Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in just a moment. Nobody will take a frown at face value anymore now that the word has gotten around about Jack Benny's return to the air. With Mary Livingston, Dennis Day, Rochester, Don Wilson, Mel Blank, Frank Nelson, and Mr. Kitzel, nothing less than your very best smile will do for the occasion. Tonight, and every Sunday night, hear CBS Radio's Jack Benny Show and give your sense of humor a real workout. Now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Markham Matter.
Take a rich old house on a rich old street in San Francisco. Walk in with a legitimate insurance check for $50,000 and tell a man named Floyd Markham you want to deliver it to his wife. Tell him this when you know that no one has seen or heard from his wife in six months. Just tell him you want to see her. Insist that you see her. Then stand around and listen to him lie a couple of times. Then let him take you to her. Give her the check. Say goodbye. Twenty minutes after I walked out of the Markham's house and picked up Ed Porter, we drove back to the house and parked a hundred feet from the entrance. This is the darndest thing I ever heard of, Mr. Dollar. I'm not sure it's all clear to me. What's our position? Oh, I wouldn't know that, Mr. Porter. That's up to the legal department. This much I'm sure of right now. Markham's already deposited $100,000 of her insurance money into a joint account. If I'm not mistaken, this last check will go into that account, too. Right now, while we're sitting here, she's probably endorsing that check. Well, then I don't see where it's any of our He's business. making her endorse the check. He's making her stay in that house, in that room, away from everybody. Well, how? What way? He said she was ill. You said she appeared ill. I don't see I don't it. know how he's doing it, but I'm going to find out. Are you sure this isn't all surmise on your part? You weren't in the room when she said, let's have some sherry. Please, let's have some sherry. Well, I, I must be pretty She was dumb, really said... saying, trying to say, she wanted him to leave the room so she could talk to me. So she could have one little minute to tell me what the matter is, what's going on. His next move is to deposit that check. Then one big withdrawal, the whole 150000 and bye-bye Floyd Markham. Mr. Dollar, I'm just an insurance broker. I don't understand that... Well, how'd you like to be an investigator hmm? for about ten minutes? Me? Yeah. You see that car that just pulled up in the driveway? Well, yes, the yes. The girl I... driving it holds down that dummy office of Markham's. Her name's Bidler. She might be in on this with him. A- and that's Mr. Markham leaving the house. Good. Now, look, here's what you do. Follow them. I think I know where they're going, but you follow them and make sure. Well, where are they going? To the bank to deposit that check. Oh. Well, where are you going? To have that glass of sherry, Mr. Porter. Ed Porter pulled his hat down low over his face and put both hands on the wheel and took out after that 55 Cadillac sedan. I crossed the street, went back up on the porch of the house and knocked. I didn't expect her to answer. I didn't expect anyone to answer, but I wanted to make sure. I went around to the garden. There wasn't a sound in the big old house when I opened the garden door and went up the stairs again. The door to her room was closed. She wasn't by the window anymore. She was stretched out on the divan. I felt her wrist for a pulse. It was there, faint, but there. About three inches up her arm, there was a series of little marks. I lifted one eyelid and felt her neck muscles. She was doped to the ears. Mrs. Markham... Mrs. Markham, can you hear me? Look, I've come to help you. Me? Yes. Yes, I'm going to take you out of here. Now, don't be frightened. Mr. Dollar? That's right. That's right. That's the ticket. An insurance company? Yes. Now, I remember. Yes, that's right. Thank you for bringing my check. I don't want... Want... Want what, Mrs. Markham? Want any of my friends to worry. Oh. I'm improving, but I don't want them to know I'm ill. Just say I'm out of town for a while. He told you to say that, didn't he? Yes. He told me to say. Exactly that. Mr. Dollar, don't fool me. Please don't fool me. What? You will help me get out of here. You aren't fooling me, are you? Are you? I carried her downstairs and put her in my car and drove her to the St. Regis Emergency Hospital. Expense account item six one hundred dollars deposit with the hospital office. I explained as much as necessary to the intern who promised to advise me when Mrs. Markham became rational. After that, I drove back to the house. Ed Porter's blue coupe was parked across the street. I didn't know what to do but come back here. And when I got back, I didn't know what to do either. Slow down, slow down. You're doing fine. Oh, you were right. You were absolutely right. They went straight to the Bank of America to deposit that money. I kind of thought they might be back here by now. No, no, they're over at Angelo's having a drink and some dinner. I followed them there. You're getting to be quite a sleuth, Mr. Porter. Well, I try to do my best and use my head. 
Uh, Mr. Dollar, did you talk to Mrs. Marker? As much as I could. She was doped. I took her out and put her in the hospital. Oh. Well, should you have done that, Mr. Dollar? I could have left her up in that room to die, Mr. Porter. Oh, yes. Yes. Well, uh, what's our next move? Ours? Well, certainly. I can't quit now, Mr. Uh, Johnny. <laughs> well, let's go to Angelo's, Eddie. <laughs> Ed Porter settled the hat lower on his ears and gripped the wheel harder, and we took off for Angelo's on Stoker Street. When we got there, we didn't have to go inside to see if our people were still around. The Cadillac sedan was in the parking lot. So we took up a plant across the street. Well, why wait? Why not go in and take them out of there and take them down to the police? Well, that might blow the whole thing. Now we have to wait and see what Mrs. Markham has to say when she's well enough to talk. Yeah, but, uh... I'm sure she'll have some charges to prefer. In the meantime, we wait and see what's what. Yeah, what do you think he'll do when he goes home and finds her gone? <laughs> well, that'll be pretty interesting. What do you think he'll do? Well, I, I imagine he'll, um... Uh, he'll think she got up and walked out. No, no, he knows better than that. He's had her doped up for six months. He knows he can go out of the house and she'll stay right where he left her while he's gone. No, that isn't it. Oh, but then he'll know that she had help. That's more like it, Mr. Porter. Uh, I, I liked Eddie. It uh, gives me kind of a feeling. Okay, Eddie. Now answer the question. Oh, uh, what'll he do? Well, uh, it's, he'll try to get out of town. That's it. He'll try to leave town. He'll know that he's had it. Come on. Huh? They're pulling out. We followed them to a cocktail lounge near the Presidio. We waited around outside the place for two hours. Expense account item seven twenty-five cents. I called the St. Regis Receiving Hospital. Mrs. Markham's condition was unchanged. Item eight, two dollars, two hamburgers, two cokes, and cigarettes for Mr. Porter and myself. We had just finished eating when Floyd Markham's Cadillac turned out onto the street. We followed it for ten minutes. When Markham parked on a dark hill, we cut our lights and came to a stop. Mr. Dollar. Yeah, Eddie. Can you see what they're doing? Yeah. What? Necking. Huh? Necking, you know. I should have telephoned my wife. At 12.10, Floyd Markham turned the car around and drove back into town. We followed once more. We saw him double park outside a four-story apartment house on a steep hill, let the woman out, then drive on. Eddie? Hey, yeah, Johnny? Think you can handle something else alone? Oh, I'd love to. Women sometimes talk a lot easier than men. You keep on him. When he finds his wife absent, I want to know where he goes. Wherever it is, I'll let you know. Are you going to shake her down? Uh, something like that. Yeah. Get going. I watched my new assistant investigator follow out after Markham's Cadillac. Then I went inside the apartment house. I, Bidler, was on the mailbox of apartment 104. I walked down the hall, listened a minute, and gave it a try. Yes? Well, what on earth are you doing? I'm here to see you, Miss Bidler. It's important. You're, um, Mr. Harris. I'm Mr. Dollar, Johnny Dollar. I'm an insurance investigator. Oh. There was something about you today. I, I wasn't sure. Now you're sure. Oh! What are you doing? Right now, I'm working for Western well, Life and Trust Company. You'd better sit down. Well, I don't know that I'd better do anything, Mr. Dollar. You're rather rude. Then you can stand. We've been checking into Floyd Markham. I don't think I have to tell you what we found out so far. I think you also know that by this time tomorrow, he'll be in jail and you might be right along with him. Well, I'm sorry, Mr. Dollar. I simply oh, don't... don't be sorry. Just use your head. I said you might be right along with him. On the other hand, if you have some useful information, the insurance company might be useful to you. What do you mean? Well, I figure he sold you on a, an island trip or uh, an estate in the country bill of goods. It'll be hard at getting it out of him, but we'll get it one way or another. We'll get it all right. Now, what do you want to do? I... I want a drink. You? Oh, thanks. I'm... I'm not bad. I'm I'm not a criminal. I, I've never been in trouble. You are now. Why? Because I fell in love with him? Because you were helping him kill her. What are you talking about? Mrs. Markham. She's in a hospital right now. What? I took her there myself today. He's had a dope with I don't know what for months. 
having us sign checks, endorse deposit slips. Oh, funny. Is it? He told me that Mrs. Markham was out of town, divorcing him. I wondered how I... You were right. It was a country estate. In England. A genteel life, he said. The London theater. Walks in the country. Little harmless things that most people can never do. He said we could do them as soon as he cleaned up his affairs. By tonight, he said we could start pack... Packing... I took Iris Bidler with me back to the Markham house. The Cadillac was in the garage and Ed Porter's blue coupe was pulled up across the street. When he saw us in the cab, he walked up. Hi. Hi. How's he doing? Uh, You can talk in front of her. Well, he he hasn't done anything. I mean, I saw the light go on upstairs in Mrs. Markham's room, then it went out again. He's downstairs now, sitting in the living room. Okay. Wait here. Uh. Markham. Hello. If you're worried about your wife, which I doubt, she's in the hospital. Are you a policeman? Insurance investigator. That's Miss Beidler in the taxi over there. Oh. I want you to come with me now. Of course. Yes. uh, You said your name was Dollar? That's right. Why couldn't you have come around, say... Next week. She'd have been dead by then. That's the way she should have been for 16 years. Dead. Yeah. Come on, Markham. Expense account, item 9, $102, hotel and board in San Francisco. Item 10, $116, airfare back to Hartford. Item 11, $42.16 miscellaneous. Remarks? This one will wind up in court. Mrs. Markham's charges will include attempted homicide, attempt to defraud, attempt to... In the end, it was his attempt to run away, and it didn't work. It never works. Even if you get away, you find something new to run from. Total expenses, $968.20. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Here's our star to tell you about next week's story. Before I do, I want to say something to you about Thanksgiving. Now, there's a day that deserves celebration. And heartfelt thanks to the God who made us for being able to live in the most free and peaceful and bountiful country in the world. And yet, why wait for next Thursday or any Thanksgiving day? For Americans, it seems to me, Thanksgiving should be every day. Think about it, won't you? Next week in our story, New Orleans, the French Quarter, a beautiful girl and high adventure. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in tonight's cast were Lois Corbett, Frank Nelson, Virginia Gregg, Bert Holland, Paula Winslow, and John Daner. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking.
From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Why, man? How's your stomach, Johnny? What? Rich food gave you any trouble? Who is this? Boy, your old buddy, Angie Orsati. Oh, hi, Angie. Glad you got my message. Yeah. How about dinner tonight at Antoine's, Johnny? Shrimp gumbo, oysters, Rockefeller. Yeah, sounds fine. Only I've got to do some work first. Man, I thought you were here in New Orleans on vacation. Nope. Little matter of fire insurance and the company's check for 16000 Somebody trying to cheat them out of it, huh? You won't believe this, Angie. Somebody turned it down. What? Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of a man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Providential Fire and Marine, 787 Greenleaf Avenue, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Royal Street matter. Expense account item one, $103.82, transportation to New Orleans. Item two, $4.20, cab from the airport to the Roosevelt Hotel. After unpacking, I put in the call to my old friend Angie Orsati. Nobody knows the French Quarter or the people living there like Angie does. For three months of the winter, he stays in the swamp, trapping muskrats. The rest of the year, he lives with his mother near the Cabildo. Angie wasn't in, but his mother said he, she knew where to reach him, and five minutes later, he returned my call. We arranged to meet for dinner, then I phoned the agent who had sold the policy in question. His name's Benford, and naturally, he was anxious to see me. C.D. Benford's office is on the third floor of the Hibernia Bank building. He's a stocky, red-faced man, probably in his late 50s. Come in, Mr. Dollar. Come in, come in. Thanks. Help yourself to the chair. Say, you fellas sure don't waste any time, do you? We try not to, Mr. Benford. C.D., boy. What? You call me C.D. like all the other folks do. Oh, okay, C.D. Yeah. Now, like I was saying, you boys sure don't waste any time at all. Well, I didn't even call the home office till the day before yesterday. I know. When was the fire? Last week on Thursday night. What did they tell you about it? Well, not very much. Figured I'd get all the information from you. Well, it's a doozy. First time I've ever run across a policyholder who wasn't yelling for us to pay him yesterday for his loss today. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, who is the insured, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, C.D.? man named Dupa, Henry Dupa. Took out a policy for 48000 That's full coverage on his antique shop down on Royal Street. How long ago? August, just three months back. I've been after him for, oh, maybe five, six months to buy some protection, but he kept saying he didn't have the money. Didn't have the money. And one day I dropped in to see him about his car insurance, and right off he told me to write a policy giving him full fire coverage on the shop. Well, how do you arrange to pay it? Cash. In full the day I delivered the policy. He tell you why he changed his mind? Yeah, not exactly. That he mentioned something about times being better. <laughs> I reckon they must be. Why'd he say that? Well, a few days later, he had the back part of his shop all painted and fixed up. And that's the part that burned. And he hired himself a girl to work in the office. A real good looker, too. Well, what caused the fire, you know? I sure do. Antique kerosene lamp got knocked over accidental. According to what Dupa told the fireman, he was in the back of the shop with a customer showing him the lamp. Uh-huh. When it fell, the fire started. The two of them tried to put it out. Reckon that's why they didn't call the fire department right off. Uh-huh. And did Dupa tell you the same thing? Dupa? He didn't tell me nothing. Well, he reported the fire to you, didn't he? He did not. And that's what's got me so riled up. I wouldn't know about it now if I hadn't dropped in there the other day. Was Dupa there when you stopped in? Yes, sir. He... And when I saw the place, look, the whole back of the store gutted out and the slew of his antiques destroyed. I let him have both barrels, I tell you. Oh, what'd he say to that? Well, yeah, nothing too much. Just acted like he wasn't interested in whether we paid for it or not. Didn't even ask for a claim for him. Hmm. That's funny. Sure is. I thought maybe he was so upset over losing some of his valuable antiques, he didn't know what he was doing. Hmm. So, after I checked with the fire department, got a copy of their report... I typed up a claim for him. 
You figured the damage at 16000 right? Mm-hmm. I uh, knew how much he spent fixing up the back. When I'd issued the policy, I'd gotten an estimate on most of the antiques. So what happened when you gave him the claim? He signed it? He did not. Said to forget about the fire. Huh? And when I kept after him, he called me a busybody and told me to get out of his shop and stay out. What do you think, C.D.? You have any idea why he didn't report it or sign that claim? If I had, boy, I wouldn't have sent for you. I left Binford's office and walked over to Canal Street. The sun had gone down and a cool breeze was coming in off the river, bringing with it the smell of coffee beans and fruit from the banana boats. I crossed Canal and turned onto Royal, heading into the French Quarter. When I reached Henry Dupas' antique shop, I stopped. There are a lot of antique shops on Royal. All of them look pretty much the same. The buildings as old as the fine rosewood and mahogany pieces they shelter. There was nothing different about this one, at least from the outside. The fire had started and finished in the rear of the building. I tried the front door, but it was locked. I didn't think anyone would be there that late, but I knocked anyway. Who is it? Mr. Dupont? Who is it? My name is Dollar, Mr. Dupont. I represent the Providential Fire Marine. Why do you people persist in annoying me? Well, we wouldn't if you'd tell us about the fire There's you There's nothing here. special about that fire, Mr. Dollar. It was an accident. Well, then why didn't you file a claim? You're entitled to enough money to cover your Mr. loss. Mr. Benford explained that to me quite carefully. If you haven't talked to him, Mr. Dollar, you should. Oh, I've talked to him. Well, then go away. Well, not until you answer a few questions. No, leave me alone, please. I'd noticed an alley next to the shop that ended where the rear door had been. I started back along it, not quite sure what I was looking for or what I expected to find. But I was sure of one thing. Dupa was a frightened man. It was too dark to see anything at the end of the alley, so I returned to the street. Item three, thirty dollars fifty cents. Phone call, taxi, and dinner for two at Antoine's. Oh man, kind of nice, ain't it, Johnny? Hmm. Oh, the way it never changes. Same waiter, same chef, same clientele. Yeah. Like another Cafe Royale, ain't she? No, no, thanks. Well, Johnny. Yeah. Well, when you gonna ask me? Ask you what? Don't kid me. John, you've had that old bloodhound look in your eye ever since we sat down. What's the question? <laughs> okay, Angie. What do you know about a man named Henry Dupas? Dupas antique shop? That's right. Oh, not much. Seen him around some, so. Yeah, where? Oh, you, you know what kind of places I like, Johnny. Yeah, but I can't picture Dupas liking them. Well, maybe he don't, but maybe that little old blonde he's been carrying with him does. Blonde? Yeah, you know, female, girl, bleached tail. I know, I know. Yeah. How old? Oh, 24, 5. Yeah, real nice for old coot like him. Real winter and spring, huh? Yeah. You seen them together often? Oh, a few times. Saw them about two weeks ago at Butch's place. Hey, you know something? I walked in there that night with a five and I walked out with 200. <laughs> How about that? Great. You know who the blonde is? No, but I might be able to find out. You want? Yeah. I want. I left Angie and started back toward Royal Street. On the way, I ran up item four, one dollar and eighty-five cents for one flashlight and batteries. The shades on Dupas' shop were drawn, but I could tell there were lights on inside. In the alley, a small pickup truck was parked near the side entrance to the shop. In the back of the truck, looking like they'd just been taken off the boat, were several stalks of bananas. There wasn't much else to see except the charred wood and refuse left in the alley after the fire. I started back toward the street when a man, a much larger man than Dupas, came out the side door and got into the truck. He turned over the engine and switched on the lights before I could get clear. Hey, what are you doing there? Hold it, mister, right there. Hey, buddy, you just hold it. What were you doing back there, huh? Well, right now, mister, I'm wondering what this load of bananas is doing in an antique shop. What is it, Carl? Well, I just caught this guy snooping around in the back. What? It's Mr. Dull. Yeah, that's right. You you know him, Dupas? He's one of those insurance men I told you about. Oh, well, 
What are you here for, Dollar? Didn't Depa tell you he doesn't want any money from you people? Now, why not? Because he's afraid we might have to take a good look around before paying no, off. No, sir. Uh, now, now, is... now, look, Dollar. Mr. Dupas has been okay with you people, so you got no reason to come snooping around. Especially after he's told you he don't want you around. So now maybe Mr. Dupa will have to do something to keep you away. Ain't that right, Mr. Dupa? Uh, you know what I mean. Yes. That's all right. I'll do it, Carl. And he'll never bother us again. Go on, Dollar. Get out of here. At the time, I had no idea what they meant to do, so it wasn't easy to turn my back on them. But I did. And nothing happened. I went back to my hotel and hit the sack, and I must confess I slept later than usual the next morning. I was still in bed when the phone rang. Johnny Duller. Well, hey now, where's my dynamic northern friend? Oh, he's off today. I'm taking his place. Uh, well, then the news I got, well, I reckon it'll keep till tomorrow. Yeah. Well, so long. No, no, wait, 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 Angie. Yeah. Did you find out anything about that blonde the has been seeing? Oh, sure, everybody around the French market coffee shop used to know her. Uh, used to, meaning up till she went to work for Mr. Dupas. She worked for Dupas? Yeah, in the office at his store. Started in there about three months ago. Well, come on. Well, since then, nobody sees her anymore. At least none of her old gang. You know where she lives? Yep. The Pont Alba Apartments. That is, unless she has moved. Well, what's her name? Rose Allen. What? Yeah. She used to be a dancer. That enough for you to go on? Yeah, and she thanks. That's plenty. Expense account item five, one dollar and forty cents cab fare from my hotel to the Pontalba Apartments. The list of names on the register near the manager's office told me Rose Ellen's apartment was number two fifteen. But when I got up there, the girl who opened the door wasn't a blonde. Yes. Oh, I'm looking for Miss Rose Ellen. She is in. Oh. She at work? Who are you? I mean, are you a friend of hers? My name is Dollar. Johnny Dollar. I'm an insurance investigator. Invest? Well, she hasn't done anything, has she? <laughs> well, not that I know of. Uh, look, Miss... Um... Garbo. Garbo? May Garbo. Ah, you're a dancer, aren't you? How'd you guess? Oh, I'm good at recognizing talent. Oh? Would you like to come in? I've got some coffee on. Well, that'll be just fine. Say, you've certainly got a nice view of the square from here. I suppose. Don't you think so? Oh, sure, if you like that sort of thing. Me, I just think the square's kind of square. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, that's good. That's very good. I brought good. it up the day we moved here. You and Rose move in here together? Uh-huh. Oh, sit down, Johnny. Make yourself at home. Well, thanks. Gee, you're so polite. You wait to be asked. Yeah. Look, tell me, what time do you think Rose will be home? Oh, I couldn't say. Uh, May, this is important. What time does she usually get home? Well, I don't know. I mean, after all, she's got her own life to live, you know, and I'm not her keeper. Okay, okay. Sometimes she doesn't get home for days. Oh, I better get the coffee. She ever say anything to you about the fire? Fire. The fire down at the antique shop. No, you want cream and sugar? No, thanks, just black. Good. When was that? The fire? Last Thursday night. That's funny. What's funny? That was the last time I saw her. What? Yeah. Rose went to work last Thursday, but she never came home. <laughs> Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in just a moment. You don't have to be a special investigator to know that Americans don't take their civic responsibilities lightly. The Election Day turnout proved that beyond any shadow of doubt. So now it's time for you to face up to another responsibility to the nation in just as straightforward a way. Our Ground Observer Corps needs volunteers. We at CBS Radio urge you to write or telephone your nearest civil defense center to learn how you can help in this vast program that patrols our skies. 
Now, Act Two of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar and the Royal Street Matter. This was the screwiest deal I'd ever seen. A guy refusing insurance money he was entitled to. Rose Allen was my one lead, so I continued questioning May, her roommate. May told me this was the first time Rose had been away so long without at least sending for a change of clothes. I asked about Rose's boyfriends. She told me Rose had been going with one other man beside Dupas, but she didn't know who he was. After May promised to call me if she heard from Rose Allen, I left. Expense account item six, one dollar and ninety cents taxi from the Pontalba Apartments to the Hibernia Bank Building. My insurance contact, Benford, wasn't in. So while I waited for him, I wondered again why Dupont had refused to sign the claim for the fire damage to his shop. Could he afford a loss of sixteen thousand dollars? I wondered if something had happened in that shop. Something Dupont had tried to cover up with a fire. I was wondering what it could have been when Benford walked in. Well, I'm glad you're here, Johnny. We got trouble. Oh? I hear you paid Dupas a call last night. That we have been? Yeah. He phoned me about ten, wanted me there fast. Oh, boy. I wish I had sense enough to stay away. Well, what happened, C.D.? Before I tell you that, you tell me what he said to you last night. Nothing important. Just something about fixing it so I couldn't bother him again. Oh? Well, he did. How? He canceled his fire insurance policy and every other policy he ever bought from me. Canceled? Yeah. So you might as well go on back to your hotel and pack, Johnny. It's none of your affair now, no matter what he's up to. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's too bad it had to turn out this way. You want a drink before you go? No, I guess I need one. Yeah. What'll it be, scotch or rye? Scotch, neat, please. Good, saves making a mess. When you, uh... Reckon you leave. Oh, I don't know. I'll check with the airline when I get back to the hotel. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there you go. Thanks. Better luck next time. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, that's that. Uh, CD. Hmm. What about the policy? Policy. Did he return the policy to you? Uh, no, I said do it tomorrow. But he's covered until he does return it. Does he know that? Why, no. I don't reckon he does. Good, good. He might get careless. And as long as that policy is in force, I can bother him as much as I want. Oh, I don't see what's the use, Johnny. He'll have it here by tomorrow evening. That still gives me 24 hours to get lucky. C.D., you said something about a customer being with him when that kerosene lamp was knocked over. Mm-hmm. According to what he told the fire department, there was. You had that person's name? Well, I should have. I took it in the fire department report. And I've got that right here. Uh, yeah, yeah, here it is. Now, let's see. Mm-hmm. The name is Andrew W. DeLong. Address, 1515 West Claiborne. There wasn't any Andrew DeLong at that address. We checked the telephone book and the city directory, and the only Andrew W. DeLong we found was out in Metri, in a mausoleum. So we drove back towards C.D.'s office. Well, now what, Johnny? Dupin. Huh? Find out everything we can about Dupin and everybody who works for him. Ain't nobody but his secretary and his assistant. Tell the name Carl. Yeah, how long has Carl been working for him? Oh, about as long as she has. Does this Carl own a fruit stand? A fruit? Oh, not I uh, know about. Why? Oh, I just wondered. Hey, what time is it, C.D.? Uh, uh 2.15. Say, if we're going to check on Dupas' credit, we better get to the bank before the close. You're driving. Let's move. Expense account item 7, $22.80. Telephone calls and a couple of gratuities to obtain a lot of information about Dupas. I learned, among other things, that he banked almost $11,000 in the past three months. Before that, almost nothing. But there's no law against making money, so I still had nothing concrete to go on. At 5.30, I left Benford, went back to my hotel, and there found a message from May, Rose Allen's roommate, asking me to go to her apartment immediately. So I did. Oh, Johnny. Yeah, hi, May. Oh, come in. 
Johnny, you know what you made me promise. Yeah? Well, it happened. You mean you've heard from Rose? Well, no, not exactly. But a man called this afternoon and talked about her. Oh, well, I hope he had only nice things to say. Oh, yes. He said she's just fine. What? Didn't you hear me? Yeah, he said she's fine. Fine. Well, what else did he say? Well, he said he was going to come by at 4 o'clock and pick up her clothes. I should have them ready. No, but of course he didn't. Well, he did so. He did? Well, what man? You know him? You get his name? Mr. Dollar. You don't think I'd let Rose's things go out of here with a complete stranger, do you? Of course he told me his name. Well? You aren't nearly as polite as you were this morning. All right, I'm sorry. What's the man's name, darling? Oh, well, that's much better. It's Grant. Grant? That's right. That doesn't register. From the way he talked, he must be the one Rose was going with while she was dating that old antique. You ever see this guy, Grant, before? No, but I'm sure he's the one she talked about. Really, it used to get so tiresome. Carl this and Carl does that. Oh. What? I said, oh. May, tell me. Where did he say he was taking her clothes? Well, he didn't say. He just put them in that old truck. Thanks, sweetheart. See you later. I needed a fast car and a driver who could handle it, so I called Angelo Arsati. Twenty minutes later, we parked in front of Dupas' antique shop. There was a dim light on inside. Brother, there's really no reason for you to get mixed up in this thing. Are you kidding, sir? Hmm. Looks like Dupai ain't going to answer. All right, let's see what this hunk of stone will do to the glass. Here. Hey, that got it. I can reach through to lock. Looks like nobody here. Well. Hey, wait a minute. Yeah, I see him. Carl, what happened to you? Dollar. Dollar. Angie, call an ambulance. Tell him a man's been stabbed here. Yeah, right, Johnny. Dollar. Get to her. Before he can. To Pa? Gonna kill Rose. You, you got to help her. To Pa wants to kill her? Why? She, she found out. Smuggling. Is that what Dupas has been up to? Smuggling in... Banana shipment. Rose found out. Where is she? He thought I'd killed her, but I love her. Yeah, well, look, tell me. You, you gotta get to her before he does. Where is she? Old Spanish fortress. Yeah? Out on Bayou Slidell. Old Spanish fortress on the Bayou Slidell. Yeah. You know where that is, Angie? Oh, sure. An old ruin out in the swamps north of town near the highway bridge. It goes over to the Gulf Coast. Carl, how long ago did Dupont leave? Ten or fifteen minutes. Yeah, well, we could beat him, Johnny, by cutting across the swamps. That is, if you could take it. What do you mean by that? Well, it's rugged. Like what? Johnny, did you ever ride a swamp buggy? <laughs> Brother, yeah. how much farther, Angie? Well, should be right up ahead. How can you tell? All I can see is swamp and marsh grass. Yeah, well, I've done a lot of trapping out here. I know the channel. Think we'll make the old ruins before Dupont? Well, we got to, don't we? Hey, there it is. That old wreck is called a fortress? Man, that's it. Well, get us up as close to it as you can. I don't see anybody parked. Nobody approaching the bridge. Here we are. Come on, let's go. Uh, hey, hey, look, John. There she is at the side end. Yeah, I see. Rose! Rose Ellen! She's scared. She ducked back inside. Rose! We're friends of Carl's. He sent us to help you. Well, come on, John. We can get inside to her through this here doorway. Okay. This place looks like it's about ready to fall apart. Rose! Yeah, man. Dark in here, too. Yeah, don't step on the falling brakes. Okay. Rose! Rose Ellen! Yes? Where? Where's Carl? Dupont tried to kill him. Oh, no. Rose! Come on out here where we can see you. 
Rose! Oh, he found out that Carl didn't kill me, is that it? Yeah, but Carl's all right now. Look, Rose, I want you to tell me all you know about the fire at DuPas' shop. Were you there? Yes. Well, what happened? Pa had me tied up. Told Carl I'd found out what they were doing. Smuggling, I mean. He told Carl to kill me. He didn't know Carl and I was going to be married. Go on, go on. Carl argued with him. That's when the lamp got knocked over. They didn't stop arguing until DuPa said he'd kill us both. So finally, Carl told DuPa he'd take care of me. Well, he had to, or DuPa would have killed us. But instead, Carl brought you here. Yes. Oh, come on, Johnny. Let's get out of this dark Wait hole. a minute, Angie. Rose, do you know why DuPa was afraid to report his fire to the insurance company? Some of the things he smuggled in was lost in the fire. If anybody come poking around, they might have found out what he's doing. What was he smuggling? Do you know? Little tiny boxes filled with white powder, hidden in the bananas. Johnny, narcotics. Yeah, sure. No wonder he banks so much money so fast. I bank much more. Huh? That's how I get rid of you, Dollar. Look, look at that. There he is in the door. Yeah, watch it. See, I ain't fooling, Dollar. He can't see us. No, but what a target he makes in that doorway against the light. No gun, no, Johnny? No, no. But we can try one of these bricks. Yeah, man, but if you miss... Dollar! Wish me luck. Yeah. Dollar! Right here to pop! <laughs> Come on. Oh, man, dear. You could qualify for the New York Yankees, Johnny. All right, Japa. On your feet. Let's get out of here. Expense account total, including rental on the swamp buggy, incidentals and transportation back to Hartford, $517.20. Remarks? Well, where he's going, Japa wouldn't have any use for the insurance money anyway. Carl Grant turned state's evidence and clinched the smuggling charges against him. Because of that, Carl may get off easy. I hope so. He and Rose could make a very happy couple. And a remarks, and a report. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Our star will return in just a moment. If we are to remain alert to possible acts of aggression, we need the continuous operation of the Ground Observer Corps. And if the Ground Observer Corps is to remain on the job around the clock, seven days a week, your help is needed. Tomorrow, telephone your nearest Civil Defense Center and volunteer a few hours of your time each week to the Ground Observer Corps. Join our Ground Observer Corps at the Civil Defense Center nearest your home. Now, here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week... Three sets of twins, two men, two girls, and two fires that hit the coast of Florida with the impact of a hurricane. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood. Written by Charles B. Smith, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in tonight's cast were Virginia Gregg, Forrest Lewis, Lou Merrill, Lawrence Dobkin, and Frank Gersel. Musical supervision is by Amerigo Marino and Carl Fortino. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Dan Coverly speaking.
From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Earl Foreman here. Foreman? Uh, Tri-State Life and Casualty. I'm the branch office manager down here. Oh, sorry, Mr. Foreman, but the answer is no. Uh, Well, this is an arson case, Dollar, and we're already having to make one payoff on it. I'm sorry, but it'll have to wait. I'm going to get as far away from this New England winter as I can. Well, for that, I don't blame you, but there's no reason you shouldn't come Look, I've had a rough year of it. I'm tired and I'm cold. And unless I can get down to where the warm, balmy breezes waft in... Dollar, I have got to have you on this case. There's a lot at stake. Now, my office is down here in... No, sir, I'm sorry. You see... Down here in Sarasota. I just can't do it, Mr. Foreman. I've already made a plane reservation for Sarasota, Florida. And this is one time I'm going to... Where did you say your branch office is? Sarasota, Florida. Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Tri-State Life and Casualty Insurance Company Home Office, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the burning car matter. Expense account item one, which I'd thought I was going to have to absorb myself. $129, transportation and incidentals to Sarasota, Florida. It was nearly 5 p.m. when I got there, so instead of checking into a hotel, I taxied, that's item two, a dollar even, I taxied to Earl Foreman's office in the Conroy building. He turned out to be a tall, lanky, easygoing fellow with clear blue eyes and a ready smile. Sit in an office and talk business this time of day? You're in Florida now, Johnny. Well, I thought from your call this was a pretty urgent matter, Mr. Foreman. It is. Arson, you said. Yeah, probably, but here's no reason we can't go out to my little shack on the key and be comfortable while we talk about it. Besides, Michael wants you for dinner. Mike? Uh, my wife, Gertrude. Oh. Uh, come on, my jalopy's right out at the curb. Come on, Johnny. <laughs> Poor man was a misnomer for this man because his jalopy turned out to be a spanking new Cadillac, complete with air conditioning and all the fixings. And the shack, anything but. It was on St. Armand's Key across Sarasota Bay from the mainland, a beautiful two-story concrete and stucco job. The big yard backed on a quiet bayou, and there tied up at a private dock was a 24-foot lap strake speedboat, ideal for fishing the Gulf of Mexico. After all, as long as you're down here on expense account. Yeah, but it's charged to your company, remember? Oh. <laughs> hey, there she is at the door. Huh? The big, fat, overbearing broad I'm married to. This was another switch. For Earl's wife standing in the doorway was the cutest little trick I'd seen in a long time. Petite, pretty, and blonde, and with eyes that you notice right away because they were almost green. Eyes that suddenly narrowed as she looked at me. And I wondered why. Johnny? Dollar, did you say? That's right. Insurance investigator down here to look into those fires. Oh. Any objections? No. No, of course not. Just set your bags here in the hall, Johnny. All right, thanks. And wouldn't you like a drink after your long trip? Yeah, and you can get me one, too. Scotch, Johnny? Martin ZVO. Oh, great. Well, soda, please. Uh, sit down, sit down. Thanks. I, uh, I take it Mike isn't too interested in the insurance business, huh? <laughs> Uh, you know, she used to be a singer, dancer. Oh, well, this is a little different. But now, tell me all. Well, actually, I guess we ought to wait until Arnold Carr gets back. Carr? Uh, Carr Brothers, Lumber Enterprises. Arnold runs the business, and his brother Edward... (laughs) Well, Ed just shares the profits. Real black sheep of the family, from what I've been able to learn. Oh. Anyway, they have yards all over the state. There's one here in Sarasota, one up the coast a ways at Fort Pierce, and still another at Arcadia. That's about 40 miles inland, just east of here. And there was one up in Orlando. Was? Completely destroyed by fire a couple of weeks ago. And a $120,000 claim has been filed. A hundred and... Wow. That's where Arnold Carr is then, in Orlando, trying to clear things up. Here's your drink. Oh, thanks. Here, Earl. Yeah, well, to the gods and goddesses and us. But shouldn't I be up in Orlando then? Uh, Arnold's on his way back here now. He lives here. 
He just went up there to arrange for clearing off and selling the property. You mean he's planning to just pocket the money? If Tri-State pays off, I mean. Looks like it. But I take it you suspect arson. Yes, Earl suspects arson, Johnny, and so does Arnold Carr. At least he says he does, but they have no reason. No? How about the other fires? Or attempted fires? Oh, where? At Arcadia, for one, but they got it out in time. At least that's the way Arnold Carr reported it. The way he Let tells me it... tell it, Mike. Oh. There was another at the yard here in Sarasota. Arnold himself discovered it one night when he was just driving around. But nothing to indicate it was attempted arson. No, well, and it... the authorities up in Orlando found no indication of it there. Mike, you know as well as I do that a lumberyard fire will obliterate signs of arson better than any other kind of fire in the world. Yeah, but she has a point, though, Earl. Unless there's some evidence of arson. Of course. Yeah, why send for me? Well, mostly because... Actually, because Arnold Carr suspects him. But he's given you no real reason. None at all. I think he has a real reason, but he just won't tell us. Wait till you see him. He's going to call when he gets in. We'll run over to his place on Longboat Key. What about his brother? Edward, did you say? I've never met him. He's always stayed in Orlando. I was wondering if he might tell things that Arnold is holding back. Oh, Ed... Edward Carr wouldn't know anything. Uh, you can never be too sure. Uh, look, why can't you agree with me for a... Ch- uh, that must be Arnie now. Excuse me. Hello? Uh, this is Arnold Carr. Oh, hi, Arnie. Uh, Johnny Dollar arrived, so we'll be... Well, here, I'll let you talk to him. Here, Johnny. Uh, no. Okay. No, Earl, listen. What? Uh, I told you before it was arson. It was arson again tonight. Tonight? What's that? Arcadia just went up in flames, the whole yard. Good Lord. Did you hear that, Johnny? Yeah, I heard it. Can you prove it was arson uh, tonight in Arcadia and before in Orlando? I... I have proof. Well, Arnie, we'll be over just as fast as... No. What? No. Wait for me there at your home. Well, but look now... You mustn't come here. And I I mustn't stay here because I... I... Uh, Now, listen, man, you... uh, uh, Arnie... Well, I guess he's ready to tell us now. A suspicion began to grow in my mind. A suspicion that Mike apparently shared with me. That Arnold Carr himself might be responsible for the fires. After all, he was the only one who had seemed to know about the two unsuccessful attempts. He himself had planted the idea of arson. He'd lost no time in filing claim for the Orlando burnout. But Earl said I was wrong. Arnold was too honest a man. Earl had also said we were only 15 minutes from Carr's home. So when half an hour passed, we called him back. Got a busy signal. After the fourth try, the three of us took off in Earl's cab. As we pulled into Carr's driveway, we could see him through the picture window, sitting at his desk, telephone in hand, apparently engrossed in a call. Then, as we walked up to the door, I noticed something else. Arnold Carr looked enough like me to be my brother. Maybe that explained Mike's reaction when she first saw me. Hey, Arnie. Can't you see? He's on the phone in there. Well, the least he can do is hear his own doorbell. Earl, wait. Good Lord. What's the matter? Through the window. Oh, no. Earl? Stand back. Earl, for heaven's sake, what is it? Couldn't you see from out there? No, what's wrong? I... I... Well, Johnny... Right through the forehead, Earl. Looks like a thirty-eight. Before I could stop him, Earl took the phone out of the dead man's hand and called headquarters. Mike turned pale and slumped into a chair. And I gave the place a quick rundown, checked doors, windows, etc. A few minutes later, an officious young sergeant named Larkin arrived and took over. Thirty-eight caliber straight through the middle of the forehead. Were all three of you here when it happened? Mr. Foreman, Mrs. Foreman, and uh, who are you? The answer to your first question, Sergeant, is no, none of us was here. And this is Johnny Dollar, insurance investigator. Hiya. You insurance guys work pretty fast. You related to Mr. Carr? No, why? You look a little like him. Who busted in the front door? The killer? I did. When we drove up, we saw Mr. Carr sitting there at his desk. We rang the doorbell and knocked, but... And when he didn't move, you took things in your own hands and busted in, huh? That's right. You haven't moved anything, have you? No. Except I took the phone out of his hand to call you. Dollar, if you're any kind of investigator, you should have known better than let him touch anything. Now, now, let's see. The shot must have come from somewhere near this window by the fire. Ah, oh, sure, here we are. Bullet hole right through the pane. Bullet was fired from outside. 
You're sure, Sergeant? Sure, I'm sure. Look for yourself. You call yourself an investigator? Hey, Cummings, Woolway, check the area around that window beside the chimney out there for footprints. Maybe an empty cartridge case. Now, you folks get out of here so I can call Doc Hanley over and get on with my investigation. And no, Dollar, I don't need any of your help. Well, thank you, Sergeant. Your job is fires, not... Hey, where did Mrs. Porman go? Out to the car. Why? Who told her she could leave? Who told her she had to sit here looking at a corpse? All right, Dollar, all right. Just be sure the three of you stick around town in case I decide to question you further. Oh, of course, Sergeant. Yeah. Yeah. Not shot by somebody standing outside? What do you mean, Johnny? Oh, I spotted that bullet hole in the window, too. So? I also noticed there were no particles of glass on the inside sill. But there were some on the outside. Yeah. The shot that made that hole was fired from inside that room to make it look as though it had come from outside. Then somebody was in there with Arnold Carr. Yeah. Either somebody he let in or who had normal access to the house. And he had to stop Arnold from talking about the fire in Arcadia. Hey, how much do you know about his brother, Edward? Well, nothing really outside of what Arnold told me. Was either of them married, family of any sort? Arnie wasn't, but I... Arnold's death means Edward will own the business then. Well, yes. And he lives up in Orlando, scene of the first big fire. Yes, very good heavens. Johnny, you don't think his own brother... Where can I rent a car? Take Mike Chevy. It's in the carport at the house. But what are you going to do? Drive up to Orlando by way of Arcadia. When I got to Arcadia, only a few people were standing around the remains of the fire. One hose company was still working on it, and a couple of police were poking about in the embers. Walking toward it, I almost stumbled over a little old man sitting alone in the darkness beside a palm tree, hunched over, his head in his hands, sobbing. He didn't even look up when I stopped beside him. It's like losing part of my own life, it is. You, uh, you lost someone in the fire, sir? No, son. Only part of my life. I helped build up that yard, me and Mr. Arnie. Arnold Carr. All along, he's been worried about it. Last week, when him and me smelled smoke and come over here and put out the barrel of trash that was smoldering, he knew. Knew what? That somebody was trying to burn him out? That's why he stopped by tonight on his way home. That's why we drove over here, him and me. And I brought my gun just in case. Yeah. Well, we got here too late. It was already blazing. And when he seen the automobile pulling away... What auto? Yes, Frank, he said to me. I knowed he was the one trying to burn me out, he said. Who? Who, old timer? Who do you mean? He he didn't say. Then he called the fire department. That car that pulled away, what was it? Just an auto, big white Buick. But he tied it in with whoever set the fire. All he said was, I knowed he was the one. Do you know who it was he meant? He told me even if I didn't know, I should never tell. Even the police. Well, who do you think it was? Break my word to Mr. Arnie? Uh-uh. Never, son. All right, look, old man, I'm sorry to have to tell you this. Mr. Arnie's dead. What? What, he... But he can't be. He was... You. Huh? Ah, maybe you thought in the darkness I wouldn't know you. But I do know you, you... Oh, now, just a minute, old timer. If Mr. Arnie's dead, it's because you killed him. What? Just like you set the fire. No, no, I'm not who you think I am. And I'll kill you. That's what I'll do. Put down that gun. I'll kill you. Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in just a moment. Back in the old days, the very old days, that is, a girl named Cassandra had a corner on the Oracle market. But nowadays, you can do some foretelling yourself. On Jukebox Jury, for example, you can help decide which of Tin Pan Alley's new recordings are destined for the hit brackets and which ones are likely to spiral all the way down to oblivion. Remember, Jukebox Jury is yours to hear on most of these same stations every Sunday. Now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, and the burning car matter. (laughs) 
Expense account, item three, $5.15, gas for the borrowed Chevy to keep me going to Orlando. Either the old man's eyesight was bad or he was just a lousy shot. Either way, it was okay by me. I hated to slap him down, but there was no point hanging around Arcadia trying to explain things to the local authorities. So after making sure I hadn't really hurt him, I appropriated his gun and took off fast. He'd thought I was someone else. Even I had noticed a family-type resemblance to myself in Arnold Carr. Sergeant Larkin had asked me if I was related to him. And now the old man at the fire had apparently thought I was the one who... Oh, well, I'm afraid I made the rest of the trip to Orlando in somewhat less than legal time. And at police headquarters, I barged into the office of Lieutenant Cal Hudson without bothering to be announced. So early in the morning? Sit down while I finish up report, Mr. Carr. Uh, thanks. I was trying to reach you, but we got no answer to the phone at your house. Well, that's very interesting, Lieutenant. I'm afraid I have the painful duty of notifying you that your brother Arnold down in Sarasota last night... Why did you say very interesting, Mr. Carr? Or had you already learned... Well, I'll be doggone. Yeah. You're not the first one. Who are you? Johnny Dollar, insurance investigator. I can't believe it. You... Dollar, you look enough like Edward Carr to be his twin... You even sound a lot like it. I take it you haven't located Edward yet? Well, no. Lieutenant, I think Edward Carr is the firebug we're after. And the killer. Wait a minute. Briefly as possible, I told him of Arnold Carr's phone call to Earl Foreman. His emotional upset just before he was killed. I told him Arnold had been murdered by someone inside the house, someone close to him. And that everything indicated that someone could very well be Edward Carr. That's still all just theory, Dollar, without any proof. Well, I will admit that Edward is a pretty worthless playboy living off the profits of the lumberyard. In any event, the lieutenant promised to put out an APB on Edward Carr. That was at breakfast for the two of us, item four, three dollars and a quarter. Before I left him, he gave me Ed Carr's address, 1726 Allen Place. As I expected, there was no answer to the doorbell at 1726, so I tried visiting up the street. It quickly became clear that Ed Carr wasn't very popular in this otherwise quiet, well-ordered neighborhood. Those big, noisy parties at all hours of the night, cars parked up and down the street, blocking respectable people's driveways. Yes, ma'am, You know, well... once in a while you expect a person to have callers and such. Me, I have the Ladies' Bridge Club every third Wednesday, for instance. Well, that's nice. But these are all ladies, not like some of the trash that that man and his friends have, dancing and drinking and carrying on at all hours. Yes, you mentioned cars, Mrs. You know, Oh, people like Mrs. Herford Robin. She's awfully nice. And Janet Osterworthy. Now, she's a widow. Well, and you know, she could have her pick of anybody she likes, but does she ever look at another man? No, sir. And then there's Mrs. Mrs. Harper. Uh, yes? You mentioned cars. Do you know what kind Mr. Carr drove? Why, yes. It was a big white one. And the make? Well, no. My husband, when he was alive, always drove a Maxwell, and I guess that's the only kind I ever got to know by name. But Mr. Cars is white. Only I guess that isn't much help to you, is it? All the white cars here in Florida, I mean. Look. Now, even that blonde hussy who's around him all the time drives a white car. Oh, I really shouldn't use a word like that, though, should I? But it fits... Wait a minute. What blonde, Mrs. Harper? Mr. Dollar. I don't pay any attention to people like that. Why, you'd think she owned that house of his. The way she keeps popping in and out all hours as if she belonged there. Mrs. Harper. And drives all the way up from Sarasota, too. Do you know who she is? I do not. I refuse to pay any attention to people like... And the way she dresses, too, like a newly rich chorus girl with all her fancy clothes and furs and things. How do you know she comes from Sarasota? By the license on her car, of course. Every city has its own number. You know that very well. And hers is 12WW something. And you don't know her name? Of course not. Flaunting all those expensive furs as though she bought and paid for them herself. And if there's anything I hate to see, it's a little shrimp loaded down with furs. Now, a tall person I like see. me... I see. Well, her thanks. Eyes, oh, if there's anyone I don't trust, it's a person with green eyes. Why, Thank you, Mrs. You... Harper. Her description of Carr's girlfriend stopped me in my tracks. That description could fit Mike Porman to the letter. Petite, blonde, green eyes, and she came from Sarasota. And then I remembered Mike's reaction when she first saw me. 
Her dismissal of Edward as a possible suspect. There was obvious friction between Earl and Mike, too. I figured it was just normal in a couple who'd been married for a while. But now... Item five, a dollar thirty phone call from the nearest booth I could find to Earl Poorman at his office in Sarasota. No, she isn't, Johnny. Why? Well, you know where Mike is. When I woke up this morning, I could hear her talking to her girlfriend, Betty, on the phone downstairs. Betty? Uh, Betty lives here in Sarasota. They used to be on the stage together, sister act, you know. Yeah, well, uh... Uh, Well, then when I went down for breakfast, she was gone. Took my car, too. I had to come here to the office in a taxi. Yeah, well, okay, Earl. Thanks a lot. Hey, uh, now, wait a minute. How are you doing? You found out anything I ought to know about this arson and murder business? Uh, No, Earl. Nothing that you need to worry about. Liar. I sat down at a corner drugstore. That's item five, 80 cents, over a sandwich and a Coke to try to think things out. But I'm afraid I didn't like anything that I thought. Finally, I drove over to Allen Place again. I parked a couple of blocks away and walked to 1726. I rang the front doorbell, knocked a couple of times. Then I slipped around to the back door, finagled a lock on it with a little celluloid pocket calendar, finally got it open. I left it open for the sake of a quick exit if such became necessary. But I guess that was a mistake. For a couple of minutes later, as I rounded the corner from the den into the living room, I felt the barrel of a gun poked into my back. Out of town, huh? Now, wait a minute. Don't move, Eddie boy. Trying to stall off, pay me the five grand by saying you're going to be out of town, huh? Okay, so you think I'm Edward Carr. You kidding. Don't you know what happens when somebody tries to stall me? This! I don't know exactly how long I was out, but when I came to, it was dark. Except for the glow from a streetlight outside. And what roused me was the sound of footsteps, feminine steps, cautiously entering the back door. Then, briefly, silhouetted against a window, I saw a trim, petite figure that was all too familiar coming toward me. And she saw me, too. Oh, darling, you're hurt. What happened? Uh, What do you think? Who did this? Who struck you? You don't know? Yes, of course. It was Tony. Because you didn't pay him soon enough for the Arcadia job. Here, Eddie, let me help you. No, no, just let me rest for a minute. I thought that was Tony I passed on the road in from Sarasota. Why'd you come over from Sarasota? To see you. I knew you'd be here. Oh, why? Why? So the police could surprise you with the news of your poor dear brother's death. But why did you come to the house? Because I hoped you'd come here, I guess. Eddie, you should have waited until I could raise the money to pay off Tony. You mean for killing Arnold, too? Of course. No. Are you trying to say you didn't kill Arnold? But I saw you from outside in the Buick. You'd swear to that, wouldn't you? I, I don't know what you... Eddie, you sound like you don't trust me. We're in this thing together. Yeah, you sure that? What are you talking about? Whose idea was it to knock off Arnold? But you had to. When he saw you at Arcadia, he he knew that you were having the yards burned up. That's the way you figured it from the beginning, wasn't it? Now look, baby. First burn up the lumber yards and collect the insurance on them. Then convince me that you and I should have it all by putting Arnold out of the way. But you had to kill Arnold. I don't understand you, Eddie. Yeah, And I wish I didn't understand you, Mike. Mike? Come on. Let's turn on a light. No. No. Somebody sees us. Eddie, you... Who... Who are you? Are you kidding, Mike? I... Wait a minute. Who are you? You're that insurance investigator, Johnny Dollar, that Mike told me. Let me out of here. Oh, no, you don't. You're staying right here. Mike Poorman's sister, aren't you? Well? Who's sister? (laughs) So we once did a sister act before she married that poor man guy. Now, let, let me go. Not by a long shot. You may as well, Dollar. What? Eddie. Don't move, Dollar. Get his gun, Betty. Get it. Yeah, yeah, sure. Here, Ed. Good. Ed Carr, huh? That's right. You know, we do look alike, you and me. Yeah, sure. Enough for Betty here to have told me all I need to know. Don't believe him, Eddie. He's lying. I heard, No, baby. Eddie, I, I thought he was you. Don't you see? Sure, him? sure. Why'd you come up here anyway? Because Mike told me that Dollar was coming up here. You've been shooting off your mouth to her, too? She knew about us. She thought you might have something to do with the fire. She was my friend. She was trying to get me out of this whole mess, and I wish I'd listened to her. Well, it's too late now, baby. Eddie, what are you going to do? Now i got to get rid of both of them. No! And figure some way to shut up Tony's mouth. Ed, please! You know you'd never get away with it, Carr. Oh, no, I'll call him. That's what I'll do. 
Yeah, Betty, and he'll come here to get his money. Then I'll call the police, see? Tell him to come right away. Tell him I found out about you having Tony start the fire. What? That's right, that you had him burn up the yard so there'd be even more money for you to bleed from me, like all the dough you got from me already. You're crazy, Ed. I'll tell the police to meet me here. And when they come in, it'll just be in time to see me kill Tony in self-defense. After getting here too late to save you, I'll tell them. You're out of your mind. They'll check that gun of yours so fast. And that'll prove it. Because the only shot out of my gun will be the one that gets Tony. This gun of yours is the one that's going to knock you two off. And they'll think it's Tony's. Oh, Eddie, please, you're drunk. Are you crazy? Crazy to save my own life, to keep you and Tony and Dollar from putting a noose around my neck? If you think that harebrained scheme of yours will ever work, you're it's off your It's got to work, because it's my only chance. So it's going to work now. <laughs> Thanks, Lieutenant. I'm afraid I was too late to save it, Johnny. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. But Eddie Carl lived to face a jury. What brought you here anyhow? I did, Johnny. Mike, stay there. Stay right here, Mike. I know. I don't want to see it. She was my friend. Where's Earl? I came alone. When I talked to Betty this morning, I knew your suspicions about Ed were right because, you see, I knew Betty and Ed were going together. Earl didn't know. Yeah. Maybe you better call him. Expense account item six, nine dollars eighty cents, gas and incidentals for the drive for the two of us back to Sarasota. Remarks? Betty, of course, has already paid for her part in the deal. And I guess it's pretty obvious what'll happen to Ed Carr and Tony Ricardo. The insurance money in the Carr estates will be distributed according to Florida law. Further remarks, the apparent friction between Earl and Mike was only part of a normal married life. They're a pretty nice pair. Oh, and I thoroughly enjoyed three days of fishing in the Gulf, thanks to Earl. Expense account total, including all the incidentals I could think of, 385.26. Our star will return in just a moment. You don't have to be an efficiency expert to figure out that it's easier to lend your support to several worthwhile fundraising campaigns all at once than it would be helping one campaign at a time. That kind of efficiency is yours to enjoy through the United Community Campaigns. CBS Radio hopes that when the United Community Campaigns are underway in your town, that you'll remember how much good you can accomplish with one gesture of support. Now, here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, a case with a real twist. One that I think will just about tear your heart out. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote tonight's story. Heard in our cast were Virginia Gregg, Harley Bear, Victor Perrin, Bob Bruce, Harry Bartell, Vivi Janus, Tony Barrett, and Junius Matthews. Musical supervision is by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Dan Coverly speaking.
From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Uh, my name is Hardy, Mr. Dollar. Yes? I'm returning the call you made to Mr. Ellis Rasmussen. If you will state your business, I shall be glad to transmit it to him. You tell Mr. Rasmussen I'm an insurance investigator from Hartford and the matter involves a member of his own family. Oh, uh, young Mr. Rasmussen? Yes. Uh, oh, uh, could you hold on a moment, sir? I could. Uh, Mr. Rasmussen will send a car for you at six o'clock. Look, I can take a cab. It oh, well. <laughs> Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Universal Adjustment Bureau, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Rasmussen matter. Expense account item one, $204.35. Airfare from Hartford to San Francisco to Los Angeles. Trying to compile the details of the Rasmussen case. I'd been on it three days when I was stonewalled in Los Angeles with a Holmby Hills address and the phone number of Ellis Rasmussen. At six o'clock, a liveried chauffeur in immaculate uniform stepped up to me at the desk. Mr. Dollar? Yes? My name is Stauffer, sir. I have Mr. Rasmussen's car outside. Well, gee whiz, Stauffer. <laughs> Ain't it the truth, sir? A few minutes later, when we turned into the lush green Holmby Hills section, I had a suspicion I was about to deal with a bona fide millionaire. When we parked in front of the big two-story colonial home and a man with graying hair and swallowtail coat stepped out of the door... Well, I knew I was going to meet the real article. I'm Hardy, sir. Hello, Hardy. And Mr. Rasmussen is waiting for you. Uh, this way, please. We stopped in front of a huge panel door. Hardy tapped on it once, then pulled on the knob. As we entered, a tall man with a shock of pure white hair rose from his chair and turned toward us. Uh, this is Mr. Dollar, Mr. Rasmussen. I want about four fingers of sour mash. What do you want? Oh, you took the words right out of my mouth, Mr. Rasmussen. Uh, very good, sir. He's a pretty nice fellow. We're all pretty nice fellows around here, Mr. Dollar. Sit down. Thanks. Could you hand me that lighter? Oh, sure. Here. Thank you. What are you doing in Los Angeles? Why, federal underwriters of Hartford wrote a blanket policy for all Imperial Rubber Company employees... Your son was an executive with Imperial when he was killed in Malaya last spring. Federal owes his widow $25,000. I don't know where she is, Mr. Dollar. I see. I doubt if you do. Let me put it this way. I never met the young lady. Fred married her one night in Elko, Nevada. Two days later, they were on their way to Malaya. Six months there, and the development station was raided by guerrillas one night. And... I suddenly no longer have a son. Have you eaten your dinner, Mr. Dollar? Oh, I wouldn't want to trouble you. Uh, Hardy, set a place for Mr. Dollar. Uh, very good, sir. Well? Well, I thought she might phone me when she got back to the States. She never did. Never a letter, nothing. I'm old and sick, but I still want to see the girl my son married. Not an easy thing to lose a son, Mr. Dollar. And I lost a good one. I lost the best son a man ever had. I'm sure you did, sir. To your son. To Fred. During dinner and afterward over coffee and liqueurs, I listened to the story of Ellis Rasmussen's life. It came from the lips of an old man who was dying but in whose eyes I could see reflected the memories of a brawling, bustling life that started in an Oklahoma oil field and moved to Alaska and Arabia and Africa. More and more during the talk, I began to know his lost son. For in everything the old man had to say about himself, I could sense an unmistakable reflection of his son. Finally, I thanked him and left. 
Uh, if I may say so, I do hope you'll call soon again, sir. Mr. Rasmussen enjoyed your visit very much. I haven't seen him so much like his old self since we received the terrible news of young Mr. Rasmussen's death. He must have been quite a man, Hardy, young Fred Rasmussen. Yeah, he was, sir. All of us miss him dreadfully. None of us ever met Mrs. Rasmussen, and we were most anxious to receive her, especially after young Mr. Fred's death. I imagine so. Uh, the car's all ready, Mr. Dollar. Uh, good night, sir. Good night, Hardy. Fine night, Mr. Dollar. Yeah. Stomper. Uh, yes, sir? I didn't want to press the point with Mr. Rasmussen, but... Now, maybe you can straighten me out. Did he approve of his son's marriage? Mm, let's put it this way, Mr. Dollar. Mr. Rasmussen approved of Mr. Fred. And if Mr. Fred got himself married, then Mr. Rasmussen approved of the girl. Between them two, they had that kind of understanding. Real people. Expense account item two, $1.98, telegram. To Personnel Division, Imperial Rubber Company, requesting a copy of all information they might have on Laura Olson Rasmussen. Item three, six dollars, one long-distance phone call to the Universal Agent working the case in San Francisco. Mrs. Rasmussen left the Malaya Peninsula by boat from a town called Cochetti three days after the news of her husband's death. A week later, she booked plane passage in Hong Kong with Trans-Pacific Airlines. She changed planes in Honolulu. She cleared the port authority in San Francisco. From there on, we lost her. Get a list of all the passengers who were on that plane. Okay. Get someone checking the hotels in the Bay Area. She might have checked into one when she hit Frisco. Okay. Now listen, we're looking for a woman whose husband was brutally murdered about two weeks before she got back to the States. If she's anything like I think, she was probably about at the end of a rope. Now start asking questions at places where people like that go. Right. On Wednesday morning, I rented a car. That's item four, twenty-five dollars and made the rounds. First stop, Los Angeles Board of Education. By four o'clock in the afternoon, I had found 35 Laura Olsons who had attended public school in Los Angeles and were more or less in the proper age bracket. The next day, the folder arrived from Imperial Rubber Company. Among other things, it contained a passport picture and a complete description of Laura Olson Rasmussen. She was a blonde girl with a pouting, sultry kind of mouth and wide, dark eyes. Yes? What do you want? I'm looking for Mrs. Frances Olson. Are you Mrs. Olson? I don't want to buy nothing. Do you have a daughter named Laura Olson? Are you a policeman? No, I'm an insurance investigator. I'm trying to locate Laura Olson Rasmussen. Well, how'd you get this address? What's that? A picture of her. I see. Ask my Laura what about her. I've been trying to locate her for some time. Is she here? No, no, she ain't here. She ain't been here for five years. Do you have any idea where I can find her? Friends, maybe? Other relatives? <laughs> you say her name's Rasmussen now? Yes, she married a man named Fred Rasmussen. Married? Well, ain't that just something? You didn't know your daughter had been married, Mrs. Olson? How would I know? How would I know anything about her? Saturday at noon, a registered letter arrived from the agent in San Francisco containing the list of passengers who had been on the plane with her. Three of the names were in the Los Angeles area, including a Mr. Oberlin, who lived in Pasadena. For well, sure, I remember her. Real pretty. We sat together all the way from Honolulu. <laughs> What's up? We're trying to locate her, Mr. Oberlin. Did she happen to mention her plans when she returned to the States? Plans? You know, what hotel she might be staying at in San Francisco? Or if she was going on to another city? Uh-uh. <laughs> no, 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 not her. You say that very emphatically. Yeah, I guess I do. <laughs> you didn't have to show me a picture. You know, a guy always prays he'll meet someone like her on a plane, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, live it up. Yesterday's gone, she said tomorrow ain't here, and the only thing we got is today. Yeah, we had a swell time. You're sure about this? We were pretty chummy, pal, if you want the truth of it. Mr. Roblin... Did she mention anything about being in Malaya before she boarded that plane? Uh-uh. Then she didn't tell you that her husband had been killed a week before. Killed? Oh. He was murdered by gorillas in Malaya. Well, no, she didn't mention that. She didn't mention that at all, Mr. Dollar.
Johnny Dollar. Uh, this is Hardy, Mr. Dollar. How are you, Hardy? How's Mr. Rasmussen? He's not so well, sir. That's why I called. Could you possibly find time to visit him? Tonight? Uh, may I send a car right away? Is it serious? He's dying, sir. I knew why he wanted to see me. Have you located my daughter-in-law yet? No, I haven't located her, Mr. Rasmussen. But I know something about her. I know she drank whiskey and flirted with a fat salesman on an airplane all the way from Honolulu to San Francisco. I know her mother's a drunk. I know she didn't think enough of you or your son to contact you or anybody else when she got back. Mr. Rasmussen, it looks to me like your daughter-in-law is a first-class bum. Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in just a moment. Our daily lives are sharply affected by world news. And for a complete roundup of the news every single weekday evening, just keep your dial on CBS Radio for the news broadcasts of our famous CBS newsmen, Edward R. Murrow and Lowell Thomas. Hear up-to-the-minute news with Edward R. Murrow and Lowell Thomas on CBS Radio. Now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Rasmussen Matter. There was a black coupe with M.D. on the license parked in the driveway of the Rasmussen house when we pulled up. In the bedroom, a silvery-haired man in a black suit was sitting beside the bed that held Ellis Rasmussen. He was introduced as Dr. Butler. Then I shook the hand of Mr. Rasmussen. Someone suggested that Dr. Butler might like to use the library for his calls. And I was alone with the old man. If you want some whiskey, I keep it in the sideboard over there. Uh, not now, thanks. I, uh... I wish I had some news for you, Mr. Rasmussen. We're finding out things, but we haven't found her yet. What things? Oh, things. Nothing important. Dollar, if I judge you right, you know your business. And if you haven't found my daughter-in-law by now, you've certainly found out what kind of person she is. So tell me. I haven't met her. I don't know. You're being evasive. I don't work for you, Mr. Rasmussen. I'm an insurance investigator trying to locate a woman and pay off a claim. If I don't find her, the case will just have to sit. Unless you or someone else concerned makes a report to missing persons. Then the cops can take over, and maybe they should right now. My son was a fine man. I can look back on all the years I had with him and be proud of every year and every day. He married a girl named Laura Olson. I don't know where she came from or who she was... But I know my son wouldn't have married her unless he loved her, unless she loved him in return and was worthy of his love. You know what a lot, Mr. Rasmussen. Perhaps I should go to the police. No. No, don't do that. We'll find her, Mr. Rasmussen. We're getting it narrowed down. Well, I'd better leave now. As you say. Uh, Mr. Dollar. Yes, sir. I want to see her. Yes, sir. I'm sorry I talked to you the way I did. Phone call for you, Mr. Dollar. Would you like to take it in there? Oh, yeah, sure. Keep an eye on him, Hardy. Uh, Trust me, sir. Johnny Dollar. This is Officer Daly, Los Angeles Police. Oh, yeah. You the insurance guy looking for a Laura Olson Rasmussen? Yeah, have you got anything? We got her. Huh? She's here with the rest of the girls in the drunk tank. A drunk tank will always smell of disinfectant. This one was no different. There are no bunks, no chairs, no blankets, no nothing. So you stand to sit on a concrete floor and wait for something to happen. The legal period is 24 hours. You get rebooked or you get released. It all depends. What's the story on her, Dollar? I've got a check for $25,000 for her. Gee, insurance money? Yeah. Quiet! 
Quiet in there. All right, quiet down. You girls better learn to get along. Which one? Back there, sitting on the floor. Oh, good. What's the situation? If somebody comes up with bail, they're going to have her. Expense account item seven, one hundred dollars bail. While I was waiting around, Officer Daly broke open a file on her. A dozen aliases, a dozen charges, and one conviction for shoplifting. A career of petty thievery that began at the age of 16 and ran up into a 22nd year. Expense account item A, $35 telegrams. I sent wires to all parties concerned, all parties except Ellis Rasmussen, ordering a stop on their activities since Laura Olson Rasmussen had been found. Who are you? My name's Johnny Dollar. Thanks for getting me out. Why? I did it for a friend. Friend? I didn't know I had any. Expense account item nine, 20 cents, two cups of coffee. We had it in a diner across from the women's section of the main jail. I looked at Laura Olson Rasmussen while she drank the coffee. Looked at the blonde hair and the wide eyes and the pouting mouth. Looked at the woman who had once been the wife of Fred Rasmussen. What's the catch, mister? No catch. You put up a hundred dollars for me. I don't know you from a load of coal. No, you don't. Where do you live? I've been staying at the Piedmont Hotel. You know where it is? No. No, not many people do. Especially people with clean shirts. What have you been doing since you got back from Malaya? I've been getting along. You got something to do with Fred? You know about Malaya? I know about a lot of things. I've been looking for you for a month. So what? Why didn't you contact your father-in-law when you got back? Why should I? What would he care about me? He never met me. What do I mean to him? Right now, since he no longer has a son, you mean everything to him. You're kidding me, mister. I wish I was kidding you. I wish to heaven I was kidding you. Well, what now? Oh, I want you to come over to my hotel with oh, me. Oh, now, look. Just sign it... some papers... I have a check for $25,000 for you. What was that? Your husband was insured. You're his beneficiary. All you have to do is fill out an application. I'll give you the check. I don't believe it. It's true. Come on. Expense account item 10, $2, cab fare to my hotel. I took her upstairs with me, stood over her while she filled out the necessary papers. Outside of that, we didn't say a word. Johnny Dollar. Uh, this is Stoffer, Mr. Dollar. Uh, Hardy asked me to phone you to see if there's any word. Oh, yes. Well, uh, what'll I tell him, Mr. Dollar? Tell him no luck yet, Stoffer. How is... How is the old man? About the same, sir. Counting on you, I think. I'll talk to you later. Yes, sir. Here you are. Okay. Thanks. Here's your check. Anything else? Nope. That's it. Okay. See you around sometime. Sure. Fred told me about a man named Stoffer who worked for his old man for years. Was that him on the phone just now? Yeah. Yeah. I didn't know what I was going to say to the old man, but I did know I was hoping that if Rasmussen had to die, that he'd die before anybody told him the kind of daughter-in-law I'd turned up. I didn't want to be in on that. Expense account item 11, $83, hotel bill. I checked out at 5.30, picked up my airline tickets at the desk, that's item 12, then sat around the lobby for five minutes. Item 13, two drinks for myself. Mr. Dollar? Yeah? Oh. I read in the paper that 
Ellis Rasmussen is dying. Is that true? That's true. Mind if I sit down? Suit yourself. What are you drinking? Nothing. I know why you didn't tell them you found me, and I don't blame you. Fred's dad is anything like Fred was, and I know how you felt finding me the way you did. Let's forget it, Mrs. Rasmussen, shall we? I'd like to meet Fred's father. So you want to meet him, huh? The human thing would have been to see him when you came back. But not a line, not a word. That old man in that house knows his son was really a man. And on that basis, he believes without seeing you that his son married a real woman. He had love and sympathy and help and devotion and, and all the things you don't seem to have any use for waiting for you in that house. He... Oh, never mind. I loved Fred. Loved him from the first minute I saw him. You know what I was doing when I saw him? I was serving cocktails in a place like this. He didn't ask me what kind of a family I came from. Whether I was good or bad. He just put one of those big arms around me one night and said, you're mine. He said that to me. He said it because he loved me. No one ever loved me. No one. <laughs> but he did. I told him who I was and where I came from, and all he said was, you're with me now. We, we went to Malaya together, and I never knew... In all of my life, what I knew then, how it was to be wanted by someone who was decent, kind. And then he was killed. He told me one afternoon when I was in Kachetti. I took a boat and then I took a plane back here. Go on. I want to see Fred's father. I took a car to the house and I saw what kind of a house and what kind of people his family were. I didn't go in. Couldn't you see me, cheap, rotten, dirty little me? Couldn't you see me walking in there and saying, I'm me? Couldn't you see that mother of mine moving in? What would that have done to the old man? It would have crushed out his whole memory of Fred. But don't think, Mr. Dollar, I haven't got my memory, too. I didn't drink that away. I was... I was loved by a man. And I loved him back. Still got that. I'm going out there pretty soon. Would you like to meet him? Do you think I can? I think so. I think so very much. Oh, Mr. Dollar, I've been waiting in the lobby. I thought you might be here. Uh, how'd you do, miss? Stouffer, I'd like you to meet Mrs. Rasmus. Well... My, my. I'm mighty pleased to meet you. The boss will be mighty happy. She dried her eyes in the car. I didn't say much. She didn't say much. But in the half hour it took to get out to Holmby Hill, something happened to her again. The something that must have happened when the big arm went around her shoulders the first time. Good evening. Mrs. Rasmussen, Hardy. How do you do, Mrs. Rasmussen? We're very happy to see you. Thank you, Hardy. Fred spoke of you often. That was kind of Fred. Uh, this way, please. Come in, come in. Uh, I think you can introduce Mrs. Rasmussen, Mr. Dollar. Uh, ring if you need me, sir. I'm scared. Laura, if there ever was a man for you not to be scared of, it's that man in there. Oh, God. How can I tell him about myself? I've been in jail. I can't... Watch. 
Well, Mr. Dollar, come in. I'd... I brought someone for you to meet, Mr. Rasmussen. Come here. You'd be my son's Laura. Yes, you're Laura. Hello. Yes. Oh, now, there, there, here, here. Now, look, look, us Rasmussens mustn't meet like this with tears. There's so much I have to tell you. No, there's nothing you have to tell me. What? Let me put my arm around you. There. Now, feel it. Mm Mm-hmm. You're my daughter. Do you understand that? Yes. Oh, yes. Then that's all the explanations we need between us. Yes. Uh, uh, Hardy, Hardy. Uh, yes, Mr. Rasmussen? Uh, bring, uh, bring Mrs. Rasmussen some brandy, I think. And I'll have some sour mash, Mr. Dollar. Sure. Make mine sour mash, too, Hardy. Very good, sir. <laughs> Expense account item 14, 40 bucks, miscellaneous. Item 15, 35 dollars, stenographic. Expense account total 1,965 dollars. Remarks? The old man's got a few weeks more. Laura's moving into the house with him to take care of him. She won't be telling him a lot of things about herself. She doesn't have to. You should have stood there like I did and seen that big arm go around her shoulder when he said, You're my daughter. Yeah. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Our star will return in just a moment. Folks abroad want to know more about us Americans. How we live, how we eat, what we do in our leisure time. You know something? You can help promote international goodwill by corresponding with someone abroad. For the name of a correspondent, write to Letters Abroad, 45 East 65th Street, New York. That's Letters Abroad, 45 East 65th Street, New York. Stay tuned for five minutes of CBS News to be followed over most of these same stations by the FBI in Peace and War. Now here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, one cute tiny little mouse, that's right, mouse, almost scares a big insurance company out of business. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in tonight's cast were Virginia Gregg, Gene Tatum, Eric Snowden, Roy Glenn, Will Wright, Frank Nelson, and Jack Crucian. Musical supervision is by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Dan Coverly speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Hi, Johnny. Who that? George Reed. Well, Merry Christmas, George. Is it? Well, what's the matter? You ever hear of Jediah Gillis? Uh, eccentric? Owns about half of Rhode Island? That's the boy. A couple of weeks ago, he wrote a special policy on an item he wanted insured. And it's up and disappeared, huh? How'd you know? 
Oh, just a wild guess. What did he lose? I hope you're sitting down, Johnny. Yeah? Why? Because the insured item is a mouse. House? Mouse. What? <laughs> Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Floyd's of England, American Branch Office, 443 North 15th Street, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the missing mouse matter. Expense account item one, 85 cents. Taxi from my apartment to George Reed's office. He was on his feet waiting for me. His Ivy League suit looked as though it had been slept in and he needed to shave. Close the door, Johnny. Yeah, sure. Johnny, I've got to level with you. This thing has me going. Well, it serves you right. Anybody who'd insure a mouse deserves what he gets. Yeah, but it isn't an ordinary mouse, Johnny. No. Not according to Mr. Gillis's original application. Yeah, take a look. Uh, item to be insured. One unusually talented grayish-brown mouse. Unusually talented? Like how? I don't know. What? I tried to find out, but Gillis wouldn't tell me. And still you issued the policy. Well, you know our company, Johnny. We have a reputation for insuring almost anything, but we have to draw the line occasionally, and we would have here, except for one thing. What's that? And believe me, it better be good. It is. Gillis carries all of his insurance with us. Yeah, but even so. Just one of his several policies is a straight life for 350000 Wow, Well, we. King-size premiums, huh? Exactly. So when he called asking us to insure this fellow's mouse for a few weeks... Well, wait a minute. Gillis doesn't own it? No. Well, who does? It belongs to a friend of his, a man named Glazer. He's spending the holidays with Gillis. Gillis didn't want to be responsible if something happened to Glazer's mouse while he's there, so he asked us to write the policy. How much did you insure it for? All the company would allow, 5000 Oh, now, George, you think I want to get all worked up over a lousy five grand loss? What kind of a commission can I possibly make on Look, that? give me a chance to finish, will you? All right, but only because it's Christmas. All right. Late last night, I received a call from Gillis. He wanted to know whom we considered the best investigator in this part of the country. When I told him, he told me about the mouse and insisted I send you up to help look for it. No, no, George, I'm sorry, but I'm going to pass. I've handled some screwy cases in my time, but this is... Please, wait till I finish, will you? I told Gillis you wouldn't be interested. That's when he started putting on the squeeze. Squeeze? What do you mean? He said if I didn't get you, he'd cancel his policy. Oh, come on. You don't believe that, do you? I don't know what to believe. Gillis is a screwball of the first water. We've known that for a long time, and frankly, I'd rather not take a chance. Well, you've got to. Maybe not. Hmm? I've received an okay from upstairs. On this one, you can write your own ticket. Well, why didn't you say so in the first place? You didn't give me a chance. Look, there's a train for Providence at 3.30... Here's Gillis's address. He wants you to stay with him. That'll cost more, Georgie. It figures. Merry Christmas, Johnny. Same to you, Santa Claus. <laughs> Expense account item 285 cents, cab fare, back to my apartment. I was intrigued by what George had told me and by what his company was going to add to my bank account, so I didn't really mind changing my plans for the holidays. Expense account item three eighteen dollars and ninety cents transportation, including a round trip ticket, Hartford to Providence, and cab fare out to the Gillis residence. Palace would be a better word for it. It stood in the middle of a large wooded park. It must have been half a dozen acres, all of it surrounded by an old fashioned iron fence. I dismissed the cab and had started toward the front door when it opened. And standing against the light, watching me, was a tall, beautiful girl. Careful the steps. Why? Steps, they're icy. Oh, oh, thanks. We've been expecting you, Mr. Dollar. Hi. Well, hi. Mr. Glazer and Father are in the library. Would you like to meet them now or wait till after you're settled? Oh, I'm I'm afraid I'd better see them right away, Miss Gillis. Marion, Johnny. Well, come along. You know, for the first time, I'm glad I came home for the holidays. Home from where? New York. Here we are. You'll have to come visit me, Johnny. Maybe I'll do something drastic, like losing a mouse to guarantee it. Marion! 
I told you to keep that door closed. Oh, Mr. Doll is here, Father. Oh, oh, well, have him come in. <laughs> yes, by all means, have him come in. <laughs> See you later, Johnny. Yeah. Well, Dollar, glad you finally got here. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Uh, this is my friend and associate, Bert Glazer. Hi, Mr. Glazer. Uh, Bertie and his pals, Mr. Dollar. Beg pardon? Uh, my dog act. Uh, you investigators are supposed to have good memories. I hoped you might have caught us at some time or other. No, I'm afraid not. Oh, would you like to have a drink, Mr. Dollar? Uh, no, thanks. Not supposed I to get... I got anything you want to drink. I got an eggnog, hot buttered rum. Well, uh, maybe later. Right now, I'd like to hear the details of your loss. You mean that insurance agent didn't give you all the information? He didn't know it all, Mr. Gillis. All he did know was that a so-called talented mouse so-called. has disappeared. So-called. And he hasn't disappeared either. Not at all. He's been kidnapped, that's what. Kidnapped, yes, sir, and we know who did it, too. And why? We know why, too. And it's your job to get him back, Dollar. Oh, now, wait a minute. And I... I'm not going to pay one red cent for ransom. Not one cent. Not one cent. Okay, okay. But what makes you so sure the mouse was kidnapped? Well, I... I'm afraid I can't tell you that without Bert's permission. Well, Mr. Glazer? Well, if we tell you, we must have your solemn promise you won't repeat it to anybody. Uh, until Christmas Day. Well, I... I'm not sure I can do that. If you can't, we don't open our mouths. Right. Well? Okay. Till Christmas Day. Good, good. Uh, Dollar, suppose I told you Gulliver was worth at least $50,000. Gulliver? The missing mouse. Oh. You'd be surprised if I said he was worth that much? Depends. You claim he's talented. Does that have something to do with this uh, valuation you put on him? Something. something. Oh, it has everything to do with it. Yes, sir. Well, what does Gulliver do that other mice can't? Nothing. But it's how he does it that counts. How he does what? Sings. What? Can't you hear the man, Mr. Dollar? Can't you hear him? Gulliver sings. He carries a tune. You know. With the clarity of a clarion, the fervor of a female opera star, and the tone of a tenor. If that's how we plan to bill him. I, um, <clears throat> I see, um, uh, well, uh... But he doesn't believe us. Ah. Oh, no, wait, I, I, I didn't say that. <laughs> There's no need to. We can tell by your face. Can't we, Bert? But a mouse. Mr. Dollar, it is a scientific fact that mice sing. Mice sing. Well-known magazines have published articles proving it. Unfortunately, most of them sing in a scale too high for human hearing. Ah, uh, but not Gulliver. Well, not Gulliver. Yeah, that's right. He's a basso. A basso. Uh, by mousy standards, that is. Oh, no. <laughs> no, Bert, he still doesn't believe us. Very well, Jediah, there is only one thing to do. There's only one thing to do. You follow us, Dollar. We'll erase the doubt in your mind forever. I took a good look at Bert Glazer, then reluctantly followed the two of them out of the library and down a long hall. At the moment, this thing had all the earmarks of a good old-fashioned con game. Or better still, a benefit on behalf of Bert Glazer with Jodiah Gillis and Floyds of England as the sole cash contributors. We wandered for what seemed like blocks through the old mansion and finally reached a large playroom. On top of one of the billiard tables was a small brass cage. In it were two small grayish-brown mice. Glazer opened the cage and let them out. Mr. Dollar, allow me to present Hecuba and Esmeralda. Oh, how do you do? I mean, uh, I suppose they sing too. Oh, they certainly do. But not nearly as well as Gulliver. Just don't have the instrument, you know. Instrument? The voice, the voice, Dollar, the voice, the vocal cords. Oh, oh, yeah, I I see. But, uh, now, where did you keep Gulliver? Uh, In here with the others. Bert didn't want to separate them. Uh, That's right. I originally started to make the three of them into a singing, uh, you know, trio like the Andrews sisters. But Gulliver advanced so rapidly, I decided he should be a soloist. Oh, sure. You aren't afraid of mice, Mr. Dyer? No. No, well, that's fine. Nice sensitive you are, you know. It upsets them. It upsets them. All right, now, Hecuba, move over a bit. Give Esmeralda some room. That's it. Now, up on your haunches. Up, 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 Esmeralda. There we are. <laughs> now, what would you like to hear, Mr. Dollar? Oh, anything at all. <laughs> oh, Bert, how about my favorite, Dyer? Over the way. Good, good, good. Da, 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 da. Hey, you got it, Esmeralda? Over the waves. That's it, Hecuba. All ready then? Mm. Good, that'll be fine. Ready now? One, two, three. One, two, three. 
Oh, that's it. Oh, beautiful, Esmeralda. Beautiful. Yeah, da 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 da. Well, I won't say I was convinced, but I won't say I wasn't. But I will say those mice were singing something, or giving a mighty good imitation of it. We returned to the library, and this time I sampled the eggnog liberally. <laughs> Is that all right, Dollar? Oh, fine, thanks. Well, Dollar, you know now why we believe Gulliver was kidnapped? Well, I'm not sure. To exploit him, what else? Exactly. Do you have any idea who did it? Harry McQueen, that's who. McQueen. Who's McQueen? Used to be my agent. Theatrical agent? Uh Uh-huh. He's been snooping around here lately, Johnny. We figure he's gotten wind of our mice. What do you mean by snooping around, Mr. Gillis? Oh, you know, he's been out here twice this week wanting to see me. Had to kick him out of here yesterday morning. How'd he get in? Well, my daughter answered the door. Uh, Yes, I... She didn't know McQueen from Adam. So when he asked for me, she figured he belonged in here, rehearsing the show with the rest of us. Rehearsing what show, Mr. Gillis? What show? The show for the children's hospital. (laughs) Jodiah puts one on for the sick kids every Christmas Eve. Of course. You know, Dollar, Variety Act, Santa Claus. Uh, This year, though, we got a radio hookup. Go all over the state. And Gulliver, well, he was going to headline. And that's why I sent for you, Dollar. I figured you can get him back by tomorrow afternoon if anybody can. How long was McQueen in here before you noticed him? Long enough to lift Gulliver. This was our dress rehearsal, darling. We'd asked some of the kids from around the neighborhood in to watch, so it was pretty crowded. Where were the mice during the rehearsal? Well, that's where I made my mistake. What do you mean? We were keeping them a secret till the real show. Well, where were they? In their cage, over there on the mantel. Now, we were using this part of the room for the stage, so McQueen could have just reached in and taken Gulliver without us seeing him. Now, what makes you so sure McQueen did it? We told you. Besides, who else would want him? Uh, who else? And it was right after I kicked him out of here that I discovered Gulliver was missing. What'd you do then? Well, I called off the rehearsal and started searching for him. McQueen? Big Gulliver. And I put in a telephone call to the Providence House where McQueen was staying. Did you talk to him? Nope. They said he checked out. After questioning them for a while, I finally had a nightcap with Judiah, then went to the phone in the hall and made some calls. Including one to George Reed. Well, how's it going, Johnny? It's not. That's why I'm calling. Look, they think a theatrical agent named Harry McQueen stole the mouse. He has offices in Boston and New York. I placed a person-to-person call to both offices, but with tomorrow Christmas Eve, he might not get the message. So, what do you want me to do? Find out his home number. Ask him to call me here. Okay. Anything else? Hello? Johnny? Johnny, you there? Yeah. And so is a cat. A big yellow cat. What's so unusual about that? Oh, nothing. Except he's got a grayish brown mouse between his two front paws. Act two of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, in just a moment. You can't buy happiness by the pound or the yard, but you can have it by the hour with no strings attached every Monday through Friday evening and each Saturday in the daytime when the Robert Q. Lewis Show is on the air. Join him and his fun-loving gang five nights a week and Saturdays in the daytime on most of these same stations. Now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Missing Mouse Matter. I was standing in the hall of Jediah Gillis' home looking at a big yellow cat that had a mouse between its two front paws. As far as I was concerned, a mouse is a mouse, and this one could be Gulliver. I cut short my phone conversation with George Reed, then started toward the cat. Here, kitty. Here, kitty, kitty. Nice, kitty. Pretty kitty. Mama, Here, kitty. Mama, where are you? Here, kitty, kitty. That's a good kitty. Ah, kitty, let me have the little mouse. Mama, you naughty cat. Where... Oh... This cannibal belonged to you, Marion? Yes, I promised Father I'd... What do you mean, cannibal? Take a look. Oh, no. Oh, yes. And he's very, very dead. Oh. You don't think it's Gulliver, do you? Well, Mr. Glazer will have to identify him. And if he is... Well, that's that. Oh, no. No, Johnny. What do you mean? Oh, Johnny, please. You don't have to tell him, do you? Well, sure. If it's Gulliver, this thing's cleared up. If it's not, your Rama gets a reward for being a good mouser. Oh, Johnny, please. Dad almost had a fit when I arrived here with Rama. He made me promise to keep him in my room. This the only time he's been out? Well, no. Oh. He was out for a little while yesterday while they were rehearsing. I didn't notice he was gone till after lunch. Then the corpse could be Gulliver's. 
Oh, Johnny, if it is, there's nothing we can do about it now. And if you tell my father besides making him angry, it'll break his heart. All right. I won't say anything until tomorrow night. Oh, thanks, Johnny. Good night. Good night. <laughs> Christmas Eve morning came cold, crisp, and clear. The Gillis grounds were covered with new-fallen snow, and the trees were heavy with icicles, giving the whole place the look of a winter wonderland. I dressed and went down to join Gillis and Bert Glazer at breakfast. I was on my third strawberry when the phone started to ring. Yeah, you expecting a call, darling? Hmm. Well, yeah, matter of fact, I am. Yeah, and you'd better answer it. If it's somebody at the broadcast station for me, tell them I'll be at the children's hospital at noon. They can call me there. Right. Hello? Johnny Dollar? Speaking. Look, I don't know what's going on down there or why you're going to pester me about it. Who is this? Harry McQueen. Who did you think? Well, I wasn't sure. Well, your friend Reed got me out of bed this morning, Dollar. He told me you wanted to ask me some questions about a mouse that's missing from Jediah Gillis's place. Hey, that's right. What do you know about it? Well, I've done a lot of pilfering in my time. I've taken towels from hotels from Maine to Miami and Seattle to Bridgeport. But I never had to stoop so low as to steal a mouse from any hotel, garbage dump, trap, or field. Do I make myself clear? Perfectly. Except for one thing. Yeah? This particular mouse was a performer. Was a what? He was trained, did tricks. Still doesn't interest me. Well, then why were you trying to see Mr. Gillis? To get some of my people on his Christmas show. Anything wrong with that? No. That would be a lot of publicity about it. Would have done him a lot of good. And you're sure you weren't interested in the mouse? Look, Dollar, when I went into this business 18 years ago, I swore then I'd never handle kids, belly dances, or animal acts. But you handled Bert Glazer's dog act. His what? Dog act. Bertie and his pal. Oh, somebody's feeding you a line, Dollar. That act was Bill Bertie and his pal. And the pal is a dummy. Plays as a top-notch ventriloquist. He's a master. You hear me, Dollar? Yeah, Harry. I hear you fine. I had to do some thinking, so I put on my coat and went outside for a walk around that wooded park. What I had just learned about Glazer confirmed what my instinct, my common sense, had been telling me all along. Except for one thing. The performance given by Hecuba and Esmeralda the night before. If Glazer had been doing the singing for those two mice, he was a master ventriloquist. Which was exactly what Harry McQueen said he was. I'd started back toward the house, wondering if I should get Jediah aside now and tell him or wait until after the show when something soft and cold hit me on the back of the head. Hey! <laughs> Sorry, Johnny, I couldn't oh. resist such a serious target. Anything new? Uh, well, if you mean have I found Gulliver, the singing mouse, no. Dad told me to tell you, if Gulliver does turn up before 1.15, rush him over to the hospital. Yeah, sure. But I think that's extremely unlikely. You think Rama got him, don't you? If he did, he got a very ordinary mouse. He didn't get one that sings. I'm afraid I lost you. Doesn't matter. Oh, now, I wonder what he wants. Hmm. That boy on the porch. Oh, well, if this was Hartford, I'd say he was the paper boy coming around to collect. Well, it's not Hartford, and he's not a paper boy because Dad doesn't subscribe to anything but fortune. Oh, well, then he's selling something. Well, if he is, he's not going to give us a chance to buy any. Johnny, looks looks like we scared him off. Hmm, that's funny. Hey! Hey, come back! He sure tore out of here when he saw us. I wonder what he wanted. Do you suppose he was one of the kids they invited in to see the dress rehearsal? Well, if he was, what would he be doing back here today? I don't know. Let's take a look around. We found it in the playroom, near where Gulliver's cage had been. It was a roundish metal clamp, the kind of boy wraps around his trouser leg when he's riding a bike. I was about to call the hospital and ask Judiah for a list of all the kids they'd invited to the rehearsal when the front doorbell rang. Johnny, it's that boy again. Better let me get in. Hi. 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 Uh... I was over here to see the show the other day. Oh? Yeah. You see it? No, I uh, I wasn't here then. Oh. Jeez, sure is calling. Yeah, sure is. Oh, why don't you come in and get warm? Oh, no, that's okay. No, come on, come on. Nobody's here. No? Oh, okay. Yeah, sure, come on. 
I don't want to bother nobody, you know. I was just riding by and I thought I'd stop and tell old man Gillis what a swell show they put on. You really liked it, huh? Yeah. All except for that Santa Claus. Oh? What was wrong with him? Nothing. Just that, well, who believes in all that smushy kid stuff? Hmm? Kids, I guess. How old are you, uh... Bobby. Uh, Bobby Neves. How old are you, Bobby? Almost 11. Well, being that old, I can understand why you weren't impressed with the Santa Claus. All that other stuff, too. You know, like giving presents and singing those hymns and junk like that. You gotta cut it out when you, when you start growing up. You sure do, boy. Yeah. You know, you and my mom, you, you get along just fine. Oh? Yeah. She feels about Christmas. She feels about Christmas just like you and me do. All right. Yeah. Boy, this this log fire sure makes your eyes smart, don't it? Yeah, sure does. Where do you live, Bobby? Uh, across town, Scully Avenue. Well, how'd you happen to be over here the other day? Well, I I was riding my bike when I when I saw this dog. What well, gee, he was. Anyhow, when I, when I tried to catch him, he ran from me. I followed the silly muck clear over here. Uh-huh. You ever catch him? No. I was about to when this man hollered and asked me if I wanted to see a free show. So I I came in. I see. Well, dear, you must like dogs a lot, huh? Sure. You got one? Used to have one. When my pop was with us, but we can't have no pets where we're living now. Oh, that's rough. Yeah. You know that poem? Which one? You know, about all through the house, not a creature was stirring, not, not even a mouse. Yeah? Well, that fits our place. Especially now. How do you mean? Well, I didn't think he'd miss it, you know. Man with a house as big as this one and also. Well, I saw this cute little fellow up in that cage. What? Well, I didn't really mean to take him on hold, but when he got under my sweater and was real quiet, like he liked me, well, you know what I mean. Yeah, Bobby, I know. But I got to thinking, decided to bring him back. So would you give me the old man to Mr. Gillis for me, please? No. I think you'd better do that yourself. Oh, no, no, please. He might be awful mad at me by now. No, Bobby. In fact, you're going to get a reward. Yeah? <laughs> Word of honor. Now, what do you say we go down where Mr. Gillis is putting on that Christmas show and see it? Okay? Oh, sure. Bobby. Yeah? Did you notice anything unusual about this mouse? Yeah, I sure did. What was it? He got some white on his right hind foot. <laughs> Expense account item four, one dollar and sixty cents. Cab fare from the Gillis residence to the children's hospital for Mary and Bobby and myself. Inside, we followed the sound of children laughing and reached the auditorium. Marion found a seat among the nurses and I took Bobby backstage. When Jadaya saw Gulliver, his face lit up like, well, like one of the trees he'd had delivered to the war. <laughs> Gulliver! By golly, by golly. I knew if anybody could do it, you could, Dollar. I didn't do a thing, Mr. Gillis. All the credit goes to Bobby. Oh, to Bobby Whale. I'll speak you after the show, young man. Yes, sir. <laughs> Bert, Bert, look, look. He's back. <laughs> oh, oh, Gulliver. Oh, I do declare I have never been so glad to see a person before. Yeah, you better hurry, Bert. He's scheduled to go on in just a minute. Oh, he will, he will. And I'll go check on the microphone when everything be just so. <laughs> Don't go away, Dollar. No, he won't. Bobby, why don't you sit over there where you can see the stage? Yes, sir. Uh, Bert, you think Gulliver will sing today? I think? I know he will. Oh, get ready, Gulliver. But that boy had Gulliver all day and all night, and he didn't sing once. Ah, did the boy ask him to? Lady, don't get her, man. Boys and girls. For the first time in the world, one of the wonders of the world, Gulliver, the singing mouse. King 
Mr. Dollar. Can that mouse really sing? That is what we're going to find out, Bobby. Uh, exciting, isn't it, Dollar? Sure is, Mr. Gillis. I thank you, folks. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now, for Gulliver's first number, he'd like to sing with... Uh, uh, what's that, Gulliver? <laughs> oh, I, I see. Uh-huh. Uh, he's going to sing Jingle Bells. But he wants me to get off stage so everybody will know it's really him doing it and not me. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Is he all right, Bert? Oh, fine, fine. Just feeling his out. Well, why doesn't he start? He's going to listen... Well, Dollar. Now I have seen everything. Me too. Gee. Bert Glazer had a logical answer for having lied about his old vaudeville act. He knew I wouldn't believe the mice could really sing if I'd known he was a ventriloquist. And you know, well, after all, yet sometimes. Ah. Expense account total, including camp fare, Hartford Station, and my apartment, $38.20. As for my separate and additional fee, as agreed upon before I took this matter, well, there's a boy named Bobby Neves who lives on Scully Avenue over in Providence. See that he gets it, huh? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Our star will tell you about next week's story in just a moment. Meantime... Yeah, I'll make a deal with you. Oh? Let me have the mic for a second, then you can tell them about next week's story. By all means, be my guest. All right. I just don't want to pass up a chance to do two things. First, well, Pam and Eric and Fran, Mr. and Mrs. Froelich, Helen, Will, Scotty, oh, all the rest of you nice people who've written in to tell us how much you like the program. Thanks. I really appreciate hearing from you, and believe me, I'll answer your letters just as quickly as I can. Second, well, I'm sure you know what this is, and I want you to know it comes from the heart. Merry Christmas to you. God bless you. Now, next week... Next week, the case of a prize fighter who could win only by losing, because his life depended on it. Right. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood. It is written by Charles B. Smith and produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in our cast were Mary Jane Croft, Howard McNear, Parley Bear, G. Stanley Jones, Bill James, Lawrence Dobkin, and Richard Beals. Musical supervision is by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Dan Coverly speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Paul Kendrick, Johnny. Over at Eastern Allied Casualty, remember? Oh, sure, Paul. How are you? Seen any good fights lately? Prize fights, that is? Yeah, the championship bout at the stadium over in Mulville last week. Were you there? No, I had to miss it. But it didn't miss me. Huh? The minute Georgie hit the canvas in that fourth round, it cost me 50 bucks. Johnny... 
You remember Al Coronado? Are you kidding? I've watched that boy come up from the Golden Gloves. Well, he fought in one of the preliminary bouts. I know. I lost on him, too. Twenty bucks. Come on over, will you? And I'll tell you why the company may lose 50000 on it. <laughs> Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Eastern Allied Casualty Insurance Company, 422 Spital Building, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the squared circle matter. Expense account item one, a dollar ten cents, cab from my apartment to the offices of Eastern Allied. When I got upstairs into his personal cubicle, I found Paul Kendrick pacing the floor. Sit down, Johnny. Uh, have a drink if you want one. No, no thanks. Hey, looks like you're the one who could use a drink. What are you worried about? Don't tell me you've been hitting the company till for big money to bet on the fights. Johnny, I'm worried about murder. Listen. I'm all ears. How long since you've seen Al Coronado fight? Oh, six months, a year, maybe. But before that, when he was working all the local arenas, you and I were present every time he put on the gloves. So? We knew him when he had reflexes quick enough to... Well, do you remember how he'd show off by picking a fly or mosquito out of the air, grabbing it between his fingers without even hurting it? Yeah, Sure. He was no metal giant, not by a long shot, but he had the fastest eyes and hands I ever saw in a man. Right. But something has happened to him, something very wrong, and I think I know what it is. Listen. I'm listening. A few years ago, his manager, Ricky Malone, took out a $50,000 policy on him, annuity. So what? A lot of managers take out policies on their boys. And then get them killed? Look, Al is fighting again tomorrow night in a small town outside of Joplin. Joplin? Missouri? A little place just across the state line. Johnny, I want you to be there. You mean as a sort of bodyguard? I want you to see the fight, that's all. See Al Coronado fight. Yeah, but this murder crack... I'm having a copy of the policy made, and you can pick it up at the Joplin Post Office. General delivery. Now, Paul... I know, I know. I may be all wrong. This may only be a hunch without a single legitimate reason for suspicion. That's why I took a whole week to think it over before calling him. That's why I want somebody who knows Al as well as you and I do to... Look, will you go down there and see him? Well, I... We'll pay the freight. Hand your expense account, anything you like. Oh, now that's an attractive But do it, Johnny. Will you? Item two, another dollar ten, back to my apartment to pack. Item three, one hundred twenty-four dollars even. Plain fare and incidentals to Joplin. By your leave, Paul, the incidentals included a new sports shirt, loud enough to startle the whole state of Arizona, an extra pack of razor blades, and a new toothbrush. Also, item four, three bucks, flowers for the stewardess, who managed to find me an extra bottle of champagne. I arrived at Joplin shortly before noon, and after checking into a hotel, found that by some miracle, a copy of Al's policy was waiting for me at the post office. A quick glance at it brings up item five, four dollars and a quarter, phone call. What do you mean, holding out on you? I thought you said Ricky Malone took out the policy. He did, and pays all the premiums. But the beneficiary named is Frankie Fortina. Now, who's he? I don't know yet. Well, his address is in New York City. You better look him up, will you? I've been trying to. But the last time Fortina was at the address on the policy, it was a racetrack bookie joint. Oh, so that's why you're worried. Uh, That's one reason. Well, if you learn anything about him, let me know, will you? I'm staying at the Beverly Arms. Okay, Johnny. Johnny. Yeah? Call me again, will you? After the fight tonight? Sure. I was tired, so I had a big lunch. That's item six. Went up to my room and slept. I overslept. It was nearly nine o'clock when I woke up, so I grabbed a cab. That's item seven. and went out to the arena in the nearby town of Mount Elba. For five bucks, item eight, I managed to get a seat at ringside in time to catch the end of the last preliminary. The program told me Al was scheduled for the main event against some local boy named Rafe Cummings. I never heard of him, and I doubt if anybody outside of Tucson ever had. I understood why when he stepped into the ring. This kid looked like the rankest kind of amateur. Strong, sure, and in good condition, but clumsy. He almost tripped over his own size 15 feet, and it was no act to fool an opponent either. 
Al, when he came in, looked as good as ever. He gave me a quick glance of recognition, though I'm sure he knew nothing about me except possibly my name. At the opening bell, he came out fast. All the old speed and timing were there. Faint weave and flick out that light, but punishing left. Same old pattern, same old... Wait a minute. Those quick left jazz were only landing about one and four. As though he touched Cummings only when the clumsy ox happened to walk into him. But because of his speed, Al took nothing but a few light ones on the body. He kept his face well out of reach. Oh, yeah, his timing was perfect, but his aim was terrible. Every time he shot out his fist, he was three, four inches wide. What a funny thing happened. At the end of the round, when Al went back to his corner, and remember, Rafe had only tapped him a few times on the body. When he went back to his corner and started to sit down, he almost missed the stool. Would have if one of the seconds hadn't named it under him. Funny. The second round got underway the same as the first. Al was all speed, dodging, weaving, keeping his face out of the way. But again, he wasn't hitting his mark. And then it happened. He missed Cummings wide, then practically ran into his glove, catching it hard in the cheek, and down he went. Why, there wasn't enough steam behind Cummings' glove to hurt it. But Al took the count. He'd been hurt by that tap on the face. Then another thing. The second he was counted out, his handlers practically hauled him out of the ring and back to his dressing room. And believe me, Al looked terrible. His eyes had a strange, almost faraway look. As though that little smack had knocked his brains loose. Had... My seat was on the far side of the ring, but I elbowed my way through the crowd and back to the row of dressing rooms in a hallway built on the one end of the building. Al! Al Coronado! I told you on the way up the aisle, Doc, huh? we don't need you. The boy's all right. Go on, Doc. Beat it. You hear me, Doc? Listen, this is Johnny Dollar. Huh? Old fan of Al's from Hartford. I want to see him. Some other time. No, no, right away. Come on, open up. I said some other time. Don't you understand? We're pulling out of this, Berg, and we ain't got time to stand around and talk. Now, look, buddy. Malone's the name. I'm Mel's manager, see? And when I say get out, I mean Van Moose. Al, the... are you okay, boy? This is Johnny Dollar. Oh, no, you don't. Hey, brother, that's what you're wrong. Hey, Al. Al. Good Lord, Al. What's the matter with you? Oh, uh, uh, hello, hello, Johnny. Hey, Al. Look at me. No, no, I mean straight at me. Here. Al. I'm, I'm all right, Johnny. You're in bad shape. You should never have fought tonight. Oh, that, that's all right. Where are your seconds, your trainer? Uh, Ricky, he don't, don't let nobody in after fight. Look, Al, can you get up off that table, stand up and walk? Oh, sure, sure, Johnny. Then come on, I'm taking you out of here to no, the doctor. No, Johnny. Easy, Al. No, look, look behind Al, you, Rick. Please, He's up, he's got it. You bet I am, Dollar. Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in just a moment. Each Monday through Friday evening, most of these same stations bring you the Amos and Andy Music Hall, variety entertainment at its best, for top songs, informal visits with top stars, and for a never-ending supply of fun. Turn your home into the Amos and Andy Music Hall five nights a week. Now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, and the Squared Circle Matter. <laughs> When I came to, the dressing room was dark and quiet. After carefully falling off the table where they'd left me, I groped my way to the light switch, stumbling incidentally over the remains of the chair Ricky Malone had used on me. It was well after midnight, so I left by the dressing room window. The second I reached my hotel room, I put through a long-distance call, hoping Paul Kendrick would be in home, in bed. He was. Yeah, uh, hello. Johnny Dollar. And Paul, you're right. It'll be murder unless I can stop it. Hey, you awake? Oh, hey. you mean Al Coronado? What's happened, Johnny? Plenty. And listen, that boy is more than punch drunk. He's had a brain injury of some kind. I'll bet on it. That's what I was afraid of. The tap on the face that knocked him out tonight wasn't enough to hurt a kitten. But a good solid blow would probably kill him. That's why he kept protecting his face. But Ricky Malone is making him keep on? Oh, well, I just met the gentleman, by the way. Well, what'd he say? Did you question him? Before I could, he cracked me over the head with a chair. Where is he now? Oh, I don't know. What are you going to do? See if the police can track them down. Malone said something about leaving town right away. Well, keep after him. Did you read that policy carefully? You kidding? I haven't had time. It's an annuity. That much I saw. Beginning in three or four years, it'll pay Al a nice little income for the rest of his life, if he survives. But the beneficiary named... Yes, Frankie Fortina, who gets the full face value of the policy if Al dies. Johnny. Yeah? 
I got a rundown on Fortina. You said he was a bookie at one time. That was the least of his crimes. He has a record as long as your arm. As I see it, he owns Al Coronado. Then you're probably thinking what I am. But Al hasn't been doing so well lately. He's taken a big drop in class. Isn't making the purses he used to. You know that? Yes. The ANBA keeps a complete record. So with this injury to his brain, the only way Fortina can clean up on him is by seeing him dead. That's right. Well, what about medical examinations before these fights? Ricky Malone could bribe his own mother, especially in some of the towns where Al has been fighting lately. Yeah, that's possible, of course. Also, what you and I believe is wrong with Al is one of the hardest things in the world to detect. Yeah, yeah, I must admit he looked great when he entered the ring. Okay, Paul, one thing's in our favor. Neither Al nor Ricky Malone knows who I am, outside of being a fight fan. Just so Fortina doesn't learn different. Where is Fortina, by the way? I don't know. So, Johnny, whatever you do, be careful. Expense account item 9, 370 for a couple of phone calls, some breakfast, then a taxi to police headquarters. I'll say this for the gentlemen police. When they go into action, they really get things done. Within less than two hours, Sergeant Danny Ruskin dug up all the information I wanted. Well, that ties in with what Conroy found out at the airport. No, that does it, Herm. Thanks very much. Something? And I think it gives us the whole story, Johnny. Al and his manager, Ricky Malone, checked out of their hotel, the Rayberry, at one o'clock this morning. Just the two of them? Right. There was no third party by the name of 14 or anything else. Just the two of them. Uh, they caught the 140 plane for Oklahoma City. Oh. And there they bought tickets routing them to Monterey, Mexico. Mexico? How soon can I get a plane? You're going down there, huh? I told you. I got to save that guy's life. All right. Look, in Monterey, look up Sergeant Romelia Garcia, Main Homicide Division. You mention my name, he'll give you anything you want. Good. Now, what about that plane? <laughs> deal on plane connections turned out to be bad. The best time I could make was by way of El Paso. That's item 10, $127, including incidentals. I finally pulled into Monterey shortly after 8 p.m. I parked my bag at the airport, taxied into town. Item 11, I went straight to main headquarters of the Policia. Sergeant Romilio Garcia was off duty. He had gone to the fights. Item 12, $4 American for a fast taxi ride at the Plaza del Fisticuffs, or whatever they call it. There for item 13, five bucks, I had the sergeant paged over the PA system. After two or three minutes, a short, stocky, important-looking figure in police uniform stood up to the door. Senor Johnny Dollar? Yeah, that's right, Sergeant. How are you? You Americanos. Now, what is so important I must leave the excellent fights to talk with you, huh? The possible murder of an American fighter right here in your own ring. So what is that to be excited about? Something that happens all the time. It's because the Mexican fighter is more better than the Americano fighter. So if that is all that is bothering you... Incidentally, Sergeant Danny Ruskin of the Joplin Police... Sergeant Danny! Why do you not say so at the beginning? Well, you didn't give me much of a chance. <laughs> How is it, my good friend, Sergeant Danny? Boys, it's too long I have seen here. Yeah, well, look... Excellent man, Sergeant Danny. When I have trouble with one of our Mexican nationals who escape across the border and go all the way to Missouri, Joplin, it's Sergeant Danny who... Uh, but, but you have a problem, eh? Yeah. A fighter named of Al Coronado. Coronado... Oh, but of course, tomorrow night he is fighting here, and he will lose. Why do you say that? Come, look. Here on the, what do you call, uh, a billboard, a picture of the man he is to fight. So, El Toro Negro. That sounds more like the name of a bull than a... Holy... See, si. big man, is he not? Is this picture real? 240 pounds, senor. But Al Coronado only weighs in at 181. See. Si. El Toro, big man. The Senor Dollar, he is a killer. Our best. Three men he's knocked out of the ring. But nobody hurts him, so no wonder you're worried. Sergeant, unless you and I can stop it, that won't be a fight tomorrow night. It'll be a premeditated, cold-blooded killing. Oh? How so? I showed Garcia my credentials. Then told him what I knew and what I suspected. Until we have proof of this, senor, to start what you call an international situation, you are not now in your own country, you know. Still, he agreed to cooperate. First thing, of course, was to locate Al and his manager. In this city of nearly 200,000, that could be pretty rough. But he said he'd try. He drove me by the airport to pick up my bag, then to a hotel. And there, as the bellhop unlocked the door of my room, I got a real break. The next door down the hall opened. Hey, kid, uh, how'd you like to bring me up a glass of warm milk, huh? Al! Al Coronado! Huh? 
Oh, oh, hi. Here, boy. Just put in my bags inside and leave the door open. Gracias, senor. Hey, Al. Are you alone? Oh, sure. Hey. hey. You're Johnny, ain't you? Yeah, that's right, Johnny. And I want to talk to you. I used to see you inside all the time up in Hartford, huh? You saw me in Joplin, too. Only you don't remember. Where's Ricky Malone, your manager? Oh, uh, he said he had to go meet somebody. He's always going out. Look, Al, I'm an insurance investigator. Oh? Oh, I got some insurance. Yeah. One more fight and somebody's going to collect it. Oh, uh, no, Johnny. That's my retiring money. The only one who'll retire on it is Frankie Fortina. Hey, Frankie, he's my owner. You know him? Hey. Who takes all the aspirin around here? Me. I get a lot of headaches all the time. But maybe that's why I ain't been hitting so good lately. Yeah. Here. Catch this bottle. Hey, now. Ah, uh, now look what you did. No, no, Al. You look what you did. You missed that bottle by three inches. Uh, For the same reason you haven't been hitting well. Why you have these headaches. All right, I'll give it to you straight. You've had a brain injury, Al. One good wallop on that head will kill you. And that's just what Ricky and Fortina want. Ah, uh, no. Ricky always says they keep my head protected, so you must be wrong. Am I? Well, Ricky's good to me. Why, you numbskull, he's trying to get you killed. I, uh, you, Johnny, you are wrong. You know the man you're up against tomorrow night? Well, I know his name. Well, he's the one scheduled to finish you off. Johnny, I, I don't believe that. Al, Al, listen, you gotta believe it. Now, where's the tell? Here. Uh, uh, who are you going to call? Hello, this is an emergency. Get me Sergeant Romilio Garcia at Central Police Headquarters. Uh, cops? That's right, Al. And a doctor. Uh, no, look, Ricky says to stay away from doctors. All they do All is they can they... do is stop you from ever fighting again. And that would make you worth just $50,000 less to Frankie... For... Sergeant Johnny Dollar, I found Al. Hotel room right next to mine, room 915. Bring a doctor, a brain specialist if you can, even if you have to drag him out of bed. Oh, look, we'll fight the international situation when we come to it. You get a doctor up here, you hear me? Sir? You hang up or I'll blow your head off. Well, Mr. Fortina, I believe. First, Kim Ricky. Sure, boys. He's clean. Huh? I hate to shoot an unarmed man, Dollar, but if you make one phony move... So you know who I am, huh? Ricky here may be stupid in some ways, but he had sense enough to call me from Joplin after you broke in on him there. Finding out what you're up to wasn't difficult. Finding out what you're up to wasn't very tough either, Fortina. But it's all over. Not for me, Dollar. That's where you're wrong. That phone call I made was to the police. I know. To central headquarters. That's over three miles from here. By the time your sergeant finds a doctor and gets here, you'll be dead. And I will be gone. Have you forgotten that you have a border to cross, you Fortina? You think I'm stupid? Frankie Fortina has never been here. He's never been even in Mexico. Because my tourist card reads Charles Edward Smith. And since the next plane leaves for the States in about 20 minutes... Ricky. Yeah, boss? I think Mr. Dollar had better have an accident. Fall out of the window, perhaps. Oh, now, wait a minute, what? boss. I mean, well... Listen to me, Malone. I had two reasons for coming down here. To see if you were right about Dollar and to make sure of that fight tomorrow. You've been stalling with Al. You've taken too long. The heat is on up north. I need the dough. I told you, boss, that El Toro will I do it tomorrow. Fellas, Shut up. Uh... And look, if you take care of Dollar, what about me? What? Maybe you can get back to the States, but me, with, with Dollar laying dead here, and, and if Al talks... Al won't and... talk. You won't either. Frankie. Dollar has given us a perfect setup. He came here to Al's room. You found him here. Hmm? You had a fight. Dollar ends up in the street below. But what happens to me, Haven't then? I always taken care of you in the past when you were working for me? You know what will happen if you ever try to cross it. No, no, All right, listen, all right, I... all right. I have contacts down here. I have plenty of them. I have lawyers, good ones. It's going to be self-defense, pure and simple. But what if Al talks? I told you before, Ricky, you've taken too long with hey, him. Frankie, listen. While I hold this gun, you're going to take care of Al, too. The way you should have a long, long time ago in his Frank, fights. I, I don't no, understand. no, listen to me, Frank. You listen. I You've been in this whole thing just as deep as I have. And deeper. Because you're the one who's kept Al fighting. You've paid off all those phony medicos. You set him up for this El Toro tomorrow night. 
You'll do it, Ricky. No. Then I'll use the gun on all three of you. Frankie! You're out of your mind, Fortina. Am I? It will still look like a fight between you and Ricky. Boss. I'll just happen to get hit accidentally by the gun that will be found beside your body. Boss. Hmm? Boss, I'll do it. <laughs> you bet you will. I'll do anything you say if you just help me get out of it. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. Dollar is first. And, brother, if you think it's going to be it's easy. Either the window or this gun, Dollar. So far as you're concerned, I don't care which. Go on, Ricky. Okay, Just remember, boss. your own life depends on it. You bet I... Yeah. Hey. Hey, dirty, will you? The window, Ricky. The window, I said. Remember, it's your own life, Ricky. Good. All right, Fortina. So you have got a gun. Al. <laughs> uh, yeah, Johnny, I, I, I hit him, but... What I'll be. See, Senor Dollar, with one very fine, clean left hook. Well, Fortino was watching you and the uh, unfortunate Ricky. Yeah. You got here a little late, Garcia. You see, but uh, tell me, Senor, what makes you think this Al Coronado has lost his punch? Expense account item 13, $100. Legal expense, mainly a deposition for a lawyer to take to court. Just now, Garcia got me out of having to stay in Monterey for a hearing. I will never know, but he did. As for Al Coronado, I suggest the company make some adjustment in his policy that'll permit paying his annuities immediately. And why not? The company should have investigated more thoroughly before issuing this policy anyway. And if it doesn't show a little heart, well, I'm sure it will. Item 14, 24.50. Hotel and incidentals and transportation back to Hartford. Expense account total, four ninety one twenty. Yours truly... Johnny Dollar. Now, here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, a fast trip to the West Coast to an impossible case involving an impossible man. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote tonight's story. Heard in our cast were Harry Bartell, Herb Ellis, Victor Perrin, Jack Crucian, Les Tremaine, and Lawrence Dobkin. Musical supervision is by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Stay tuned for five minutes of CBS News to be followed over most of these same stations by the FBI in Peace and War. Dan Coverly speaking. Hollywood. It's time now for <coughs> Johnny Dollar. Pat McCracken, Johnny, Universal Adjustment. Oh, hi, Pat. What's on your mind? The sleek, lovely, beautiful Ellen Deer. On the strength of that description, I'll take her. And she's loaded. Three hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars worth of jewelry. Hey, that girl needs a bodyguard. Sleep. Yeah, hey, yeah, Johnny needs a guard of some kind. Only she isn't a girl. She's a boat. I've just lost my enthusiasm. What's the matter with the old tub? That's what I want you to find out, Johnny. That last crack suddenly got me interested again. Okay, Pat, I'll be right over. (laughs) 
Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Western Maritime and Property Insurance Company, Los Angeles, California. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Ellen Deere matter. Expense account item 190 cents taxi from my apartment to the offices of Universal Adjustment Bureau in Hartford. Pat McCracken's usual smile was noticeably missing when I walked in on him. Come in, Johnny, and sit down. Thanks. Oh, and you're to build Western Maritime and property on this one instead of us. Okay, but how are you involved? We handle all their claims that are of any size. Tory, you ever hear of Randolph Berman? Mm, I know of a jeweler down in New York. That's the one. And if you know him, Johnny, you've been putting too much gravy in your expense account. I said no of him. Hmm. Didn't he bring in the uh, star of Cape Town and the Kamandu Emerald? That's right. Everybody seems to think he's a crook, and yet somehow he manages to handle some of the finest jewels in the world. I got an honest man afford it. Uh, this time it's the Betten House collection. It's out of Hungary. Oh, yeah, I read about that. Only I, I thought somebody down in Mexico owned it. Yeah, a fellow named Rigo Mariani, down in Guadalajara. He's the one who sold it to Randolph Berman. Okay, now. Is this Ellen Deere you mentioned, Berman's wife? Uh, no, no, no. Former, former wife. He's on about his fifth. All beautiful dumb dolls. But more important, it's the name of his 72-foot motor cruiser. Mm -hmm. And the Burmans have been traveling around in it, down the coast, through the canal, along the coast of Central America, and so on. Anyhow, when he got word that the Bettenhaus collection could be had, he wasted no time in getting to Guadalajara. And that's where Western Maritime and Property comes in. Right. They had already written a policy on the boat for 52000 Their main office in Los Angeles was close at hand, so he had them write the policy on the jewels. Is that where Berman is now in Los Angeles? Oh, no, no. He's still in Mexico. Didn't want to move with those priceless rocks until he was certain of the insurance. And before Weston would write it, of course, they wanted the collection of prey. Naturally. But who in Mexico? Uh, Jacques Jean-Pierre, the famous gemologist, was right there in Guadalajara, you know, to look over the collection himself. Ah. So he made the appraisal. The policy has been issued. 325000 I still don't see anything wrong with the whole deal, Pat. Well, there isn't anything wrong with it yet. But in spite of Berman's standing in the profession, he... His reputation, it isn't everything it might be. Yeah, come to think of it, wasn't there a killing or two involved in this acquisition of the Star of Cape Town? There have been several things like that. He's been involved in attempts to smuggle in some valuable pieces. He's... Oh, well. He always managed somehow to come out smelling like a rose. Legally, perfectly clean, you understand? But you still don't trust him. Oh, no, no. And with his planning to carry that load of stuff around in his yacht. Yeah, see what you mean. If anything happened to those rocks or the boat, over 300 grand right out the window. Exactly. Now, belatedly, Western is worried about it. And they'll pay good money to have you assuage their worries. You have a Mexican tourist card? Sure, from my last fishing trip down there. And I think you better go down and guard that collection until Berman gets it safely up into the States. He's considered quite the host. He'll probably be perfectly willing to have you aboard. Now, this is the kind of assignment I like, yachting in the Blue Pacific. But surely he hasn't got his boat parked in Guadalajara. That's over 100 miles inland. Oh, no, it's at Mazatlan. And from what I've been able to learn, it's surrounded by armed guards day and night. Well, he has some engine work done. But as soon as that's finished, he'll head north to the States. So he says. Got a branch office in Los Angeles. He'll probably deliver the collection there. I just want to be sure he gets there, Johnny. Hmm? Okay, Pat. You can wire the boys at Weston that I'm on my way. <laughs> Item 2, 40, plane fare and incidentals, Hartford to Mazatlan via Los Angeles. The first leg of the flight to L.A. was uneventful. Except for a good-looking young blonde from Santa Barbara, whom I promised to look up as soon as this case is... Well, that's not for the expense account. <clears throat> when we arrived at the Los Angeles International Airport, I learned that I'd have a three-quarter hour wait for my plane to Mazatlan. So I grabbed a magazine, that's item three, 35 cents, when I heard my name being called on the it's PA system. Johnny, 
dollar report to Pan American Airways death. With the thought in mind that perhaps my little friend from the Thank plane you. might have Johnny decided to stay dollar. over in L.A. Report Her name was Rita, by the way. Airways I lost death. no time in getting over to the Pan Am desk. Uh, Mr. Dollar? Yeah? Uh, Johnny Dollar? That's right. I'm Arthur Arthur, Western Maritime and Property Insurance Company. Oh, yeah. How do, Mr. Arthur? Planning to go on down to Mazatlan with me? Uh, no, no. Uh, meet Monsieur Jacques Jean-Pierre. Monsieur Dallaire, I am honored. How are you, Mr. Jean-Pierre? Uh, this is the gentleman who appraised the Batten House collection for us. Oh, yes, I, yes. I so have an expert. So issue the policy on it to Mr. Berman. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, he's done this sort of thing for us many times. Oh, I do not have I'm any... afraid that he's brought us rather bad news. Something's already happened to the collection? Well, not exactly. Not for the whole collection. No, I no, mean. not the, the well, whole collection. Uh, uh, please. Uh, that is, I'm not quite sure. What I mean is... Yeah, just what do you mean, Mr. Arthur? Uh, perhaps I should explain to Monsieur Dollar, eh? Well, I think somebody better. Yes, you go ahead, Jean. Yeah, very well. Yeah. And while you're doing it, I'll cancel the rest of Mr. Dollar's reservation to Mozartland. Yes, I'll do that. Oh, clearly... Oh, no, wait a minute. First, let me find out what this is all about. Ah, oui, oui, oui. Oh, very well. Jacques here was in Guadalajara when the Betten House collection became available for purchase. Uh Uh, Yes, Monsieur Dallaire. I had gone there in the hope that some of the pieces might be purchased separately. So? Alas, such was not the case. The Mariani firm decided to dispose of the collection only as a whole. I see. Well, what's this bad news you have? Ah, I am getting to that. Yes, you see, it's this way. Please, please. Ah, Please, please. Well, then then go ahead, Jacques. Thank you, thank you. Uh, uh, Monsieur Dollar, interested as I was, I looked over the collection very carefully, each individual piece. Oh, yeah, oh, and you knows. must believe me, to an expert like myself, every facet of every gem has a character all its own. A precious stone is like a face to me, always to be remembered. Yeah. Well, go on, please. I simply wish to make it clear to you, monsieur, that every item in the Bettenhaus collection is completely familiar to me. Oh, it is? As are many other important gems throughout the world. You know, each is like a friend. And each stone in them is like a face. Ah, precisely. Always to be remembered. Yes, yes. Hello. Yes. Well, uh... The, the, the collection is purchased by Monsieur Randolph Berman. Uh, yes, uh, yes, Mr. Please, please. Uh, uh, he wishes to insure it in Monsieur Arthur's company. Yeah, I know all that. Well, Monsieur Arthur requests by telephone that I appraise it. 325000 Ah, then you know. I know. So, I stay at Guadalajara a few days to wait Monsieur Arthur's check for my service. Yes. You want to be sure uh, the check please, right? please. I visit some of my old friends among the jewel setters. And then... Then, on the third day, what do you think happens? You tell me. Johnny, this is it. In the shop... No, no, please, yeah. monsieur. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, in the shop of my friend Garcia, Hernandez, I watch him work on the mound for a beautiful diamond. And suddenly, I see that the stone is an old friend. One from the Patton House collection? Ah, oui. The caliber diamond that was supposedly in the possession of Monsieur Beaumont. You're sure of the identity of that stone, Mr. Jean-Pierre? Oh, please. As I told you, monsieur, a precious stone to yeah, me... Yeah, yeah, it's like a face to you. So what you figure, Arthur, is that you've insured a boatload of $300,000 worth of gems on the way to the USA, and maybe they're not on board. Exactly. Unless, of course... Mr. That... Jean-Pierre, did you tell Mr. Berman about this one stone? Oh, I went immediately to Mazatlan, where I knew he had his boat, the LND. Well, what did he say? Uh, alas, he had sealed away. Did you learn his destination? Oh, he, yes. Uh, uh, Los Angeles, Johnny, right here. He has a branch office. Well, has he had time to get here yet? I don't think so. Have you tried radioing to his yacht? No, no, I've done nothing. You see, I didn't learn about this until Mr. Jean-Pierre arrived just a few hours ago. Yes, I came up on the aeroplane. The better to arrive and speak with Monsieur Arthur before Monsieur Berman would arrive. Do you know where Berman plans to dock his boat? Well, I... I, 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 Probably the, the port in San Pedro, if he is coming here. But who can be sure? Usually on vacation trips, he docks down the coast of Balboa, the yacht club. Or, who knows, he might even... Yeah... He might have no intention of coming up to the States at all. He might not even have the jewels with him. He... Arthur, do you know where his branch office is? Oh, yes, uh, it's in Los Angeles. Well, actually, it's in Beverly Hills. Got a car? Uh, Yeah. Then let's go. Though he couldn't quite put his finger on it, Arthur was convinced that Randolph Berman was up to something and that his insurance company was going to have to take the rap. On the way into Berman's Beverly Hills office, we dropped Jean-Pierre at the Beverly Hilton and told him to sit tight in case we needed him again. Berman's office was in a nice modern building on South Beverly Drive, tastefully furnished with pictures of various famous jewels on the walls, but with nothing of particular value in evidence. However, I did notice that one wall held a built-in vault big enough for a reasonably sized bank. 
We were approached by a hand-rubbing, obsequious little character dressed in striped pants and cutaway coat and wearing thick glasses. Good morning, gentlemen. Is there any way I may be of service to you? Yeah, I think there is. Are you oh, the... Oh, Mr. Arthur, forgive me. I didn't recognize you for a moment. Mr. Carello, this is Mr. Johnny Dollar. Hi. How do you do? Is there something I may show you, Mr. Dollar? Some little uh, bauble, perhaps, for a charming lady? Well, not at the moment, Mr. Carello. Oh. oh, Mr. Arthur, there's no reason to mail this to you. Uh, let me see now. Oh, yes, here it is. Uh, here is a request for slight revision of the policy on the Benton House collection. Oh? What's this? Oh, the wire was sent by Mr. Berman just before he embarked for Mazatland. I was going to put it into letter form to be more What's proper. It say? But, well, uh, now here, I'll, I'll read this. Please request Arthur revise Benton House policy. Exclude Calabar Diamond. Value 4000 which I have sold private party in Guadalajara. Oh, well, we kind of guessed wrong, didn't we, Johnny? Hmm. Mr. Carello. Yes. Has Mr. Berman wired you whether he's coming here? Oh, of course he is, with that collection. When? When is he going to arrive? Well, his lovely yacht, the India, should reach San Pedro Harbor late tonight. But that's what he wired me, and I intend to meet him there. Then I'm sure you won't mind if I go with you. Oh? Uh, Mr. Dollar is a special investigator. Investigators? Well, actually, I'm here just to help Mr. Berman protect that collection. Oh, excellent. Then you can arrange for the police escort. Yes, and alert the harbor police to guard the Allen Deer, as Mr. Berman requested. Did he request that? Oh, indeed. But apparently he hasn't been worried about anything happening to the collection while he's at sea. At sea? Oh. Well, surely you don't mean pirates or anything like that in this modern day and age. <laughs> you know something? At this point, I'm not quite sure what I mean, or even why I'm here. Uh, well, of course. Um, well, well, of course, what, Arthur? Oh, excuse me while I answer that. Well, I mean... Berman uh, Jewel. Uh, that is... Uh, what? Uh, well, at least I'll feel better when the stuff is here in the vault. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Oh, no. Carello at the phone paled visibly, then gasped and clutched the back of a chair for support as he listened on the phone. His jaw dropped, his eyes widened, and he shook his head once or twice in horrified disbelief. Finally, slowly, he hung up and came unsteadily toward us. Mr. Corello. Yeah, what is it, Mr. Corello? The... The Coast Guard. Yes? They said the Ellen de Villas. Yes? Sunk. What? In 600 feet of water. In the outer channel. <laughs> Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in just a moment. Democracy. What has it to do with money, the medium of exchange of mankind? A couple of thousand years ago, it was said that money alone sets the world in motion. That's one way of saying that money and economy are virtually one and the same thing. The economy of a nation depends on its commerce. Commerce depends on manufacturing and services. It has been proven that those nations which practice democracy have the greatest economics. That means money, more money for more people, and a greater freedom of opportunity to earn a higher standard of living. That's why democracy provides mankind with its richest legacy of freedom. Now, Act Two of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar and the Ellen Deer Matter. <laughs> Expense account item four, seven dollars even for a fast taxi ride to Coast Guard headquarters in San Pedro, which is really the port of Los Angeles. By dint of elbowing my way in, I got directly to Captain Barney Thorson. I'm afraid that you've got only half the story, Mr. Dollar. All I know, Captain, is that the Ellen Deer went down in some 600 feet of water in the outer channel. Total loss. That's correct. However, what you don't know is that the passengers, Mr. and Mrs. Berman, and the crew were picked up and brought in here. Oh, Outside of a little soaking and a little scare, they were perfectly all right. You see, the Ellen Deer had apparently had some engine trouble before she left Mazatlan. Yes, so I understand. Mexican authorities, with whom we fully cooperate, notified us we'd better keep an eye out for her. So when she reached the channel, we weren't surprised to get a radio call from her asking us to stand by that Universal Joint was kicking up. Is that what happened? By the time one of our cutters got within hailing distance, she was on the way down. That propeller shaft had whipped loose, torn through the hull, and the Ellen Deer was sinking fast. Ask me, that boat was overpowered, Dollar. 
How do you mean? Well, it must have been because sheer torque tore the whole engine loose from its mountings. And it plowed through the bottom along with everything else on board that was heavy. It was a big safe, for instance, anchored to midships. There was a what? A safe. A safe, you know, a small, heavy steel vault. Yeah, I know. That went down, too? Yeah, uh-huh, with the engine. It was all our boys could do to keep the owner from diving over after it. It was crying like a baby. You'd think he'd had the crown jewels in it. <sighs> Maybe you're not too wrong at that. What? Not the crown jewels, perhaps, but a collection worth something over 300 grand. Now, what about salvage? Salvage operations in 600 feet of water in that channel? Oh, yeah. No, no, Dollar. Salvage, even if it were possible, it would cost a couple of times the worth of that stuff, at least. The only passengers were the Burmans, huh? That's right. Crew three. And they weren't able to save anything? Nothing. Not of any consequence, that is. One of the crew didn't even have his shoes and his shirt on. What about Berman and his wife? funny what people will do in an emergency sometimes. What do you mean? Well, you've heard about the man whose house catches fire, he gets panicky, throws all the china and the glassware out the window, and carries out the mattress. What are you getting at, Captain? The only thing that Berman saved in his excitement was two beat-up old hats and a fishing rod. Oh, yeah, I see what you mean. And all his wife brought along was a handful of nylon stockings. She was hanging on to them for dear life. Oh, yeah, a big hat box with an evening dress half hanging out of it. And that's all? That's all. Hey, you know, that Mrs. Berman's quite a dish. Not too bright, but a real looker. Where are they now, Captain? They're headed for Beverly Hills. Beverly Wilshire was the hotel, I think. In any event, Dollar, I'm afraid your company is going to have a big, fat claim to pay. On the yacht, yes. What's that mean? What do you think? <laughs> Item 5, 320, long distance call to the police in Mazatlan. I wanted to be sure that the Benton House collection had been on board the Ellen Deer when she left port down there. Inspector Romulo assured me it had, that he'd checked the safe on the boat himself before allowing it to sail. Furthermore, he had insisted his own maritime service keep tabs on it up to the point where it made contact with the U.S. Coast Guard. In other words, the loot couldn't very well have been passed to someone else at sea. Item 6, 580 cab fare to Beverly Hills, where I dropped in at Berman's office. No, Mr. Dollar, he and Mrs. Berman are at the Beverly Wilshire. I'm sure you understand it's been necessary for them to buy a lot of clothes and things. Yeah, but he will come here. Oh, yes, yes, indeed. Uh, From his last phone call, I'd say he'll be here within the hour. All right, then I'll come back. Please ask him to stick around and wait for me if he doesn't mind. Of course, Mr. Dollar, I shall be glad to. Oh, incidentally, he has had me phone Mr. Arthur and ask that claim forms for both the Bettenhaus collection and the loss of the cruiser be brought here to the office just as quickly as possible. Yeah, I'd figured as much. Berman wasn't wasting any time. Oh, I know there still wasn't any concrete evidence that Berman was trying to pull a fast one. Ostensibly, the only reason for my trip out here was to watch over that fabulous jewel collection. A lot of good I'd been. He'd lost the collection and his boat, and the company would have to pay. Then a wild idea hit me. I suddenly remembered something that had happened months ago. Last July, to be exact, when a big passenger liner... The Andrea Doria had sunk off the Atlantic coast. According to the papers, when the survivors were brought into the port, the usual customs inspection was waived. And it occurred to me at the time that every one of those people could have easily smuggled in anything he could carry or conceal in his clothing. I'm not saying it did happen. I'm sure it didn't. But it could have. And if such an idea occurred to me, why not to a man like Berman, who was already pretty well known for his tricks to evade customs? Item 6, 20 cents. Phone call to the Coast Guard and Captain Thorson. Thorson speaking. Johnny Dollar, Captain. Answer me just one question, will you? Sure. What? When you brought them in, were the Bermans required to pass through customs? Well, no, of course not. There'd hardly be any reason to... Thank you very much. (laughs) Item 7, 10 cents. Another call. This time to Arthur Arthur at Western Maritime and Property Insurance. You caught me in the nick of time, Johnny. I was just walking out the door. On your way to Berman's office? Why, yes. With a handful of claims forms? Yes. Now, listen. Get there as fast as you can. Get there ahead of him. What? So that you can see if he brings anything into the office, like the Betton House collection. What? Though I doubt if he'd be that foolish. Foolish or not, how could he, Johnny? That collection, unfortunately, is at the bottom of the ocean. Listen to me. Keep him there. Maybe on the pretext of having to wait for me. Any reason you can think of. I'm afraid I don't understand. Just hold him until I get there, understand? Very well, Johnny. But what are you going to do? Arthur, I may have to break in and rob a hotel room. 
I went out and stationed myself across the street from the Beverly Wilshire. Five minutes later, I saw Randolph Berman walk out the front door and head east on Wilshire Boulevard in the direction of his office on Beverly Drive. I waited a few minutes to make sure he didn't turn back, then entered the hotel. At the desk, I learned the number of Berman's suite on the ninth floor. Break in? It would have taken a battering ram. So I tried knocking. You forget your key and... No. Get out of here, buddy. Randy said not to let anybody in. He's out buying us clothes. Oh, he'd tell you to let me in, baby. Hey, who are you? Fernandez sent me up here from Guadalajara. Oh, then come in. Oh, you are in. Yeah. Well, have a drink then. No, thanks. A girl's entitled to a couple of drinks after that dousing in the ocean, and you might as well... What about Hernandez? Your husband sold him the wrong stone from that collection. Sold? Oh, he gave it to him. Oh, then you know about it. Oh, sure. So he could make a legit-looking change in the insurance and convince everybody he was on the up and... You sure you're from Hernandez? You kidding? How else would I know about the whole deal? I don't know. Hey, Randy said not to let anybody in here or he'd kill me. Dumb blonde, he called me. You? A smart, beautiful girl like you? Oh, hey, you're okay. My name's Vi. Come on, let's have a drink. No, no, thanks. Uh, listen, Vi, I've got to get the right stone from that collection, the caliber diamond. Then I'll leave this one I've got in my pocket here. Which one you got? Let me see it. Oh, no, no, only Mr. Berman. And only when he gives me the calabar. Well, which one you got there, huh? Well, never mind. I'll show it to Mr. Burns. I just want to see it. Not until I get the calabar from the collection. So, if he isn't here, if he's taking it to the office, <laughs> I'll just... You think he's crazy? Let everybody know he... Let me see the one you have, huh? Now look, I just told you. Anyway, how do I know where I can trust you? I didn't even see you in Guadalajara. Oh, now you sound like Randy. Dumb blonde, he says. Keep the door locked. But I let the bellboy in with the drinks, and I let you in, didn't I? Now, let me see the one you got. Will you, if I get you the other one? From the hat box that didn't have to go through customs? How did you know? Hey, you're cutie. I bet you read about the Andrew Dorsey, just like Randy did. Come on, now let's take Where a is look. the hat box, boy? Now, wait a minute. Maybe I am dumb. Who did you say you are? Where's the hat box? No. No, I won't tell you. You get out of here. Now, without the collection, boy. No, you can't. He... Randy would kill me. He'd kill me if he even knew I let you in here. Who are you? Johnny Dollar, insurance investigator. Oh, please, Johnny, get out of here. The stuff in the bedroom? You can't go in there. I mean it. He'd kill me. Sorry, but that's your worry. Oh, no. Stop it or I'll set your eyes out. Hey, no, you can't. Pulling those claws, baby. No, you... Well, I hate to do this, but... No, no, help! Help! Oh, yeah, that's right, that's right. Get the manager up here. Get the police up here. Police? Oh, no. Oh, yes. Then you'd really be in trouble. You'd be better off if Berman tried to kill you. Now, where's the stuff? It's in the closet, on the floor, in the hat box. Thanks. Well, well. Just a handful of weather fortune. Well. Oh, now, wait a minute, girl. Put down that bottle. I, I, I gotta stop you. He'd kill me, don't you understand? Just for letting you in here. You don't know him. Look, baby, you're in this thing deep enough as it is. Don't try to make it any worse for yourself. But when he finds out that I... Listen. He's come back. And I open up. Get my hands full. What'll I do? Where'll I go? Right here. Behind this closet door. Quick. Ah! Johnny, Just I... stay there. Hang on to that bottle and think over what I told you about getting in deeper. Hi, where'd you get these drinks? You got somebody in here. Bellboy? Why, you half-witted bird brain, I told you. 
Who are you? The name is Dollar, Mr. Berman. Insurance, Dick? I just dropped by to pick up the Benton House collection. Put it down, Dollar. I'm a good shot with this thing. Yeah. And it wouldn't be the first time you killed over a handful of jewelry, would it? That's right. Won't be the last. But you'll never know about it. Now, where's Vi? How should I know? She let you in here? I murdered that dizzy blonde. That dizzy blonde is a lot smarter than you think. Where is she? What do you mean? By helping me, she has a chance of getting out of this mess you've involved her in. Of getting out clean. That dirty two-time and... Dollar, I'm going to kill you. You'd even like to involve her in that, too, wouldn't you? Thanks for the idea. I'll make it look like she killed you. Oh, no, you... (laughs) Nice work with that bottle, Vi. Oh, he missed you. Please, you won't let him... No, no, don't worry, baby. He won't bother anybody. Not for a long, long time. Item 8, $245 even. Incidentals during a couple of days of relaxation under the California sun and transportation back to Hartford. Expense account total, $453.95. Remarks? By way of getting off as easily as possible, Vi sang like a canary. And incidentally, cleared up a couple of other of his shady deals. Result? By the time his prison term runs out, he'll be too long dead to collect the insurance on his yacht. And a remark, send a report. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week... The DeSalle matter, and I promise you a double barrel thrill in it. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote tonight's story. Heard in our cast were Virginia Gregg, Lawrence Dobkin, Howard McNear, Jay Novello, Jack Edwards, Barney Phillips, and Raymond Burr. Musical supervision is by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Dan Coverly speaking. Johnny Dollar has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. Hollywood. It's time now for... Johnny Deller. Paul Brennan, Inter-Allied Insurance Company, Johnny. Oh, hi, Paul. How's the world doing by you? Oh, I got troubles. Oh? Like what? Like Albert W. Winkler. Winkler? Who's he? Maybe you mean who was he? Well, which is it? Well, that's the trouble, Johnny. We don't know. Huh? Well, he's disappeared, and with him a hunk of emerald worth exactly 100,000 clams. Wow. Well... Sure. Bob Bailey, 
in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Inter-Allied Insurance Company, Dawson Building, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Blooming Blossom matter. Expense account item one, a dollar even. Taxi from my apartment to the offices of Inter-Allied, where Paul Brennan wasted no time in getting to the point. Albert Winkler was a partner in a small jewelry firm down in New York. Real exclusive type place. Lord and Winkler? Yeah, that's the outfit. Well, a few days ago, they got hold of an emerald. It's called the Green Eye of Calcutta. And Johnny, the darn thing's big enough to choke a horse. Okay, Paul, okay. I don't think you need to go any further. No, wait. They planned to put it on an exhibition at the big international jewelry show in Chicago next month, and Winkler took it home to work on it. Oof. Insured for 100000 you said. Yeah, and Winkler's insured for ten. Okay, so who killed him and stole the rock? Listen, will you? Go ahead. Well, Sunday morning, his partner Blewett tried to phone him at his apartment. No answer. So Blewett sauntered down to the office thinking he might be there. But no sign of him? Right. Nor of the green eye of Calcutta. Only a note Winkler had left the night before saying he was taking the stone home to work on it. Well, that makes it look as though maybe Winkler... Listen, about that time, the phone rang there in the office. It was the police department, also looking for Winkler. Oh. Yeah, they'd been called by Winkler's landlord after a chambermaid had found his apartment completely ransacked and the old boy missing. Uh Uh-oh. Who's working on it? For the NYPD, I mean. Uh, Sergeant Randy Singer, 18th Precinct, Homicide. Old friend of yours, I believe. Yeah, good man. Has he come up with anything? Nothing. Well, Johnny? Sure, Paul. Now? Now. Item two, another dollar for a taxi back to my apartment where I slicked the stubble off my face, showered, dressed, and was about to head for New York when the phone rang. Johnny Dollar. Johnny Dollar? That's right. Well, who's that? Oh, yes, of course, Mr. Dollar. Huh? I must talk with you, sir. It's important, very important. Well, who are you? Me? <laughs> well, this is Wilbert Kenworthy Blossom. Yes, and I must see you right away. Well, what's this all about, Mr. Uh, Blossom, did you say? Oh, why, that's right. How did you know that? Oh, for... Is this some kind of a gag? It certainly is not. And to think that now I'll be working with you on a... Oh, it's wonderful, just wonderful. What are you talking about? Why, you. Don't you see? I follow every single one of your cases, sir. Either in the newspapers or on the radio. Oh, I'm your biggest fan. Is, uh, is that all you call to say, Mr. Blossom? It is not. I'm calling about the mysterious disappearance of Mr. Albert Winkler. Winkler? You know something about him? His whereabouts? I certainly do. Where are you, Mr. Blossom? Uh, here at my house in New York. And I'll be waiting for you, sir. Goodbye. No, wait. Give me your address. Oh, how could you know where to come if I hadn't given you that? Yeah. <laughs> that was silly of me. We have good goodbye. The address, man, the address. Oh, oh of course. Yeah. It's 825 East 73rd Street. Item three, $9.20, transportation and incidentals to New York City and 825 East 73rd Street. It turned out to be one of New York's famous old brownstone houses well-preserved and reeking of an era long past, when the city's wealthy and elite had built row on row of these monuments to a now-forgotten financial aristocracy. Oh, come in, Mr. Dyer. Come in. I'm Wilbert Kenworthy Blossom, and I cannot tell you how thrilled I am to be working with you on this. I don't know how to describe it, but I'll try. The inside of Blossom's home was unbelievable. Ornate pre-Victorian furnishings, heavy velvet draperies, huge lamps and chandeliers, gilt frame mirrors, even an ancient horsehair sofa. It was also filled with dusty piles of newspapers and magazines, hundreds of old books. Travel books, Mr. Dollar, and mysteries. Oh, I just love mysteries. One corner of the high ceiling living room was piled with old trunks and handbags, an old carpet bag even. Boxes of tools and utensils were stacked about. An ancient Victrola, beat-up sewing machine. You just never know when you might want to sew something, do you? Old guns and pistols, some of them museum pieces. A stringless tennis racket. A pair of rusty handcuffs locked to the base of a floor lamp without a shade. 
A broken bicycle pump. That's just in case I ever find a bicycle to go with it, you understand. Uh, yes. Against one wall stood an old metal cabinet loaded with rusty surgical instruments and a worn-out catcher's mitt. Yet, directly opposite was a corner shelf full of priceless porcelain figurines and rare pieces of china. Some of the old clocks and jewelry on the mantelpiece were collector's items. Fine original oil paintings lay among piles of old shoes. All in all, it looked as though the contents of half a dozen pawn shops had been dumped into it. At auction sales, Mr. Dollar. Oh, yes, sir. I just cannot resist an auction sale or a bargain. But what are you going to do with all this stuff? Oh, just keep it. I like it. I like a lot of things. Yeah, so I see. Including 12 gross of Spencer's superlative steel tip shoelaces patented 1841. They were a bargain, Mr. Dollar. Just like all this fine artwork is, too. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> Some of my friends pamper me a bit, though. You know, send me things they pick up at sale. Yeah, now look, Mr. Blossom, you told me you know something about Albert W. Winkler. Oh, yes. Yes, indeed. Well? And think of that magnificent emerald. Gone. Disappeared. Yeah, but now you said... And that poor Interallied Insurance Company. Oh, my. That's how I knew you would be called on this case. But a hundred thousand dollars... And ten thousand dollars on Mr. Winkler. Well, at least they're off the hook on him until he's proved dead. Aha. And that's where I come in. With proof. Proof? What proof? Have you seen Winkler? Mr. Dollar... I have. Well, where is he? You understand, of course, that I know Mr. Winkler very well because I've seen him at his office so many times. Yeah, okay, go on. Oh, go on. yes, indeed. Such beautiful, beautiful jewelry he had there. And, of course, he was always trying to buy some of the things I But had. you say you've seen him. Where? Well, Saturday I'd planned with a couple of old friends to attend a railroad auction. Uh, that was the Canyon City and Metropolitan Railroad. Winkler was there at the auction sale? Oh, well, yes. Did you speak to him? Oh, no. Well, why not? You said you knew him. Well, I didn't go to the auction. I wasn't feeling very well that day. I had a little... <coughs> a little cough. <coughs> it was kind of like that. Then how do you know he was there? My friends went. And at least they talked about going. Mr. Blossom. And I'm sure you... they did, too, because they sent me something from... And what do you suppose it was? I don't know. I don't care. Now, look here. You got it me It to... was the very thing that has solved this whole case for you. What? And think of it. This dull, drab, dreary life of mine has suddenly become... Why, it's almost like a mystery story, isn't it? Adventure and... Look, Mr. Blossom, would you... Think of it. I'm being a detective. I'm working with my idol, the famous Johnny Dollar. Oh, George. Mr. Blossom, what did they send you? What's that? Oh, oh, yes, of course. Mr. Uh, Here. Here it is, sir. It's right here between the erector set and the golf clubs. This old trunk? That's right. Oh, great Scott, you think you do. But at first, of course, I, I thought of calling the police. But knowing all about you... Mr. Blossom, let me see that. Excuse me. There are a lot of crumpled newspapers on top. Yeah, I see. As old as the trunk. Good Lord. It, uh, It isn't pretty, is it? Sergeant Randy Singer, homicide. Randy, Johnny Dollar, get somebody over to 825 East 73rd Street right away, will you? Body of Albert Winkler. Randy got there in a matter of minutes. Got the same story from Blossom that I had, then called for the lab crew to come and take over. Now, now, who delivered this trunk, Mr. Blossom? But it was just, uh, just a delivery man. Can you describe him? Would you know him if you saw him? Yeah, well, he was big and strong. He was very strong. Distinguishing features. Scars or a limp or a beard or well, something? Well, I told you, Johnny, he was big and strong. How old? Well, I would say he was somewhere between 25 and, um... Yeah? 50. Uh, yes, I'm sure. Well, that's a lot of help. Yeah, you better have those thick spectacles changed. But he was big. Yes, we know, and strong. What about his truck? Oh, I didn't see that. He left it outside. No. Now, look. These friends of yours who did attend the auction, who were they? Oh, oh yes. Now the investigation proceeds. Now the excitement... Who were they, Mr. Blossom? Uh, oh. Well, there's uh, Randolph Harrison and Chris... Randy Singer took down the names of Blossom's three auction-minded friends, 
The lab crew arrived. Randy took off to dig up Blossom's friends, and I took a cab. That's item 480 cents to the apartment of Elwood Blewett, Winkler's partner in the jewelry business. Blewett lived alone in a modest but tastefully furnished five or six rooms on East 52nd Street. Of course, Mr. Dollar. I'll be glad to help you all I can. Albert's death has been a terrible blow. Yes. Well, tell me this, please. Yes? Did Mr. Winkler make a habit of taking valuable pieces of jewelry to his residence? Yes, Albert often took pieces home with him to work on them, clean, polish, and so on. Wasn't that a rather dangerous practice? Frankly, I always thought so, but he felt there was far more chance of being robbed if he were alone at the office than at his flat, where he wouldn't be expected to have anything of great value. Well, who has seen the green eye of Calcutta besides you and Mr. Winkler? I'm not sure. Of course, almost anyone would have been able to recognize it. Because of the publicity and pictures when you brought it over here? Yes. Come to think of it, Blossom indicated he'd been much impressed with it. Wilbur Blossom? Yeah. You know him? He's been in the office many times. He and Albert were always bickering over pieces that either of us... Bickering? Well, it was really something of a joke. Albert always wanted some of Blossom's heirloom pieces, and Blossom wanted some of the finer things we had. Did he ever buy? Never. He always wanted us to put them up at auction or at a bargain price. Hardly our way of doing things, needless to say. When did you last see Blossom? By last Friday. I was busy with an important client, and from the back room where Albert worked, I remember hearing Blossom insist that Albert show him the emerald. What did he? I don't know. The silly argument got so noisy that I closed the door on them. Hmm. Oh, now wait... Certainly you aren't thinking that perhaps Wilbert Blossom... I'm not quite certain what I'm thinking, Mr. Blewett. Item five, ten cents, phone call to Randy Singer. No, not a thing, Johnny. One of the three names on Blossom's list is in Europe. The other two did go to the railroad auction, but purchased nothing. Randy, do a couple of things for me, will you? Like what? Phone whoever is stationed at Winkler's place that I want to look it over. Sure, everything is just as it was, including the poker that was used to kill him. Also, I want a copy of the picture of the trunk your lab boys took and the list of Blossom's friends. I'll have them waiting for you. And post a man at Blossom's place. Keep an eye on him. Hmm? Yes, right away. Johnny, have you learned something? That... No, no, just, uh, well, just for his protection, say. I'll talk to you later. Yeah, but... I... Blossom. Yeah, Blossom. Maybe I hadn't given enough thought to the strange little character. Or to why the trunk with Winkler's body had been at his place. But if he were involved, why call me in? Cover up? Possibility. But Wilbert Blossom kill a man? Yeah, maybe he could. Maybe he did. I'd better see him as soon as I get through with the inspection of Winkler's apartment. Mr. Dollar? Oh, hi, officer. Did Sergeant Singer call and tell you that... He's on the phone here in the Winkler apartment now. Wants to talk to you. Says it's very urgent, sir. Okay, thanks. Johnny Dollar. Johnny, how did you know? Huh? The man I sent to cover Blossom's house for you got there too late. What? Whoever got in and attacked the poor old coot got away. Attacked? Blossom? Yeah, really did a job on him. Johnny? (sighs) Okay, Randy. Thanks. Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in just a moment. Democracy. As everyone knows, democracy means many things. Self-rule of the people, a higher standard of living, freedom of speech, press and religion, rights and privileges, liberty. But the most vital promise of democracy is mankind's right to dignity. For it is through the dignity of man that democracy has given mankind its greatest legacy of freedom. Now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Blooming Blossom Matter. Expense account item six, two dollars and a quarter for a fast taxi ride to 18th Precinct Police Headquarters. All right. As soon as I got your call, Johnny, I sent a uniformed man over to Blossom's house. From the way you talked, I thought maybe you suspected him. Yeah, Randy, I'm afraid I did. Boy, how wrong can you be? Anyhow, when he got there, he found the front door open and Blossom lying in the dark hallway. Where's Blossom now? In the hospital, but he's okay, just bruised up a bit. They're letting him out. Fingerprints? Anything to go on? The lab's checking on the prints right now. Uh-huh. Let me know. Yeah. 
Anything else? Nope. So, now let's find out who tried to put Blossom out of the way, and we'll have the guy who killed Winkler. And stole the hundred thousand worth of emerald, then shipped Winkler's body to Blossom. Oh, uh, and by the way, here's the picture of the trunk you asked for and the three names Blossom gave me. Harrison, Norton, and Scatterday. What are you going to do with them? Randy. Hmm? Suppose the man who attacked Blossom is the one who did all the rest. You got a better suppose? Well, look, Randy, whoever wielded that poker on Winkler couldn't have been very strong. A really hefty wallop would have bent it out of shape. And the lab agrees with you. But, of course, it didn't take much of a blow to finish off old Winkler. He didn't weigh much over 100 pounds, you know. Yeah. Any strong arm could have finished him off easily and without messing up the whole apartment. And don't forget, whoever did him in also put him in the trunk and delivered it to Blossom's house. But why? Yeah. Yeah, and where's the emerald? That's what you should be worried about. A hundred grand worth of worry for your insurance company. Now, what are you going to do with that picture of the trunk and the list of Blossom's friends? Oh, yeah, sure. Hmm? I'll see you later. Item seven, five dollars and a half for a taxi to the warehouse of the Canyon City and Metropolitan Railroad over in Jersey. There I finally managed to track down a man who knew something about their occasional auction sales of unclaimed baggage and stuff. Insurance investigator, eh? Huh? That's right, Mr. McKinney. One of those boys with a fancy expense count, eh? Well, that's a matter of opinion. Look, you had an auction sale here last Saturday, didn't you? That's right. Handled it myself. Want to know something about uh, something we sold off? Exactly. Then I'm your man. Always remember all about every single item I sell and who bought it and, and all about them. That's fine. Because I want to know if any of the names on this list bought from you on Saturday. Yeah. Randolph Harrison. Man by the name of Harrison buy anything? Mm, no. Nope. How about Percival Wentworth Scatterday? Nope. Ellsworth Norton. Nope. You sure, Mr. McKinney? I'm sure. How, uh, how about Blossom? That a man's name? Yes, Wilbert Blossom. Well? No, sir. Nope, never heard of him. And like I told you, I never forget the stuff I sell or the fellas I sell it to. Wait. This picture of a trunk. Huh? Have you ever seen this trunk? Well, yes. Did you sell this trunk on Saturday? Yes, I did. To whom? Come on, man, it's important. Well, and I was real early in the sale. Yeah, before most of the people got here. Uh, bought this trunk and had it sent to his apartment in New York. And his name? Well, it was a funny kind of name. Uh, Blinky or Winky or... Uh, oh, no. Winkler. Winkler. That was it. Albert Winkler. I'd have made two dollars, two drinks for myself at the nearest bar. But they didn't help to kill my feeling of utter frustration. Item 9550 taxi back to 18th Precinct headquarters in New York for want of a better place to go. Oh, it's about time you got here, Johnny. Oh? Uh, we matched up the prints we found after Blossom was attacked. You know who made them? Yeah, here's his card. Carlo Bernasconi. Any reckon? A couple of a dozen arrests, only one conviction. Anything to do with jewelry? Better. Accessory to a hijack operation a couple of years ago. He drove the truck. Hey. Sure. Got a mugshot of him? We got him. Downstairs. Come on, I'll take you down. Randy, what's he look like? Like you'd expect the truck driver to look, big husky brute. Has he admitted anything? Well, the threat of a murder charge made him talk, all right, but none of it makes any sense. Of course it doesn't. But he's our boy, all right. He killed Winkler, beat up Blossom. I thought your lab decided whoever killed Winkler was a small fella. Mm, yeah, I... So the theory about the same man killing Winkler and beating up Blossom doesn't work. But, Johnny, holy... Come on down, let's talk to this Bernice Cone. After I make a phone call. Huh? Who to? Yeah? Get me a man named McKinney. Canyon City and Metropolitan Railroad Warehouse over in Jersey. Make it fast, please. Yes, sir. Hey, you been over there, Johnny? Just before I got here. Did you find out anything? No, but I'm going to now. Like what? Randy, for the first time, this whole thing is beginning to make sense. Here's your party. Mr. McKinney? That's me. This is Johnny Dollar, remember? Sure do. And Good. say... Now... I've been reading in the paper since you left here about that body found a trunk over there in New York. Yeah, well, look. In that same... Is that same trunk you was over here asking about? Yes. Now, you told me that trunk was bought by a man who gave his name as Winkler. That's right, Do you remember what he looked like? Sure do. Why, I can give it to you as accurate as if it was in the police file. Well? Height, uh, mm, five foot nine, maybe nine and a half. Go on. Weight, between 155 and 58. You see, when I was young, I worked with a carny show guessing weight and height, and if I didn't guess it right... Yeah, okay, okay. Now, how about the uh, color of the eyes? <laughs> well, I noticed them, because...
because of the way he squinted through them thick, old-fashioned steel glasses. He... Thanks, Mac. I'm sending you a ten spot in the next mail. Well, now. Well, Johnny? Come on, Randy. Let's go down and see this Bernasconi. You find something out new? Yeah. And I don't like it. I don't like it. Now, look, Bernasconi, you're in plenty of trouble for the assault on Blossom. Maybe even more. But I'm the man who can save you from a murder rap, if you'll answer a couple of questions. Ah, uh, sure. I told the cops... All right, all right. Did you pick up and deliver a trunk yesterday morning? Sure, I told him. For a guy named Winkler. You got the trunk from Winkler? Sure, at his apartment on East... What did he look like? How tall? Oh, uh, maybe five, eight, or ten. What? Johnny... Slight uh... build or heavy or what? I'd say about medium. Maybe 150 pounds. Johnny... Now, look, mister... Now, wait a minute. You look... Did you deliver that trunk to a man named Blossom? Sure. At 825 East 73rd Street. What did he look like? Him I never seen. I knew it. He hollered from a window that the door was open and I should put the trunk in the living room. <laughs> what a junk house. But you must have seen him later when you came back and assaulted him. It was night then. When he come to the door, I just slugged him and let him lay there. Then I went inside where the lights was on to look for... Well, to look for the big rock I'd read about in the paper. But then I heard a prowl car coming, so I beat it. Frank wasn't there anyway. Okay, Bernasconi. See you later, Randy. Now, just a minute. Johnny. Hey, and what about me? You said it. Item 1090 cents taxi to Wilbert Blossom's old brownstone house on East 73rd. Come in, come in, Johnny. Thanks, Mr. Blossom. All recovered from your beating? Oh, of course I am. Here, sit down, sit down. You, uh,. You said you wanted to help me on this case. Oh, yes. Yes, indeed. Why, this chance to work with a man I consider the finest insurance investigator in the world. Yeah. That's why I called you when I got the trunk with Mr. Winkler's body in it. Mr. Blossom, why don't you tell the truth? All my drab, dull life, I've wanted to be a detective, an investigator. And this was my chance. My chance to... Tell the truth, did you say? (sighs) Mr. Blossom... Listen to some facts for a minute and see what conclusions you draw from them. Oh, deductions. <laughs> like a detective. To begin with, this house of yours is so full of, well, junk. I told you, Johnny, I like things. I like things. But it also has a lot of fine paintings, sculpture, china, jewelry. Oh, I like all sorts of things. Especially if they're fine and rare. And bargains. <laughs> like the green eye of Calcutta? Oh. The most beautiful emerald in the world. And I would conclude that you'd do just about anything to have that stone. Yes, sir, Johnny. I'd reach the same conclusion. Okay. Now, when Albert Winkler and the emerald disappeared, it was in the papers that Inter-Allied had written policies on them. Conclusion? Yes, sir. I would deduce that you would be called in. Wouldn't it be smart, then, if the killer was afraid I'd eventually get around to him anyway... Wouldn't it be smart for him to call me in and offer to help me? As a cover-up for what he'd done? Oh, yes. Yes, yes, indeed. Or at least he'd think it would. Oh, yes, I I guess he thought it would. Another thing, Mr. Boss. Oh? What is it, Johnny? The body was packed in the trunk with old newspapers. Like these you keep piled around. Oh, why, yes, yes. And I would deduce... So obvious that both Randy Singer and I overlooked them completely. Oh, well, there's so many things piled around here. (laughs) You couldn't be expected to... Johnny. Yeah? What really made you decide that... uh... Well, I'd like to know. All right. Albert Winkler was a frail little old man, about 4'11", not much over 100 pounds. Yes, he was. But the man who bought the trunk and had it sent to Winkler's apartment, who gave his name as Winkler, that man was about 5'9", 155 pounds. And he wore thick, old-fashioned, steel-rimmed glasses. But, Johnny, I can't see without them. Then there's the truck driver. The man who ordered the trunk delivered to this house gave his name as Winkler, too. But Winkler was dead by then. Dead from a blow inflicted not by some big bruiser, but by somebody of... Say your bill. Oh, that awful truck driver who thought the emerald would be in the trunk and came here to steal it and who beat me up. I suppose you want the emerald. 
Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Here, Johnny, I, I kept it in this old coffee pot uh, that I picked up at an auction sale. Real bargain, too. Oh, isn't it a beautiful stone? Oh, if only Mr. Winkley would have sold it to me. At a bargain, that is. Then none of this would have happened. Well, I guess we better go now, haven't we? Huh. It's such a silly thing. Me trying to act like a detective. I guess I didn't even make a very good killer. Did I? Why? Just this overpowering passion to have things? Maybe. Or maybe it was just a reaction. A last desperate attempt to some way, any way, break from a lifetime of lonely, dull, drab idleness. I don't know. But for some crazy reason, I feel sorry for the funny little old character who turned killer. Expense account total, including incidentals and fare, back to Hartford, $61.55. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, a case so simple, so easy, so obvious, that it proves almost impossible to solve. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote tonight's story. Heard in our cast were Howard McNear, Herb Ellis, Herb Vigran, Junius Matthews, Herb Butterfield, Frank Gersel, and Johnny Jacobs. Musical supervision is by Jerry Goldsmith. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Dan Coverly speaking. Johnny Dollar has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. Hollywood. It's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Hi there, Johnny. This is Buster. Buster? Buster Favor, Lake Mojave Resort over on the Colorado River. Oh, well, Buster, how are things? Oh, you never really did get in the fishing we promised you over here. No, but so help me, I'm going to one of these days. Is that what you call me about? No. Johnny, you remember old Mike Kirby? Kirby, Kirby... Oh, sure. The sweet old fellow I met down at your boat dock. A uh, guide or something? That's the one. Oh, sure, I remember him. How is he? Well, that's what I'm calling about. He, uh, he isn't. What? And Johnny, I think it was murder. <laughs> Bob Bailey, 
in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Tri-State Life and Casualty Insurance Company home office, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Kirby Will matter. As soon as I hung up on Buster, I lost no time in making the necessary plane reservation to Las Vegas and picking up a handful of American Express traveler's checks. That's item one on the expense account, a total of $320. Then I packed a bag, was about to take off, and the phone rang again. Johnny Dollar. Oh, Johnny, I'm glad I caught you in. It's Danny Newcomb at Tri-State Life and Casualty. Oh, hi, Danny. Johnny, I need you badly, and I need Whoops. you fast. I, there's only a $5,000 policy involved. Danny, the circumstances are I'm sorry, that... Dan, but I can't handle it. I'm about to catch a plane out no, of no, here. No, no, Johnny, now listen. There may be a killing involved in this case, so we don't dare waste any time. And what's No, no, more, you we... listen. There may be a killing involved in what I'm going out What's to... more, the death of our client occurred at one of your old stamping grounds. Sorry, at Dan. the Lake Mojave Resort. Danny, I told you I... What? Yeah, that's right. Mike Kirby? Yeah. Okay, Danny, I'm on my way. It was 7.30 a.m. when the plane dropped me off in Las Vegas, Nevada, smack in the middle of the Mojave Desert. Even at that hour of the morning, the otherwise clear, clean air was filled with the cacophony of the city of chance. The stuttering clicks of the ball on the roulette wheels, the rattle and gallop of the ivories on the dice table, the endless drone of the croupier, the flat clank of the chuckaluck cages, the snap of cards by the blackjack dealers, the never-ending click of poker chips and silver dollars. And over it all, the interminable chunk and whir of the slot machines, day and night from one end of the town to the other. Fabulous. I grabbed breakfast, that's item two, then rented a car and headed south and east on Route 93 toward Kingman, Arizona. Then, just five miles short of that town, I swung right on 68 down toward Davis Dam, down to Lake Mojave Resort. Mile after mile of nothing but sun-baked rock and sand, sagebrush and Joshua trees, tumbleweed and cactus. And right in the middle of it, the clear blue waters of Lake Mojave. Buster Favor, whose general factotum of the resort, was waiting for me. After a hearty greeting, he led me into the office, and we sat down and got to work. Yeah, it was murder, all right, Johnny. Hey, sure. Yeah. And by the way, I don't know how much you knew about Mike Kirby. Well, only that he seemed to be one of the fixtures around here. Was obviously well-liked. Well, he'd been a businessman back east. Owned a string of restaurants, made a fortune. Uh-huh. And about ten years ago, he retired. Did a lot of traveling all over the world, I guess. Oh, lucky man. Did he have any relatives, Buster? Oh, only some nephews and nieces. I see. Anyhow, a little over three years ago, he settled down here to spend the rest of his life just fishing, taking it easy. Can't think of a better place or way to retire. How old was he, Buster? Sixty-one. Didn't look it, though. No. Well, if I remember right, he was pretty fit. Mm, he was. Well, I had the impression when I was here before that he was just a hired fishing guy, something like that. Oh, he used that as an excuse to meet folks. Half the time, he clean forgot to charge for his guide services. Accidentally on purpose, no doubt. Well, now you said... Now, don't rush me, Johnny. I got to give you the background. Okay, sure. He kept saying over and over and over again how glad he was to be out from under a lot of responsibilities. And one day, about six, seven months ago, he suddenly transferred title to his boat, his motor, his fishing tackle, and his old beat-up Ford to us. Oh. I know. I asked him at the time if he wanted to... Get him off his personal inventory, why not give him to his relatives? Well, what'd he say to that? Said he didn't like him. Felt they were just waiting around for him to die so they could get their hands on his money. Oh. Said he just wanted to make sure that if anything happened to him, the stuff would end up with us, on account of we'd use it and appreciate it. Also, Johnny, he plunked down $10,000 in cash and insisted that we take that, too. Ten thousand? What for? His rent on his cabin for as long as he lived. Oh. Buster, did he leave a will of any kind? Well, now, I'm getting to that. Anyhow, last Friday afternoon, he went out fishing alone like he often did. And just before dark, one of the rental boats came in with two young kids. 
It's seen old Mike's boat up on the beach in that big cove just above the power line crossing. They found Mike laying on the sand beside it, as still as death. Well, they came tearing in to report it, scared half out of their wits. Well, I sure hope you Oh, sure, sure. I grabbed Ham Pratt and a big flashlight. You remember Ham. Oh, yeah, the manager of the resort. Yeah, yeah. Well? Well, we... We found him there. And he... He was gone. Poor old fella. Go on, Buster. Well, Ham took one look at him and... Rattlesnake, he said it. Rattlesnake did it. Mm -hmm. You could tell by the way Mike looked, laying there. Fang marks? Yeah, on his right leg, just above the ankle. And a big bruise on his head, like he'd hit a rock when he fell. But on the phone, you said you thought it was murder. And a minute ago, you said you're sure of it. Well, we put him in our boat, hitched his on behind, and brought him back here. We phoned Tad Harding of the Kingman Police Department. I remember him. Good man. Yeah, well, Chief Harding took one look, and he agreed with Ham. Poison from a rattler. Well, they took him into Kingman, and I telegraphed the relatives. But, Buster, now look, you... Then I got to thinking. There was something wrong. What do you mean? Well, there are very few rattlers in this part of the country because of the heat. They can't take it. If anybody would know better than to fool with one, it'd be old Mike. And they always sound a warning before they strike anyhow, don't sure, they? Sure, sure. So early next morning, I went back to the cove. And? Number one, there was no sign of any rock that Mike might have hit his head on when he fell. Go on, Buster, go on. There was no trail from any kind of a snake anywhere around. Well, the sand could have drifted over. No, sir. The footprints Ham and I and the kids had made were clear as crystal, but no tracks of a snake. All right, go on. Well, then I noticed it, where another boat had been beached. Strange one, not from our landing. It was right next to where Mike's had been, right alongside. Any footprints from it? Well, if there were, we and the kids had mashed them all out. And I remember the way Mike had been laying there, as though he could have been rolled out of his boat or thrown out right on the sand. Then it looks as though somebody met him out on the lake, banged him over the head, made the fang marks, which isn't hard, then lashed the two boats together, dumped him off at the cove and left. It sure does, Johnny. I want to see that place. Yeah, and all the excitement, I might have overlooked a lot of things. Oh, that I doubt. Now, Buster, if there's no sign of rattlesnake poison in old Mike's body... Well, right after I called you, I phoned Chief Harding. Connor's making his autopsy today. He'll call me. Well, now, look. These nephews and nieces of Mike's, how much do you know about them? Oh, I never met them. But according to their answering telegrams, they're going to descend on us like a swarm of locusts. There are a lot of them? Well, no. I was thinking of the way that they... Well, one, there's a woman name of Martha Woodbury who... Excuse me. Mr. Faber? Yeah, I'm Buster Faber. I am Miss Martha Woodbury. Oh, well, Miss Woodbury, we were just... Uh, uh, this is Mr. Johnny Dollar. Miss... How do you do? Mr. Favor, I'm a niece of Michael Jonathan Kirby, and probably the major beneficiary of his estate. I wired you that I would be here, and I am. You got here kind of fast, too, didn't you? I also wired Uncle Michael's attorney in Kingman that I saw no reason why he should delay the reading of Uncle Michael's will. Lawyer Guilford phoned me about that, and I guess you weren't the only one. He should be here late this afternoon. I also wish to make funeral arrangements befitting one of his financial status. Uh, won't you sit down? Now, please tell me the circumstances of his death. And, of course, I wish to see the old, the poor darling's body. Miss Woodbury. Oh, uh, yes? What do you do for a living? Why, if it's of any concern to you, I teach at Armand College. Toxicology. Toxicology, huh? Yes. Well, isn't very interesting. Is it? Why? Who are you, Mr. Dollar? Well, I'm a special investigator for your uncle's insurance company. What? Yes, you see, we have good reason to believe your uncle was murdered. Murdered? Murdered? Who said that? Oh. Hello, Martha. Hey, you said murdered. Are you talking about Uncle Michael? Well, that's right. Who are you? I am Chester Kirby, and as far as I know, the heir to my uncle's fortune. Uh -huh. Who are you, sir? Uh, Chester, Mr. Dollar, is an insurance investigator. Oh, an investigator, huh? Dollar, I'm Hank Kirby, family black sheep, also Uncle Mike's nephew. What's this talk about murder? Are, uh, are you three his only relatives? That's right, Dollar, except for Lita. Lita? Lolita Laverne. We sometimes try to forget that. Oh, come off of that. Why, Miss Woodbury? My sister is a cheap nightclub dancer. We prefer to forget it. And the silly stage name she uses. Now, take it easy, teacher. Of course, Martha. This is hardly the time or place to... What do you do for a living, Mr. Kirby? Chester? 
Oh, uh, well, play the stock market a bit, that sort of thing. He's a playboy, Mr. Dollar, and a gambler, and I suspect not a very honest one. Martha, my dear girl, I resent that. You've never done a lick of honest work in your life. And if you think Uncle Michael didn't know it, would let his money ever get into those soft, pickpocket fingers of yours? You don't think you're the well, one Well, let me it. tell you something, Oh, shut up, both of you. Pay our money grabbing. If you had to work for a living... Like what, Hank? What do you do? Yes. Tell him, Henry. Oh, I told you I was the black sheep of the family, but I work. You know, odd job. I'll tell you, Mr. Dollar. He's a roustabout. Circuses. Carnival, that disgusting sort of thing. Where are you working now, Hank? Well, there's a sort of a scientific exhibit. Side uh, show is more like it. All right, all right. Along the highway over near Victorville. A lot of rare animals, reptiles, and things on display. And Henry, dear boy, when he's off the bottle, is appropriately enough in charge of the snake pit. Oh. Uh. Well, we do scientific work, too. You, you know, like, uh, well, like, uh... Like, uh, what, Henry? Like milking the venom from the snakes to sell to laboratories? Yeah. Well, that is would. Excuse me. Hello? What? You sure? Well, what... Mr. Dollar, oh, I think it's about time you tell us hey, what you Buster. meant when... Yeah, Buster. I want you to hear this. It's Chief Harding. Go ahead, Chief. Well, as I said, Buster, there was evidence of rattlesnake venom in the body, all right. But it didn't enter at the fang marks on the leg. What, what do you mean, Chief? Well, the coroner says those marks were fakes. The venom was injected with a needle up near the armpit where it wouldn't be noticed. Chief, this is Johnny Dollar. Oh, hi there, Mr. Dollar. Haven't seen you since you were out here Listen, working on the... Listen, was the venom injected into his body before or after old Mike received the blow on the head? Was the coroner able to check that? I don't think he's tried, Mr. Dollar. Well, have him do it, would you please, if he can? Well, sure. Also, I'll do me a favor and check with lawyer Guilford. I'd like to know when he's coming out here with a will. Oh, I saw him just a few minutes ago, and he asked me to tell Buster sometime this afternoon if he can get away. Good, thanks. I'll talk to you later. Well, sure, Mr. As I started to say, Mr. Dollar, Look, Miss I... Miss Woodbury, there is nothing that you or any of us can do until we get the complete report from the coroner. Well, you can at least tell us what you meant And what about meant... dear Uncle Michael's will, Mr. Dollar? That will have to wait for the attorney. He expects to be here sometime later today. Now, wait a minute. You said murdered. Incidentally... I suppose the will shouldn't be read until uh, Lolita, or whatever her name is, gets here. According to her telegram, she ought to get here today. Well, she better. What I want you to do is arrange for quarters here. And uh, all of you stay here. If you won't do it of your own free will, I'll have Chief Harding of the Kingman Police Department take whatever... No. No. Such a humiliation is entirely unnecessary. There's nothing to keep me from sticking around. I want to hear that world, too. Of course. Don't we all? Okay, then. Sit tight. For my money, any one of them could have done it. A toxicologist, a man whose business was handling poisonous reptiles, and a cheap tin horn gambler, and the nightclub dancer who hadn't appeared yet. Yeah, any one of them. The latch onto the old man's fortune. I avoided telling the three present about the circumstances of their uncle's death and the hope one of them would slip, would give himself away by saying something to show that he or she already knew. As soon as they were ensconced in their rooms, Buster and I hopped into his outboard and headed up the lake. Remember the last time we rode up here looking for evidence, Johnny? Yeah, I sure do. That was the Midas Touch mine. Yeah. And a pretty little lady owned a high-power rifle with a scope sight. Just about here, she started taking pot shots at us from the shore. Wow, that's one thing we won't have to worry about this trip. Now, right around this point is where I found Mike's boat on the beach. And like I told you, I may have overlooked some clue that you'll spot in a second. Buster. Yeah? Tell me, did old Mike earn enough as a fishing guy to make a living? Well, just about enough to buy food and a few odds and ends. And... Well, like I told you, most of the time he deliberately forgot to join not needing the money and all. Hey, Johnny. There in the cove. Why? A boat. Right where Mike was. Whose is it? Do you know? Isn't out of our landing by... Hey, that puff of smoke from behind the bush way up on the sand dune. Swing us around. That's somebody with a gun. And look, we're taking in water. Those holes in the bottom. Grab that can. Start bailing. Hey, that guy can shoot. Pull us around, Buster. We're like a pair of sitting ducks out here. Right. Uh, 
Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in just a moment. Democracy. It takes an awareness of life and a respect for mankind to make democracy work. But when this happens, democracy works in mysterious ways to better the lives of everyone. Why? Because democracy is concerned with everyone. One could say that democracy is people. For the people rule themselves in a democracy. No tyrant stands a chance. No dictator can get a foothold. The systems of laws and justice in a democratic government is made and operated by the people, for the people. And people like to be free. That's why democracy gives mankind its finest legacy of freedom. Now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Kirby Will Matter. Whoever had been shooting at us from the shore there on Lake Mojave had a good eye. But a 30-mile-an-hour outboard at over 200 yards and swerving like mad can be a pretty tough target. With a hull full of holes, we had no choice but to go back to the landing. There, I made a quick check of the three I suspected of having killed old Mike Kirby. First, his nephew, Chester. Right here in my room, Mr. Dollar, reading. Then a brief walk in the hills. Why? And when is that lawyer coming to read Uncle Michael's will? Then the niece, Martha Woodbury. Gathering a few desert plans, as you must know. Hardly racing about on the lake armed with a gun, as you seem to suspect. Why don't you question Henry? If anyone should know how to handle a gun, he should. So I questioned Hank Kirby. Patient, that's what. I saw no reason to just sit around waiting for that lawyer to arrive. I was patient in that first big cove on the right. On the Arizona side. That's right. And I saw you and Buster tearing back here. That's when I come back to see what was up. Now, what is up? Mr. Kirby? Yeah, yeah Buster? On the pay phone, the phone booth next to the cafe. Yeah? Kingman operator just called. Yeah. She still hadn't been able to reach your party on whatever that call was you made. Oh, yeah, thanks. What call, Hank? Uh, I've been trying to locate Lita, find out why she hasn't got down here. Maybe she doesn't care about the world. Where is she, Hank? She was to a dive up in Las Vegas that I sent the telegram, Johnny. Yeah, 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 that's where she's been working. Is that where you called earlier, Hank? Earlier? Yeah, didn't I see you in that phone booth when Buster and I pulled out... Oh, yeah, sure. Trying to get Lita then, too. Yeah. Yeah, it reminds me, Johnny. Lawyer Guilford just phoned me from Kingman. He'll be over here in about an hour. Then the will gets read, huh? Perhaps we ought to wait for Lita. What do you think, Hank? She'll... She'll be. Well, did you talk to her? Is she on her way? Yeah, she's on her way. All right. If Buster's willing, we'll use the office when Guilford gets here. Sure. So, Hank, you tell the others to be ready and waiting. Yeah, sure thing. Come on, Buster. Right, Johnny. What's on your mind? Well, maybe it's just a hunch, nothing more. But I want to get on that phone in the office. I called Armand College first. Yes, Miss Martha Woodbury had left there only last night. So she couldn't have been here when Mike Kirby was killed. A call to Chester's Hangout, a private gambling club in Reno, indicated the same thing. Call number three was to the so-called museum, where Hank Kirby worked with the snakes a place within easy driving distance of Lake Mojave. But the records showed he hadn't left the place in two weeks until this present trip to be here. Lolita? Well, the manager of the club in Las Vegas said she hadn't missed a show. Daytimes? Well, who knew? But she was there every night. Then I suddenly remembered something about the geography of Lake Mojave. Yeah, Johnny. Cottonwood Landing is only about 25 miles north on the west, the Nevada side of the lake. Could that boat we saw in the cove... Sure, that's where it came from. I knew there was something familiar about it. Hey, what are you going to do, Johnny? Kingman. Operator, get me Cottonwood Landing, please. Yes, sir. It's one of their rental boats, Johnny. Yes, sir, I'm sure of it. Any number? Any identification on it? Well, that I didn't see. Anyhow, they rent so many to fishermen every day. Uh-huh. Hey, here comes Lawyer Guilford driving up. Good. Cottonwood. Hello, this is Johnny Dollar, special investigator. Yes, sir. What... I want to know if you rented a boat today to a girl named Lolita Laverne. Laverne? I'll meet him, Johnny, and I'll bring him all in here. Okay. Uh, no, sir. Uh, nobody with that name rented today. Well, uh, what about Friday? Friday afternoon. Friday. Yeah, that's right. Uh, well, the only women we rented to on Friday was old lady Newberry, down from Canada for a couple of days. No, this is a young girl. Well, the other was Miss Hancock. Hancock? Lucy Hancock. 
Okay. Thanks very much. I've never seen... Johnny, this is Lawyer Gilbert. Lawyer, Mr. Johnny Dollar. It's a pleasure, Mr. Dollar. How are you, sir? Now, if, if you'll all please sit down. All right. Uh, I'm a little pressed for time, so I'll waste none in getting to the reading of Michael Kirby's will. Well, you, you don't think we ought to wait for Lita to get here? It, it won't be necessary. Uh, no. I, I possess a full accounting of the net value of Mr. Kirby's estate. Excellent. Oh. It, it may surprise you, by the way. Fine, fine. This will confirms that valuation. It is dated, by the way, just five months ago. Made it out right after. Oh, look, let's get to the well. Oh, let's raise it. Yes, yes, come please, on. Please. His real property consisted only of his clothes, then the outboard motorboat, and an old car which he transferred to the Lake Mojave Resort, together with the sum of money to provide for his living here. How much? Yeah. Only $10,000. Oh, well, good. Uh, some years ago, he turned all other of his real property, including some rather important real estate and business holdings, into cash. Well, where is all the cash deposited now? Yes. Surely you aren't considering adding bank robbery to your rather questionable career, Henry. Martha, that is quite uncalled for. Now, why don't we proceed with the will? Yeah. Uh, there is one asset specifically set aside that perhaps I should mention since it concerns Mr. Dollar. He is the beneficiary? Oh, no, 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 no. I refer to the insurance policy for $5,000. But don't worry about a fiddling amount like that. Let's have the will, oh, man. Oh, <clears throat> the insurance policy is to cover burial expenses and nothing else. All of it is to be used. Okay, okay. Let's have the rest of the world. Yes. Can't you leave all that <clears throat> Very well. <clears throat> I, Michael Jonathan Kirby, do make, ordain, and declare this instrument to be my last will and testament. Oh, why don't you skip that stuff? Please. <clears throat> Being of sound mind and body, determined to enjoy... The fruits of an industrious life to the fullest. The bequests, man. Life to the fullest. And rather than burden others with the responsibility that money demands. What? For these and other reasons, I have carefully spent every dollar I ever owned. What? No, he was out of mind. I couldn't do that. That is the will of Michael Jonathan Kirby in its entirety. Good day. Good day. What fools we've made of ourselves. What fools. And it's no less than we deserve. I only wish that Lucy had been here. Wait a minute. Lucy? Yes, Lucy. A real name, a proper name, not Lolita Laverne. It's Lucy Hancock Woodbury. But as I told you before... Now listen, all of you. You're to stay right here. Stay in your room. Oh? What's the point? Now we know the contents of that stupid will. Yeah. By what right, you... Chief Harding? Tell him to stand by in case these people get itchy feet. Right. What little I've done so far in this case was based on nothing but hunches. So when 10, then 11 p.m. came and Lolita, Lucy Hancock Woodbury, hadn't arrived, I acted on another hunch. Good, Johnny. My room is right next door to the office, so if this leader arrives and signs in, I'll let you know right away. No, Buster, no. Huh? Just sign her into a room after you've done a little tampering with the register. What do you mean? Chester is in number six, isn't he? That's right. All right. Change that on the register to number eight. That's this one. Your room. That's right. And be sure that Lita sees the register. I don't understand. You don't have to, Buster. Let's just hope she gets here. Buster left. And with my door ajar, I turned off the light and lay on the bed and waited. It must have been after midnight when I heard the car pull in. I heard Buster admit someone to a room a couple of doors down the line and then go back to his home. Then, silence. Then, the quiet click of feminine footsteps approaching my door. Quickly, in the darkness, I lit a cigarette, held the glowing end away from my face. Well, darling. Yeah. About time. And about time you got some sense, Chet. No, no, don't turn on the light. The others are asleep. Their rooms are dark. Uh-huh. Listen, dear cousin, have you lost your mind? Mm. Shooting at that boat from over the ridge between the two coves. 
What were they? Police? Detectives? Hmm. You, you should have known you couldn't have hit them that far away, Chet. You should have waited until they got on shore looking for me. Well. Did they fall for the rattlesnake bite we made on the old man? Uh-huh. Well, they'll never find the needle I used. It's at the bottom of the lake. And look, if the cops question you, I hope you had sense enough to remind them what Martha and Hank do for a living. No chance. And what about the will? <laughs> Would you be surprised? What? Say that again, Chet. Say anything. You sound like somebody else. Yeah, like Johnny Dollar. Let's have a light. Dollar? That's right, special investigator. Oh, no. Let me out of here. No, where do you think you're going? No, let me go of me. Come on. Let me. 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 Yeah, all four of them had wanted to see old Mike dead. But Hank, the only honest working man of the lot, didn't have the brains. Martha wouldn't have used a means that tied in with her toxicology work and probably didn't have the nerve. So Chet, who lived by his wits, and Lita, who was a real cheap, no account, well, the courts will take good care of them. And I still have to chuckle over poor old Mike's will. Being of sound mind, I have spent all my money. Which reminds me, expense account total, including transportation back to Hartford, three thirty one twenty five. Yours truly, Johnny Dalton. Now, here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week... Well, next week, the most complicated case in years comes up with the simplest, most obvious solution. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote tonight's story. Heard in our cast were Virginia Gregg, Barney Phillips, Shirley Mitchell, Stacey Harris, Carlton Young, Forrest Lewis, Frank Nelson, and John Daner. Musical supervision is by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Johnny Dollar has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Lord Barlow, Johnny, I'm on a spot. What's the matter? The Templeton house in Boston was knocked over sometime during the night. We have a $100,000 loss on our hands. Can you go over there right away? Well, I'll see what the plane situation is, Lord. And Never can... mind the plane situation. Just pack up and get out to the airport. I'll meet you at Hangar 12. What? I'm chartering a plane for you. <laughs> Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. 
to the Mideastern Indemnity Corporation Home Office, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Templeton matter. Expense account item one, five dollars even, cab fare, for my apartment to hangar 12 at the airport. A twin-engine Bonanza had been rolled out and a fueling truck was pulled up alongside. A man in a sheepskin seemed to be supervising things. The man who seemed to be supervising him was Lud Barlow. When he saw me, he waved his briefcase. Hey, Johnny! Hi! Hi, you all set? Well, I'm here. That's what you mean, Lud. That all your luggage? Yeah, this is it. This is Tommy Clark, Johnny, your pilot. How are you? Hi, Tom. I'll uh, stow this gear for you. Oh, thanks. The faster we move on this, the better off we are. You know that. I know. Uh, This is the blanket policy. This is the itemized list. This is the itemized list broken down. You'll have to check the itemized against the sales. Your authorization procedure. And a description of stock records, including shipments received by Templeton House up to and including the first day of last week. Okay? Well, now maybe you'll tell me what this is all about. And when you get there, what? What it's all about. Let's start with Templeton House, huh? Biggest jewelry firm in Boston. You said they were robbed last night. Burglarized. Broken into somewhere between 5 and 7 o'clock in the morning. All set, Mr. Dollar. What'd they get away with? Well, that's for you to find out, Johnny. We carry a blanket policy on all their stock. Anything in the store in the way of merchandise is covered. On the phone, you said something about $100,000. It may be $200,000, Johnny. I take it you talked to somebody in Boston. Yeah. Yeah. Did you talk to the police? Yes, for a minute. I told them I was sending a man. They're expecting you. Give your hand, Mr. Dollar. Oh. Thanks, Tom. Uh, okay. Yeah. Thanks. Who's in charge, lad? Lieutenant Roebuck. Roebuck? Yeah. Get your seatbelt, Mr. Della. Oh, sure. If you want to see those contents records, you'll be sure and tell them they're up to date. Who's the man with the company? What? The man at the company. Temple Dunn. Stand clear, Mr. Barlow. Remember, Johnny, a client can face a thing like this a lot better than that when the insurance company standing by. I'll it? try to remember that. Good luck and keep the informed. By the time we arrived at the Boston airport, I'd read over the policy and had a fair idea of the coverage involved. Expense account item two, ten dollars, more cab fare. I dropped my bags off at the Independence Hotel and had the driver take me over to Templeton House. Two police cars were parked in front of the building and two uniformed police officers were parked in the doorway. I'm sorry, mister, the store's not open today. Oh, I'm from the insurance company. Oh, Lieutenant Robux in the back. Go ahead. At the back of the store, a white-coated intern and an ambulance attendant were working over a blanket wrap figure laid out on the stretcher. One of them was operating a plasma tube. The other was checking the pulse. A group of men, some in uniform, were watching closely. The tall, thin ones seemed to be in charge of things. (laughs) Roebuck? Uh, yeah. Johnny Dollar, Mid-Eastern oh, okay. Indemnity. Oh, didn't take you long. This, uh, Sergeant Younger, Sergeant Toohey, this is Mr. Dollar from the insurance company. Hi, man. What's this? Oh, this man was a special patrolman working the area. He must have walked right into the middle of it and got himself shot. They've been giving him transfusions ever since they found him. Uh-huh. Said anything yet? I oh, hasn't been conscious. Doc, how about it? Well, we can't do any more here, Lieutenant. We'll have to risk a trip to the hospital and try to operate. Okay, boys, load up. Doc, this is Mr. Dollar, insurance company. How are you, Doc? Okay. Doc, we're going to want to talk to him the minute he comes around. I'm not going to promise you anything, Lieutenant. Well, see you. Fine. Now, Mr. Dollar, you didn't waste much time. I brought a contents list that might help you, Lieutenant. Good. The best help we're going to get is from that patrolman. Come on, stay around. This is where they got in. Jimmy, huh? Yeah, most likely. There's marks there on the door, Jim. As near as we can tell right now, they only took important stuff. Easy to move. Easy to break down and unload, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, yeah you can see where they snipped the alarms, grounded the wires. Mm-hmm. Showcases aren't touched. No, they went straight for the safe, darling. Well, we really got something on our hands, huh? You don't just break into a store and open one of these things very easy. Someone did. The neighborhood was canvassed for possible witnesses. I spent the rest of the morning with Dorian Templeton, the owner of the company. By noon, we had taken an inventory of the missing stock and drawn up a tentative list. As far as I know, that about does it, Mr. Dollar. 
No, what's the next step? I'll check this against the merchandise received reports, Mr. Templeton. It'll take a while. As soon as I have that finished, you can check it over again and file a formal claim. And then? The company will reimburse you in cash. Well, what are the chances for recovery in a case like this? Well, I could quote the actuaries, Mr. Templeton, but I won't. Why not? Whoever broke in here last night knew what they were about. They opened your vault the way you'd open your front door. They took what they wanted and got out very quickly. No alarm, no witnesses. The chances are they planned the rest of it just as well. They probably scattered. The police aren't sure how many men were involved. They know it was at least two men, possibly three. How did they arrive at that? One man working on the safe, another man looking out. Possibly two. The point is, the more men who are involved, the harder it'll be for them to take the jewelry, break it down, sell it, and stay out of sight. They're going to get away with it? I didn't say that. Well, nothing seems to have gone wrong with their plan so far. One thing went wrong. That special patrolman surprised them. True, he didn't have time to draw his gun or sound the alarm, but they had to shoot him. And if something hadn't gone wrong, they'd have been satisfied to knock him on the head. Uh, yes. Well, what happens now? Well, that's up to the police. I can tell you their investigation will take some time. Burglary is the toughest kind of thing to work on. Why? No witnesses. Ah, uh, I never thought of that. All are you all cleaned up? Well, we got a tentative list. As soon as I check it, I'll give it to you. Okay. Mr. Templeton, I'd like to have you come with me now. Now? Yes, we'll want your statement, sir, and there's quite a bit of work to do with the employees. Uh, all right. Dollar, as soon as you get the list up, give me a ring, will you? Yeah, okay. Uh, any news about the policeman? Yeah. It's a murder case now. Expense account item three, twenty-five dollars Stenographic fees. The public stenographer at the hotel helped me make a comprehensive list of the stolen items, which was verified by Templeton. The amount of loss was set at $100,000. By late afternoon, clerks, stenographers, accountants, designers, salespeople, stonecutters, all in Templeton's employ had made statements to Lieutenant Roebuck. The statements were in the process of being checked. A general roundup of known safe crackers and burglary suspects had begun. Expense account item four, $3.75 dinner. Lieutenant Roebuck and myself. Well, it's going to be a long night. Yeah. Any luck on the employees? Well, that's hard to say yet. One of them has a record. Hmm? Yeah, a fellow named Tabor. One of the janitors there. He's a two-time loser. I had him tucked away in a cell until we clear some of this other stuff away. Has he said anything? Oh, he denies all knowledge. As far as time incident goes, he was home sleeping when all this happened, but that doesn't rule him out of... Somehow getting that safe combination and passing it on to a friend. Yeah. Man with the records apt to have that kind of friends would be interested in just that kind of thing. Hey, uh, how much do you want me around? You're a free agent, darling. If you have any ideas, I'll listen. It's a tough baby, any way you look at it. Let me talk to Tabor. There might be a shortcut. Why not? Well, John Tabor? That's right. Who are you? Johnny Dollar. I'd like to talk to you a minute. Okay, talk. You might be in a lot of trouble, Tabor. That'd be too bad. They tell me you're a two-time loser. If you don't believe what they tell you, you just go look it up for yourself. It's right down there in the books. How did you get that job at Templeton's? I asked for it. They know about your record? No. You keep it from them? I didn't broadcast it, would you? No. Okay, what other dumb questions have you got? Do you have any ideas about this? I've got a lot of ideas. Do you know anything about it? No. Need anything? What? Cigarettes, anything? I'm all set. Okay. My company faces a big loss in this case. We'd like to avoid that loss. There's a standard offer I'm authorized to make in some instances. I'm going to make it to you all. If you have any knowledge of this crime and can furnish any information that will lead to the arrest of the persons involved and recovery of the merchandise, my company will guarantee you the best possible legal assistance in the event that information should incriminate you. That's pretty generous. Well, I have to say it to you. You can use your own judgment. Hey, guy. It's a pretty good offer when you think about it, Tabor. You have a record. The police can't pass you up without a lot of scrutiny. You know that. That record makes me a real hot one. I swiped a couple of cars, and now they think I might have opened that vault. No, they don't think that. But they have to find out if you might have contact with somebody who did open it. I don't know anything about it. 
That case should be released. Oh, sure. Sure, I'll be released when every cop in town had a go at me twice. I'll be released when the guys who did the job walk into the station and say we didn't mean it, we want to give it back. They've always got to have somebody to throw to the newspapers. Maybe. You know it and I know it. Nothing better than to throw some old ex-con in a can and hold him for questioning. Well, darling, you go for it? No. Any more ideas? Turn him loose, Lieutenant. See whom he talks to and whom he meets. John Tabor was released without bail and a 24-hour watch was put on his residence. By 10 o'clock the next morning, the police had located three witnesses to the shots that had killed the special patrolman. However, none of them had seen the burglars or the car that was used. The district attorney's office issued an order impounding the financial records of Templeton House. A complete audit revealed that its affairs were in excellent shape. It also revealed that Templeton himself was the only man in the jewelry firm who had the combination to the vaults. His statements emphatically denied giving the combination to anyone. As far as the police were able to determine, he was telling the truth. The search for all known safe crackers extended into New York and Philadelphia and Chicago. On the morning of the third day, a claims adjuster arrived from Hartford with a check for $100,000, full payment on the claim. Two hours later, we had the first break on the case. Hey! Caller, hey! What? Oh! Hello, Lieutenant. Come on, get in. What's up? Well, the Harvard Division found a body down by the docks early this morning. All weighted down with 38 slugs. They were fired from the same gun that killed that special patrolman. They match, huh? Like the dimples on your knee. Two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in just a moment. It is a rare event when a young man decides to leave civilization behind and hide himself away in the steaming jungle, just so he can help his fellow humans in a remote corner of the world. The late Dr. Tom Dooley did just that when he left the United States to help the sick and starving jungle people in the little kingdom of Laos in Southeast Asia. Dr. Dooley's story is well known to nearly everyone. And all over the world, people talk of his little jungle hospital on stilts. That's where he treated the dread diseases of the jungle and trained native medical technicians so that they might help their own people. Dr. Dooley wrote and lectured to many people so that the work of his medical assistance program, Medico, might go on. It was not easy for someone so young and so talented to give up the bright lights of the city and plant himself down in an unknown jungle just for the purpose of helping unfortunate people he didn't even know. But through Medico, Dr. Tom Dooley wanted to help people. They wanted to help people to help themselves. Today, the work of Medico is going forward in a number of countries besides Laos. Young men are being sent to the United States to be schooled in medicine with the idea of returning to their own countries to help their own people. Hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of medical supplies have been donated by American businessmen and pharmaceutical companies. Today, Dr. Tom Dooley's work is being continued for him. It is helping to create better understanding. It is... An injection of the spirit of freedom. The right of all men everywhere. Now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Templeton Matter. I spent the rest of the day with Lieutenant Roebuck at the morgue. The body that had been found in the harbor was a man about 35 to 40 years old. Slim Bill, dark hair. The labels had been cut out of his clothes and the laundry marks torn off. His fingerprints didn't check with anything in the local files. Roebuck put them on the wire to Washington and requested an urgent identification. Johnny Dollar. Blood Barlow, 
Look, Johnny, what's this in the paper? Well, the special patrolman and the unidentified man were killed by the same gun. As soon as we get an identification, we can go to work. Well, how about that ex-con that turned up working at Templeton's? Tabor? Well, they're still watching him. He might have been the case, man. So far, it's just an idea. I'd like a recovery on this one, Johnny. So would I. What do you think is possible? Well, two days ago, I would have said no. Today, things look better. For one thing, none of the merchandise has shown up on the market. For another thing, there'll be, there has to be, some kind of connection with this unidentified man. I just read your report on Templeton himself. He's out of the question as a suspect? So far, yeah. He's the only one who had the combination to the safe. There's no apparent motive for him to rob himself. But he's the only Don't one who Don't start had... yelling at me, Lud. I know what you're thinking. Find a motive. Well, give us time, boy. Give us time on everything. Lud? Oh, I guess I hate to pay off big claims. <laughs> You may get it back. Keep your pants on. Expense account item five, fifty dollars deposit for rented car. That afternoon, I drove from Boston to Creeksdale, the home of the Grantland Safe Company, where I met a man who looked as formidable as the product he manufactured. I am Grantland's. Uh... I found him standing inside a shiny new vault, ready for shipment. Beautiful thing, eh? On its way to South America tonight. Well, I... I never thought of a safe exactly that way, Mr. Grant. Ah, beauty, strength. Think for a moment, sir, the treasures it will someday hold. But I bore you, sir, with my enthusiasm. Now then, you say you are here on a matter of vaults? One vault, Mr. Grantlin. No. The one your company sold and installed at the Templeton House in Boston 17 years ago. Yes. Have you read about the burglary? No, sir, I have not. Mm. Templeton House. Yes, the vault was opened. Blasted? Opened. Someone had a combination. I am bewildered, sir. Indeed I am. You want a thorough accounting for my organization, of course. Well, that's up to the police, Mr. Grantland. Right now, for my own information, I wonder if you could tell me who might have the combination to that vault. Well, in answer to your question, I would first have to inspect our records. I brought the serial numbers. Oh, well, let me see. Um, mm-hmm. That's as good as... Uh, the K series, Mr. Keating set the final combination. Mr. Keating? Yes, my chief engineer for years. And who else? Uh, myself, sir. I'd have a record of the combination in my own file. And who are those available to? Myself, sir. I keep them in my own vault. I see. Anyone else? No one here. The people in proper authority at Templeton. I'd like to meet Mr. Keating if I could. Impossible, Mr. Dollar. Why? Mr. Keating has been dead these six years. I drove back to Boston, phoned Roebuck, and told him about my interview with Grantland. He said he'd already started looking into Grantland's background and expected to have a report within 36 hours. I was a little surprised when Dorian Tevelin called half an hour later and asked me to have lunch with him. Would you like a drink? No, not now, guys, no. I didn't know whether to call you or the police, Mr. Dollar. I finally decided on you. Uh Uh-huh. What's the matter? Well, it's one of those strange things. Uh, I'm not a particularly observant man, and I don't know why I observe this. Go on. However, last night, Mrs. Templeton and I went to a dinner dance at the country club. We thought with all this business, a little relaxation should do me some good. Yeah, sure. There was a young girl at the table next to ours, a very pretty girl whom I've never seen before. I happened to notice her handbag, jeweled affair, quite expensive. One of our items. Yeah? It didn't occur to me until we were leaving that it had been sampled stock, not for sale. What do you mean? It was stolen, Mr. Dollar. Why not the police, Mr. Templeton? I was going to call them first thing this morning and report it. And then I got a package in the mail. It was the handbag, intact. Crazy? You said it. Did you happen to get the name of the girl? I asked the meta D. He said her name was Helen Tabor. That's not so crazy. Expense account item six, ten cents, one phone call. To Lieutenant Roebuck to see if John Tabor was still being watched. Roebuck said that two men were on duty watching his house at all times. I saw them when I drove up an hour later. They were parked across the street. (laughs) 
Yes. Miss Tabor? Yes, who are you? Johnny Dollar. Is your father in? Oh, he's sleeping right now. May I help you? I don't know. Didn't I see you at the country club last night? Why, yes, were you there? Couldn't keep my eyes off of you. Or your handbag. Oh. I'll talk to him, honey. Dad, is anything wrong? Nothing I can handle. Go ahead, fix up a pot of coffee. All right, Dad. Nice girl, Tabor. Yeah. Templeton was at the country club last night. He saw her. You can talk to me or you can talk to the police. I don't have to talk to anybody. The way it looks is that you cased the job. You might even have killed a special patrolman. He was shot close range. Could have been somebody new and trusted. You've got your share of things. That handbag was part of it. A little part of it. The way it looks, huh? Yeah, that's about it. Of course, I don't understand why you sent the handbag back, but then you've probably got a good story for that. Oh, I've got a good story. Nobody will believe it, but I've got a good one. It starts off by me saying I didn't help in that heist. I had nothing to do with it. I didn't case the place for anybody. I didn't even know it was coming off. Let's get to the handbag. I took that two days ago. I borrowed it. I've been borrowing stuff right along whenever my kid needed anything. I always come back in good shape. I told her they... They let me do it. She don't know anything. Borrowed, huh? That's kind of a strange philosophy. I don't even know how to spell the word. I do know my kid's got a life ahead of her. I gotta give her every chance to look good, act good, use her brains, meet the right people. Not just because the right people have money, but because they know more right people. It takes a it takes a little extra to let her do things like that. You let her use the handbag because she had a date to go to a dance. Uh, you guys are all the same. I didn't expect you to believe it. Oh, relax. Maybe I do believe you. What? It sounds nutty enough to be the truth. It is the truth. All right. You're taking me in? I'm going to tell Roebuck about this. He'll probably want to talk to you. He can check it better than I can. Now, I haven't any authority to take you in. I wouldn't take you in anyhow. I'm interested in guys who walk into vaults. See you around. Hey, wait a minute. What? I never thought I'd see the day when I try to help a cop or anybody like a cop. Maybe this is the day. I, um, I saw the paper last night. Oh, huh? The picture of that guy they found floating in the harbor. They tagged him yet? He's a John Doe until we hear from Washington. His name's Kylie. Billy Kylie. How do you know? I used to know him a long time ago. Billy Kylie? Yeah, from Philadelphia. Thanks. A check with the Philadelphia police and a comparison of fingerprints identified the man as William H. Kiley. His Boston address was on Parker Street. I drove out there with Lieutenant Roebuck. It was an ordinary, undistinguished apartment house. No one answered at apartment 12A, so we let ourselves in. The room had nothing to offer in the way of evidence. Well, did you find anything? No. Now I'll ask some men come out here and give it a good going over. Well, maybe the manager or the tennis list, something that'll help us. Come on, let's go. Yeah. Be careful, though. Yeah. Yeah. Tim? Yeah, this is Tim. Any trouble there? A little. Say that again. A little. I don't know who you are, but I know you're not Tim. Well, it sounds like we're getting something. Here, let me have the phone. See if I can trace it. Don't bother. I know where we can find him. What? I'd recognize his voice anywhere. It was dark by the time we got to the Grantland Safe Company factory in Creekstale. There was a single work light spreading a sickly yellow glow over the main floor loading platform. We were expected. It went off somewhere in the darkness of the building. You okay? Yeah, I'm okay. All right, let's try for that stair rating. Right here. See the flashes? There. All right. We'll have to try. Mr. Make it. Dollar. He did your alone. Answer him. Yeah. What are you doing here? Looking for $100,000 worth of jewelry and the answer to a couple of murders. <laughs> Funny? <laughs> You're very foolhardy. 
But you're courageous. A man of your perception could do well with a part of that money. No, thanks. I'll take it all. You will take nothing, sir. Keep him talking. I'll try to get under the stairs. Are you alone? For a little while. But I've got people coming, though. People, eh? (laughs) Mr. Dollar? Still alive and kicking, Mr. Grantlin. You can't shoot around corners. No. (laughs) But then I don't have to shoot around the corner. Grandland, I want a statement. No, no. No statement. No statement. He was dead before the ambulance arrived. And there was no statement. There was never a statement. As nearly as it could be pieced together, Grandland himself opened the vaults at Templeton House. William Kiley and possibly a man named Tim helped him. Kylie, of course, was killed for his efforts. Tim never appeared, was never identified. My hotel bill ran up to $168. That's item seven. Item eight, $35, car rental. I got $50 deposit back. Item nine, $32 and a half, airfare and incidentals back to Hartford. Expense account total, $413.28. Remarks? Put that against $100,000 the insurance company didn't have to pay off. Danny Dollar. There's a fire low. I just talked to Roebuck in Boston. There's not one scrap of that jewelry anywhere in that whole safe factory. Not one piece. I know. What? Just about now, there's a safe at the port of New York being shipped to South America. It's a Grantland safe. And if you hurry over there, you can... (laughs) Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Johnny Dollar has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Deller. Where have you been for the past 20 minutes? In the shower. For 20 minutes? Okay, so I'm a shiny dollar. So you're... Who's that? Max. Max Green of Assured Equity. Oh, hi, Max. What's on your mind? Four score and seven years ago... Our father's brought forth, but that doesn't answer my question. Johnny, you ever hear of the Meeks? Uh... New England family, stood away in the Mayflower, speak only to their money? That's the Meeks. What about them? No, not about them. It's about Mariah Meek and Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. She's lost her copy of it. Well, it shouldn't be hard to find her another one. That's where you're wrong, Johnny. Huh? It would be very hard. Might cost us $100,000. Bob Bailey. In the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar.
Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To the Assured Equity and Trust Company, 325 Scott Avenue, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Meek Memorial matter. Expense account item one, $1.90. Cab from my apartment of Max Green's office. He was standing in a haze of cigar smoke, ashes on his vest, and a worried look on his face. Oh, good morning, good morning, Johnny. Oh, you want a cigar? Oh, no, no, thanks. Then sit up, sir. Excuse me. Listen, Johnny, what do you know about that speech that Lincoln made at Gettysburg? Well, I had to memorize it in school like every other kid. All right, you know how many words are in it? Um, maybe a couple of hundred. Why? Wait a minute, it's in this book. Here, yeah. it's page 143. Speech is printed here exactly as Mr. Lincoln released it to the newspapers after the Gettysburg Address. You find it? Yeah, but now what do you... Okay, total number of words, 268. Oh. But the first two drafts of that speech, including the one he read that day... Contained only 266 words. So he padded his part. That's right. Two more words. Mm -hmm. How come? Oh, according to the historians, Lincoln had lived the two additional words at the time he read it. Later on, when he made three new copies of the speech, he included those two words. You with me so far? Keep going, Max. Yes. All right. Right down at the end of it, just before Of the People, By the People, where he said that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, hmm? the words under God do not appear in the first two drafts he wrote. Yeah. Well, this is all very interesting, Max, but I still don't see what it is or what it has to do with me. Well, Mariah Meek's copy has disappeared. Oh. And Johnny, that copy happens to contain just 266 words. You mean she owns one of the first two original drafts? Handwritten by Mr. Lincoln himself while he was on the train riding to Gettysburg. Wow. Yeah. Which is, of course, why we insured it for the full amount it cost her. Which is one hundred thousand dollars, even. Of course, you made sure it was authentic before you issued the policy. Oh, policies. naturally. Well, who'd she buy it from? An antique dealer down in Richmond, Virginia, a fellow named uh, Jason Penrod. Uh huh. Well, where's she been keeping it? Under glass in the Meek Memorial. What's that? Well, she collects Americana, so she had a museum built to keep it in, and she calls it the Meek Memorial. Follows. Follows. Also follows the most expensive item in the collection, the Gettysburg Address, would be the one to disappear. Oh, you're just an old pessimist, Max. You think somebody lifted it? What do you think? It walked out by itself. Okay, okay. So what are you going to do about it? Well, we're going to run newspaper ads. We're going to offer a $10,000 reward for information leading to its return. If anyone answers it, you let me know where you'll be and I'll refer them to you. Good. When was it taken? The night before last. Is there any kind of market for something that rare? Uh... Hard to say, Johnny. A hot camera would be easier to peddle. Sure. But a good many wealthy people, like Mrs. Meek, they make a hobby of collecting things, you know, antiques, objects of art, etching. But whoever took this or buys it from the thief couldn't just let everybody see it. Well, it wouldn't matter to some people. They take it and put it in a vault and keep it there. Then what's the point in having it around? Pride of possession. You've got something no other collector could own. Mm. And, of course, it might not have really disappeared at all. You're thinking of fraud? A hundred grand is a lot of cash. Expense account item two, one dollar and ninety cents, cab fare back to my apartment. I wasn't particularly intrigued by this assignment. Rare documents, like anything else antique, have always seemed to be just one step from decay. And that sometimes goes for the people who collect such things. Item three, sixteen dollars and ten cents, transportation, including a round trip ticket, Hartford to New Bedford, and cab fare to the Whalers Hotel. There was a convention in town, so I was lucky to get a room. After checking in, I called the Meek residence. Mrs. Meek was expecting me and said she'd have her car pick me up. I had just put down the phone when someone knocked on the door. You in there? Depends on what you're looking for. I'm well, looking for Mr. Mr. J. Jay, did you say? Nobody by that name here. Oh, yeah. I, I see. I, I, I guess I got the wrong room. Yeah, well, uh, why don't you ask down at the desk? Huh? Yeah, yeah. Oh, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. Huh. Funny. Or is it? I cracked the door open again. Watched him walk to the stairs. Then I took the elevator down the eight flights to the lobby. Half an hour later, I was in the backseat of the Meek limousine, heading toward the home out on Buzzards Bay. 
It was a big, sprawling frame building facing on the beach. About 50 yards behind it, closer to the road, was the Meek Memorial Museum. I was starting up the front steps when the door opened. Mr. Dollar? Ah, that's right. I'm Paul Meek. I understand you have an appointment with my grandmother. Right again. Now come in, please. He's waiting for you upstairs in the sitting room. Okay, thanks. Uh, before you go up, I wonder if I could have a few words with you. Why not? Stay in here, then. You've never met my grandmother, have you? No, no, I haven't had that pleasure. Some people consider it a dubious one, Mr. Dollar. Oh. Uh, Mr. Dollar, this is my wife, Janice. This is me. Hi. How about a drink? Uh, thanks, not just now. How about you, old stick in the mud? You want another one? After a bit, Janice. And if I were you, I wouldn't have any more. But you're not me, are you? You will have to excuse my wife, Mr. Dollar. She, well, we've both been under a severe strain since moving here. Grandmother is blind, you know. No, I didn't know. Her sight began failing about four years ago. I'm surprised the insurance agent didn't tell you. Well, Mr. Green was so concerned over the theft of the Lincoln manuscript, I, I imagine it slipped his mind. Mm-hmm. And just how do you intend to locate that manuscript? I'm not so sure that I can. It would be a pity if you could be just awful. It's grandmother's prized possession. She hasn't been herself since it was stolen. And being quite elderly, well, we're all very much concerned. Oh, my, yes. We're afraid she might die and leave us all that lovely money. Janice. It's the truth. You see, Paul and I don't have any money of our own, Mr. Dollar. We'll never have any until she does die. Instead of giving it to us now while we're young, you know what she does with it? Spends it buying junk for that silly old museum. Now, look. That's yeah. gratitude, isn't it? I bathe her feet or rub her feet and do all her dirty work. Janice, you've said quite enough. Mr. Dollar isn't interested in our personal problems. Oh, stick in the mud. All right. I'll be in the den if you want me. And that's the funniest thing I've said all day. If you want me. I'm sorry. She doesn't mean half of what she says. Uh, oh, that's grandmother's signal. Then hadn't we better go up? Yes. Yes, we'd better. We went up the broad staircase, through a hall, and into a bright, sunny room. Wrapped in an old kimono and shawl, Martha Meek sat in an invalid chair, facing the ocean. Paul introduced us, then sat down quietly near the door. Paul? Paul, I know you're there. Now answer me. Yes, Grandmother. You go on downstairs. I want to talk with Mr. Dollar in private. Whatever you say. And close that door. Don't mind my back, Mr. Dollar. I couldn't see you if I looked into your face. Now then, when are you going to arrest that crook and bring my Lincoln speech back to me? Well, I, I'm going to need a lot of help and information, Mrs. Meek. Mm-hmm. What kind of information? Mostly about the museum. Like what? Well, do you know who was in there the night the manuscript disappeared? Certainly. That dirty robber was. Anyone else? Well, old Pete's always there. Supposed to be guarding the place, but he didn't do a very good job the other night. Got himself slugged. Does he live on the grounds? Yes. I brought him over from Naples ten years ago. He was my guide in Italy. Showed me around so nice I decided to bring him back. Tell me, is the memorial open to the public? It was going to be. I intended it to be once. That when my eyes... No, Mr. Dollar, I keep it locked most of the time. Uh -huh. And who discovered the manuscript was missing? Pete did, I guess. At least when he recovered, he ran yelling bloody murder up here to the house. Everybody went down to see what had happened. Everybody but me. They left me all to myself. Were there any strangers here in the house that night, Mrs. Meek? Anyone besides the servants and your grandson and his wife? One person, but he's no stranger. Who's that? Jason Penrod from Richmond. He's an art dealer. We were discussing some business. May I, uh, ask what kind of business? Uh, it has nothing to do with you or the people you work for. Sorry. Where can I find Mr. Penrod? Uh, he's staying here now. If he isn't in his room, then he's most likely out in the memorial. Now, that's enough questions. You, give me a cigarette. Ma'am? What's the matter, you deaf? Give me a cigarette for Paul or that snoopy wife of his comes prowling around. <laughs> All right, sure. Light me. Yeah. <sighs> well, you want any more information? Pete's the one to talk to. All right, thanks. 
Well, what about your son and daughter-in-law? Were they inside the house at the time of the robbery? You don't suspect them, do you? Right now, I suspect everybody, Mrs. Meek. Even me? Yes, ma'am. Even you. Well, bless you, boy. I found Pete Vesuvio trimming the shrubbery just outside the memorial building. He seemed quite willing to talk to me. Uh, how you say what happened to me, mister? I'm uh, hit out? <laughs> Knocked out, Pete. Ah, see, si, senor. And because of this, I do not see anything. Nothing at all, huh? Please, mister, do not use the insult. I am American citizen, first papers. And because of the kindness of my patron, I will soon be second papers. I know by heart the Constitution, United States, Gettysburg address, pledge allegiance to my flag. Yeah. You know how I know that these things which help me be citizen? Because of my lady, she's letting me work in a place where great papers are for me to read. Because of her, I would not hide anything, mister. Okay, Pete, okay. I'm convinced. But I'm sorry I cannot help you, mister. Well, it's not your fault. Hey, you like to hear me say Gettysburg address. Well, Do it very good. Learn it right from President's own writing. Some other time, Pete. Right now, I have to find Mr. Penrod. Oh, uh, he's inside, mister. Counting the treasures. All of the beautiful things a lady can no longer see. You'll find him in a Section L, senor. <laughs> I found the small, neat-appearing art dealer just where Pete had said he'd be, peering into a glass case crowded with Derringer pistols. He had a notebook under his arm and seemed to be making some sort of inventory. Hey, oh, oh, dear. You, you gave me quite a fright, sir. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, I uh, wish I could concentrate like that. Oh, well, there's nothing more interesting to me than these fine old pistol things. <laughs> what history they must have, Mr. Uh, Dollar. Johnny Dollar. Oh, yes, the insurance investigator. Paul told me you were wondering about the place. I, I suppose you'd like to ask me some questions, no? If you don't mind. Oh, no, goodness, no. I understand you were with Mrs. Meek the night of the robbery. Uh, that is correct, sir. We heard the shouting. We ran out here just as fast as we could. I was the one who discovered the manuscript was missing. You have any idea how the thief got in here? No, sir, no, no. Unless someone forgot to lock the front door, or unless he had a key. <laughs> Well, has Mrs. Meek given out many of the keys? Well, in my opinion, too many. <laughs> Even I have one. What about Paul Meek and his wife? No, I don't think so. Well, they, they really aren't interested in the museum at all, Mr. Dollar. Oh. Yeah. Mr. Penrod, I understand you're quite an authority on antique art and things like that. Well, I... Uh... Isn't taking inventory a little beneath your position? Well, I suppose it is, Mr. Dollar. Uh, last week, when I received dear Mariah's wire asking me to do it, I, I simply couldn't refuse it. She's been such a good customer of mine. Will she? Yes. You have any idea who might have wanted the Lincoln manuscript? Well, I know several persons who'd love to have it. He'd give most anything, but I don't know anyone with uh, the nerve to break in here and take it by force. You remember where Paul Meek and his wife were when you heard Pete shouting? They were right in here when I arrived. I see. Well, thanks for... Oh, just one more thing. Oh, yes? If you'd stolen the manuscript... Mr. Darlow... A hypothetical question, Mr. Penrod. But if you had, and you wanted to sell it at a good price with the least danger of being caught, how would you go about it? Well, I, I, I take it abroad, of course. I put it on the open market over there. Huh. You aren't planning on going abroad soon, are you, Mr. Penrod? Oh, gracious, no. <laughs> you know anyone who is? Anyone who, uh... Who well, didn't Paul and Janice tell you? Oh, they're flying to Paris Wednesday night. I left the memorial and walked back to the house. The Meeks were in the study, engaged in their favorite pastime. When I told them what the art dealer had said, Paul set down his glass long enough to confirm the fact that they did have reservations and insisted that he had a logical explanation for not having told me of those plans earlier. Very logical explanation, Mr. Dollar. Let me handle this, Janice, please. Sure. Drink, Johnny? No, first I want to hear that explanation, if you don't mind, Paul. Of course I don't mind. Janice and me, we're fed up. Why didn't you tell me about the plane reservations? Well, why should I have? I'm not even sure I'm going to use them. Oh? Grandmother's upset enough over losing that manuscript. Something else might... Well, anyhow, if the manuscript doesn't turn up within 48 hours, we're canceling our trip. Oh, no, please. Sorry, Janice, but that's the way it's got to be. She did it. What do you mean? It's an act, don't you see? 
Mistress and Penrod told her we were going to leave, so she had him hide the manuscript. And now this thing about her being so upset and having such a weak heart. It's an act to keep her precious darling boy tied to her apron string. I don't believe that. Well, just wait. You will. Anything else, Dollar? What does a trip to Paris cost, Paul? Well, it's not inexpensive. Your wife was complaining about being so broke. Haven't you ever heard of flying now and paying later? We have friends in Paris, Dollar. It won't cost as much to live once we get there. We'll worry about paying for our ticket when we get back. Any other questions, Mr. Snooper? Yeah. Later. It was after seven when I finally got back to my hotel room. I ordered a drink and tried to make some kind of sense out of the information I'd gathered during the day. But it all added up to zero. I called Hartford and asked Max Green to look into the meek finances. Then I dressed for dinner. I was about to go downstairs when the phone rang. Johnny Dollar. Mr. Dollar, I was told to call you. Yeah? It's about the ad. The ad? In tonight's paper about something missing from a certain memorial. Go on. Well, I called Hartford. Collect. They said to call you. Yeah, that's right. Who is this? Now, my name's not important, Dollar, but that ten grand reward is. You think you can earn it? You meet me tonight, you'll see. Where? In the alley behind the Bourne Whaling Museum. Be there at 9.30 and be alone. You got it? Yeah, I got it. Expense account item four, 85 cents cab fare from my hotel to the Bourne Whaling Museum. I don't like wandering around dark alleys at night, alone in a strange town. It isn't the best way to stay alive. But at 9.29, I passed the old whaling museum and started down the alley. It was dark, no moon, and it was very quiet. I was about 20 yards in from the street when I saw him, curled up in a ball like he had a stomach ache. Only he didn't. Because somebody had made him very dead. I struck a match and turned him over. I'd only seen him once before, but I didn't have any trouble remembering where it had been. Right after I'd checked in, he'd knocked on my hotel room door. By mistake. At least that's what he'd said. After giving a statement to the local police who identified him, I went back to my hotel. Evening, Mr. Dollar. Yeah, say, uh, look, I know it's probably against all your rules, but uh, who had my room just before I checked in? Oh, I couldn't disclose that information, sir. Sorry. Oh, well, so am I. It'd mean a lot for me to know. Maybe even five bucks worth. Well, I... Uh... Well, sir, if it's that important... <clears throat> Thank you. Yeah, let's see. Uh, um... Yeah, yes, here it is. Uh, can you read his signature, Mr. Dollar? Yeah, thanks. Just fine. <laughs> The name I'd seen scrawled on the hotel register wasn't important now. At least not without something more to back it up. There was no law against checking out of a hotel. But there was a law against murder. If it could be proven. And that would be hard to do without finding a motive. So I went back to the Meek house to look for it. I paid off the taxi, that's item five, and started up the front steps. Oh, hi, Johnny. I thought it might be you. That's so? Mm Mm-hmm. I hope you aren't mad at me for the things I said today. No, no, not at all. I've been a very bad girl. But everything's going to be all right now. It is. Mm-hmm. Or haven't you heard? Heard what? About dear old grandmother. She had a real bad stroke. Isn't expected to live. You, uh, aren't a bit sorry, are you? Would you be, if you were me? Dollar, you mind coming up here? No, not a bit, Paul. I'm trying to reach you at your hotel. Thank goodness you've come here. Did Janice tell you? Yeah. How is she? Bad. Doctor's given up. Says it's only a matter of hours. Uh, she told me to send for you, Mr. Dollar. Oh? I don't know why. I've never been able to figure out a lot of things she did. All right, where is she? In there. Oh, Pete's with her, but go on in. Thanks. They take increased devotion to that cause for which they here gave her the last... Who is it? Oh, it's uh, Mr. Dollar, my lady. Hello, Mrs. Meach. Oh, thank you for coming, Mr. Dollar. I uh, go now. No, wait. Mr. Dollar, you have a moment, haven't you? Of course. I promised Pete the last time I visited the museum. 
I promised I'd let him recite some of the things he's learned while working there. Haven't been able to keep that promise till now. Go on, Pete. Please. Yes, my lady. They here gave the last full measure of devotion. That we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain. That this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom. And that the government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. Thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you, my lady. Now I, I go. Well, Mr. Dollar, I have a confession to make to you. Yes? I lied to you. Oh, I'm sure it wasn't a very big lie, Mrs. Meek. Oh, but it was. I told you the business Mr. Penrod and I were discussing the night of the burglary. Yes. I told you it had nothing to do with you or the people you work for, remember? Yes, ma'am. Well, it was a lie. I'm broke, Mr. Dollar. All I have left in the world is this house and the things in the memorial. I see. That's why I sent for Jason Penrod. He purchased most of my treasures for me. He's evaluating them now. So Paul and Janice will know what they're worth when they go to sell them, which they'll do immediately. Mrs. Meek, don't you think you should try to rest now? Will you give me a cigarette? No, ma'am. Sorry. And you must rest. There isn't much else to do, is there? Good night, Mr. Dollar. Outside in the hall, Paul and Janice Meek were talking quietly to Jason Penrod. Off in the corner, standing with his back to the others, was Pete Vesuvio. Mr. Dora, is she... She is resting quietly. Oh, dear God. Why did you lie to me, Pete? What? I never lied to nobody. Who say I did? I say you did. You're crazy, mister. What lie I tell you? You said you learned the Gettysburg Address right from Mr. Lincoln's own writing in the museum. That's a no lie. What's the matter? You don't believe that, mister. I believe you, Pete. But I just had to be sure. Come on, let's join the others, shall we? Si. Well, good evening, Mr. Dollar. Mr. Penrod. Tell you any of the family secrets, Johnny? Not too many. You learn anything in there you didn't know before? Yeah. I know which one of you stole the Lincoln Manuscript. One of us? Why, you're crazy, Dollar. We were all in the house at the time it happened. That's right. But one of you hired a little man named Leo Jones to do your dirty work. Jones called me earlier this evening. He was going to tell me which one of you it was. Evidently, he didn't like the deal he was getting. What was he doing, Penrod, trying to blackmail you? What are you talking about? I don't know any Leo Jones. Then why did he come around to my hotel room this morning? The same room you just checked out of. Well, that doesn't mean a thing. I imagine several persons have been to that room today. Sure, but they're still alive. Now, let's get to the phony Lincoln manuscript. Phony manuscript? It wasn't phony, Mr. Dollar. Wasn't it? Well, you correct me if I'm wrong, Penrod. After Mrs. Meek purchased one of the first two drafts of Mr. Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, she started losing her sight. When she closed the museum to the public, you saw a chance to make yourself another $100,000 sale. So you switched copies of the manuscript, replacing that draft with one containing the words, Under God, which isn't worth anything close to a hundred grand. What do you mean, Dollar? All right, let me quote. That this nation, under God, shall have a new birth of freedom, and so on. What? The phrase, under God, was not in the manuscript he sold your grandmother, but it was in the copy old Pete has been studying in the museum. Right, Mr. Penrod? All of you, stay right where you are. You'll get what Jones got. Mr. Dollar. He won't go far, Pete. But I am the guard. The lady will want me to stop him. Pete, come back here. Keep away from me. Pete! Come on. Oh. You, uh, you tell the lady. I am a better guard now. Much better. See, si, senor. Yes, Pete. I did the good. You did fine. Pete Vesuvio will live to apply for his second papers. <laughs> and in time, probably open a spaghetti joint in New Bedford. 
Penrod will be tried for murder. As yet, he hasn't disclosed the name of the person who purchased the stolen manuscript. But on time, I am sure he will. As for the Meeks, well, Mariah passed on later that night. But as she said, there was nothing left for her but to rest. Expense account total, including hotel and numerous incidentals, $98.30. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Johnny Dollar has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Dave Lawler, Johnny, over at Surety Mutual and Trust Company. Oh, hi, Dave. Long time. Yeah, I know. Listen, do you own a pair of dark sunglasses and some real loud sports shirts? Mine are so loud I have to keep them in a soundproof drawer. Great. But where you'll be at this time tomorrow, nobody will give them a second look. Oh, like where? Well, according to the travel folders, it's, quote, the land where the summer spends the winter, unquote. In other words... Palm Springs, California. Dave, you're on. Good. But don't forget, this can be pretty expensive for your company. Oh, more than you know, Johnny. 75,000 hard cash. Ah, we. Unless you're able to prove the bracelet Dan Galloway gave to his child bride wasn't really stolen. For a trip to Palm Springs at this time of year, I think I could prove anything. <laughs> Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To the Home Office, Surety Mutual and Trust Company, Franklin Building, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the suntan oil matter. (laughs) Expense account item one, $197.40. Airline fare and incidentals, Hartford to Palm Springs, California. I registered at La Casa de Paz on South Palm Canyon Drive, changed into casual clothes, and sauntered over to police headquarters. Detective Sergeant Lacey was about to leave for lunch, so I went along with him. Yeah, Dollar, you'd be surprised at how much stuff is lost in this town during the course of just one season. 
The report we got says it was stolen, Sergeant. Oh, sure, sure. But I doubt it. A $75,000 bracelet, just five days old? That'd be a little careless of the lady, wouldn't it? Well, if you were married to one of the biggest wildcatters in the oil business, maybe you could afford to be careless. What about Dan Galloway? Didn't you say he was drilling somewhere around here? About 80 miles south in the middle of the desert down by Salton Sea. Salton Sea. Oh, that's really a big inland lake that lies way down below sea level, isn't it? Want to bring me a check, Dottie? 245 feet below sea level, Dollar. There's oil there? Dan Galloway figures it this way. One of the most successful new fields that's been worked in years is deep under the Gulf of Mexico off the coast of Louisiana. There are a lot of salt domes down there, and underneath them are big pools of oil, millions of barrels. So, why not under the Salton Sea, which is all salt deposits? Who knows? Maybe he has something. Anybody else drilling down there? Uh, just Galloway. Who else needs it? I mean, any more than he does. Well, does he? All yours, Daddy. How would I know if Galloway needs it? But there has been talk around, you know. But if he's hard up, how could he afford that fancy bracelet last week? Yeah, or the uh, snazzy Italian sports car the week before that. I don't know either, Dollar. What about his wife? Oh, 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 that Roberta. What a doll. And in 3D, if you know what I mean, how an old coot like him could ever latch onto a pretty little chick like her? I take it Roberta's somewhat younger than her husband. Oh, not more than 35, 40 years. Oh, I see. How long have they been married? Mm, two, maybe three years. Uh, down in Dallas, I think it was. She's a Texas girl. Well, is it working out? I mean, are they happy? There's talk about that, too. What kind of talk? Oh, it's really just small-town gossip for the most part. Uh, ever hear of Sonny Wyman? Wyman? No. Well, Sonny's around Roberta's age. One of those kids who came up from nothing, but all the time knew exactly where he was going. You know, made a point of meeting the right people, shaking the right hands. Real nice kid, too. Ah, uh, what's he do? Well, uh, when the season's over here, he works Pasadena, Beverly Hills, and L.A. Always has something that'll intrigue his wealthy friends. Uh, this season, it's Italian sports cars. Uh, Cosmo Romas, I think they are. And he's the one who sold the Galloways theirs, huh? Uh, he sold Roberta hers. Any angle there in connection with the bracelet? Hmm? There is. You let me know. Well, if there isn't, what have you been working up to? Well, actually, nothing. You see, I still believe it was lost. Expense account item two, $35 for rental of a drive-your-own car. I found the Galloway place about two miles out north and east of town. As I parked in the broad U-shaped driveway, I noticed a low, shiny, suntan color sports car standing in the shade of a date palm back by the garage. I started over to take a look at it. With the front door of the house open, a Filipino boy appeared, took my name, and showed me into the living room. Through the solid wall of picture windows, I could see that the whole place was built around a kidney-shaped swimming pool. Huh. Mighty inviting. And so was Roberta, Mrs. Galloway, when she stepped into the room a minute or two later. Hi there, Mr. Dollar. My, it's nice of you to come all the way out here. Yeah, Sergeant Lacey was right. Roberta was a living doll. Twenty-two or three, trim, petite, and with a figure that... Well, let's not go into that. She said it would be more comfortable out on the lanai beside the pool. I just wish there was something I could tell you about that bracelet that'd help you find it, Mr. Dollar, but... Well, just must have been stolen. Well, it makes no difference insofar as your claim is concerned, Mrs. Galloway. The company will still have to pay up, you know, unless, of course, it's found. Oh, I know that. How do you go about your investigation? I mean, uh, do you offer a reward or something? Uh, usually, yes. Uh, of course, it depends on... How much have they offered for my bracelet? Well, frankly, I haven't checked on that yet. But now, Mrs. How Galloway... How much would you guess, Johnny? Well, claim this size, probably somewhere between 10 and 30 percent. The... What's the matter, Johnny? Your ear's out a mile. Uh, nothing. I I just thought I heard... Now, that's funny. I didn't hear a thing. But I had. Quick footsteps somewhere in the house. Then a door opened and closed. Then a few seconds later, the unmistakable growl of a high-powered engine thundering out through twin straight pipes. Oh, Dad, probably some hot rod fan in the neighborhood just drove by. Aren't they She all... prattled on for another hour or so and again asked about possibilities of a reward for a bracelet. But so far as helpful information was concerned, she came up with nothing. So I excused myself and drove back to town. I wanted to talk to the driver of that sports car. 
I also wanted to check with Will Hoyt Van Hook, the jeweler who had sold the bracelet. I found his shop on Palm Canyon Drive, a small place, but very ultra-ultra. As I was about to enter the door... Hey, Mr. Dollar, got a minute? Oh, yeah, sure. Two or three minutes. And I, uh, I like your car. Mr. Wyman, isn't it? That's right. How'd you know? How'd you know mine? Yeah, real cloak and dagger stuff, huh? You, uh, you knew I was out at Berta's house, didn't you? Well, it seemed pretty obvious when I heard you hot-footed for the door and then heard this pint-sized monster of yours barrel off. Hey, you wouldn't like to buy a Cosmo Romo, would you? It's a real dilly. Oh, I'd like nothing better, but I'm out here on a job. Yeah, I know. That's what I wanted to talk to you about. Well... You know anything that'll help me? Not much, I'm afraid. But I'll be glad to tell you anything I can. You going in to see Willie? Willie? Yeah, you know, Will Hoyt Van Hook, the jeweler. I was, yeah. Why? Do you know him? Know him? I sold him one of these. One exactly like mine. And we're both going to be in the rally they're holding next Sunday. You ever see a good sports car race? Uh, No, I'm afraid not. Well, we'll soon fix that. And look, uh, after you've talked to Willie, if you want to go down to where Dan Galloway is drilling his new well, I'll be glad to give you a lift. Good idea. But I don't want to take you out of your way. Oh, not at all. I was going that way anyhow. Besides, uh, I thought it might give us a chance to talk a little. Sure, why not? Why not? With a name like Will Hoyt Van Hook, I expected... Well, I don't know what I expected. As it turned out, he was a smartly dressed chap of about 40, tall and slim, blonde hair and quick blue eyes, an alert mind. I told him why I was in Palm Springs, showed him my credentials, and he immediately offered full cooperation. No, here we are, Mr. Dollar. Here's a copy of the appraisal. A duplicate of the statement I sent Dan Galloway. And here, yes, here's a sketch of the bracelet. Ah, yeah. very good. Diamonds here, emeralds, and the mounting is yellow gold. Hand worked, all of it. Mm hmm. One thing I can't help wondering about, Mr. Van Hook. Yes? Isn't a $75,000 bracelet a bit unusual for a shop in a resort town? As a matter of fact, it is. As you can see, I specialize in rare and exclusive sort of things. But very little over, say, ten or $12,000. Then the Galloway bracelet was an exception. Yes. After Dan told me what he had in mind to give to his wife, I had some sent over from Pasadena and Los Angeles by wholesalers with whom I do business. You know, had him shipped down on consignment. He liked one, and that was that. I see. Mr. Dollar, I wouldn't want this to go any farther, of course. But after all, jewelers and insurance companies are... Well, our businesses are pretty well tied together, at least on occasion. Yes, unfortunately. But what are you getting at? I'll tell you. Two days after the bracelet was delivered, one morning, just as I was opening up, Dan came in here. So? He was ill at ease, looked worried. He said he had to have some cash quickly. He asked if I could possibly refund his money. Oh? Did you? No, because I couldn't. Things have been rather slow for me this season. Quite frankly, I'd used all I'd made on the bracelet to pay up some old bills. I told him as much, and that I was sorry, but I just couldn't help him. Did Galloway say why he had to have that much cash right away? Yes. Well? I don't know much about oil drilling, but as I understand it, his test well is down some 400 feet further than he'd planned on going. And the day before he came in here, something on his rig had broken loose and left him with a highly expensive repair job before he could proceed any further. Apparently, it was all very serious and very expensive. Strange, his wife didn't seem to be bothered. I just talked to her. Berta? (laughs) Believe me, Mr. Dollar, she wouldn't be. In fact, I doubt if she even knows. Oh? Figure it out for yourself. A man of nearly 60 who has to give bracelets and fancy cars to his wife to keep up her interest. Well, you'd hardly expect him to tell her that kind of news, now would you? No, I suppose not. Especially if he's worried about the competition. And if you ask me, he has competition. If only he could see it. Suntan and chrome Cosmo Roma was all Sonny Wyman claimed it was. It purred like a kitten performed beautifully. But I was more interested at the moment in what Sonny wanted to talk about. Johnny, I'm going to be perfectly blunt with you. I'll go along with that. Out at the house a while ago, I felt pretty foolish when you arrived and Berta insisted I hide until she could get you out on the lanai. Did she have any particular reason? Well, you see, we know that... 
Well, there's some talk going around about Bert and me. Any truth in it, Sonny? A little, I guess. You saw her. Oh, yeah? I mean, there's nothing serious between us. It's just that, well, with Dan away so much of the time, we, uh... Well, we have fun together. Yeah, sure. Now, what about the bracelet? You mean who might have stolen it? That's the general idea. I don't know. I have no idea. That, uh, sound funny to you? Should it? Well, after all, Dan and Bert are keeping their house open to everybody. People in to swim, play badminton, cocktails, barbecues. I guess half the population of Palm Springs has been there at one time or another. And even if it weren't an invited guest, why, it'd be simple for someone to just sneak in and walk off with it. Providing, of course, they knew where it was kept. Well, yeah, someone who was close enough to... Well, yeah, I, uh... I heard uh, Bert ask you about a reward for it. You think a big enough reward would turn it up? I would think so. I understand that stolen jewelry brings about uh, 20 cents on the dollar. Sometimes it brings 20 cents. Sometimes 20 years. Uh, well, yeah. Well, I uh, j- just wonder. How's the car business doing, Sonny? Oh, great, great. It's really one of the reasons I'm driving out this way. Oh, a prospect? An oil-rich Indian or a well-to-do prairie dog? <laughs> Hardly. No, I told you we were having a sports car rally on Sunday... Well, being the promoter, so to speak, I'm going down to check the course. If you're still around, you ought to come. Oh, maybe I will. Having some good events, too. Willie Van Hook and I are running a match race. He's quite a bug, you know. And ever since I sold him the twin of this job, he's been working it over. Special carburetor, racing cams, everything. And I wonder I can't afford this kind of stuff. Oh, man. You'd be amazed at the amount of, m- amount of money that changes hands. Hey, wait a minute, Sonny. Rigs. Isn't that an oil rig over there? Uh, yeah, Dan Galloway's. The rig itself is about uh, 50 feet out in the lake. The shack or office or whatever you want to call it's over the other way. You see? About a quarter of a mile beyond those Joshua trees. I'll drive you over. He did. There was an old car parked near the shack, so we figured Dan Galloway must be inside. Sonny Wyman dropped me in front of it, then took off in a cloud of dust and exhaust gas. I picked my way between the cactus plants, opened the door without knocking, and barged right in. Mr. Uh... Oh. Oh, hello. No use asking. If Mr. Galloway is here, I can see he isn't. No, he isn't. Is it all right if I wait? I'm Johnny Dollar. I'm Mrs. Galloway, Mr. Dollar. Huh? Hell, that is, I'm the first Mrs. Galloway. The former. The one who scrimped and saved while Dan was booming around every oil field all over the country trying to make his score. I'm the forgotten Mrs. Galloway. Oh, yeah. Well, I'm sorry. Are you expecting him back soon? (laughs) Who knows? I've been waiting here three hours. But I'll wait three days if I have to. Promises, that's all, promises. What do you mean, Mrs. Galloway? After working to help him the way I did for all those years, and then to be tossed over for somebody else who never did a lick of work in her life. Oh, sure. Give me anything I want if I let him free. So what have I got? Promises. Well, I, I'm sorry. But getting all upset isn't going to help. Well, wouldn't you be upset if you had more than $18,000 in back alimony coming to you? And with them living like royalty? Oh, I see. Well, he's not going to keep on getting away with it. That's why I'm here. Well, now, that gun in your handbag isn't the answer, I'm afraid. How'd you know? I've seen that kind of bulge in a handbag before. You really have ideas about using it on him? Well? Well, I... Oh, I don't know. I... There are times when I feel as though killing would be too good for him. Then there are other times when... Oh, I, I don't know. Well, here, better let me no. have it. No, leave me alone! Well, I'm not going to sit here and try to make sense with somebody as upset as you are who has a gun. Well, how would you feel? What would you do if you were me? How should I know? But killing him isn't the answer. Isn't it? Or sitting here shouting at me. Who are you anyway? What are you doing here? I came out here to see your husband, your ex-husband, on business. What kind of business? A friend drove me out here and figured Dan would drive me back. But since he isn't around, there's no point in my staying here. Or you either. Well, maybe you aren't You have a car, so you and I are driving back to Palm Springs. I'm not leaving here till I see Dan. Until I get some money from him. Or see him dead. Maybe he's at the well. All right. Maybe he is over there. Now, come on. Why I took this on, I didn't know. But I couldn't leave that slightly frantic woman sitting there, waiting, with murder in her heart. For all I knew, she'd murdered Dan already. Better inspect the gun later. The road down toward the oil rig was just a pair of ruts in desert sand. Then just as we cut in between some yucca plants and a wind-blown Joshua tree, I slammed on the brakes. <laughs> there, in the middle of the trail, lay a man's body, crushed and twisted. Dan Galloway had been carefully, repeatedly run over by a car. Uh-huh. 
Expense account item three, one dollar nineteen cents for a quick phone call to Sergeant Lacey in Palm Springs and smelling salts and a bromide for Florida, the ex Mrs. Galloway. Then I dropped her off at the Galloway house. She and Roberta ended up consoling each other while I huddled with Lacey in his office at headquarters. Some of the boys are still out there, Dollar, checking tire prints, taking pictures, and so on. No clue as to who ran Galloway down? Not yet. Looked to me as though Galloway stepped out of his own car to see whoever had pulled up in the other and was run down for his trouble. The car that did it ran around in a circle over and over him. Any suspects, Sergeant? You found his ex-wife, Flora, waiting for him in the field office, you said. That's right. And she was pretty nervous, on edge, you said. So? Also, she was carrying a gun. Whoa, whoa, now, wait a minute. Uh, Any reason why she couldn't have run him down earlier, then gone back and just waited for somebody like you to come along? Somebody with whom she could then discover the body? Only one hitch. You told me yourself, Dollar, that she was pretty insistent about your going over there to look for Gannon. Yeah, yeah, I know. But, Sergeant, you're off on the wrong foot. Why? Because of the tracks left by the killer's car. They didn't match the tires on Flora's car. You checked? I checked. And if I were you, I'd have your boys find out whose car did make those tracks. I, I'm way ahead of you. Well, if you know, then what do you... Hey, wait a second. Yeah? Levine, Sergeant. I got news for you. Hey, listen to this, Dunn. About those tire tracks at the scene of the killing. Well, right on cue. They're the, the same make and size as the tires on Sonny Wyman's Cosmo Roma. You sure? Well, I told you it's a scene. I thought it was a sports car by the small size of the circle the tracks made. Yeah. And knowing the feeling between Wyman and Galloway, I went right over to his place. Nice, clean tracks all over. And they match. You holding Wyman? Oh, well, I don't know where he is, Sergeant. He wasn't at his place, and there was no answer to the phone at his showroom. Well, then get after him. Put out a flash on him. With that car, he shouldn't be too hard to find. Let me know when he's picked up. Yes, sir. What do you think, Sergeant? You know something, Dollar? I have a notion that when we find Sonny Wyman, we'll also find out what happened to that bracelet. Yeah, could be. One thing was certain, Dan Galloway could no longer be suspect in the case. But Roberta? Why not? Maybe she did know that Dan had run out of money. Maybe that's why she was so interested in the amount of reward for the bracelet. And what about Sonny Wyman? Well, it looked bad. A smart young opportunist out for the fast buck. And of course, close to Galloway's wife. Anything he could do to hurt Galloway would help him. And now these tire tracks, the one solid clue to Galloway's killer. Sergeant Lacey and I drove out to the Galloway house. I know, Johnny. I haven't seen Sonny since he left here this afternoon. That's when you were here. He didn't call up? Why should he call up? Why shouldn't he call, Roberta, if he'd heard that Dan was killed? Now you listen here, Mr. Dollar. If you're trying to trick me into saying something about Sonny having anything to do with Dan's death, you're wasting your time. And what's more... Pardon me. Hello? Oh, yes. Just a minute. For you, Sergeant Lacey. Oh, thanks. Hello? Yes? Yes, when? Yeah, I see. Okay, Levine, thanks. Has he found Sonny Wyman? He sure has. And if you want to see him, you'll have to go to the coroner's office. What? Oh, no. Yeah, that souped-up car of his. A couple of miles out of town. Ran off a curve and over a hundred-foot bank. <laughs> Within minutes, Lacey and I were at the scene of the accident, looking things over with the help of flashlights. Yeah, he must have been really burning up the road to spin and roll this far off the highway. But surely he must have been familiar with that curve. Oh, sure. He knew these roads around here as well as anybody in the county. Tires still in one piece, too. And these sport cars usually corner pretty well. Well, this one didn't. Hey, Lacey, you look here. Yeah? This left rear fender. Looks to me like this car was sideswiped. Hey, you're right. Rolling over never make a long crease like that. Uh Uh-huh. No, wait. If another car sideswiped him, there'd be paint on this fender. Paint from the other car. Sergeant, you're absolutely right. And since there's none here... Sergeant, you're absolutely wrong. How far to the nearest filling station? What? I want to make a couple of calls to some wholesale jewelers in Pasadena and Los Angeles. Right now, in the middle of the night? Right now. Wholesale jewelers? Expense account item four eleven dollars and ninety cents. Phone calls to Pasadena and L.A. The third call yielded Mr. Alfred Mencken of Mencken Imports Incorporated, who was pretty cheerful about having been gotten out of bed. It's quite all right, Mr. Dollar. Now that I'm up, I'm wide awake almost. Well, I hate to throw something like this at you in the middle of the night, Mr. Mencken, but tell me, please. Did you ship a diamond and emerald bracelet to Will Hoyt Van Hook in Palm Springs within the past few weeks? Why, yes, Mr. Dollar. Oh, as a matter of fact, they sent him three. 
That was two weeks ago, and he returned them all. Returned them? When? Well, two of them, the day after he got them. But the third one he kept for a while. I got it back just last Thursday. Now, I don't know if that means anything to you. You bet it does. Thanks very much. Lacey and I piled into one squad car, four patrolmen in another. It was several miles out to the little ranch where Van Hook lived, and Lacey and I chewed it over as we drove along. It don't hold out on me, Johnny. Whatever made you think a Willie Van Hook is the one who drove Sonny Wyman off the road? Well, apparently there was no paint on that fender from the car that sideswiped him. Actually, there was. Holy... Of course. Van Hook's car is exactly the same color as Sonny's. Another thing. The car that ran down Galloway, like the one Sonny drove, even down to the tires, but not necessarily the same car. Plus the fact I couldn't help wondering about Van Hook all along. Yeah, but why? In a job like mine, you have to wonder about everybody connected with a case. Anything particular about Van Hook? Well, he told me that he'd use the money he got from Galloway to pay off some overdue bills. And yet, a few weeks ago, he was able to buy an $8,000 sports car. It ties up, Dollar. It all ties up. But how did Sonny Wyman figure in it? Oh, Sonny was a fellow who lived by his wits. He may have reached the same conclusion about Van Hook than I did. May have had an idea for latching on to the reward money. He mentioned the matter of reward to me a couple of times. Or he may have had ideas for blackmailing Van Hook. Another thing. Van Hook saw me drive away from his shop in Sonny's car. That meant he had to act fast, get rid of Galloway, who'd given him back the bracelet, and, of course, take Sonny out of the picture, too. Yeah, it all seems to add up very nicely. And when we face Van Hook, but well, there's his place now. Yeah, here's his driveway. Well, either he's skipped out or he's asleep. No lights on in the place. Well, if you ask me, he's far... No, no, wait. Yeah? The third window on the right. The blind was pulled away for a second or two. Well, then let's get out of this car. We're sitting ducks in here. Well, how about it, Sergeant? What do we do? You boys split up. Cover the back and sides of the house. He's in there? Yeah. Okay, boys. Come on. Right, hey, Johnny, maybe you better keep out of this. Are you kidding? I'm... Hey, listen. That car door, I'm sure of it. Yeah, I know. Holy... What's he up to? Gonna lock himself in and take the monoxide route? Come on. Are the back doors in that garage? Not that I know of. Here, wait a minute. Van Hook! This is the police! We've got men all around this place. Turn off that engine and come out of there with your hands over your head. Don't be a fool, Van Hook. You haven't got a chance. Come out of that garage. Hey, did you see that? He drove right through the door of his garage. Come on, Lacey, the car. Get after him, you guys. Get moving. Yeah, come on, boys. Getting into the side swiping habit. See what he did to that other patrol car? Yeah, they're okay. They're off and tending us. Come on, step on it, Lacey. This is one time we ought to have a Cosmo Roma. Well, maybe he can outrun us, but with two cars on his tail, he may get careless, take chances. If so, well. Yeah, hang on. Oh! Lacey, you could qualify for some of those road races yourself. That guy's out of his head. Main highway like this, full of trucks and trailers. Oh, don't worry about those guys. Those interstate truckers will give you a clear road after them. They're the best drivers in the country. Come on, hit your siren. You're right. Hey, you see, I told you those guys would give you the road. Holy... Look! The trailer in front of him! And the oncoming truck! Van Hook's trying to squeeze through! Pull up! Pull up, I will... Well, he squeezed through, all right. Squeezed right through the pearly gates. Expense account item five, $38.75, room, two meals, and valet service at the Casa de Paz. Item six, $191.60, airfare and incidentals, Palm Springs, California, back to Hartford. Expense account total, $474.84. Remarks? Well, justice is done in pretty strange ways sometimes. Kind of makes you think. Maybe it pays to tread the straight and narrow, doesn't it? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, international intrigue. A beautiful girl and a very clever chemist. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar.
Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood. It is written by Paul Franklin and is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in our cast were Barbara Eiler, Paula Winslow, Forrest Lewis, Frank Nelson, Sam Edwards, Austin Green, and Shep Mencken. Musical supervision is by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Dan Cumberly speaking. Johnny Dollar has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. Hollywood. It's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Harry Branson at Philadelphia Mutual Life and Casualty Company. Oh, hello, Harry. What's with you? John, I have a case I'd like you to handle for us. It's, uh, well, it's somewhat unusual. Have you ever handed me one that wasn't completely screwy? I said unusual. And I said screwy. So now that we understand each other, what's it all about? Well, absolutely nothing yet. Uh, but I'm very apprehensive about one of our clients. Oh, Harry, you're the biggest worry worn I ever knew. What was that? I said, who is this client? Oh, uh, Dr. Walter Merrill. Merrill? The scientist? That's right. Nobel Prize winner? The man who worked out the molecular orbital contraction, something or other? Yes, yes, that's the one. As I say, John, I'm worried. Well, who wouldn't be about him? I'll be right down to see you. Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To the Philadelphia Mutual Life and Casualty Insurance Company in Philadelphia, where else? Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the clever chemist matter. Expensive transportation and incidentals, Hartford to New York to Philadelphia. I didn't even stop to check my bag, but headed directly for the Philly Mutual building on Walnut Street. Harry Branson is a good insurance man, but a great worrier. Nonetheless, he'd given me some pretty important too. And after all, what do we live for? Hey, I keep the chin. Thanks, Doc. John? John, what took you so long? Oh, now, what's the matter, Harry? Forget to pay the rent on your office or just forgot the key? No, John, as a matter of fact, I have the key right... <clears throat> this is hardly the place for levity. Well, surely you haven't been waiting here on the sidewalk ever since you called me. No, I haven't, but by checking plane schedules, I was able to determine when you'd arrive almost to the minute and not wanting to waste time taking you upstairs to the office. Pretty urgent matter, huh? Well, you should be here shortly. What? Well, now, usually I arrange these things myself, Harry. Yes, and how we pay... Out of you. Oh, 
Harry, you touch me to the quick. Oh, now, please don't misunderstand me. I I don't mean that there's ever anything really dishonest about you your don't? expense account. Well, it's you only... ought to. Believe me, I'll pad it to the hill if I think I can get away with it. Anyway, the most important reason for engaging the car was so that you can leave immediate... Malaga. Yes, New Jersey. It's a... uh, is that where Dr. Merrill is? Yes. As is his custom, he chooses to work in some isolated spot where he can't possibly be disturbed. Uh, he and his colleague, that is. Colleague? I always heard that he worked alone, freelance. And you heard right. However, he now has a professor, Theodore Nash, with him. Nash? One of outing to Dr. Merrill. Never heard of him. John? They're working together on what I'm sure is some top secret project. Oh. Oh, say, so Wait. Didn't Merrill have something to do with the early rocket experiments? Precisely. Which is why I suspect their present work may have something to do with the space satellite or intercontinental missiles or something of the sort. Yeah, possible. But what has all this got to do with you? Their insurance. Dr. Merrill has had a policy with us for some years. $25,000. Oh. And for he took out a policy for 10000 Beneficiary? Nash made Dr. Merrill his beneficiary. Oh, well, that sort of thing is often done between men working together. Harry, you know that. Yes, yeah, so that if anything happens to one, the other will be financially able to carry on what they've started. Sure, right. Which is no doubt why Dr. Merrill changed the beneficiary of his policy to Theodore Nash. So, what's the worry? No sooner was the change made than I received a letter of protest from Dr. Merrill's daughter. Who's she? Uh, Mrs. Howard Harding. She and her husband live in West Philadelphia. He, he's a welder for an aviation company, I think. Well, what did she base her protest on, Harry? She claims her father must have been coerced into changing the policy. Oh, now, wait a minute. That sounds like the hungry relative who complains about being cut out of the will. It might. If Mrs. Harding weren't a perfectly well-balanced, intelligent, and I'm sure quite unselfish person, a completely... Uh, un- is she good-looking? Well, yes. And uh, real sweet to you? Yes, yeah, she is a... Well, now, John, I don't know what you're trying to imply. Uh, I do it every time. John. Particularly when there's a bit of money involved. Good-looking insurance broker like you. And you're a bachelor, too, aren't you, Harry? John, you're pulling my leg. Oh, Harry. But then I guess we're all suckers for someone like that. That has nothing to do with it. I've had these hunches before, John, and they've always been right. Even you will have to admit that. Yeah. Yeah, I'll confess that in the cases I've handled for you so far... Oh, why don't you call up Dr. Merrill? <laughs> I think the quaint old fellow would die rather than have a phone near enough to disturb him in his work. Oh, oh, there's your rental car waiting at the curb. So off you go, John, and see what you can find out. Okay, Harry. It all sounds like a lot of nothing you're worried about, but as long as you're willing to pay for it. And I always did like South Jersey this time of year. I drove across the Delaware River Bridge into Jersey and headed for Route 45 to Westville, Woodbury, and finally Pittman, where I picked up Route 47. What Harriet said was true. These hunches of his had a remarkable way of panning out. And yet, oh, who was I to complain? After a pleasant hour's drive through cranberry bog and farm country, through miles of orchards and the intoxicating odor of the peach blossoms, I pulled into the quiet little town of Malaga. Population, oh, I'd say around 500. First stop, the post office. Uh, Dr. Merrill? Yeah, sure. You go back the way you came, about a mile, till you see, you see the name Wampus Bone. Wampus what? Wampus means cat. Bung, bungalow, wampus bung. I, uh, yeah. Yeah, the doctor and the professor got the fourth cottage beyond it. White one with a fence around it. Yeah, good, thanks. And if you don't mind, you can uh, take their mail out to them. They haven't been in to pick it up four or five days now. Oh, nothing wrong, is there? Well, who'd know the way those two keep to themselves? Well, you'd think whatever they're working on was the atomic bomb. Yeah, well. Just to be sure, you let them know that you're at the gate now before you try to go through the fence. Oh, what's that supposed to mean? The professor sees you prowling around. He's liable to take a shot at you. As I drove back and toward the edge of Little Malaga Lake, the idea of getting shot at by anyone living in this peaceful, quiet place seemed ridiculous. The lake itself, by the way, looked pretty inviting. I made a mental note to come back here on my own sometime after the fishing season opened. As the postmaster had indicated, the fourth cottage beyond Wampus Bung was heavily fenced in. So I gave notice of my arrival. I had barely left the car when the door of the little cottage opened. Yes? Who who is it? Dr. Merrill? Oh. Oh, yes. My name is Dollar, sir. Johnny Dollar, insurance investigator. Harry... Branson? Yes, sir, that's right. Harry Branson sent me down here to see you. Oh, uh, come in. Come in. Uh, I'm most most glad to see you. Uh, please, come into the house. All right, thank uh, you. 
Is uh, Professor Nash here? In the uh, in the laboratory. But please. As come he spoke, into the, the sliding door on the garage at the side of the house opened. A rather swarthy man stepped out, quickly closed the door, and threw a heavy bolt on it. Then looked over toward us suspiciously. Yes, because it's better that you and I talk in in private, alone. Doctor, who is that? <laughs> oh, oh, yes, Professor. If we have a visitor. Why do you not bring him here where we can both speak to him? Oh, oh, yes, yes, of course. This is Mr. Johnny Dollar, Professor Theodore Nash. Mr. Dollar? I do, Professor. I'm from your insurance company. Just uh, making a little routine checkup. Oh, fine, fine. I'm very glad to see you. As a matter of fact, I wish to talk with you. (laughs) How do you do? Now, come into the laboratory. Professor, do you do you think it wise? Oh, of course, Doctor. Since he is not a man of science, I'm sure there is no harm in his seeing it. And you have an experiment going, remember? But I wish to Mr. speak Dollar, to him. Mr. Dollar, within these four walls, the genius of Doctor Merrill and my own poor efforts are creating things that will startle the world. Outside, the small building looked like an ordinary two-car garage. Someone in need of paint and repair. But inside, it was immaculate and loaded with scientific equipment of all shapes and sorts and sizes. There were racks of test tubes, bottles of chemicals, beakers, a centrifuge, machines and apparatus I'd never seen before that I imagine much of the world never dreamed of. And all of it as neat as a pin, not so much as a stirring rod out of place. Ah, look, Doctor. The polymerization step is almost complete. Yeah? Now, you must continue the molecular balance check immediately. Oh. Oh, yes, yes, and you must both leave me. This must not be seen by, by anyone. Yeah, we understand, who, Doctor. We understand. I hope you will pardon me, Mr. Mr. Dollar. Yes, of course, Doctor. Oh, come, Mr. Dollar. Yes, I, I will lock the door. Yes. He, uh, he does require privacy, doesn't he? Yes. Oh, hey, you're not going to bolt that door open. Oh, 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 of course not, <laughs> Force of habit, I guess. Oh, it is he who keeps things locked so tightly when he's working. Unnecessarily so. But then uh, genius is permitted his idiosyncrasies, huh? Harry Branson seems to think you two may be working on something to do with guided missiles. A uh, very perceptive man. But that is something we must not speak about. Now, <clears throat> why have you come here, Mr. Dollar? Well, like I said, just a routine checkup. We, uh... We usually do this when a sizable policy has changed. Oh, there is something unusual about two men working together on important things, ensuring in each other's favor? Well, no. Uh, But when his daughter perhaps objects... You know Dr. Merrill's daughter? Oh, I know about her and about her unfortunate marriage to that uh, that day laborer. Nothing wrong with day labor, Professor. Yeah, but one who waits for a great man like the doctor to die so that he can get his hands on the insurance money. You think that's why his daughter objected to the change? Of course. But his money will be used to further his work by me. And, of course, for the good of humanity. I uh, see. Well, how soon do you think the doctor will be through with this experiment? An hour, perhaps two. And then... He will call me in to assist him with the next, the crucial step. Uh, but now, about now, look, insurance. why don't I run in town, arrange for a place to stay, grab a bite to eat, and then come back here, huh? If you like. I'm sorry we have no room in the cottage. No, don't give it a second out. thought. I'll see you later. Something of Harry Branson's hunch had passed on to me. A strange feeling about the whole setup. There was something wrong about both Merrill and Nash, particularly the latter. Something I couldn't quite put my finger on. Was Dr. Merrill... Afraid of Nash? I don't know. Item two, a dollar even for a quick bite in a little cafe along the highway after I'd made arrangements for a room for the night in a private home. It was not much over an hour later when I drove back to the little cottage by the lake. And then I heard it. Someone pounding on the door of the laboratory from the inside. Someone calling for help. Professor! But the lock's on the inside. Turn the lock. What? Bolt here on the up. Oh, what are you... Oh. 
Oh, oh think of it. Good Lord, Professor. What happened to you? You look like you've been run over by... Dr. Merrill. Too late. Too late. Professor, what happened here? He beat me. Threw acid at me. The doctor? No, the, the man. Who... <laughs> then he killed the doctor with a gun. He killed him. Who, oh, Professor? Who? I, I, I don't know. Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in just a moment. Democracy. To the many who have lived under tyranny, democracy comes as a guiding light, shining on a brighter future. That is because democracy stands for the establishment of government conceived from deep thought and free choice, rather than being based on accident and force. It is also normal that the free choice of a democratic government happens because people who choose their own government are directed by true interests in the welfare of mankind. Democracy has been proven to be mankind's greatest legacy of freedom. Now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Clever Chemist Matter. Expense account item three, ten dollars for the services of one Dr. Frederick Foote, the only resident medico in the little town of Malaga, New Jersey. After pronouncing Dr. Walter Merrill dead, he took the badly beaten Professor Nash to his office clinic. While waiting for Nash to get in good enough shape to talk, I ran up item four, ten cents, phone call to the sheriff, who promised to come over as soon as he could enlist the aid of the nearby state police. Finally, Dr. Foote gave the word. But I suggest you talk with him as little as possible, Mr. Dollar. In pretty bad shape, huh, Dr. Foote? The intruder not only beat him severely, but threw a bottle of acid in his face. Oh. Professor Nash will never have the use of his left eye again because of that nitric acid. Has Nash said anything that might help us identify the assailant and killer? No. Now, please don't talk with him too long. Uh, Professor? Yes. Yes. Hello, Professor. Oh, Mr. Dollar... I will never see again with my left eye. He has told me. Yes, I know. I'm sorry. But the great Dr. Merrill, he is dead. What a loss. Professor. <laughs> Professor, tell me, did you see the man who attacked you? Yes. Can you describe him at all? Yes, you know, young, not more than 30, five feet, six or eight, very heavy, yes. stocky, and black curly hair. Yeah. Hands like a working man, a laborer. Come Have you ever seen this man before? No, I... <coughs> oh, here. <coughs> Some water. Thank you, thank you. Do you know why he came in and attacked you and Dr. Murray? no. Was he after something there in the laboratory? And only to kill Dr. Merrill. I tried. I tried to defend him. I'm sorry, Mr. Dollar, but I think that's enough. Yes, yes, okay, Dr. Foote. I think I've heard enough. I managed to get back to the cottage by the lake before the police arrived and came up with one very damning piece of evidence. In one of the bedrooms, I found a picture of a wedding couple. It was inscribed... Love to the dearest father in the world. And next to the bride stood a man who answered perfectly the description Professor Nash had just given me. The husband of Dr. Merrill's daughter, Howard Harding. And then I, I thought of what Nash had said about Harding. His antagonism, his conviction that Harding was the one who resented the change in the insurance policy. But there was something else, too. That had happened when I talked with Nash in the doctor's office that... Hmm... By the time I got back to the laboratory, the sheriff and state police arrived. The sheriff, I'm afraid, must up any prints that might have been left on the bottle of acid. However, in the weeds outside, a state trooper found the pistol, a 38 caliber Luger that had killed Dr. Merrill. Fingerprints had apparently been wiped off, but the gun was carefully... Fingerprints. Before taking off in a mad dash back to Philadelphia, I stopped at Dr. Foote's and picked up one water tumbler. 
Item five, three seventy for a tank full of gas. Item six, fifty cents. Parking in Philadelphia as close as possible to Harry Branson's office. John, what have you found out about Dr. Merrill? Harry, he's dead. Well, oh, dear. Now, listen. Write down the address of Mr. and Mrs. Howard Harding for me. His daughter, does she know? No, she doesn't know yet, and I hope I can avoid telling her before I write it down, will you, man? Well, yes, of course, Take but this. I... Don't unwrap it, but see that it gets to Ray Kemper at the Federal Bureau fast. I'll check with him about it later, thanks. But, now, John... Harry, I... this is one time this expense account of mine is going to save you a lot of money. I think. I don't know how many red lights I skipped on the drive out to West Philadelphia, but I felt like a hound dog in a hot scent. The home of Mr. and Mrs. Howard Harding turned out to be in a nice, quiet residential area. I was met at the door by the girl in the wedding picture. A tall, very nice-looking blonde in her late 20s. Oh, yes? Mrs. Harding? I'm Perry Harding. Well, I'm Johnny Dollar from your father's insurance company. Oh, good. Come in. Perhaps you can help me make him do something about that policy of his. Well, uh, that isn't exactly... Someone has poisoned Daddy's mind, Mr. Dollar. Oh? What do you mean? It isn't that I need the money if Daddy dies, which heaven forbid. No, it doesn't exactly look as though you do. No, of course we don't. Howard's been doing so wonderfully at Colonial Aviation. Yes, apparently. And I'd had a notion he was just a laborer or something. Oh, dear, no. That's what Daddy called him because... Well, because he wasn't too fond of Howard. And that is the way Howard started before we were married. But now he's one of the officers of the company. Uh... Where is he, Mrs. Harding? Well, as a matter of fact, I thought you were Howard when you drove up just now. He's been fishing. Fishing? On some little lake over in Jersey. He goes every Saturday all by himself. Malaga Lake? No, Malaga's where Daddy was. Mm -hmm. He and that... That what, Mrs. Harding? Well, I... I don't know. It's Howard, I guess. What do you mean? Howard has never liked or trusted him, even though they've never actually met. When Daddy changed his insurance to name that professor... There is something wrong about that man, Mr. Dollar. What, Mrs. Harding? I don't know. Daddy always worked alone until he came along. Daddy's such an alert, bright-eyed little busybody in spite of his Wait age. A Your father... Like a cute little wound-up spring, hopping about like a... Mrs. Harding. Yes? Mrs. Harding, when I saw your father... You've seen Daddy. Well, then you know what I he mean. He was tired. Almost in a daze. He spoke with difficulty. Oh, no. You're mistaken. He chatters away like a jaybird. He... What is it, Mr. Dollar? Well, he must have been doped. He looked as though... Hi, honey. Well, I'm just as lousy a fisherman as usual. Not a single... Oh, excuse me. Mr. Harding, just tell me one thing. Well, that depends. Who are you? Mr. Dollar's from the insurance company, darling. Not Johnny Dollar. Yeah, that's right. Well, I've certainly heard of you. Uh, tell me... No, you tell me, Harding. Where have you been? Why, fishing. Where? Over in Jersey. Where in Jersey? Little private lake. Where? Over near Mount Holly. One place I know of where nobody else ever goes, where I can get rid of the cobwebs at my job. Hey, wait a minute, Dollar. What is this? Harding, you've been identified as the man who murdered Dr. Walter Merrill. What? Murdered? I'm Did sorry, I... Mrs. Harding. I'm sorry, but it's true. No. What are you talking no. about, Dollar? You didn't know about it? Of course not. How could I? Where did it happen? How? At his place in Malaga. Oh. Professor Nash. I'll kill that man. You'll take it easy. You seem to forget that so far you're the only suspect in the case. You're out of your mind. If it was anybody, it was that Nash. Never have trusted that man. And the insurance policy. If anybody killed Dr. Merrill, it was that professor. Now listen to me. Nash was with Dr. Merrill when he was killed there in his laboratory. Of course he was. But Nash was attacked also, beaten, acid thrown at him. He lost the sight of one eye because of it. And I tell you... You sure? Yes, of course I'm sure. It was I who found them, Nash beating against the inside of the door of that laboratory, crying for help. A door that was bolted on the outside. But, Dollar, I... You're sure of that? I'm sure. Well, I still think... Oh, Terry, I'm sorry, honey. Here, let me... Oh, Howard, it's so terrible. Better answer that phone, Howard. Yeah. Hello? Yes? Oh, yes. It's, uh, for you, Mr. Dollar. Oh, thanks. Terry, here. come on, you've got to pull yourself together. Johnny Dollar. Right. John, this is Harry Branson. I just received a call from Mr. Kemper at the Federal Bureau. Yes. He says he must see you immediately. Call him back, Harry. Tell him I'll be there in 15 minutes. Harding, just to keep things straight, I wouldn't leave this house if I were you. Well, now, wait a minute, just Dollar. Just sit tight. I think you're in the clear. More red lights got passed up on my way into the Philadelphia offices of the Bureau. 
So Ray Kemper felt that whatever he'd found was important. If so, it would back up one of my suspicions. But in view of the circumstances, that bolted door in the laboratory, for instance, how could it? Important is putting it mildly, Johnny. The prints you found on the water glass, Ray. Three sets. One, yours. Yeah, well, naturally. Two, uh, Dr. Frederick Foote, who is currently practicing medicine. I know, I know, in the town of Malaga, New Jersey. That's where the glass came from. Oh, but the third set of prints. Yes. I had to go into the international file for them. And Johnny... Nash? Theodore Nash? Nash? Nashevsky. What? Theodore Nashevsky. Chemist from one of our not-so-friendly countries. Huh? Expert on explosives. One time, he was thought to have attempted to enter this country. That was in 1940. Ray, have you got any pictures on him? Plenty. From the time he was a kid. Uh, here. Tell me how you picked up these prints. The beard in this picture. That looks like him, all right. Yeah, this too. The shaved head. Almost as though he tried to keep changing his appearance. Johnny, oh, Wait it... a sec, wait a sec. This picture of him as a youngster, this eye patch on his left eye. Our dossier is pretty complete. He was quite an athlete until he injured that eye. But it doesn't show in these other pictures, and he hasn't a glass eye. No, his eye always looked perfectly natural. But now, Johnny, if you have information... Ray, I... this has done it for me. Thanks. Hey, no, just a I'll see you. Hey, Johnny! Well, this is Kemper. Give me a man to tail Johnny Dollar. All the way back to Malaga, New Jersey, I hoped my rental car would hold together. It did, in spite of the fact I pushed it all the way. International intrigue is a bit out of my line, but this time, so help me, I was beginning to feel like an FBI man. I stopped at state police headquarters along the way, and according to them, Nash was off the hook. Not only because of the acid thrown in his face, but even more important, because of my own testimony that I'd found them locked in that laboratory. I stopped again at the lab. Nothing. Then back to Dr. Foot's office. Very well, Mr. Dollar. When they arrive, I'll insist that they wait for you. All right, thanks, Doctor. Well, Professor, you're sitting up. Oh, have they found anything, Mr. Dollar? Have they found the man who attacked us and killed poor Dr. Merrill? Professor, I think I have. Oh? But tell me something. Yes, of course. Your, uh, your government doesn't pay you very well, does it? Merrill and I were not working for the government, Mr. Dollar. Although, of course, the results of our work... I'm talking about your government, your own real boss. I do not understand. No doubt it's very much interested in anything this country develops in the line of guided missiles, that sort of thing. Mr. Dollar... Now, let me go on. Merrill was doing important work. Stuff that would be of great value to any country in the world. Of course. Your country would have paid you well for the results of his work. But, brother, they'll never get it. I do not know what you are talking Money, about. Money, the loot from Merrill's insurance, sure. Sure, it was enough to get you out of here after you'd gained the knowledge you need of Merrill's work. See here, Dollar. After you'd killed him, before he could give to his country, the United States, what he'd invented. You are a fool. Could... I was beaten, The poor too. old man put up a pretty stiff fight, didn't he? Do you think I would have done this to myself? You My gave eye... yourself away earlier when you reached out for a glass of water I handed you right here in this room. A man who'd lost his sight in one eye would have lost his aim until he got used to it. Funny, though, it didn't come to me until you later. You are mad. You haven't seen out of that left eye since you were a kid. I tell you, you are mad. And a little acid burn to make it look like somebody had thrown it at you would be well worth the alibi it gave you. Feodor. That's right, Feodor Nashevsky. Uh, listen to me. You, you were the one who found us locked in. The door bolted from the outside. You found us. Yeah. Also the cord, the string you used to pull the bolt, too. That you looped over the bolt and pulled after you got inside. You couldn't have. I dropped it in the vat of acid. Yeah. Thanks. I was bluffing. But I made a lucky guess. What? <laughs> oh, what a brain. Nashevsky, I'm sure glad you're not working on our side. <laughs> the capsule he fished out of his pocket never got to his mouth. And I'm afraid he won't see very well out of his other eye for a while. My knuckles still hurt. And it was lucky for him that the police arrived. I'm afraid I don't like guys like him. Expense account total, including all the incidentals I could think of, and transportation back to Hartford, eighty-four thirty-five. Remarks? Well, don't beef on this one, Harry. The criminal, in spite of being the name beneficiary, doesn't get paid. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, 
Here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, a real close look at a little known but very dramatic side of Hollywood. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Duff. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote tonight's story. Heard in our cast were Virginia Gregg, Harry Bartell, Howard McNear, Forrest Lewis, Jack Crucian, Russell Thorson, Frank Gersel, and Bob Bruce. Musical supervision is by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Johnny Dollar has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. Hollywood. It's time now for... Johnny Dollar. George Reed speaking. Oh, good morning, George. Is it? Well, sure. The birds are singing, the bees are buzzing. And there are whales in the Gulf of Mexico. So there are. What? You know anything about whales, Johnny? Can't say that I do. Well, neither do I. Neither does our agent down in Gulfport, Mississippi. Can you go down there? Well, yeah, sure, but what's this all about? I told you. A whale. Oh, come on. You people didn't insure it. Now, George. Oh, Johnny, of course we didn't, but we did write a floater policy covering 80 pounds of amber gris. Amber who? Gris. Comes from a whale. Uh-huh. Very valuable, used in the making of perfume. Oh, yeah. We issued the policy a week ago. Yesterday, the stuff disappeared. How much did you cover it for? 20000 And our agent down there is W.C. Owen. Got it? Owen, huh? Yes. You really shouldn't have any trouble locating the stuff. No? Why not? Because, and I quote Mr. Owen... Ambergris smells worse than a hound dog, which has caught a skunk. Bob Bailey, in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. And now, act one of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Floyd's of England, American Branch Office, 443 North 15th Street, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Michael Meany Mirage matter. Expense account item one, $168. Transportation from Hartford to the Markham Hotel in Gulfport, Mississippi. I called W.C. Owen, the agent who had sold the policy covering the ambergris. Half an hour later, I opened the door of my room to a middle-aged man wearing a brown seersucker suit. Mr. Dollar, is that right? Sure is. Come on in, Mr. Owen. Come on. In. Thanks, thanks. Well, Dollar, I'm not going to fool around about this. I'm in a mess, and you're my only chance of getting out of it. Well, I'll do whatever I can, Mr. Owen. You just find that ambergris. And, man, please find it within the next 48 hours. Oh, why the rush? Two reasons. When the ambergris was stolen off the freight platform at the train depot day before yesterday, it was packed for shipping. Had enough dry ice around it to last up to two hours, but no more. Uh-huh. Now, what's the second reason? That Mike Meany. 
Who's he? Owner of the Amber Griffin, a real good client of mine. I promised him you'd locate the stuff for sure. Well, I appreciate your confidence, Mr. Owen. Name's W.C. Mr. around here sounds too highfalutin for an insurance salesman. Okay, W.C. But what's this fellow mean he's so worried about? The ambergris is covered for 20000 He told me he'd learned it was worth a lot more than that since the floater was issued. Something up near 60000 Pretty rare stuff. Which is. Matter of fact, this is the first time I've ever heard of anybody finding ambergris in the Gulf. Who fished him out of the water? Meany? No, a young fellow worked for him named Billy Fisher. Did Meany buy it from Fisher? Didn't have to. Belonged to Mr. Meany right off. Oh, why's that? Well, because Fisher works for him. Mr. Meany lets out his fishing boats to fellas, which ain't got no boat of their own, or even a chance of getting one. He rents them out, you mean? No, he don't rent them. He lets them out on share. Mr. Meany puts up the boat, gas, nets, everything. And whoever runs the boat, well, he... Whatever he catches, he belongs to Mr. Meany. Ah, uh-huh. and because Fisher happened to be in Meany's boat when he found the Abergris, it automatically became Meany's property, huh? Now you got it, boy. Uh-huh. Did Fisher know what it was? Or the value of it when he turned it over to Meany? Well, you have to ask him about that. Yeah, I plan to. But first, I'd like to have a talk with this Mike Meany. I'm way ahead of you, Dollar. I called Meany right after you called me. He's waiting for us. How far does he live from here? Oh, about three or four miles down the beach road toward Biloxi. Place called Mississippi City. Mississippi City? Uh-huh. But don't let the name fool you. Ain't nothing there except a couple of stores, fishing boat landing, and the train depot. Uh, sounds like a real quiet place. It is. It's also where this whole thing started and where I hope it finishes. And the sooner, the better. A few minutes later, we were driving east along the coast. Ahead of us, we could see Mississippi City's one and only landmark, a long wooden pier extending far out into the gulf. Anchored near the end of it were several small fishing boats. We passed the Meany General Store and the Meany Fish Market, then turned into a narrow driveway. I'm not sure what kind of a house I'd expected Mike Meany to live in, but this certainly wasn't it. It was too small and it needed a coat of paint. We got out and no one led the way to the side porch. Mr. Meany, you at home? Doesn't look like he is. No, no, he's here. Listen. What in the name of... Sure, heavy, ain't he? Yes, sir. Ain't another man his size in the whole United States. Good night, I believe. W.C. boy, you sure took your sweet time getting here. Yeah. Well, I made it just as fast as we could, Mr. Meany. Uh, but this is the fellow I was telling you about, Mr. Johnny Dollar. Uh, both of you come inside. That's it. Come on in. You men sit down on the sofa. I'll just lower... Uh, lower myself into this, uh, this here, uh, chair. There. Yeah, now then, you're a detective, huh, Dollar? Well... Well, then, me ain't giving me an answer. You're a detective or you ain't a detective. Now, which is it? I'm an insurance investigator. Right now, I'm being paid to find 80 pounds of ambergris that you lost. Lost? Lost? You didn't mean nothing by saying that. You hush up, you... You road agent. Mr. Meany. Dollar, that stuff was stolen, you hear? Thieved. Right in the broad light of day. You're sure? Well, I'm sure 80 pounds of ambergris didn't get up and walk off by itself. Yes, sir. Me too. It's out. Exactly where was it when it was stolen? Well, uh, sitting in a box I had built for it, a special bo- box. Box? Smell proof. Cost $25. Oh, shut up. I was sending it to New Orleans to a fella I'd heard might be able to sell it for me. The box was on the platform right outside the American Express office of the depot. Here in Mississippi City? Boy, you ever take a bad fall out of your cri- crib? No, you ignorant in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Where do you think that depot was? Well, it could have been in Gulfport. No, it couldn't ever do business there. Okay, okay, so I'm wrong. No, but that's the first time you ever admitted it. <sighs> had the box been checked in at American Express? You mean, had the freight been paid in New Orleans? Yes, that's what I mean. That scrounge and ignorant, no good. Had it been paid, Mr. Meany? No, it had Why not? Because the rat I trusted with the Amber Grissom sent down to the station to see it got on the train... Yeah? He'd promise. He'd give his word. He wouldn't take his eyes off that stuff for one second. No. That dirty. That north, yeah. That, uh, Are you uh, okay, Mr. Meany? No. But you sit down. You make me nervous, W.C. <laughs> yes, sir. Jeez. 
Every time I think of that, T.J., that stupid nephew of mine, well, you know what he done, Dollar. He spotted something more interesting to look after than $20,000 worth of ambergris. Ambergris. Okay, who was she? She... Oh, W.C. told you. No, I didn't. No, sir. Mr. Dollar, he, he's just clever. Yeah, well, anyway, according to T.J., this young female pulled up in an open car across from the road from where he was at, and it, it wasn't until he got up close that he could see that she was wearing a, a strapless bathing suit. You see, Mr. Dollar, T.J. He thought... He knows what T.J. thought, you miserable... You keep your mouth shut, W.C. Well, whatever you say, Mr. Well, well, while T.J. was investigating the uh, situation, uh, someone made off of the ambergris. Is that right? Right. Well, what about the other people at the station? There weren't no other people there. How about the baggage clerk and the passenger agent? Where were they? They? Sam Burroughs is the only man that works down the depot. And he was busy selling some woman a Pullman ticket to Memphis. How long did T.J. talk to the girl? Just a couple of minutes, according to him, that is. If you want to ask him yourself, he works at the all-night cafe in Gulfport. All right, thanks. Well, we sure haven't much to go on. You got nothing to go on. So you might as well give me my 20000 and head back up north. We you belong? Belong. Not yet, Mr. Meaning. You got 45 hours. At the end of that time, I want my insurance money. Money. You don't see that I have it, Mr. W.C. Owen. You're going to be sorry. You know what I mean? Mean? Yes, sir. I know. Owen didn't say another word until we pulled out of Fat Mike Meany's driveway and a turn left going on down the beach toward Biloxi. I suppose you think I should have stood up to him a little more, huh? No, I, I figured you had your reasons for not wanting to get into an argument with him. See those boats off the end of the pier? The small fishing boats, uh-huh. Well, they belong to Meany. He's also got money invested in half the business place along the beach. You know what that means, Dollar. Yeah, well, where I come from, he'd pull a lot of weight. That's it. And anybody he gets riled at, well, one word from him and a good many of my clients would be screaming for me to cancel their policies. Like that, huh? Just like that. Hey, where are we going? Billy Fishers. This way, this here is the boarding house he lives in. Come on. Uh oh. Okay, boy. Okay. Easy now. Easy, easy. That's it. Good boy. Good boy. Did you know the dog is back in this house? Well, good afternoon, Miss Harvey. Oh, well, my goodness, Miss Owen. This is an unexpected pleasure for sure. Why, thank you, ma'am. Uh, this here is Mr. Johnny Dollar, Miss Harvey. Afternoon. Pleased to know you, Mr. Dollar. Wouldn't you like to come in and sit down? No, thanks. We really don't have much time. Oh? Mr. Dollar is an insurance investigator. Right now, he wants to have a talk with Billy Fisher, providing his home. Why, sure he is. You'll find him round the side there. Oh, but... Yes, sir? Well, he's with Jane Higgins, Miss Owen. Jane Higgins? Oh, you know her pa rented that old Miller place again. The girl that got Billy into that trouble. Oh, oh, yes. Yeah. What, uh, what kind of trouble, Mrs. Harvey? Well, it happened when the Higginses were down here two years ago. Billy and Jane have always been sweet on each other. But being as Billy is Billy and doesn't have the fang of his own, not even a job except fishing one of Mr. Meany's boat. Well... Jane's pa just put his foot down. <laughs> but didn't mean a thing to Billy. No, sir. At least not until old man Higgins got a sheriff out. <laughs> that still didn't stop Jane. <laughs> and finally, the Higginses just packed up. They didn't come back until just three weeks ago Saturday. How old is the Higgins girl now? Oh, he's 19. And she hasn't changed one bit in those two years. No, sir. She's just over here all the time. <laughs> <laughs> She'll be some fur fly when her paw finds oh, out. <laughs> there they are now. Billy? <laughs> James! Hi. Yes. Come over here a minute, Billy. Someone wants to see you. Sure. Billy? Now this here's Mr. Dollar. Hi. Howdy. Uh, Miss Higgins, Mr. Dollar, and Miss Owen. Uh, Hello, Miss Higgins. You? Billy, I wonder if I could speak to you alone for a moment, huh? Yes, sir. What do you want to talk to me about? Mr. Meany and the ambergris you found. Oh, that. Where did you find it, Billy? Out near Cat Island, floating in the East Channel. Uh-huh. Did you know what it was as soon as you saw it? No, sir, not exactly, but I read a story once about a fellow that found some ambergris and... He sure made a lot of money off So you weren't going to take any chances and you hauled it aboard, is that right? Uh, yes, sir. Something like that. Billy, 
you realized that anything you caught or salvaged with that boat uh, belonging to Mr. Meany, uh, it wasn't yours. You realized that, didn't you? Well, not right then I didn't know, sir. He gave me some kind of a contract to sign when I started working for him, but I never read it. Well, what happened when you put in at the pier that night? Well, that Cliff Stillinger, Mr. Meany's checker, he spied the ambergris right off, and he made me turn it over to him. Was that the last time you saw it? Yes, sir. Yes, sir, that was it. Okay, Billy. That's all I had on my mind. Well, that's all? I mean, no questions about whether I swiped it from the train station or not? Would you tell me if you had? You crazy something? Heck no. After saying goodbye to Jane Higgins and taking a rain check on a dinner invitation for Mrs. Harvey, Owen and I drove back to town. I was tired and I was discouraged, and I needed a good night's sleep, so I had him drop me off at the hotel. At the desk, I found a message to call long-distance operator 19. A few minutes later, the call was completed. George Reed speaking. Hi, George. Thought it was you. Johnny, where in blazes have you been? I've been trying to get hold of you all afternoon. Oh, something important? No, I was just curious about the weather down there. Oh, well, it's great, great. Warm, but not too Johnny. warm. Johnny. Okay, George, what's happened? Well, one of the boys upstairs got wind of that ambergris claim. So? So he just happens to have a friend who's an ichthyologist. Well, bully for him. Johnny, this ichthyologist says that ambergris comes only from the sperm whale. And there has never been a sperm whale alive that would be caught dead swimming in the Gulf of Mexico. What? You follow me, Johnny? I think so. If there's never been a sperm whale in the Gulf, then that stuff you people insured couldn't have been... But, George, if it wasn't ambergris, what was it? I don't know. But unless you find it, we're stuck for 20,000 bucks. Holy smokes. <laughs> Two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. Our flag now numbers 50 stars, and behind each star there stands yet another flag for each of the 50 states. New Mexico's flag is an ancient Zia sun symbol, a red circle on a field of yellow, radiating from four points, which we might indicate as north, east, south, and west, are four parallel lines. Four was a sacred number of Zia, the number most often used by the giver of all good gifts. The earth had four main directions, each with its own gifts. The year had four seasons, each with a different offering for mankind. The day had four phases, sunrise, noontime, evening, and night. Life had its four divisions, childhood, youth, manhood, and old age. Everything in life and nature was bound together in a circle, the circle of life and love, without beginning and without end. And in this great brotherhood of all things, man had four obligations. He must develop a strong body, a clear mind, and a pure spirit. Fourth, and most sacred, he must fear it to the welfare of his people. From this simple symbol, the Zia Sun, we read the legend of a wonderful philosophy. The flag's colors of flaming red and golden orange represent the banners of Ferdinand and Isabella, which were carried by Columbus across the Atlantic. New Mexico's state flag, the flag of the 47th state to enter the Union, was adopted on March 19, 1925. Now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, and the Michael Meany Mirage Matter. <laughs> After talking to George Reed and learning that there was considerable doubt in his mind concerning the origin of the ambergris Mike Meany had insured with Reed's company, I called WCO and the agent who had issued the policy to come down to the hotel. He was as shocked and surprised as I'd been. Johnny, I, I just can't believe it. Yeah, well, it's true. At least according to a man who studied the habits of sperm whales for years. Oh, and those kind of whales never come into the Gulf? No, not according to him. What if... Ambergris isn't ambergris. What is it? Well, you see, your guess is as good as mine. But whatever it is, it isn't worth $20,000. Oh, no, guess not. Johnny? Yeah? You don't think Mr. Meany's trying to pull a fast one, do you? Trying to defraud the company? Yeah. Oh, no, I, I doubt it. He has all the money he'll need for a while. Yeah, that's for sure. 
Uh, tell me, W.C., did Meany have the Ambergris analyzed before he asked you to insure it? Matter of fact, he did. Even showed me a letter which said that the stuff was Ambergris. You remember who made the analysis for him? A chemist over in Biloxi. Don't recall his name offhand, but he signed that letter he gave Mr. Meany. Ah, uh -huh. okay. First thing in the morning, we'll take another trip out to Meany's place. Good. In the meantime, don't mention any of this to anyone, will no, you? No, 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 I won't. Jerry? Yeah? I should have checked on that camera, shouldn't I? And, uh, and, and I shouldn't have been so anxious to take Mr. Meany's word. Well, we all make mistakes. Not big ones. Not big ones like this. Johnny, we just got to find that stuff. Because if we don't, we'll never know if it was Ambergris or not. Will we? No, W.C., we won't. I felt sorry for Owen. I knew as well as he did that the company might recall his franchise unless we could prove it was Ambergris that had been insured. And at the moment, I was quite sure we couldn't do that. The next morning, the coffee shop was crowded, so I started up toward the center of town looking for another place to have breakfast. I was about four or five blocks from the hotel when I heard someone calling me. Mr. Dollar. Johnny. Hmm. Oh. Oh, yeah. Good morning, Jane. Good morning yourself. Well, well, what are you doing in town so bright and early? I'm going on a shopping spree. Oh. A girl can't get married and just any old thing, oh, you know. I guess you can't. Oh, oh, well, who's the lucky guy? Well, who do you think? Billy Fisher? I certainly wouldn't marry anyone else. Well, uh, Jane, it's none of my business, but uh, I heard... You heard that my father is dead set against Billy, didn't you? Yeah, something like that. Well, he is. But there isn't much he can do about it. I'm over 18. Besides, he's going to change his mind about Billy. I hope so. Mm. He's going to be real sorry he ever treats Billy the way he has. Uh, Jane, look, I haven't had breakfast yet. How about joining me for a cup of coffee? Oh, I'd love to. Where we go? Oh, how about over there? The all-night cafe. All right. Oh, no, I mean, I... Do you know what time it is, Mr. Dollar? Mm, just ten after nine. Why? Well, I just remembered something important. I'll see you later, here. Hmm. Funny. What is it? I crossed the street and entered the all-night cafe. Behind the counter, wearing a white T-shirt, apron, and a Valentino-type hairdo, was a man about 23 years old. Morning. Will it be? Ham and eggs and coffee. I want them eggs. Over easy. Okay? It's okay with me. I ain't eating them. Two and a half nice with pig. You want your coffee now? Yeah, please. Um, do you happen to know a man named Mike Meany? I should. He's my uncle. Oh, well, then you must be T.J. That's right. Yeah, uh, how come you know me? I was talking to your uncle yesterday. My name's Dollar. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he told me if you come around, I should tell you anything you want to know. Well, what happened at the depot that afternoon, T.J.? Didn't he already tell you that? I'd like to hear your side of it. Well, ain't much to tell. I was sitting there waiting to put that box in the 303, and this here gal drove up. Uh-huh. What happened then? Man, she gave me just about the biggest come on I ever did get. So you left the freight platform and crossed the road to talk to her. Well, shoot, Mr. Dollar. I didn't see nothing wrong in doing that. There wasn't nobody around. Oh, there must have been. Yeah. Yeah, I reckon so, but I sure didn't see you. T.J., did that girl tell you her name? Yeah. What is it? Betty Lou Miller. Betty Lou Miller. Yeah. Now, look, Mr. I'm just... No, no, wait. Have you seen her since then? Well, sure. When was that? Well, just now, out in the street. She's a girl you was talking to. I finished my ham and eggs and walked back to the hotel. Owen was waiting for me, but before we drove to Mike Meany's house, we made a stop at the railroad depot. The agent remembered everything that had happened that afternoon, the afternoon the Ambergris had been stolen, including the name of the woman who had purchased the Pullman ticket to Memphis at the time of the theft. After thanking Sam for his help, we went on to the Meany place. Come on in. Sit yourself down. Well, thank you, Mr. Meany. Dollar. Dollar, you find my ambergris here? No, sir. Yeah. But I think I know who has it. What do you mean? You mean you know who stole it from the depot? I think so, Mr. Meany. I'm not sure. Well, boy. Boy, you just let me have their name. Yes, sir. I'll get the sheriff out here and see their foot under the jail. Now, you come on. Tell me. Who did it? No, sir, I'm sorry. I'll tell you when I'm sure and not before. What? Well, when's that going to be? Depends. Depends on what? Whether you'll help me or not. <laughs> Why, 
You ignorant, stupid Yankee. You know good and well, boy. I'll help you. Yes, sir. No, no, what? What do you want me to do? Give Owen here the letter you received from the chemist and analyze the emigrants. Is that all? That's all for now. Uh, but, boy, boy, you dollar. Where do you think you're going? To see a lady, Mr. Meany. Oh, and I'll call you as soon as I'm sure. Right. Good luck, Johnny. In Owen's car, I drove down the beach to Mrs. Harvey's boarding house. Billy Fisher was out with the boat, so I had plenty of time to tell her what I knew. It's all my fault, Mr. Dollar. I planned the whole thing and put Billy up to it. And bought the Pullman ticket? Yes. I still have it. Been meaning to turn it in for the money, but just hadn't had a chance to get down to the depot. Tell me, Mrs. Harvey, how did you know that T.J. would leave the ambergris when he did? Oh, everybody around here knows T.J.'s weakness for girls. One that to me hasn't been locked up long ago. Yeah. Well, it was a beautiful job. You timed it just like a professional. <laughs> I thank you for the compliment. Where was Billy? In the woods on the other side of the railroad track. Uh. He waited till Jane got T.J. all mixed up. Then he scooted across, got the ambergris, and ran back into the tree. And Jane picked him up after leaving the depot? Yes, sir. You care for a cup of coffee, Mr. Dollar? No, no, thanks, Mrs. Harvey. You look so downhearted. <sighs> well, I, I guess that's part of my job, too. Well, what did Billy do with the ambergris? I sent it on to Atlanta. A man there's going to sell it for him. Oh, I see. My, you sure look like you lost your best friend. Yeah, well, I, um, I ran into Jane this morning. She was going shopping for her trousseau. Yes, I know. Mrs. Harvey, if it turns out that that isn't Ambergris... Oh, they'll still get married no matter what, Mr. Dollar. If not now, then don't so Dollar! 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 You Yankee schemer! What? Where are you at? What a Miss Harvey! Well, that sounds like Mr. Owen. And my friend, Mr. Meany. Dollar, just what you trying to put. I tried to keep him from coming over here, Mr. Dollar, but I just couldn't handle him at all. All right, W. It's a long way from being all right. Just what do you want here, Mr. Fat Mike Meany? What do I want, why, woman? I want to arrest you and that dirty, that backbiting, Billy Fisher and his girl for stealing my amber. Amber, amber grease, that's what I want. Hush. I want to see you in jail. Jail? Don't be ridiculous. Ridiculous? Why, woman? That's uh... what I said. Now, if you don't get off my property... Yeah, but you, woman, you stole it. How do you know I stole anything? I know because this here worm of an insurance agent wouldn't have a customer left on the beach unless he told me. Well, he told you wrong. Billy took that amber no. But it belonged to him all the time. Well, a woman, that's a lie. Ain't no. that right, Mr. Dollar? Yeah, it sure is. At least it is if it was ambergris. It's ambergris right enough. On. Well, I <clears throat> I called that chemist, but he quit his job a couple of days ago. Couldn't find no record he made of it. Don't need no record. It's ambergris, and it's mine. It's Billy. Mine. You think it's mm. yours, you're seeing a mirage. Tell him, Mr. Dollar. Dollar, if this is some kind of a low-down yank, he trick. It's no trick, Mr. Meany. Mrs. Harvey showed me the contract you have with Bill. Well, what's that got to do with him stealing the ambergris? Just this. Please. The contract states that all fish and fish products and byproducts caught or sane while using your boat belong to you. That's right. Exactly right, so... So, the ambergris doesn't. What? No, sir. Ambergris comes from a whale. And the whale is not a fish. It's a mammal. <laughs> Dollar, now, Dollar, you boy, no, no, wait a minute. Well, doggone. Yeah. Doggone. They say that young love can work miracles, and I guess it must be true, because later that day, a huge sperm whale was sighted about three miles offshore near the Cat Island Channel. Proving, as I've always said, you can't figure whales any more than you can people. Expense account total, including hotel bill and transportation back to Hartford, $420.10. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, the wayward truck matter. And I'll leave you to figure that one out for yourself. But join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood 
Written by Charles B. Smith and is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in our cast were Virginia Gregg, Jeanette Nolan, G. Stanley Jones, Junius Matthews, Gil Stratton, Dick Crenna, and John Daner. Musical supervision is by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Dan Coverley speaking. Johnny Dollar has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Crutcher, Mr. Dollar. Lester Crutcher at Continental Insurance Company. Oh, how are you, Mr. Crutcher? Uh, tell me, are you familiar with the Priest Expedition Collection? Priest Expedition? Some of the relics, artifacts, of considerable archaeological import that were excavated from the ruins of the city of Ur in the valley of the Euphrates. What? Findings from the temple erected to the god Baal, which proved of such historical value to students of the ancient Babylonian civilization. You know. Yeah, I certainly don't know. But what about it? We carry some special insurance on that collection. And what's happened to it? Nothing yet. But I think you'd better come over and see me. Right away. Okay, Mr. Crutcher. Why not? Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. And now, Act One of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Continental Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the loss of memory matter. Ancient Babylonia, Crutcher had said. So on the way down to his office, I stopped off at the library for a good look at the encyclopedia. And I learned that what was once Babylonia is now a part of the country of Iraq, one of the hot spots in the Middle East. Good, good, there might be some action, even international intrigue. On a map, I found the location of the long-forgotten city of Ur. The confluence of the Tigris and Euphrates River near the Persian Gulf was where it was. Romantic names, all of them. And not too far away, the exotic city of Baghdad. Yes, at long last, a trip to the Middle East. Middle East? Uh, Well, that's what the map said, Mr. Crutcher. Near west is more like it, Dollar. Huh? Uh, You must have misunderstood me. The relics from the temple of the god Baal I mentioned are presently in the little town of Lakeview. Lakeview? Yes, right here in Connecticut. (laughs) I guess I did misunderstand. They're owned by a Mr. Alvin Peabody Cartwright, who, uh, I might venture to say, is a crackpot of the First Order, but who happens to have placed a great deal of insurance with us on his life, property, art collection, and so forth. I see. You uh, mentioned a priest's expedition collection. Of rare scrolls and tablets, principally, taken from excavations along the bank of the Euphrates River, some of them over 4,000 years old, all of them of great historical and archaeological value. Here. Here. This is a relatively unimportant piece that Mr. Cartwright gave to me some years ago. Well, uh, what is it? What does it look like? Well, like a tiny sort of sofa pillow. Only it's made out of dried mud or some... Hey, wait a minute. There are a lot of tiny marks on it. Hieroglyphics, Dollar. Those are a perfect example of the cuneiform writing that was used by the ancients. Oh, what's it say? Has anybody deciphered it? It's a receipt for 24 fat sheep, 12 oxen, and 12 goats that were taken to the temple for sacrifice to the great god Baal. Well, how about that? Does the whole collection consist of stuff like this? Yes, and of priceless scrolls made of papyrus and leather. You've heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls? Oh, yeah, sure. They throw so much light on biblical times. Yeah, they've had a lot of publicity in time and life and so on. Yes. 
Those in the priest collection cover much of the history of the Canaanites and Phoenicians. And you've insured the collection? It's this way. Mr. Cartwright has decided to sell it to the museum here in Hartford. Has promised them that his stepson, Alfred Hocking, who lives with him, would deliver it to them today. But now he's suddenly worried to death that something will happen to it en route. So? So, to keep him happy, we've issued a $20,000 transit policy. Well, then what's he worried about? Now he demands a guard for it, too. Well, doesn't he trust his stepson, this Alfred? Who knows? Who knows what old Cartwright thinks, whom he trusts? Well, now look, And I... after all, $250 plus whatever expense account you can dream up for a couple of hours' drive in the country. What if his own... Oh? Well, sure, why not? Expense account item two, fifty dollars deposit on a rental car in which I probably headed north and west on Highway 44. The fifty-odd mile drive to Lakeview was easy and pleasant. Finding Cartwright's home was also easy. It sat prominently atop a hill on the outskirts of the little town with perhaps two acres of ground around it. All of it looking worth a lot of money, yet rather seedy and run down. Alvin Peabody Cartwright himself greeted me at the door. I take it you're Mr. Dollar. That's right. Mr. Uh, Cartwright? Let me see your credentials. Oh, well, yeah, sure. All right, here you are. Uh, yes, all right, you can come in. This way, in my study. Right here. And there, Mr. Dollar, is the box containing the Babylonian relics. That one carton is all that's to be delivered to the museum in Hartford? That's all. Young man, the contents of that sealed carton are worth $21,000, and it's sealed, you understand, so that neither you nor that worthless stepson of mine can get your hands on any part of it. Alfred, this is Mr. Dollar. Alfred Hockey. Hmm? Hi, Dollar. Oh, I'm sorry I didn't see you sitting back here. Yeah. Uh, uh, now let me finish this phone call that you interrupted. You still there, Mr. Waring? All right, now. Huh? Yes, he finally got here. Dollar's his name. That's right. Shall Dollar. I uh, sit down? Yeah, sure. Well, just you be sure he identifies himself. Yes, and that he's accompanied by my stupid stepson, whose name's Alfred Hawking. Now, if only one of them appears, or if the seals on the carton are broken, you're not to accept it. Make him bring it back to me in a... No. 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 Call the police. Yes, that's what I said. Call the police. Otherwise, give the money to Mr. Dollar. Not to that half-wit stepson of mine. I don't trust him. Now, they'll leave here shortly, and I... I know it's late, but Waring, just make sure that you're there waiting for them with the money. Goodbye. Mr. Cartwright. Yes, well, what? what? If you're so concerned about it, I can't help wondering why you haven't asked the police to guard this shipment for you. Because I don't trust them. I don't trust them any more than I trust this numbskull Alfred. Thanks. I don't trust anybody. Oh, does that include me? Of course it does. Why do you suppose I'm having both of you take it over there? I'll tell you why, to keep an eye on each other. Now, get yourselves out of here and on the way to Hartford. Just be sure you bring that cash right back here to me tonight. You mean check, don't you? I mean cash. I don't believe in checks. I don't believe in banks. I don't trust them. I've kept all I have in my big safe here in the house for the past 47 years, and I intend to continue keeping it there, where I can watch over it myself. Now, go on, you and this dumb Albert. Get out of here. Dumb, Alfred? I'm not so sure. On the other hand, as we drove back toward Hartford with Alfred at the wheel, he said he knew a backcountry shortcut. I decided he just wasn't as clever as he'd like to be. Hey, hey, take it easy, Al. I'll give it to you straight, Dollar. I'd hope the old buzzard would let me make this delivery alone. Because believe me, if he had, <laughs> he'd never see one red cent of that 21 grand we're going to pick up. I take it you and your stepfather don't get along too well. Uh, that's putting it mild. But I'm telling you, boy, that once I figure a way to relieve him of his dough, he'll never see me again. 21,000 bucks. Boy, that would get me so far away from here, I tell you... You, uh, been living with him long? All my life. The crazy old Scrooge has never let me have any money of my own. And me, I got a right to blow myself, have a little fun, as much as anybody. Well, maybe he thinks you ought to work for him. Hey, hey, now, you better slow down, Al. Work, did you say? When he's got more than he'll ever be able to use stashed away in that old safe in the cellar? Why should I have to work? Hey, I said take it easy, Al. Uh, why don't those trucks stay off those back country roads? Oh, now, Al. 
Why should I work when all I need to do is to get my hands on some of that pile he's got in the safe and I can live like a king? <laughs> He'll never spend it. And he'll never leave it to me when he kicks off. That's why I haven't knocked him off myself, but believe me... Al, been... look, just stop this crate and let me take the wheel. Yeah, why? Oh, with all your ranting and raving, you're all over the road. Sure, okay, okay. Sure, you can drive. Well, stop. Sure, I'll stop. Look out, we'll skip. Let us skip. Look out! It was a long, long period of deep, dull blackness, without sound, without feeling. And then slowly, hazily, the light came back, but it wasn't clear. Everything seemed very confusing, very vague. I was conscious of a terrible throbbing in my head, and then it slowly passed, leaving only a dull ache. A strange and helpless feeling of not knowing who or what or where I was. Until the shadow of a man rose from the ground beside me. Slowly took definite form as it wavered for a moment. Then stood over me. How about you, boy? Back to the world again? Well? Yeah, you... You really hit that windshield frame. Here, let me help you sit up. Lean you up against what's left of the car. And yeah, I'll. Car? Sure. Yeah, this is the wreck we cracked up in. There you are. Nothing busted. You were just knocked out. Cracked up? Sure. On our way to Hartford. Hartford? Hey. What's the matter with you? I don't know. I, I can't seem to re remember anything. What do you mean? I not anything. I, I can't remember. My mind is all blank. Well, you, 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 you know who you are, don't you? No. What? No, and I, my head, it's just, it's. So look, 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 look. Are you, are you kidding, Fred? Car? Sure, sure. Hartford to deliver some stuff and collect a big water. You, you're sure you don't remember? I don't remember. Not even who you are. I don't remember. I'm trying to. But it's well, I'll be... It's... Okay, oh, okay, Lana. Listen, <sighs> listen, listen. Everything's going to be okay. Real okay. You want to know who you are, huh? Yeah. Who I am. Sure, sure you do. And I'll tell you. Your name is Hawking. Alfred Hawking. Alfred. That's right, yeah. You're Alfred Hawking. We were driving along here in the car. See, uh, I was. You were keeping me company. You get it? Yeah, I, I guess so. Yeah, sure you do, sure. You see, I have to deliver some stuff in Hartford. It's in this box here in the car. Now, you see it? Box. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you just came along for the ride. The, the ride to Hartford, see? Oh. Yeah, and after I deliver this stuff and pick up the... Uh, make a little pickup, that is... Why, then you and me will part and go our merry way, you see? I, 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 I don't know. I guess so. Sure you do. Sure, sure you do. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, sure. You feel better now, huh? Yeah, yeah, much. I, if only my head would clear. If only I could remember something, anything. Look, look, you're going to be okay. Al? Al. I'm Al. That's right. Yeah. You, I, I can't remember, huh? Who are you? Me? My name is Johnny Dollar. Dollar. Yeah, yeah. Remember that, Johnny Dollar. That's right. Yeah. Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. We sometimes wonder, what is the life of a human being really worth? Not too much? Or maybe a great deal? Does it depend on whose life it is? Whatever the answer, one thing is certain. Fred Hargesheimer, since World War II, has felt that his life is worth quite a lot. Quite a lot of gratitude. 
During the war in the Pacific, about June of 1943, Lieutenant Hargesheimer had his P-38 fighter plane shot out of the sky. Badly wounded, he bailed out over a tiny island, New Britain. It looked pretty small from where he hit the silk, but he found it much bigger when he hit the ground. It was bigger, and in complete control of the enemy. But Hargesheimer was lucky. After a month of lonely hiding, he was found by a group of friendly natives from the village of Nantambu. They cared for him and successfully hid him from enemy patrols for the next four months at the risk of their own lives. Then Hargesheimer was able to make it back to civilization. For the next 17 years, Fred Hargesheimer thought about those wonderful people of Nantambu. 12,000 miles away in the United States of America, Hargesheimer put a great plan into effect. He made speeches, took up collections, sold jewelry belonging to his family, and worked out a way to bring a bit of civilization and happiness to the little village of Nantambu. Needless to say, the villagers gave him a spectacular welcome upon his return. Fred Hargesheimer showed his gratitude to the people who had saved his life. But life is worth little without freedom. The right of all men, everywhere. Now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, and the loss of memory matters. Amnesia. Sudden, complete amnesia. And all the feeling of utter helplessness that goes with it. The man who was with me told me of the crack-up of our car on the way to a place he called Hartford. Hartford? Not nothing to me. Nor did I recognize anything of the countryside or the road where we sat waiting, hoping someone would pick us up. Names, places, I remembered nothing. Not even who I was. Or who the man with me was. That's right. Dollar. I'm Johnny Dollar. I, uh, I see. And your name is Hawking. Alfred Hawking. Hawking. Yeah. Yeah, you're feeling better, aren't you? Yeah, I, I think so. Well, look in the pocket of your coat. Pocket. Oh, is there a bill folder? Yeah, yeah, open it up. Yeah, here's... Yeah, there's a name in it. Sure, see? Alfred P. Hawking. That's right, that's you. And I'm Johnny Dollar. Just remember that and everything will be all right. Huh. Why don't some truck come along and pick us up or a car? What, uh, what are we doing out here, Johnny? You, you see this box? Well, I've got orders to deliver it to the museum in Hartford. Museum, huh? What's in it? No, just some old relics. Then I'll collect the money for it and that'll be that. You can be on your merry way, okay? Yeah. Yeah, I guess so. Oh, sure. But how come I'm going with you, Johnny? Why, you, you live in Hartford, see? Oh, I see. You didn't even know that. You still don't remember anything. Only what's happened since I woke up here. Look now. Yeah? Why, why, why don't you take me home first, if we can get a ride, that is, and maybe if I rest, I'll feel better. My no, head, no. Maybe my mind will clear up. No. But, no, first the museum. But, Johnny... All right, listen. The crazy old coot I'm delivering this stuff for, uh, well, he phoned ahead that there'd be two of us, see, so you've got to come along to the museum. Museum? Yeah, yeah, the museum, the one in Hartford, like I told you. Oh, yes. Uh, but uh, once I get the money for it, I'll take care of you. Yeah, I'll take care of you. Well, you, you've done pretty good as it is, I guess. Sure I have, Dal. Al, I mean. I've pulled you out of the wreck and all. Hey, look, here comes a big moving van, and if I know those boys, who will pick us up. Come on, get up on your feet, and we'll flag him down. The helpful driver of the big cross-country truck picked us up and was all for getting me to a hospital before anything else. But my companion, who called himself Johnny Dollar, assured him he'd do it as soon as our mission was accomplished. So the driver agreed to take us directly to the museum Johnny had mentioned. Johnny Dollar. The name had a strangely familiar sound, but I, I couldn't remember. Finally, in the city, they told me it was Hartford. We pulled up in front of a large, rather imposing granite building. 
sure somebody will still be there waiting to meet you, mister? It's getting pretty late. Don't worry, driver. There'll be somebody, all right. Okay, but you sure you don't want any wait and take your friend Al to a hospital? Like I told you, the minute we're through here, I'll take care of him. Come on, Al. Sure. Thanks, driver. Uh, yeah, thanks. It's okay, boys. If I couldn't give somebody in trouble a hand, I'd have no business driving this rig. Funny. Here's your package. Oh, thanks again. Now, come on, Al. Okay, Jimmy. I'll do all the talking, and uh, you just remember who you are. Sure. Let me help you carry that. You you just push the bell button there beside... Well, it's about time. Uh, which of you is Mr. Dollar? Uh, that's me. Hi, Mr. Waring. Uh, here's my credentials. Uh, oh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, uh, then you... Uh... Al Hawking. Oh, yes. Uh, just as Mr. Cartwright said on the phone. But uh, what happened to you? I had a little car accident on the way. Oh, yes. Are you, uh, are you feeling all right, Mr. Hawking? Well, uh, my... Oh, sure, sure. I'm going to take care of him as soon as we leave here. So if you don't mind, uh, you've got something for me, haven't you? Yeah, uh, of course. Uh, mm -hmm. Seals are still intact. Sure are, in spite of the accident. Oh, very well. If you'll step inside, I'll give you the money. Good, good. Come on. Al. I must confess my bewildered mind was somewhat puzzled by what happened next. Mr. Waring opened a small wall safe and handed my companion a package. From it, he extracted and counted almost greedily $21,000. He signed a receipt, accepted a receipt for the packet of bills. Then we left the museum and hailed a taxi. Hey, buddy, you know a drive-your-own car place that's still open? Sure do. Then take us there, and uh, uh, there's an extra fin for you if you step on it. All right, you are. Johnny, can't the cabbie take me home first? I said I'd take care of you, didn't I? All right, now, don't ask any questions. We haven't got time. Maybe I had lost all memory. Maybe my mind was befuddled, confused. The pain in my head nearly driving me out of whatever sanity I'd retained. Nonetheless, I had a strange feeling that things weren't what they should be. S still, my friend, this Johnny Dollar who'd saved me from the wrecked car. If only I could remember things from before we cracked up. There was something strange, too, in the way he slowly, painstakingly, signed the application for the drive-your-own car, looking carefully all the while at the license he pulled out of his pocket. Then a few minutes later, we were on the road again, and we were heading, according to the highway signs, out of town and toward a place called Danbury on Route 6. Uh, these rental cars could stand a little souping up. Look, Johnny, I thought you were going to take me home. I am. But you said I live in Hartford. Listen, if I know that stepfather of, my, of yours, the sooner we get out of the state... What? What were you going to say? Nothing, nothing. Now, uh, no, uh, listen... Uh, I gotta get you to a hospital, see? And the best one I know is over the line in New York. You wanna get your memory back, don't you? Yeah, sure, but now look, Al. Huh? What'd you say? <laughs> it's funny. I called you, Al. What's funny about it? Sure you aren't beginning to remember things, huh? How about it? I wish to heaven I could. Now, look, Johnny, there's something funny about all this. I may be a bit muddled after that crack-up we were in, but it you seems... You are muddled. That's the reason you're getting crazy ideas, but don't. See? Just quit thinking and relax, so you might do something you'd be sorry for. Yeah. Real sorry. This determination of his to get across the state line. Things were wrong, and I knew it. But I didn't know why. A man's judgment is based on his experience, or his reasoning power is based on things he's done or that have happened to him, or at the very least on things he's known about in the past. And all of my knowledge of the past was gone from me. Anything I might do or say at this point would probably be wrong. So how could I argue with this, this Johnny Dollar? What's more, he had a gun. I felt it in his pocket when he bumped against me. Perhaps if I had a gun, I could stop him. Demand an explanation. I felt that I should. Why? I didn't know why, but somehow. Johnny? Yeah? 
Why are you so anxious to get into another state? I told you to get you to a hospital. Now, shut up. Now, listen to me. Don't ask questions. Just leave everything to me. Well, why is driving all this distance, 50 or 60 miles now, better than if you'd taken me to a hospital or a doctor back in Hartford? I told you to stop asking questions. Yeah. Johnny, why do you carry a gun? Why shouldn't I? Don't worry about it. Are you supposed to? Sure, sure. I got a permit, so forget it. Let me see it. Hey, what is this? Later. Now. Later, I said. Then I don't believe you. All right, all right, then here. Look in this card case. I looked at Johnny Donner's card case. His driver's license, business cards, it said he was a freelance insurance investigator. And again, something vaguely familiar stirred in my cloudy mind. Did you find it yet? And then, an identification card with thumbprint and snapshot. And the picture was not of the man beside me. Instinctively, I leaned over to look into the rearview mirror to look at myself. But he pulled the gun from his pocket, and before I could do it, he struck me hard across the head. Oh. All right now, Al. We're gonna stop. You hear me, Al? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You hit me. With that gun. That's right. That was a mistake. Because that second blow on the head. Why have we stopped? You'll see. You see, you gave me an idea about this gun. Now, get out. Sure. Why not? Pretty wobbly, huh? All right, now. Look down over the side of the road there. What about it? See that deep ravine down there? Why? Al? That's why. Because you called me Al. And this time you meant it. Yeah. I guess I did. Thanks to that poke on the head. So, you got some of your memory back, huh? But not your strength. No. So before you do... No, put that away. Oh, you're not going to get away Expense account total so far, $95 even, including doctor bills. Repair bill on rental car is still to come, and strangely enough, old Cartwright is perfectly willing to pay it and any other expenses that may be involved. <laughs> He's a changed man with his chiseling steps on out from underfoot. Also, I'll be required to appear in court against Alfred Hawking, and there'll be expenses involved there, too. Uh, the extra 500 Cartwright insisted I take doesn't go in this account since it came out of his own pocket. <laughs> Not bad for just a couple of wallops on the head, huh? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week? Well, it's another case of mistaken identity, but believe me, a completely different affair. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote tonight's story. Heard in our cast were Les Tremaine, Parley Bear, Joseph Kearns, Barney Phillips, Tom Henley, and Shepard Mencken. Musical supervision is by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.
from Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Earl Foreman, Johnny. In Sarasota? That's right. Florida? Where else? Well, hi, Earl. How are things in the land of infernal sunshine? What do you mean, infernal? Well, it's getting pretty hot down there these days, isn't it? Makes good fishing weather, Johnny. Yeah, but without a case to work on, what possible excuse would I have? Maybe I have one for you. Oh? Yeah, and maybe it's murder. Earl, I'll be down on the next plane. <laughs> Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Tri-State Life and Casualty Company Branch Office, Sarasota, Florida. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Parley Baron matter. Expense account item one, $131.50. Transportation and incidentals to Sarasota, Florida. Knowing Earl Poorman, I didn't bother checking into a hotel, but instead took a cab to his office in the Conroy building. Tall, lanky, easygoing, he welcomed me like a long-lost brother. Oh, Johnny, you're looking great. And I'm glad you're here, because you can clear up this case in a hurry, and then you and I can get out in the Gulf and do some real serious fishing. Oh, well, that's okay by me, Earl. Your last I'll trip just... down here, you remember, they weren't biting so good. But, oh, Johnny, so help me now that... Oh, I see you've got your bags with you. Well, uh, yeah. Good, yeah. because you're going to stay with us out the house. Now, I'm not going to take any argument. I told that old battle axe I'm married to to hang out an extra towel for you. How is my... Oh, she's great, just great. I never did understand how I was lucky enough to grab that dame, Johnny. Oh, well, now, I think maybe she kind of cares for you, too, huh? <laughs> now, uh, about yeah, what women we call... show funny tastes sometimes. Hey, maybe the old horse will go fishing with us. Mike? Yeah. Anything over ten pounds, it'd pull her right out of the boat. <laughs> but now, what kind Listen, of a problem... she's been getting pretty good with a rod and reel. Look, look, will you? This fishing uh, talk is just making my mouth water. First, I'd, we'd yes, better discuss... Yes, I, I, I know. Once I get started on fishing... I know. It's... All right, now. Let's it's... get down to cases, huh? Uh, oh, all right, if you insist. I insist. Yeah, all right. Okay. I was just trying to stall off having to. You know where Lido Key is? Lido? Yeah, a mile or so offshore, just beyond St. Armand's Key, where we live. Oh, yeah, sure. Well, a client of mine, a man I've known for years. He retired, bought himself a piece of property there, built a nice little home on it. His name is Parley Barron. So? Well, I've handled all his insurance for him, including a straight life at 50000 Uh-huh. Beneficiary? His wife, Laura Barron. And what's happened to him? Well, Friday morning, now that's the day before yesterday, he left the house just to do some errands. Well, go on. Yeah, well, he hadn't got back home by about 5 p.m., and his wife started calling around, trying to find out where he was, and nobody seemed to know. So finally, she put in a call to the police. Who's your man there? Uh, Sergeant Harry Brackett. Oh, I remember him. Sure. Go on. Well, then around 7 p.m., they found Barron's car. Found it parked down by one of the fishing docks. But no sign of him. Not a sign, not then or since. Had he gone out fishing? Police questioned everybody, the boat owners, all the boat livery, everybody. Old Will Bright, who runs the dock where the car was parked, he was closed up. Sign on the door saying he'd gone up to Gainesville. Well, could <laughs> Barron have had any reason to disappear? Oh, no, no. Well, not that anyone knows of. What kind of a person is his wife? No, yeah, yeah. no, she's very sweet, Charlie. She's a bit of a bore. But, oh, they doted on each other. All right, how about enemies? Parley Barron? Never. Sweet old guy. I sure hope you can find him. I, that he's still alive. I'm afraid I, I doubt it. Well, so far you've given me no reason to believe he's dead. Well, it's just a feeling, I guess. And I don't like it. Mm. Well, what else can you tell me, Earl? Nothing, really. Then maybe I'd better talk to Mrs. Barron and to the police. Yeah, yeah. Oh, here. You take my car. Oh, thanks. It's the new air-conditioned cat out in back of the building. What did you do? Oh, Michael picked me up. Now, we'll see you at the house for dinner, huh? Well, that may depend on what I find out in the meantime. Whenever I'll... you're ready, there's food and there's a bed waiting for you. And I hope you... Well, I just hope you find Parley Barrett. Pretty good friend of yours, isn't he? Oh, yeah, Johnny. He was. Earl seemed so sure that Barron was dead. I was pretty down in the mouth about it. 
But I wondered, did he know something about the old man that he hadn't told me? Ah, that didn't seem like Earl. He gave me the Baron's address on Lido Key, and I drove out there. Laura Barron was a fragile, gray-haired little old lady wearing steel-rimmed spectacles and with, well, with almost a sanctimonious air about her. She sat primly, properly straight in her chair as we talked, a Bible in her hand. Then Mr. Earl Poorman has told you as much as any of us knows, Mr. Dollar. I see. But uh, even the smallest bit of information may hold the key to finding your husband. Only prayer can help us now, Mr. Dollar, or help him if he's gone to the great beyond. How, uh... Well, tell me, how is he dressed on Friday morning when you last saw him? As you see him in the picture there on the table in old gray pants and a rather tattered sport shirt and that old straw hat. That shirt is blue? Yes. He was so happy the day that picture was taken. he just finished making an addition to our dock with his own two hands. He was so proud. Now... Yes, I, I'm sorry. He'd hoped to get his own little boat, too, for fishing. He loved to fish so. Yes, well, uh, tell me, please, do you know of anyone who might have wanted to harm your husband? Oh, dear, no. No, Mr. Dollar. And you'd had no, no argument or disagreement with him before he left here that morning? Huh? We had had no disagreement even about little things in 41 years of blessed marriage. Ah. Not even about his work. I see. Uh, what did he do before he retired, Mrs. Barron? Oh, I, I had hoped you wouldn't ask that because I... I've always felt that the good Lord wouldn't approve. Of his work? I'm a very religious woman, Mr. Dollar, and as I say, in 41 years, we never questioned one another's thoughts or actions. But... What was your husband's work? I, I won't say that it was sinful, because he wasn't a sinful man. Polly was a good man, and many times he made it plain that his work helped to save lives, too. And I accepted it because he felt he was doing right. Yeah, well, you still yet, haven't told me, Mrs. Barron. That... Always deep in my heart, Mr. Dollar. Yes. Have you thought that perhaps it may have been the intercession of divine providence that has taken Parley from us? Uh, <clears throat> no. But no, you I... must consider it, mustn't you? Because the workings of the power that guides our destinies, our birth, and our Mrs. death... Mrs. Barron... They are sometimes too mysterious for us mortals fully to comprehend, much less question. Well... And so, if my beloved Parley has been taken from us for some divine purpose or for something he might have done unknowing that was not in accord with the supreme Mrs. will. Mrs. Barron, I'm sorry, but I would like to know what your husband's work was. I know, and perhaps it was my humble mission on earth, the cross I had to bear to guide him away from it to chemicals. He was a chemist, Mr. Dollar. Explosives. Explosives? Yes. Heaven, please forgive me for not having led him into some other field. Where did he work? Tampa. Dufresne Chemical Corporation. Dufresne. Oh, yes, I've heard of it. Explosive things to kill in defiance of the Almighty's purpose that we love one another. Yeah, but we... now how, uh, how long ago was this? He retired in 1951. And since then? Here in Sarasota. Uh -huh. And to keep himself occupied. Oh, this lovely home of ours and his fishing... Though he never caught anything. Oh, I see. Never caught anything, Mr. Dollar. Do you suppose that that was some retribution for the work he had done so long, for some error in his living or thinking? Well, I... <laughs> well, who knows, of course. Yes, who knows. But we should consider it, shouldn't we? Uh, uh, where did he do his fishing? He never told me. But he left here almost every day to try his skill... And always he came home empty-handed. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> well, thanks, uh, Mrs. Barron. I'm sorry to have had to ask you so many questions. It's all right, Mr. Dollar. My faith will sustain me through this ordeal. I'm sure it will. Thanks again. Here, you must take some of these pamphlets with them. Oh, Read them. Yeah. Any aid to piety of the mind is good for all of us. Yes, well, thanks. I... The inspired word may help us all. Oh, sure, sure. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks very much. I like to think that on the whole, I... Well, maybe I'm not too religious in the sense of going to church regularly and that sort of thing, but well, at least I try to live a decent sort of life and observe the golden rule and stick to some ideals. And But in an atmosphere like that, well, I couldn't help wondering if her husband didn't have good reason for wanting to get away for a while. 
In any event, I'd got nowhere on the case, so I phoned Sergeant Harry Brackett. That's item two, ten cents. But the desk at headquarters said that he wouldn't be back until about 6 p.m. And since I really had nothing to go on until I could see him, I dropped in on Earl again. You kidding? Then we'll take the boat, run out into the Gulf, and get some fish for dinner. It's the best time of day. So who was I to refuse? And within the hour, we were fighting the tide through the pass between Lido and Longboat Keys on our way along into the Gulf. Eh, Johnny, I find I always have my best luck along about this time of day, just before sundown. I still ought to be back there working. Why? Sergeant Brackett won't be back at headquarters until 6 o'clock, you told me yourself. Now, what can you do until you talk to him and find out what leads he may have Oh, man, you are a funny one. You call (laughs) me long distance to get down in a hurry, then insist I go fishing instead of working. Don't you know, fishing's the answer to more problems than anything else in the world. You got worries? Go fishing. You'll forget them. Got a nagging wife? Oh, don't let Mike hear you say that. (laughs) Well, she's different. You little shrimp. But you know what I mean. A writer, he wants ideas, he goes fishing. A businessman, a detective, huh? I go ahead and say it, an insurance officer. <laughs> sure. I'll bet that more than once when you've been stumped on a case, why, if you would just relax your mind by going out somewhere and wetting a line. I wish it were that easy. And so far as this matter is concerned, I haven't even got started on it yet. Well, relax anyway. Who knows? Maybe the answer to what's happened to poor old Parley Baron will, will, well, will just come to you. Oh, yeah, sure. Oh, sure, sure. Instead of you chasing Earl. Him. Huh? Yeah? Up ahead. Just to the right there. Where? Oh, yeah. Somebody's old beat-up straw hat. Yeah, and a little further. You know something? The tide will carry that skimmer right smack into the Earl, sea here. And if the fellow that lost look, it knows... Look, further the... over to the right. Huh? What is that? Floating there. I don't know. Well, it looks like... Oh, good Lord. Johnny. It's a body, Johnny. We'll drift over to it. That's a body, all right. And that straw hat looks exactly like one I saw in a picture this afternoon. Here. I got it. Can you reach him, Johnny? Yeah. Yeah. Here we go now. Oh, good boy. All right, now let's see. Oh. Is it? Yeah. Are you sure, Earl? Oh, yeah. Yeah, Johnny, it's poor old Parley Barron. Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. Everyone loves kids, and every kid loves candy. American servicemen have heard the tearful cries for candy in most parts of the world, in Europe and the Far East during World War II and after. And there's never seemed to be enough candy to go around. Well, more than a dozen years ago, during the Berlin airlift, an Air Force lieutenant from the United States discovered he had no candy to offer some German children. However, he promised to drop them some candy the next day as he came in for a landing. Improvising a parachute out of his handkerchief, Lieutenant Gail Halverson dropped the candy bars the next day as he had promised. Now, this idea caught on among other Air Force men in the airlift, and that's how Operation Little Vittles began. The idea spread far and wide, and soon military personnel, civilians, business firms began to aid the goodwill program by supplying candy and handkerchiefs. Time after time, as the sleek cargo planes of the United States Air Force swooped low over the landing field, a shower of little bundles of sweets dotted the sky as their tiny parachutes carried them safely to the ground. And the hungry German children gathered up these bundles of mercy, which the communists try to keep from them. The men of the United States Air Force did a great job satisfying a lot of appetites, but they did more. By a wonderful sense of understanding, they nourished the cause of freedom, the right of all men and children everywhere. And now, Act Two of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar and the Parley Baron Matter. Two days' exposure to the elements and the creatures of the sea had made almost unrecognizable the body that Earl Porman and I found floating in the Gulf of Mexico off Sarasota, Florida. But Earl was certain it was the remains of old Parley Baron, who had disappeared two days before. 
The men on duty at police headquarters confirmed the identification and placed the body in the morgue to await the autopsy surgeon. On a hunch, I asked Earl to drive me over to Will Bright's boat dock, where Baron's car had been left parked. It's like I just finished telling the police over the telephone. I wasn't here when poor old Baron come for his boat on Friday. Oh, what a shame, such a nice old man. Where were you, Mr. Bright? I was up to Gainesville, picking up some fishing tackle from a wholesaler. Well, then Mr. Baron must have got a boat from someone else that morning. Oh, no, 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 sir. No? No, no sir. Why not, Mr. Bright? Oh, he never took out a boat from anybody else but me. His own boat. Uh, at least it was the one I kept set aside for him. And that's what kind of puzzled me, Mr. Dollar, is it? That's right. Well, you see, when I come back to you Saturday night, his boat was right here at the dock. But it weren't tied up in its usual spot where I always tie it up. Somebody had moved it. Must have. And it weren't my helper, Pete. You know, Johnny, that means he may have taken it out, but whoever did him in returned it. Oh, possibly. Mr. Bright, which one is his boat? Oh, right here. I'll show you. I always give him the same one. Never let nobody else use it. That's why he kept his fishing tackle just laying in it, always ready to use. Here. Yeah, I see. I've heard he wasn't a very good fisherman. No, no, he never brought in a thing. Of course, maybe he was so soft-hearted he put back everything he caught. Or maybe his daily excursions were just to get away from his wife, Mr. Bright. Now, don't you say nothing against her, mister. Maybe she is a little touched on religion. Sure, she tries a different kind every couple of months. But she's a fine woman, uh, just like he was a fine man. And everybody knows it. Yeah. The whole town is mourning him. Excuse me. What are you looking for, Johnny? Earl, I just noticed something about this tanker lying in the boat. Mm-hmm. Well? Come on. Thanks a lot, Mr. Bright. I'd like to tell you what I think might have happened. Yeah, maybe later. Thanks. Well, what did you what did you find there, Johnny? Earl, did Parley Barron ever go fishing with you? You were good friends. No, no. He always wanted to go out alone. Yeah, but not to fish. Huh? That tackle box hasn't been moved in months. The paint is still dark under it. What? And that reel, I could hardly turn it. Well, then what? I don't know what. But Baron was using that boat every day for something besides fishing. Any ideas? You know him pretty well. Have you? No. Let's get over to headquarters. Earl felt he ought to go back to his office where his wife, Mike, had promised to pick him up. So I borrowed his car again and went over to headquarters alone. Sergeant Harry Brackett, who was assigned to the case, had returned. It was on the phone when I walked in on it. He gets back to town, Mrs. Dana, so please have him call me immediately, will you? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Yes, sir, what can... Johnny! Yeah, hi, Harry. Yeah, Johnny, I'm sure glad you're here. I got a real mixed-up case on my hands. The party burn matter, huh? Well, you know about it? That's why I came to Sarasota. Earl Foreman called me. Have you found out anything? Nothing much of you. Well, only what's here, the autopsy report. What's in it, Harry? Doc Snowden says that Parley Barron was dead before he was put into the water out there in the Gulf. Oh. No water in the lungs, you see what I mean? It probably means murder. Have you told anybody this? No, not yet. Why not? Well, I don't know. Maybe because I just can't figure anybody in the world would want to kill Parley Barron. Did you talk with Will Bright down at the boat dock? Just before you came in. You know, it sounds like somebody went with Barron in his skiff that morning. Killed him, dumped him over the side, and then brought the boat back alone, doesn't it? Yeah, except for one thing. Pete Marino, a little kid who plays around Bright's dock all the time, is sort of a self-appointed caretaker when Bright isn't there. What about him? Well, Peter saw Mr. Barron take off in his skiff Friday morning alone. But he didn't see him come back. Pete went home for lunch when he got back to the dock skiff was in. Uh Uh-huh. Then whoever did it met him out on the water somewhere. Maybe several people, so that one of them could return the skiff. He'd be taking an awful change, would he? How do you mean? Yeah, Doc's in a pretty isolated spot, all right, but the killer showing up in Baron's skiff without the old man long, that's too much of a change. How else could it be returned? <sighs> Tied. Tied? Little Pete says that when he got back to Doc, the skiff was there, all right, but not in his usual place. So well, Bright mentioned. Also, it wasn't tied up. It was just sitting there. Oh, then you met untied. No, I met T-I-D-E. When the tide's rising, it floats everything from the pass between Lido and Longboat Keys right up to Will's dock. You think the boat just floated back by itself? You got a better idea? Harry. Yeah? Are you sure it was Baron's body we picked up out there? After all, the fish and whatnot disfigured it pretty badly. Honey, I've known him for years, and didn't Earl Pullman recognize him immediately? Yeah. And the clothes he was wearing, his own straw hat. Well, have you checked on his dental work? Things like that. Waiting now for Dr. Dana. He was his dentist to get back there. You know, that's a funny thing. Why? I called Dana the minute that body was brought in. Yeah. After all, teeth are about as solid identification as you can get. Oh, I thought you were sure anyway. Well, I wanted to be doubly sure. 
Anyhow, when Dana didn't get here right away, I called him again. I got his wife on the phone, and according to her, he suddenly left for Tampa. Urgent call or something. Where in Tampa? She didn't know. At least she wouldn't say, but it, it seems kind of fishy to me. Well, it may just be that one of his patients... Dana. That's right. The man who got so much publicity about atomic radiation studies, effects on the teeth and so on. That's the one. What's the matter, Johnny? Well, when you stumped on a case, says Earl Pullman, go fishing. We did. We found a body. What are you getting at? Me, when I'm stumped, I play my hunches, no matter how crazy they may seem. And the hunch I have right now, man, is the craziest. I'll see you later. I learned a long time ago in this business, when you got a hunch on the line, you play it for all it's worth. Item three, ten cents for a phone call from a booth in the drugstore just around the corner. Hello? Hello, Mrs. Daner? Uh, yes, this is Mrs. Daner. My name is Larkin, Mrs. Daner, from the Federal Bureau. Uh, the Federal Bureau? That's right, so you can see why it's important you say nothing to anyone about this call. Well, how can I be sure you I'm are? simply checking to make sure your husband has followed instructions. Oh, I see. Has he left for Tampa? Why, yes, the minute he got the phone call. Did he tell you who called? Why, no, but I did hear him mention the name Dufresne. Dufresne? Yes, only he didn't know I heard and... Oh, maybe I shouldn't have mentioned it. Just be sure you don't mention it to anyone else. Oh, no. Goodbye. <laughs> Item 4, 390, at the sign of the Flying Red Horse on the way to Tampa. The least I could do for the use of Earl's car was fill the gas tank. On expense account, of course. The FBI gag had worked before, so I used it again to bowl my way through the gate at Dufresne Chemical Corporation and to the office suite of Dufresne himself. I wasn't at all surprised to see activity in the suite, despite the late hour. Sir, are you the man the front gate just called about? Yes, that's right, FBI. Which is the door to Mr. Dufresne's office? Well, I'm afraid he has some people with him, sir. What did you say your name is? Never mind. Is this the door? Sir, please, we'll have to wait. Come in, Mr. Dollar, come in. Oh. I'm Arnold Dufresne. This is Dr. Dana, and this is Mr. McLaughlin of the Federal Bureau. How are you? We've been expecting you. Oh, uh, have you? Sit down, Dollar. I guess this is your show now, McLaughlin. My credentials, Mr. Dollar. First, I suppose I should prefer charges against you for impersonating a member of the Bureau. Uh, Yeah, well, I... I can uh... hardly say that I blame you, though, under the circumstances. Incidentally, our men in Sarasota's had quite a time keeping track of you. You mean there was a tail on me? From the moment you arrived. No kidding. We didn't dare take the chance that you might upset things for us. After all, you have a reputation for being pretty sharp. We should have anticipated that you might be called in on the case, but though we planned things very carefully, we, uh, well, shall we say, overlooked you, even as we almost slipped up with Dr. Dana here, who would identify that body. Look, will you please tell me what this is all about? A man named Poorman called you in Hartford and asked that you come here to investigate the disappearance of his old friend and client, Parley Barron. Yeah, that's right. Now, where is he? What happened to Barron? Do you know? We do. And we were afraid you might find out and let the... uh, or shall we say, cat out of the bag? That is why we were all ready to send for you to come here, but, well, as it turned out, you came all by yourself. Uh, Mr. McLaughlin. Harley Barron, by the way, Mr. Dollar, is all right, alive, healthy, and happy. Then that body we picked up, dressed in his clothes? Well, during the last war, Mr. Barron, as a research chemist, made vitally important contributions to our, or shall we say, national security. Oh. He was too valuable a man to lose, even though his wife objected to his work for... Religious reasons. Uh, yeah, I uh, gather that from talking to her. Or perhaps you even thought she might somehow be implicated in his disappearance. Uh, the thought certainly entered my mind. Well, in any event, so that he could continue to have a happy home and at the same time carry on his tremendously important work, we arranged for the little deception that has been going on for some years now. His so-called daily fishing trips. That's right. But each morning in a small hidden cove, I needn't tell you where, he was picked up and brought here to Tampa to carry on his work. <laughs> Well, I'll be done. No one was the wiser. Even our, shall we say, uh, competitor nations in atomic and missile research who were bound to keep tabs on such a man, they knew only that he was working for the Dufresne Chemical Corporation. They and that... did know that, huh? Well, we must suppose so. International espionage is pretty well organized these days. Ah. But uh, now this disappearance, Mr. Were changes in plans for nuclear developments had made it mandatory that he spend some time in... Uh, well, elsewhere. Where? Well, shall we say somewhere in New Mexico or something like that. 
So to openly send him there would have indicated to our competitors what these new developments could be. That had to be avoided at any cost. Therefore, the plan for his disappearance was carefully worked out and carried out. Then whose body was it we picked up? Well, some poor, unidentified old derelict who was on his way to Potter's Field. I see, I see. <laughs> well, believe me, if the Bureau functions this thoroughly in everything it does... Oh, we try. Well, what about Mrs. Barron? Oh, she'll bear up. We, of course, made sure of that in the beginning. And then when her dear husband does return... Well, what will it be? When his work is finished. And, of course, that'll be too late for our friends across the sea to catch up with us. And we've worked out a completely plausible story to cover his absence. Oh, I'm sure you have. Now, Dr. Dana here will return to Sarasota in the morning. He will confirm identification of the body that was fished from the sea with only uh, sufficient reservation to protect his professional reputation when Parley Barron reappears. All right. Now, what an insurance claim is filed on Barron? Well, I'm sure Mrs. Barron won't file for some time, unless urged to by your friend Poorman. No, I can prevent that without telling him anything. That's fine. What's more, with the pension that some companies have for, shall we say, slow action on claims... Well, don't let them hear you say that. Well, Barron will be back before you need to worry about it. Now, is uh, that okay with you, Mr. Dollar? Um, Shall we say... Okay. And once more, I tip my hat to the FBI. Expense account total, including plane fare and incidentals back to Hartford, $421.50. Remarks? For obvious reasons, I have used fictitious names throughout this report and, of course, delayed filing it until obtaining official clearance. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, a strange old character, the most beautiful girl I've ever met, and money all over the place. Counterfeit. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote tonight's story. Heard in our cast were Virginia Gregg, Jeanette Nolan, Will Wright, Barney Phillips, Lawrence Dobkin, Stacey Harris, and Harry Bartell. Musical supervision is by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Dan Coverley speaking. Johnny Dollar has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. Hollywood. It's time now for Johnny Dollar. Mr. 
the dollar. This is Henry Parker with Continental Assurance out in Reno. Well, how are things in Nevada, Mr. Parker? Terrible, sir. Just terrible. Well, I'm sorry to hear that. What seems uh, to be... Excuse me, Mr. Dollar. Yeah? Uh, there's someone here who would like to speak with you. Oh, who? Give me that. Who do you suppose it is, you sloth-eyed Pinkerton? Sounds to me like a cantankerous old character named Josiah Gillis. Cantankerous? Why, you miserable... What are you doing in Reno, Mr. Gillis? I tell you when you get here. When I get... Oh, no, now, wait a minute. I can't wait. If I do, he'll be dead and it'll be your fault. Who? A feline friend of mine. A what? Oh, being uncouth like you, you'd probably call him a cat. Oh, no. Look, Joe Dyer. Also, he's rich. He's what? Rich, yes, sir. Last week, he inherited $60,000. This week, somebody's making sure he won't live long enough to spend it. <laughs> Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To the Continental Assurance Company, Reno, Nevada. The following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Felicity Feline matter. Expense account item one, $164, air transportation, Hartford to Reno. En route, I wondered again what Jodiah Gillis was doing in Nevada. At Reno, he was on the flight deck waiting for my plane, and standing beside him wearing a dark suit and expression to match was a tall, cadaverous-looking gentleman. As I started down the ramp, Jodiah began calling me. Yeah, there he is! Oh, dollar! You who? Hey, John! Oh, hi, afternoon, Jodiah. Well, you are a sight for sore eyes, boy. Yes, indeed, you are. Johnny, this is my friend and business associate, Henry Parker. Mr. Parker? Oh, I'm certainly glad you've arrived, sir. That's so? Yes, my, yes. Mr. Gillis has been quite concerned over Felicity. The Felicity? The feline. What do you think you came out here for? Your help? Well, no. Yeah, and then give Parker your checks. My checks? So what's the matter with you? The altitude affects your mind? Hand over your claim checks so Parker can fetch your luggage. Oh, uh, uh, sure. Here. Yeah. Yeah. Go on, Parker, go on. We haven't got all day. Whatever you say, Mr. Gillis. Yeah. We'll be in the waiting room. You hurry up. Yes, sir. Now, come on, Dollar. Come on, come on. Jodiah, before I left Hartford, I tried to check up on this Continental Assurance Company. Nobody ever heard of it. A lot of things those white-bellied clerks in Hartford haven't heard of. But the fact is, Continental ain't exactly worldwide. Oh. Uh-huh. In, here, in here. No, sir. It ain't nationwide either. Well, uh, just how wide is it? Well, you know how far it is from Winnemucca to Black Butte? Uh, no. Good. It's just about that wide. Oh. And Parker is one of their agents, huh? Agents? Parker is the president of the Continental. The president? But you just... I mean... Will you look peaked, boy? You better sit down. Phew. <laughs> Jodiah, I shouldn't let the man that's paying my salary run after my bag. Pistache. Here. Take a look at this. It's my new business card. <laughs> yeah, go on, read it. Uh, Josiah Gillis, chairman of the board, Continental. What? Yes, sir. But Floyd's of England has always carried your policy. Carried, yes, past tense. I don't take guff from anybody, especially a ninny of an insurance agent telling me what I can insure and what I can't. You had a fight with him? Yep. My cousin Rachel, oh, she's a sweet girl. She lives in the Belgian Congo. She sent me an African anteater. Now, all I wanted... Floyd's to do was insure it for $15,000. And of course they wouldn't. Nope. So you canceled all your policies and bought the controlling interest in Continental. Same as anybody else would have done. Oh, sure, sure. And uh, naturally, you insured this anteater. Yeah, Archie. That was his name. Was his name. What happened to him? Well, it was a terrible thing, Johnny. Oh, it was just poor old Archie. He overindulged. Over? He did what? Yeah, he overindulged. He found a house full of termites. Oh. Yes, finally died. Acute indigestion. Too bad. But of course, Continental Assurance paid off. And of course they paid off. And with a smile. Same as they paid off the $60,000 to my feline friend, Felicity. 
What? 60,000 to Felicity. What do you think? The 60,000 Felicity inherited from Mrs. Hammermeyer. And who is Mrs... Was, was, was. All right, was Mrs. Hammermeyer. A client of Henry Parker's had a life policy for 60,000. Felicity was the beneficiary. But didn't she have any children or relatives? She had one brother, a nephew, and a niece. Oh, of course, not counting Mrs. Hawkins, who was Mrs. Hammermeyer's best friend. <clears throat> you see, the two ladies lived together 15 years. And right now, Mrs. Hawkins has been appointed trustee to administer the 60 grand as Felicity needs. Oh, I see. Yes, you meet her as soon as we get settled. Jodiah, what makes you think someone's trying to kill that guy? I don't think so. I know it. There have been two attempts in two weeks. You ask Mrs. Hawkins. She'll tell you. Mr. Gillis, Mr. Dollar. Ah, yeah. It's about time, Parker. Well, come on, Johnny, come on. We'll take you down to the Mapes. The Mapes? The Mapes Hotel. I'm staying there. And if it's good enough for me, it's good enough for you. The Mapes Hotel stands high above Virginia Street, overlooking the Truckee River. After Gillis checked me in and introduced me to the owner, Mr. Charles Mapes, I unpacked and went with Jediah out to the old Hamelmeyer place where Felicity the Cat, Mrs. Hawkins, and the relatives still live. We rang the old-fashioned doorbell and waited. In a moment, the door was opened by a pasty-faced man of about 28. Yeah? Oh, Mr. Gillis. Yes, afternoon, Oscar. Mrs. Hawkins in? Ain't she always? Who's he? He's a friend of mine who's also an insurance investigator. An insurance? Name's Johnny Dollar. Johnny, this is Oscar Emmett, the late Mrs. Hammermeyer's nephew. I am. I suppose you hear about that lousy cat. Uh, that's right. Well, uh, come on in. I'll tell the old lady you're here. You know where the living room is at, don't you, Mr. Oh, indeed I do. Oh, friendly sort of character. Uh, Oscar's like the rest of the Emmets. They just can't stand seeing Felicity eat steak when they gotta have tuna casserole uh -huh. in here, darling. All right. Well, what kind of work does he do? Work? Oh, Oscar? None of the Emmets work. No, sir. Not even Mrs. Hamelmeyer's brother? Emmett. Emmett spends all his time in the gambling halls. You know, gambling's legal here. Mm. He a professional? Oh, no, no. He's got a slot machine route. He huh? goes around poking his finger in the payoff trays. Picking up the nickels and dimes that people overlook. Oh, 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 I see. Yeah, let's sit down here. Let's sit down. Here. Oh, 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 what the hell? Oh, Felicity! That cat has claws. Oh, you stepped on his tail, you stupid. Oh, oh. Tell him you're sorry, Dollar. Well, I didn't know he was there. Sorry, Felicity. Oh, the bad man didn't see you. What's going on? Oh, you get right down off that table. You hear me? Oh, oh, oh you. Oh, Mr. Gillis. Would you use your influence, please? Well, I'll certainly try, Mrs. Hawkins. <laughs> Felicity. Come on now, honey. That's a good kitty. There. Now. I just put out a nice dish of scallops for him. Oh, you hear that, Felicity? Scallops? Oh, yum, yum. Sure. So you run along now. Bye-bye. <laughs> oh, I, I do declare I've never seen a man who has such a way with animals. <laughs> well, I... I and that yeah. goes for lonely widows, too, Mr. Oh. Gillis. <laughs> oh, oh, now, Leona, stop. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> oh, oh, yeah. Uh, Mrs. Hawkins. Leona is just fine. Yeah, well, well, this is the young fellow I was telling you about, Johnny Dollar. Oh, oh, well... This is indeed a pleasure, Mr. Dollar. Jodiah told me so much about you. Oh, is that so? You're much more handsome than I imagined, Mr. Dollar. Yeah, now, good gravy, Leona. Now, you just tell him what's been going on around here. You mean about Felicity? Yeah, that's what I mean. Well, somebody's after him. Trying to kill him. Tell me, has an actual attempt been made on his life? Wednesday night, a week ago. I let him out just before I went to bed, like always. Uh-huh. He'd been out about an hour when it started to pour. And knowing Felicity hates to get wet, I opened the front door to call him. Well, just as he was crossing the street, I heard this big car start up. Yeah. And it zoomed straight for Felicity. Whoever was driving it almost turned over trying to hit him. You didn't get a good look at the driver, huh? I didn't get any kind of a look. It was too dark. Well, what about the car? What make was it? If I knew that, I'd have already told you that. I haven't any secrets from him. <laughs> oh, uh, tell him about last Thursday, Leona. Felicity was poisoned. That's what the vet said. Somebody put arsenic in his lobster. 
Lobster? Oh, yes, he just loves it. According to the instructions Mrs. Hamelmeyer left, he's to have lobster once a week. Steak three times and boiled chicken every Sunday. I see. Yes. And as long as I take care of and obey her instructions, I can live here rent free. Same as her kin, the Emmets. Uh huh. Same as them. Mr. Gillis, just who gets Felicity's money in case he dies? The Emmett family? We aren't sure. Oh, why's that? Because Mrs. Hammermeyer left a sealed envelope to be opened only in the event of Felicity's death. Oh, the Emmets will get all that's left, Mr. Dollar, I'm sure of it. Oh, no, 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 Leon. You mustn't look on the dark side. Well, I did rub Mildred, uh, Mrs. Hammermeyer's back and bunions for a good many years. Did her marketing. Saw she got her medicine on time. I do hope she appreciated oh, it. Oh, she did. She did, Leona. You see. You dear, sweet man. Hello? Anybody home? Where is everybody? We're in the living room. Yes, I figured they'd start flocking in. Now it's dinner time. Dollar. Yeah? It's Joyce Emma, the niece. She hates cats. Told me so herself. Oh. Well, evening, Mrs. Hawkins. Do I have time to take a shower before dinner? Oh. I didn't know he had company. Mr. Emmett, Joyce, you both know Mr. Gillis. Yes. Hi, Mr. Gillis. Terrible. And this is Mr. Johnny Dollar. He's investigating the trouble we've had about Felicity. After the would-be cat killer, huh, Johnny? Yeah, that's right. I'll lay eight to five, you never catch him. Or her. Could be a woman, you know. Oh, yes, yes. It most certainly could. Why, Joyce, the way you say that, you act as if you want Mr. Dollar to start investigating you. Maybe I do. How about it, Johnny? Well, uh, how do you feel about Felicity, Miss Hammond? The same as everyone else in this house. Aunt Mildred had no business leaving all her money to that... that creeping night crawler. Well, he is. Mr. Dollar, just what interest do you have in Felicity? He isn't insured. Mr. Gillis sent for me, Mr. Emmett. He did? Yes, I did. Continental has a moral responsibility to see that the funds handed over to widows, children, and dumb animals are protected from swindlers, connivers, and blackguards. Of which I'm sure this house has many. Why, you now, pompous, me. wrinkled old Romeo. Joyce, please, if you can't hold your tongue, leave the room. Well, what I said is the truth. Man his age getting romantic. You wait, girl, 30 years from now, you'll be mighty glad men my age can get romantic. <laughs> oh, that's Mr. Emmett. <laughs> Mr. Emmett, do you yeah. share your daughter's opinion of Felicity? Why, of course I do. I'm a dog man. Besides, I can't see why she left all that money to the critter. Mrs. Hawkins has figured up what it costs to keep him like a king every week. Yes, yes, $23. Uh, maybe a trifle more by the time I get him out of the pretty kitty. The pretty kitty? Well, it's a beauty parlor for cats. Felicity has a standing appointment there every Friday at 1. Oh, no. $23 a week. You know how many weeks it'll take him to spend that 60000 not counting the interest that'll add up while he's doing it? No, not exactly. No, 2600 no. weeks. 50 years. And believe me, the odds in any cat living to be 50 years old, well... I'll lay you ten to one. He doesn't live another six months. Joy. Oh, speak of the devil. Well, hello there, Felicity. Oh, did you know we were talking about you? Did you finish up all your dinner, Felicity? He sometimes doesn't eat all his scallops. Last week, I gave them to Oscar. Oh, it's disgusting. Hmm? Well, look at him. He thinks he owns us. What do you mean, thinks? <laughs> A few minutes later, Jodiah drove me back to the Mapes. Whether it was the Emmets or Mrs. Hawkins who wanted Felicity out of the way, I didn't know. But I did know we should get him out of that house as soon as possible. I changed my clothes, met Jodiah and his friend Charlie Mapes in the Skyrim for dinner, and did a bit of gambling, then went to bed. Must have been about 3.30 when the phone rang. Hmm? Huh? Who is it? Mrs. Hawkins. I tried to get Mr. Gillis, but he left word he wasn't to be disturbed. Oh, well, what is it, Mrs. Hawkins? What's wrong? Oh, it's terrible. Oh, it's just terrible. Uh, what? What is it? What's happened? Felicity. He. Oh, he. Felicity what? I let him out about ten, but he... He's disappeared. Mr. Dollar, I know he's been killed. <laughs> Two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. 
Anyone who has survived the rigors of basic training is familiar with a great variety of milk that is dished out periodically in the armed forces. Now, there's frozen milk, concentrated milk, frozen concentrate, and good old powdered milk. But sometimes, supplying wholesome, fresh, real milk has been a problem when servicemen have been stationed in out-of-the-way places. The United States Air Force came across that problem some time ago in the island of Teixeira, in the Azores, those Portuguese islands that dot an eastern portion of the Atlantic Ocean. The air base there was considered powdered milk country for a long time. Although cattle have played an important role in the economy of the island of Teixeira, the herd was badly inbred and milk production was very low. Modern milk processing was not a part of the picture. And with the help of Portuguese veterinarians, the men in the United States Air Force unit worked out a free breeding service by using a small herd of milk cows acquired in England and the cattle there at Teixeira improved. Then, a complete pasteurizing, homogenizing, sterilizing, bottling refrigeration plant was flown in from the United States. As soon as this activity got underway, milk production began to climb steadily, and thirsty Air Force men and civilians were soon buying and drinking the new fresh milk. When economy of the island began to rise rapidly, the people were happy and grateful. You might say that a little milk of human kindness increased understanding on an island of freedom, the right of all men everywhere. And now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, and the Felicity Feline Matter. A few minutes later, Jediah Gillis and I were at the old Hamelmeyer home. Joyce and her father, along with Mrs. Hawkins, were waiting for us. Oscar Emmett was nowhere to be found. He's the one, Johnny. Yes, sir, that shifty critter, that Oscar. He stole Felicity, and is going to do him in. Ah, that poor Felicity. Oh, for heaven's sake, Mr. Gillis, pull yourself together. Oscar could be downtown having a run of luck, Mr. Dolly. Well, if he's gambling this time of night, he shouldn't be too hard to find. Mrs. Hawkins. Yes? When did you first realize Felicity was missing? Why, about an hour ago, I guess it was. I woke up and remembered he was still outside, so I came down and called him. Yeah? Always before, ever since he was a little kitten, he's come back home for me. But tonight, well, he's just nowhere to be found. What time did you let him out? About uh, 10.30, same time as I always do. Were you at home then, Joyce? No, she wasn't. I had a real good day yesterday, collected almost four dollars, so I took it to a movie. A movie? <laughs> That's a likely story I've ever heard. It <laughs> happens to be the truth, Mr. Gillis. What'd you see? Come on, tell me. It was an old one about a giant gorilla. That's right. Oh, I'll bet, I'll bet. Well, you die. You die. If anything has happened to poor Felicity, will we? Well... How much time will we be given before we have to move out of this house? Well, that's up to the court, but I'd say a couple of weeks. That's all? Oh, my. Well, it's all they deserve. My. All except you, my dear. Well, Johnny, you've been unusually quiet. What do you think? I think we'll take in the late spots, Judiah. See how our luck's running. Started at the Mapes and went down Virginia Street, stopping in at every gambling casino, hoping we'd find Oscar Emmett. Finally, we found him at one of the roulette wheels in Harold's Club. And in front of him was a large stack of chips. Make your bets, ladies and gentlemen. There's a couple of seats around here, gents. No, thanks. We'll just watch our friend. And a very lucky friend he is, too. Put these on 32 and these on... Uh... Good morning, Oscar. What? Huh? Well, what are you two doing here? We've been looking for you. That's so? What for? You know what for, you catnapper? What'd you do with Felicity? That cat? You know any other Felicity? You know good loafer? All bets are down. No, 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 wait a minute. I wanted these chips on 13 black. Sorry, all bets are down. What? Now see what you two made me do. If that 13 hits, I... Well, what do you want to see me about? We told you. Felicity. You know where he is? Now, how would I know? Where have you been since 10.30 this evening? All around town. How long have you been here? Long enough. Look out now. 
13, hard and black. Oh, why, you, you see what you two clowns cost me? Take my mind off what I'm doing. Now get out of my way. I'm cashing in. You're not doing nothing to the answer our questions, Mr. Oscar Emmett. You hear me? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh. Hey, wait a minute. Just a minute, Oscar. Hold back. Shania, are you all right? Uh, yes, I guess a fine bodyguard you'd make. Oh, uh, Mr. Gillis, I'm... I'm sorry, I, I didn't really mean to hit you. Well, you sure it, did. Yes, sir. <laughs> well, here, let me help you up. Are you sure you're all right, should I? Yes, if I could just sit here a minute, I'll be fine. Okay, okay, folks, it's all over. Let's get back to our business. Oh, uh, uh want to come over here a second, Dollar? If you say so. That crazy old fool, I, I didn't really mean to hit him so hard, but he... Well, you know how it is sometimes... That was the best run of luck I had this year. Well, don't worry about your dyer. He sometimes forgets he's not as young as he used to be. Huh. You can say that again. Boy, the way he's been letting that Mrs. Hawkins make a fool of him. How do you mean? Oh, you know. Telling him how much she's in love with him, how nice it'll be after they're married, you know. You heard her say this? Sure. You see, my room's on the first floor just off the parlor. And I can't help but hear what's going on. Uh-huh. Well, what makes you think Mrs. Hawkins isn't sincere? Because she's been given the same line to Mr. Remmett. Oh. Oh, only she's, she really loves him. Oh, yes, sir. Sometimes he argues with her and she breaks out crying. Now, that's something no woman like her could fake. Yeah. Maybe you're right. I didn't tell Jodiah what I'd learned from Oscar. At least not then. The wind had already been taken out of his sails. So I took him back to the Mapes. I made sure he was going to be all right. Then I returned to the old Hamelmeyer house. Joyce, Mr. Emmett, and Mrs. Hawkins were out in the yard hunting for Felicity. Hi, Johnny. Well, hi is so. We've got some coffee inside if you're interested. Coffee? Sure. But have you found any sign of Felicity? Not yet. Poor Miss Hawkins, she's about to go out of her mind. Uh-huh. Did you find Oscar last night? Yeah, yeah. He's been having a session downtown at a roulette table. That's what I thought. Johnny? Mm-hmm. What will happen if we don't find Felicity? I, I mean, if he's just run away, we won't be able to prove he's dead. And the money... Well, what will happen? Do you know? Well, I imagine there'll be a waiting period, and then the court will declare Felicity dead, and the money will go wherever Mrs. Hamelmeyer has willed it. Mm-hmm. Oh, I sure wish I knew what's in the envelope Mr. Gillis has locked in his office. Mrs. Hawkins! What? Joyce! Mr. Dollar! Now, what, what is it, Dad? In here, quick! Johnny, he found something in the garage. Come on, come on! The garage is about 25 yards from where we've been standing. We made it nothing flat. Inside, toward the back and on the ground, was a small hatchet. And near the hatchet was some blood. And cat fur. Oh, oh Johnny. Oh, no. Poor Felicity. Oh, the poor, poor thing. Well, oh. it, it looks like he met his end here, oh, and then whoever did goodness. it carted him away, oh, huh, Dollar? Yes. Looks that way. Oh. Johnny, I... Oh, take me out of here. Yeah, sure, oh. Joyce. My goodness. So ashamed. And you know I hated that cat. I really wanted him dead, but not like this. Not... Oh, hey, hey, hey. Come on now. I know it's silly. I mean, isn't it? No, no, I don't think it is. Oh, Mr. Dollar. Yes, ma'am. Will you be kind enough to notify Mr. Gillis? I... Oh, I'm afraid I just couldn't speak about it over the telephone. Of course. I'll be glad to. I drove Judea's car back to the hotel. I made sure he was feeling better, then told him what we'd found in the garage. Naturally, he wanted to call out the police reserves, but I managed to talk him out of it. At 10 o'clock, I made some telephone calls to the local banks. When I got the information I'd been after... Jodiah and I again drove out to the Hamelmeyer house. Well, I expected you two gentlemen a couple of hours ago. Sorry, Mrs. Hawkins. I had some things to take care of. Oh, well, come in. Uh, what's the matter with... Why, Jodiah Gillis, you've been fighting. So I have, woman. So I have. Sweet darling, and at your age... Seems like I've been doing a lot of crazy fool things at my age. Now, just what do you mean by that? You know very well what. Pulling the wool over my eyes. Let me think that I've found a true sweetheart at last. Oh, you... You miserable Jezebel. 
Mr. Dollar, whatever is he talking about? How about you and Mr. Emmett? Mr. And how Mr. you plan Mr. to use Jodiah's friendship to get you out of trouble in case your little scheme failed? Well, I still don't understand. No? Well, suppose I tell you that you did away with Felicity yourself. Why, you... You can't prove that. I won't need to. Jodiah's having a copy made of all your bank deposits since the time you moved in with Mrs. Hammermeyer 15 years ago. And started taking care of her by paying her bills, ordering her food and medicine, and pocketing a good share of the money for yourself. Well, why shouldn't I have? She didn't give me one cent of salary. Oh, I know. And your bank balance shows you have $47,000 on deposit. All right. Uh, all right. But I'll pay it back. You'll see. Oh, they won't be able to do a thing to me. No, sir, Mildred Hammermeyer appreciated me even if nobody else did. Or does. You'll see. My name will be in that envelope. She wanted me to have that money all the time. I know she did. Hi. Ready to read the will? Yeah, just about. Uh, Joyce, you and your father sit over there, huh? Mm-hmm. Wherever you say, Mr. Dollar. Okay, Jediah, open the will. Sure, I will. But if it does give the money to... Jediah. Well, Mrs. Hammermeyer should spin in her grave if it does. Read it if you dare, you... You old... Go to miserable female woman. Yeah. Yes, where are we just now? Here we go. Ah, codicil to the last will and testament of Mildred Emmett Hammermeyer. Witness by... Yes, there's a lot of legal gab here. Ah, here we are. The money's unspent after the death of the cat known as Felicity shall... Well, holy smoke. What? <laughs> Mr. Gillis. This is no time for laughing, Gillis. Read it, Jodan. Yes, please. Oh, oh, doggone. I'll I'll, I'll read this thing again. The monies unspent shall then go to the descendants of the original heir. The what? The descendants? What? Uh, Yes. The the original heir is Felicity. Now, the money goes to his descendants. And being as he was a tomcat who loved to go prowling at oh. night. Oh. Did he no. ever have descendants? Oh, hundreds of them. Oh. Well, sir, what happened later proved once and for all that miracles can happen. For at one o'clock on Friday afternoon, we got a phone call from the Pretty Kitty Beauty Shop. A large tomcat with a bad cut on the back of his neck had shown up for his usual shampoo and manicure. Maybe they do have nine lives. Expense account total, including hotel bill, incidentals, and transportation back to Hartford, $407.20. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, an actor who talked nothing but Shakespeare... And who talked himself into his grave. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. For the past 55 minutes, you've been listening to the best of radio drama, The Suspense and Johnny Dollar. Be sure and join us again tomorrow night at the same time, 9.05, when FEN presents The Phil Harris Show and The Life of Riley. Hollywood. 
It's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Fred Larkin, Johnny. New Jersey fire and casualty. Hope I didn't get you out of bed. Well, you sure did, Freddy, but how are things in Trenton? In Trenton, fine. In the little town of Vineland, I'm not so sure. Vineland? About halfway between Philadelphia and Atlantic City? That's the place. What goes down there? Fire. Arson? That's what I hope you can find out. Well, uh, any reason for suspicion? Yes. The man who holds the policy on $83,000 worth of bedding. Bedding? Mattresses, box springs, it went up in smoke two days ago. Okay, Fred, I'll grab the first train. Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. And now, act one of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the New Jersey Fire and Casualty Insurance Company Home Office, Trenton, New Jersey. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Smoky Sleeper matter. Expense account item one, 1075, fare and incidentals, Hartford to Trenton. Item two, 80 cents, taxi to Fred Larkin's office on West State Street. He lost no time in getting right to the point. That's right, 83,000, total loss. Well, who's filed the claim, Fred? Name is Ben Murray, sole owner and manager of Ben Murray Furniture Sales in Philadelphia. Sort of a small chain scattered around all over the city. I thought you said the loss was in Vineland. It was. That's where he had a big warehouse. All of his stores are in Philly. He claims it's cheaper than maintaining a big warehouse in the city. Also, apparently, it's close to a couple of sources of supply. He's been a good account, Johnny. We've made a lot of money on his policies. Well, it sounds like you've issued him quite a few. Well, we have. You see, in addition to the usual coverage on his stores, we've issued him a lot of short-termers on warehouse contents from time to time. I don't quite see what you mean. Uh, His whole business is based on special sales. Pre-inventory, going out of business, distressed merchandise, fire and water damage sales, summer, winter, spring, and fall sales. Anything you can think of. No kidding. Periodically, he loads up his vinyl warehouse with stuff he's accumulated for the next big sale. And we insure it. This time, it was $83,000 worth of box springs and mattresses. Wow, that's a lot of betting for just one sale. Eh, Don't worry. He'd have got rid of it. His salesmen are the sharpest bunch you ever saw. Too sharp, if you ask me. Almost like a bunch of con men. You know what switching means in the retail trade? Isn't that when they advertise a well-known item at a very low price? That's it. Then when you try to buy it, they just uh, happen to have sold the last one. That's it. But by that time, they've got you in the store where they can use the high-pressure pitch to sell you some inferior item at an even higher price. And on a no-return basis. Yeah, by the time the customer gets wise, it's too late. Exactly. I suspect they're not above using the label switch, too. You know, have some local manufacturer make up a cheap item, then put a nationally recognized label on it, or a pretty good copy. My, my, what nice clients you have, Freddy. Well, what can we do, Johnny? As long as we don't catch them red-handed in something that directly affects us. Well, you don't need to write any more policies. Mm, The company says different. At least until such a time as they try to pull something on us, or we find proof of such doings. I see. Well, where'll I find this, Ben Murray? Either his main office in Philadelphia or down in Vineland looking over what's left in the shell of that warehouse. On what exactly does Murray base the amount of his claim? Face value of the policy, which in turn was based on the cost of the goods to him. Huh? You mean you used the figures he gave you? Mm -hmm. Hardly. We got the figures from the actual bills sent him by the manufacturer. Well, I wondered. I don't blame you. No, Johnny, that 83,000 is exactly what the mattresses and box springs cost him. It was a special order from one manufacturer, made up especially for one big sale. Can your secretary check on Murray's whereabouts for me? Sure. All right, then let me use your phone. I may be able to save us all a lot of time, labor, and soap. I call my old friend Adam Bowles, who lived within a few miles of Vineland, who, before he retired, was one of the top arson men in the country. Investigator, I mean. He wasn't home, but I left word for him to drive to Vineland and meet me in the lobby of the East Landis Hotel whenever I got there. Meanwhile, Fred's secretary had learned that Ben Murray was in his Philadelphia office. 
Expense account item three, five sixty for a train to Philadelphia and cab to the main office of Benmer Furniture Sales. The place was a madhouse. Okay, Dollar, go ahead in. It's that first office on the right. Thanks. And listen. Oh, wait a minute. Sales department. Call me back. I'm busy. Listen, Dollar, if you can get a word in edgewise with Ben, ask him, where's the contracts for that West Philadelphia deal, will you? Oh, sure. Sales department. Yeah? Well, turn the hose on so that I stop and call it a block sale. What like that? Makes a picture in there, the advertisement look good, see? Put a lot of stuff around. Pictures on the wall, rug on the floor, stuff like that. Yeah, make the suckers think they're getting a 25-piece dining room suit, not just a table, four chairs, and 20 crummy dishes. Dollar, sit down. Thanks. Yeah, make it look like they'll be getting everything they see in the ad. Yeah. Now, did you get them sofas in from Sterling? Okay. Put a price ticket of 95 bucks on them, and then mark it down to 49.95, and we'll clean out the whole... Mr. Murray. Huh? See what? Sterling charges 25 bucks for those lousy sofas. Listen, we're giving them 22.50 for them, except for the demonstrator we show on the floor, the good one. Who does he think he is telling me the price he's going to charge me? Oh, the lousy bunch of chiselers trying to hike the price on me. Holy, what a business. From the looks of that outer office, you've got plenty of it. Yeah, yeah, volume, Dollar. That's what does it. I work on a narrow margin, see? Oh. Yeah, sometimes I even lose money, just to keep the volume up. I got nine stores, see? They're all over Philadelphia. Hey, Ben. Yeah, what's the matter now? Pine Street wants to know the sale prices on those three grades of night cloud mattresses. What'll I tell them? What are the cost prices? All the same. Thirteen bucks a piece. Cost us thirteen bucks, huh? Well, price them at, uh, at, uh, thirty-nine ninety-five, forty-nine ninety-five, and sixty-nine ninety-five. Okay, Ben. Hey, Larry. Narrow profit margin, huh? And now look, Dollar. Your card says you're an insurance investigator. That's right. Well, if it's about that fire I had down in Vineland a couple of days That's ago... That's exactly what it's about. Well, let me tell you something. Uh, oh, for... Yeah, what is it? Oh, yeah, well, listen. Hey, pick that other phone off the hook, Dollar. That noise is killing me, will you? Why not? I might learn something. Well, you tell him I don't care if he's a Department of Internal Revenue in person. Hello. We pay hey, for the Ben, guy I got like a dame him. here in the store. Found out that bed we sent her wasn't the yeah, same that? one she saw on the floor. Well, well no. Wait, wait we just a minute. I, uh, uh, she threatens okay. to go see the, the Better Business Bureau. Be well, look, uh, this That's isn't Ben. Huh? That's what I mean. Just hold on a minute, will you? Hold on. you tell that bookkeeper we got there, he either keeps the books the way I tell him, or either he... Well, look, I'll call you back, see? Did you hold that call for me, Dollar? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Hello? Yeah? Yeah? Well, don't take any chances. Give her anything she wants. Give her the one she saw on the floor. Go out and buy her one, a good one. Just make her happy. Keep her from... Uh, from well, you know what I mean. Yeah. Troubles, troubles, troubles. When I look, Dollar, you think there was anything wrong with that fire, you prove it, I'll give you this whole business. What do you think I am, a crook? I haven't said that. Yet. Then, then what's the idea of investigating? Not you, but that fire. We always investigate when a claim this large is involved. Oh, yeah? Do it automatically. Look, I'm trying to run an honest business here, just barely scraping by. That phone call just now. A customer ain't 100% satisfied, we make her satisfied. Oh, sure. To keep her from blabbing about the way you rooked her. Oh, look, look, get out of here, would you? Can't you see I'm busy? I try to run a decent business here, and punks like you come in and... Oh, if I'm... Yeah, hold on. Look, you got some legit reason to investigate, Dollar. You come around then. Maybe I will. Now go on. Get out, will you? Gladly. Listen, Charlie. You tell him he tries to outsmart me, I'll sue him for every cent he's got. Expense account item four. $50 deposit on a drive-your-own car. I crossed the Delaware River Bridge and finally picked up Route 47 for the 35-mile drive down to Vineland. Flat country, this, with plenty of beautiful trees and rich farmland, and occasional cranberry bog. The soft smell of ripening peaches greeted me from the vast orchards I passed. It was all very pleasant. Certainly a complete contrast to the noisy, unhealthy joint I just left. And I could see only too plainly why Fred Larkin suspected arson in the warehouse fire. Sure. If a character like Ben Murray didn't resort to arson, he'd feel he was missing a good bet. Proof of arson, however, is a different matter. And not always easy to come by. That's where I wanted the help of Ed Bowles. But Ed hadn't got to the hotel when I arrived in Vineland. So I drove over to the police headquarters at 610 Wood Street, a block north of Landis Avenue, the main drag. There I found Sergeant Louis Tommaso, who'd been working on the case. 
Be glad to take you over there, Dollar. Just the other side of Chestnut Avenue. That's over south of town. All right, Sergeant. I'd like to see that warehouse or what's left of it. Oh, there's plenty left of the warehouse. All metal construction. Come on. That in itself might make it hard to spot our... Dollar, we went over the... Lieutenant, Mr. Dollar and I are going out to the Benmer warehouse. We went over that place with a fine-toothed comb, both during and after the fire. You came up with nothing, huh? Nothing that would give any cause for suspicion. Sergeant... Do you know a man by the name of Adam Bowles? I certainly do. He's been giving me a lot of help with this. You know, just to sort of keep his hand in. And he's found nothing? Not a thing. But of course, he's the kind that never gives up. Yeah. Well, let's get on over and take a look at that place. It was obvious that the whole contents of that warehouse was damaged beyond repair. And apparently the big steel building had been packed to the roof. I looked over some of the damaged mattresses very carefully, sometimes with the aid of my pocket knife, and I learned some rather interesting things, things that showed the best possible reasons for wanting to burn up a lot of merchandise like this. Hmm. Wow. Well, have you seen enough, Mr. Dollar? Yeah, I guess so. But I still want to talk to Adam Bowles. So let's go on back to... Wait a minute, wait a minute. Looks like Ed pulling up in that car there. Huh? Oh, so it is. Hey, Ed. What? Johnny. Yeah, well, hiya. Sergeant, don't tell me you sent for a half-quit like Dollar. <laughs> Just again. a minute now, Stinky. Why, the greenest rookie on the force would get further. Ed, I'll brain you. You two know each other. <laughs> are you kidding? <laughs> Johnny, how are you, baby? Great, just great. You got my message, huh? Yeah, but I hereby inform you that, as usual, you got here too late. Oh, is that so? When I found out you were coming, I decided I'd better get to work, if only to show you up. <laughs> So I did, and I found out who started the fire. Well, I've got a pretty good suspicion myself. Who did it, Ad? Poor old Jerry Cumber. Who? Jerry? The old town ne'er-do-well? Yep, that poor, foolish old wino. Wow. How'd it happen? Oh, he was just wandering around that night, as he often does, with a bottle to keep him company. Found the back door of the warehouse open, thought he'd take a little nap, or rather sleep it off. He certainly had his choice of nice soft beds. Yeah, so he went to sleep with a lighted cigarette in his fingers. And there you have it. And the funny thing, Sergeant... Yeah? The only charge you can really hold the old bum on is being drunk and disorderly. And, of course, trespass. What? Well, you look it up. You'll see I'm right. As for you, Johnny, you can just go on back to your company and tell them to pay the claim. Oh, that's so? Yes, sir. Case is closed. At least for you. That's where you're wrong. Huh? After a couple of things I heard at the Benmer office, plus a couple of things I've seen here, Adam, I think this case is just starting for me. Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. For a long time, people have been saying that the earth is shrinking because transportation is getting faster and faster. And because this is true, people are getting closer, too. Today, our neighbors are not only the ones who live next door to us. They're all over the world. It is axiomatic that one should help his neighbor. But Americans have gone a step further. In addition to individuals helping individuals, now many American cities help many other cities through the Sister City program. Now, perhaps you've heard how it works. If not, here's an example or two. In the fall of 1959, a large area of Nagoya, Japan, was struck by a devastating typhoon. Her sister city, Los Angeles, California, sent tons of relief materials to Nagoya by way of an Air Force plane headed for the area. The Marines and the Navy rendered vital emergency aid during the disaster. When earthquakes shook Viña del Mar, Chile, during the summer of 1960, her sister city, Sausalito, California, sent hundreds of dollars' worth of relief materials to help out. Another case in point, the schoolchildren of Clovis, New Mexico, sent a number of cultural exchange packages to students in their sister city of Adana, Turkey. There are hundreds of such examples because there are hundreds of sister cities. By using this means of diplomacy, 
friendship and understanding have increased throughout the world and paved the way for permanent freedom. The right of all men everywhere. And now, Act Two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Smoky Sleeper Matter. <laughs> From the looks of things, the case was practically over. The fire at the warehouse full of box springs and inner spring mattresses had been accidental. And it looked, I underline that word looked, as though Ben Murray's claim for reparation to the tune of $83,000 was entirely justified. Ed Bowles, the finest expert on arson I knew, had produced the man who started the fire as proof. So, on the surface, there was nothing for the company to do but pay Ben Murray's claim. But I smell a rat, a big one. Expense account item five, 75 cents for a person-to-person call to Fred Larkin and Trenton. Well, Johnny, if you're satisfied with Bull's conclusion that it wasn't arson, well, that's that. We'll have to pay off the claim. Uh, what if I could prove fraud? Fraud? What do you mean? Look, Fred, you told me you saw the bills, the manufacturer's bills, to Murray, giving valuation on the bedding that was stored in that warehouse. Yes, I have photostats of those bills right here in my desk. But what... Are... Good for you. Dig them out, will you? Oh? Why? Go on, go on. Dig them out, Fred, and read them to me. What if there was no arson? I fail to see what you're driving Look, will at. you do what I ask you? I'm trying to save your company some money. All right, all right. Ah, uh, here now. Uh, now, what do you want to know? Well, the labels on the remains of the mattresses I looked at at the scene of the fire, those labels indicated there, there was a model called the Night Cloud Sleep Rest. And that checks with these bills. Now, uh, let's see. Uh, there were... 3,500 mattresses called Night Cloud Sleep Rest. Well, forget the quantities. What was the manufacturer's price to Ben Murray on that Night Cloud Sleep Rest? Well, let's see. Uh, uh, Johnny, they cost Ben Murray exactly twenty-five fifty apiece. And there's an equal number of box springs to match. Twenty-five fifty. That's right. But I overheard him say in Philadelphia that he only picked... Hmm. What, Johnny? Uh, nothing, nothing. What other models are on those bills? Uh, Night Cloud Super Sleep. And the price? Uh, just a second. And look while you're figuring, you might be interested in knowing that the labels on that sleep rest indicated a retail price of $69 each. Some profit, huh? Uh, here now. Johnny, the Night Cloud Supers cost Murray $26.20 apiece. Wow, hey. All right, I got it. And he claimed to be working on a narrow profit margin. Now, the Night Cloud Perfection Sleep cost him uh, $27.14 each. Good. Any more? Uh, those were the only ones he bought and stored in the warehouse. All right. Now, give me the name and address of the manufacturer. Easy. Golden Bedding Corporation, Woodvine, New Jersey. Good. Now, one more thing. Can you think of the name of another big chain of furniture stores, you know, like Ben Murray's, only in uh, New York or Chicago or some other big city? Well, of course, there's Glauder Brothers in New York. Glauder Brothers. Only they're such a disreputable outfit that when they try to talk insurance with us... Freddy, have... that's all the better. Thanks a lot. Now, wait, Johnny. You still haven't told oh, me... Oh, I will, Freddy. Don't you worry. I will. Why I didn't get pinched for speeding somewhere along Highway 49, I'll never know, because I certainly didn't hold back the horsepower. Just short of the town of Tuckahoe, I turned off on 557, and then a few miles later pulled into Woodvine. Although it's a small community surrounded by farms that boasts a big hat factory, a couple of clothing factories, a vast, sprawling state institution, and on the far edge of town, the Golden Bedding Corporation's huge plant. I figured the best thing to do was put on a bull front and pull my way into the president's office. But any such tactics proved entirely unnecessary. Barney Glauder, huh? Uh, yes, Mr. Golden. Uh, but just Barney's good enough. Well, I should say it is, because you must be Barney Jr. I've known your papa for years. <laughs> Sit down, my boy. Would you like a cigar? Why, uh, no, no thanks. You don't look like your old man, though. You know that? Not a bit. Of course, I haven't seen him since 42. <laughs> Barney Glauder. Yeah. Well, what are you doing in this part of the country, huh, Barney? Oh, um, business. Uh, pleasure, Charlie. Business, huh? What's the matter? We haven't had any orders from you people lately, huh? Well, up to now, I haven't really had anything to do with the business. <laughs> Living off the old man's millions, huh? Smart boy. <laughs> Did you go to college? Yeah. Oh, four, four years. Yeah, that's the way. Smart boy. Now you are in the business. Buying, maybe? Well, if you mean from you, that depends. <laughs> if you're as sharp as your papa... How old is he now, huh? Pop? Yeah. Oh, uh, let me see. How's your mama? Mama? She... Uh, look, Mr. Golden, if mm-hmm. you if you don't mind, uh, we'll talk business first. Huh? <laughs> Chip off the old block. Sure, business always first. After maybe you come out to the house and have dinner, huh? Talk over old times, your family. Sure, maybe. All right, you go right ahead. Tell me what you want to order. 
A thousand mattresses and box springs, huh? Ten thousand? Anything you want, my boy, and at a good price. Well, like I said, that depends. Uh-huh. What kind of a deal, is that what you mean? Yeah. All right, I'll tell you. Your papa's a very smart man, you know that? He's a good businessman. I know what he's thinking, so I know what you're thinking. All right. If you want to give me a nice big order for a lot of merchandise, I'll name you a price that you... Listen, Barney, I've got such a good customer in Philadelphia these days, not mentioning any names, but you'll pardon me, I don't even miss your papa's business. Understand me? But to get your business back again, I'll make you the same type deal I give this man. For a firm order, that is. You understand? No cancellations. You'll, uh... You'll, uh, pre-ticket the merchandise. That mm-hmm. is, uh, put the list price on the labels for me, uh, for us. Any price you say, regardless of the cost to you. Now, uh, look over here, my boy. The pictures of our merchandise here on the wall. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Night Cloud Perfection Street. Well, we'll put on any name you like. One should sound like some national brand, we'll think up a name for you. Not a bad deal. So far. And we make up as many models as you want. You know, we change just the ticking. They look different. All 196 springs, I personally guarantee it. Only 196? That's all you need, sure. Nobody can tell the difference. Except, of course, the demonstrators you keep on the floor to show the customer. Uh-huh. The demonstrators, you have 392 springs. Those, you can jump on and bend them anything you like. Yeah, and the customer thinks that's the kind he's getting. What else? I tell you, Barney boy, just as smart as your old man. Yeah. Now, uh, what about the price? Ah, the price. Now, Barney, this you can't resist. You understand, out here in the country, low overhead, no labor problems, nobody snooping Yeah, yeah, I know. How much? Well, for you, my boy, how many? Well, uh, say, uh, 10,000 units. 10,000 units. All right, I'll give you a special price. How much? Well, now, this depends on the ticking material. Hmm? You look here. See? First class material looks like twice the money. Go on. Plain blue and white ticking. That costs you. And remember, Barney, this is very special because of your papa and getting back his business. So, at 10,000 units in this ticking, $14.93 and you never saw such a buy. That okay? Eh, strikes me as a little high. A little high? I'm not making a thing on it. Look at here. This, the fancy ticking. This is real class. Fifteen dollars and six cents a unit. Now, you can't beat that. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Well, of course, Barney, my boy, if you want to order a few no, more. No, no, no. I, I, I think maybe I can do better up in New England. In New England? Who? Tell me who. Well. All right. All right. Now, look. I told you I've got a big customer in Philadelphia. Well, all right. Never mind. We'll do it the same way for you we do for him. All right? On the books. How do you mean? No, well, I mean fourteen ninety-three cents, huh? Only what would you think if the bill I send you says twenty-nine ninety-six, hmm? Double? Mm-hmm. You'd make it look like I paid twice as much? So? Yeah. Yeah. For tax purposes, I'd only be showing about half the profit I was actually making. Mm-hmm. Smart boy, Barney. Or, uh, suppose I insured the stuff for the amount your bill showed, and something happened to Well, there, that's huh? right, sure. However you want excuse me. Hello. Oh! <laughs> Hello, Ben. I was just thinking of you. I hear you had a lucky fire up there. What? Oh, no, not now. Listen, Ben, I've got a customer. I've got... No, I've got an important customer here, the son of a very dear old... F... What? Yes, he is. Yes. A blue shirt and a bow tie. Oh, no. Oh, no. Ben, I'll call you back. Mr. Dollar? That's right. Johnny Dollar. In person, Mr. From Golden. the insurance... Oh, no. Oh, no, no. Too bad Ben Murray's call interrupted our conversation. Oh, what advice. That was a very interesting lot of facts you gave me, and I strongly suspect it'll not only put Murray out of business, but you too, and a lot of people you've been All dealing right, with. Dollar. Brother, I hate to think of what the Better Business Bureau oh, will do when they get hold the of these facts. Bureau. To say nothing of the Federal Trade Mr. Commission. Dollar, listen to but me. But I have a notion it'll help to clear up one of the dirtiest chip rackets in years. There's no need Even to Even the long-suffering on. public understands this sort of shady operation when it's brought to their no, attention. It's not at all. As for the decent, legitimate national firms you've been practically now, stealing from. Me, Dollar, will you please listen a minute? Yeah, go ahead. Business has been good. I've made a lot of money. Oh, now, wait Maybe a minute. Maybe you, you could use a little bit. You know, we'll call it the commissioner. Huh? Say $10,000. In cash, it wouldn't show. Golden, I wouldn't even spit on that kind of money. Oh, I could maybe persuade you. You couldn't persuade me to have any part of it. Brother, you've had it coming for a long, long time. And believe me, I'm going to see that you get it. Understand? Yes, Dollar, you make it... I understand. I understand you, too. You dirty crook. 
You faker. You liar. You cheating, dirty, conniving, chiseling liar. You ruined me, you hear? You ruined me. Yes, Fred? I'm afraid that your nice client, Ben Murray, based his insurance claim on a lot of values that didn't exist. On the hiked-up prices. Hiked up to cheat you and the income tax boys. And if that is not right fraud, I'll eat my shirt. So you can just forget about paying that claim or any part of it. And I hope that you and the company will take whatever legal steps are necessary to put these guys out of business. Expense account total, including incidentals and the trip back to Hartford, $130.49. And cheap at half the price. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Our star will return in just a moment. Our flag now numbers 50 stars, and behind each star there stands yet another flag representing one of the 50 states. Kansas state flag is dark blue, and in the center is the state seal, surmounted by a large sunflower, the official state flower. The seal reflects the history of Kansas, the train of ox wagons going west, for most of the great roads passed through Kansas. An Indian is depicted chasing a herd of buffalo, recalling the words of the official state song, Oh, give me a home where the buffalo roam. For this truly was the home of the buffalo and Indian. The east is represented by a rising sun, and the promise of future prosperity is indicated by the steamboat on the river and the farmer plowing the field. Above a mountain range are 34 stars, for Kansas was the 34th state admitted to the Union. Over all is the state motto, Ad Astra Per Aspera, to the stars through difficulties. Kansas state flag, the flag of the 34th state to enter the Union, was adopted on March 23, 1927. Now, here's our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, the case of a girl who is willing to kill for money she didn't need. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote tonight's story. Heard in our cast were Russell Thorson, Jack Edwards, Will Wright, Paul Dubois, Lawrence Dobkins, and Vic Perrin. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. George Reed here, Johnny. Uh Uh-oh, what fantastic character is Floyd's of England insured this time? Now, what is that supposed to mean? More singing mice, wayward cats, and how about the counterfeit money problem? Johnny... No, no, let me guess. John, if you'll just listen to me... I got it. You're in trouble because you've done a switch. You've insured somebody against living instead of the other way around, that it? Of course not. No, I must admit we do have one policy of that sort in effect. There, I knew it. However, that is not the one I called you about. Okay, George, what is? We've issued a policy. Well, I guess it is a little unusual at that. I fear the worst, but go on. Well, it's on a small brewery over near... Brewery? You mean a beer factory? That's right. It's over near the town of Tamaqua, Pennsylvania. Oh, yeah, I know that country pretty well. Good. We've insured the Dortmund Brewery against possible damage from a nearby construction project. Well, you said unusual. What's so unusual about that? Uh... Perhaps you'd better come over here and let me tell you. Yeah. When you say it that way, I guess I'd better. Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of a man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. And now, Act One of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Floyd's of England, North American office, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the JPD matter.
Expense account item one, a dollar ten. Taxi from my apartment to George Reed's office, where he promptly dragged me over to a large map tacked to one of the walls. Here it is, Johnny, between the towns of Tamaqua and Trackville, Pennsylvania, on a little river that's called uh, Pinksatawney Creek. Old Indian name, I believe. Uh huh. The Dortmund Brewery is just about here. Yeah. Well, okay. I'll rent a car in New York and drive over there. Now, wait. By making a couple of train changes, you can get most of the way over there by rail. Anything to save the company a buck, is that it? Why not? When that freewheeling expense account of yours gets into operation... Okay, okay. What's the face value of the policy? Coverage for the whole plant. $820,000. Wow, we. So I'll rent a car in New York. All right, all right. Now, as I told you, we've insured the Dortmund Brewery against possible damage from the building of a plant right next to it. What kind of a plant? Competition. Another brewery. Oh, I see. Possible malicious damage. Is that what they're thinking of? Mm, that's what J.P. seems to be worried about. J.P.? J.P. Dortmund. Owner, manager, president, brewmeister, and anything else you can think of. Has anything happened yet? No, but I want you to go there and be sure that nothing does. Is this J.P. my contact? Yes. Okay, George, I'm on my way. <laughs> Expense account item two, nine thirty-five, fare and incidentals, Hartford to New York. Item three, fifty dollars, deposit on a drive your own car. Item four, fifty cents, toll through the Holland Tunnel. I cut straight across the top of Jersey, crossed the Delaware at Phillipsburg, and finally pulled into the little town of Tamaqua shortly after six p.m. Items five, six, and seven, twelve twenty. For dinner, a place to rest my weary head and breakfast the next morning. The Dortmund Brewery sat on the western bank of Pinksatawney Creek, about five miles out of town, and looked as though it had been sitting there for a thousand years. It was a small affair, and the old frame buildings were badly in need of a coat of paint. Just north of it rose a towering cliff, and on top of that cliff stood an array of cranes and machines and bulldozers that are used on modern large-scale construction jobs. I parked my car at the entrance of the office building and was greeted at the door by a large, raw-boned woman of about 50 with straggly yellow hair and wearing a faded blue cotton dress that looked as though it hadn't been ironed in years. Something I can do for you? Oh, why, uh, I'm looking for Mr. J.P. Jordan. Mr. I feel laugh. Is it? Why? Because I'm J.P. What? That's right. Anything wrong with it? Well, I... Hey, uh... wait a minute. You another of those lawyers from that job up on the cliff comes to fancy talk me about no. not having to worry in the world about what they're doing to no, me up there? No, no. And how I... I better mind my own business. What do you mean, no? My name is Dollar, Johnny Dollar. I'm here on behalf of Floyd's of England. The insurance company? Well, now, that's different. You come on into my private office, Johnny. Her private office was furnished with a battered walnut desk, some ancient filing cabinets, and a couple of straight wooden chairs. Nothing else. Hardly the kind of an office you'd expect for the president of a company worth $820,000. There's nothing fancy about it, Johnny, because there's nothing fancy about any part of my brewery. But that isn't what counts. We've been here ever since my great-great-grandfather built it up. And all we've cared about is making the finest beer in the country. Gretchen? And we do make it, too. Gretchen, can't you hear me out? Yes, Jimmy. Gretchen, I want you to bring Mr. Dollar a pitcher full and a glass. Yes, ma'am. Well, look, I'm afraid I'm not much of a beer man. You ma will be when you've tasted this. It's the creek that does it, you know, Pinksatawney Creek. Finest water for beer in the whole United States. That's what makes good beer, you know. Yes, so I've heard. That's why that dirty Clarkson Kemper bunch are building up on the cliff to get at that water. I understand they'll be your competitors. Ha! Huh? All their fancy modern equipment and methods can't produce the brew the way I can. The long, slow, easy way. With all the good old-fashioned apparatus. The old country methods. Yes, I see. Now... By Johnny, we make our own barley malt. And we grind it by hand. And we come up with a wort that's second to none in the world. The old-type sparger, too. And the hop jacks. And the finest strain of yeast there is. Yes, I'm sure that Three you... full months we age before we rack a drop. Sure, we take more time and more trouble, but we come up with a better brew. Better than any modern plant can ever make. Well, then what's your problem? They're getting ready to blast up on that cliff. Blast? A whole big chunk of it away. And when they do, that whole thing will come crashing down here. Thousands of tons of rock. Well, surely there's some state authority or something to prevent that. Oh, they bamboozled the authorities. And your insurance company, too. They'll say it was an accident. A miscalculation. And when that rock comes crashing down here, it'll wreck this whole plant of mine. Well, you do have insurance, remember. It'll wreck all my fine old equipment that can never again be replaced because there are no such things anymore. Well, when's all this blasting supposed to take place? Who knows? 
tonight, tomorrow, next week. Who knows? That soon? Yeah. So, Johnny, if there's anything you can do, you'd better do it now. What's insurance money if I have to lose this for it? Who knows? Maybe she was right suspecting her rivals might try a stunt like that to put her out of business. But it all seemed a little too far-fetched. And yet when I think of some of the unscrupulous things that have been done to put down competition, maybe she was justified in suspecting this Carlson Kemper crowd of... Yeah, maybe she was. Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. Our flag now numbers 50 stars, and behind each star, there stands yet another flag representing one of the 50 states. Massachusetts state flag, bearing a green pine tree, is the descendant of the famous Liberty Tree flag that came out of Boston to serve all the original 13 colonies. It was under the Liberty Tree flag that the Sons of Liberty met and planned the Boston Tea Party, that our floating batteries on the Delaware River defended Philadelphia, and on the Charles River defied Howe's cannons. Beneath the tree is inscribed the state motto, Ensu petit placidum sub libertate quietum. By the sword we seek peace, but peace only under liberty. These words were originally written by the famous English patriot Algernon Sidney about 1659. This was a message intended for King George III. Unhappily, it went unheeded. Massachusetts state flag, the flag of the sixth state to enter the Union, was adopted on March 18, 1904. And now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the J.P.D. Matter. If J.P. Dorpen was right... If there was the least possibility she was right in her suspicion that Carlson Kemper would blast thousands of tons of rock down on a little plant in order to put her out of business. Well, there was only one thing to do. I got back into my car and drove by a roundabout way up to the top of the cliff overlooking the Dortmund Brewery. There in the middle of the vast array of heavy construction equipment, giant cranes, trucks, huge cement mixers, and so on, I found the main construction shack. And by a stroke of luck, one of the partners in the proposed new brewery, Mr. James Carlson. <laughs> Ah, oh, that crazy old lady's being absurd, Mr. Dollar. <laughs> you really want the truth, well, I think she'd welcome our smashing that antiquated brewery of hers out of existence. Is that what you plan to do, Mr. Carlson? Can you be serious? By blasting a few tons of rock off the face of the cliff into the river? Or a few thousand tons? Or a few thousand tons. Won't do that place of hers a bit of harm. You're sure? Of course I'm sure. Only thing I'm not sure of is why she stays in business. What do you mean by that? Well, she can't be making any money. Methods she uses were out of date in this country 50 years ago. The product's good, sure. But today, you've got snowball. Did you know, Dollar, that out of the goodness of my heart, I offer to take that crummy plant of hers off her hands? Or because her location is better, down next to the water supply. Oh, partly, sure. I offered her nearly half a million for her spot. Uh, 400,000, to be exact. <laughs> but no dice. She just kept bothering us, trying to get out a lot of injunctions against our building there. I assume you have the necessary permits for this blasting operation. <laughs> you hold draw for them. Hey, look at them yourself. At the same time, appreciate the volume of red tape necessary to do anything these days. But suppose that something should go wrong. That quite by accident, the top of that cliff should drop down on J.P.'s brewery. Mr. Dollar, it's to obviate any such possibility that I called in one of the foremost blasters in the country. Who, um, purely incidentally, is top man for one of the biggest makers of explosives in the world. You talk to him, Mr. Donner. Maybe I will. Believe me, I can understand why you might not take my word for the safety of the operation we're about to undertake, but certainly you can't question his word. You say about to undertake. When? I believe he's planned the big blow-off for tonight. Tonight? Yeah, come on, I'll take you to it. We found this expert, a Mr. Sidney Crutchfield, in a small, tidy shack set out near the edge of the cliff, working over a series of complicated diagrams with a busy slide rule in his hand. And I must confess, he turned out to be one of the most interesting men I've ever met. Tall, slim, and gray-haired, he had a quiet, easy, yet confident manner that completely belied his hazardous occupation. This was the man who had done the dynamiting for some of the biggest jobs in this country, had moved mountains and rivers in the construction of huge dams, had blasted the way for some of our vast highway networks. As you can see by the dates on these sheets, I finished planning this blast over two weeks ago. 
But I find that constant checking and rechecking never does any harm. Mr. Carlson tells me you plan to set off this blast tonight. Yes. Actually, I shall push the plunger at exactly 2 o'clock tomorrow morning. If Mr. Carlson is ready. Don't you worry about it, Mr. Crutchfield. We're moving the equipment and the shack's away right now. Excellent. And at the time of the blast, no one is to be here but me. That's what your contract says. And that's the way it must be. For safety, Mr. Crutchfield? <laughs> well, call it a fetish of mine. Uh-huh. And there'll be no damage to the brewery plant down below? I'll stake my reputation on it. Come, Mr. Dollar. If you like, I'll show you how I've made the sets for this blast. We spent the rest of the day inspecting every tunnel, shaft, and drill hole into which the explosives have been packed and fused. And the artistry of this man was evident from the word go. By 6 p.m., all the machines and shacks and equipment had been moved back from the edge of the cliff that was to be blown off. The place was deserted, except for Mr. Crutchfield and me. And now, you must get into your car and leave, Mr. Dollar. But if there's no danger... Please. I prefer it this way. Surely you're not still concerned about the blast? <sighs> to be honest about it, no. Not one bit. And I wasn't at the moment. Yeah, this amazing man simply couldn't do anything wrong. I would have staked my life on it. But by the time I'd driven the long, curving road to the Dortmund Brewery below... Had found the place not only deserted, but completely shut down. A funny little hunch began to grow in the back of my head. Even the office building was dark, as far as I could see. With the help of a business card, I slipped the lock on the front door. And then I saw the thin streak of light under the door of J.P.'s private office. I thought I heard something in there. The office was a shambles. Account books and papers scattered all over the place... A couple of cartons, the drawers of the crusty old files, were open and, for the most part, empty. Somebody had been hastily packing and removing all the important papers. But why? I'm sorry, Johnny. Oh, uh... Sorry! Oh! And you seemed like such a nice boy. Three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. Anyone who has survived the rigors of basic training is familiar with a great variety of milk that is dished out periodically in the armed forces. Now, there's frozen milk, concentrated milk, frozen concentrate, and good old powdered milk. But sometimes, supplying wholesome, fresh, real milk has been a problem when servicemen have been stationed in out-of-the-way places. The United States Air Force came across that problem some time ago in the island of Teixeira in the Azores, those Portuguese islands that dot an eastern portion of the Atlantic Ocean. The air base there was considered powdered milk country for a long time. Although cattle have played an important role in the economy of the island of Teixeira, the herd was badly inbred and milk production was very low. Modern milk processing was not a part of the picture. And with the help of Portuguese veterinarians, the men in the United States Air Force unit worked out a free breeding service by using a small herd of milk cows acquired in England and the cattle there at Teixeira improved. Then, a complete pasteurizing, homogenizing, sterilizing, bottling refrigeration plant was flown in from the United States. As soon as this activity got underway, milk production began to climb steadily, and thirsty Air Force men and civilians were soon buying and drinking the new fresh milk. When economy of the island began to rise rapidly, the people were happy and grateful. You might say that a little milk of human kindness increased understanding on an island of freedom, the right of all men everywhere. And now, Act Three of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar and the J.P.D. Matter. When I came to in the office of the Dortmund Brewery, my head fell as though it had been split wide open. The sash weight had been used on it lay beside me. But why had J.P. struck me down from behind the door where she'd been waiting for me? And why before that had she been hastily packing a lot of business papers, bills and so on, to take away? A couple of them still lay under me where I'd fallen. 
It was several minutes before I found strength enough to roll over and try to push myself to my feet. As I did so, two things. I saw two things. One was a bill she'd overlooked in her haste to get away. A bill from Frankline Powder Company addressed to her personally. A bill for 21 cases of dynamite and some other explosives. The other was my watch. I'd been out for hours, too many hours. For according to my watch, it was 1.52 a.m., exactly eight minutes before the tremendous dynamite blast on the cliff above was to be set off. And suddenly I knew where, somehow, by her plan, those thousands of tons of rock would land, and not harmlessly in the river below. And I knew why J.P. had left me here. So I'd be crushed by them. Oh. 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 Come on. Oh. Come on, come on, come on. Oh, please, please, come on. Hello, hello. Oh, please, hello, hello. Operator. Operator, this is emergency. Yes, sir. Hey, look now, I'm, I'm calling from... Dortmund, Bury. It's between... Yes, I know where it is, sir. There's a big construction. Carlson Kemper, that's the name. Well, sir, Up on the I... cliff above this, this sir, bury here. Sir, sorry, but those lines were disconnected late this afternoon. What? But look, surely there's some way to... Operator. I'm sorry, sir, but there's no way to ring them. Oh, no. Oh, I... I've got to get out. I've got to get out of here. Somehow I get up there and get it. Oh no! Oh, please, I got it. I gotta get in that car. Get in. Don't push that like... plunger. I'm sorry, Don't set Mr. off Dollar. that blast. That's no. That's exactly what I'm going to do right now. No, you're not. No, no. I'm sorry, Mr. Dollar. You have no right to interfere. You now stand hear back. hear what I said. Dollar, put down that gun. You touch that plunger and so help me. I'll pull this trigger. Now, wait a minute. Dollar. Dollar, what's the matter with you? Oh, I... What's happened to you, man? Oh, good heavens, man. I guess it was just luck that I was still hanging on to that bill for the dynamite that I'd found. I guess it was luck that made Crutchfield grab it when he tried to keep me from falling. Made him look at it carefully by the light of his flashlight. But it was his good sense that kept him from going ahead and setting off that charge. When daylight came, he found the spot on the face of the cliff where J.P. had another charge planted. It was set to go off by concussion from the blast that Crutchfield had set. It would have diverted the rock from Crutchfield's blast to smack dab on top of her little beer factory. Nobody would ever have known who'd really done it. And J.P. would have collected 820000 insurance for it. Incidentally, when the police caught up with her, which wasn't hard, they also found the book she'd taken from her office. Yeah, J.P. Dortman was broke. Stony. Expense account total, including a handful of doctor bills for my aching head, and all the incidentals I could think of, $204.80. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Our star will return in just a moment. Our flag now numbers 50 stars, and behind each star, there stands yet another flag, representing one of the 50 states. The origin of Hawaii state flag has been the subject of much debate. It is now believed that it was the work of foreign advisors to King Kamehameha. Legend also has it that it was designed at the request of King Kamehameha by George Beckley, an English sea captain. The flag consists of eight horizontal and alternating stripes of white, red, and blue, representing the eight major islands in the chain. 
Also represented is the British Union Jack, a reminder of Captain Vancouver, who on his voyage around the world in 1794 gave King Kamehameha a British flag and the promise of British protection. The Union Jack is also a reminder of Captain James Cook, who discovered the Hawaiian Islands in 1778. Hawaii's state flag, the flag of the 50th state to enter the Union, was adopted in 1845. Now, here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, the ideal vacation matter. But believe me, it turns out to be neither ideal nor a vacation. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote tonight's story. Heard in our cast were Eleanor Audley, Gene Bates, G. Stanley Jones, Alan Reed, and Austin Green. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Dan Coverley speaking. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. Hollywood. It's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Pat McCracken, Johnny, Universal Adjustment Bureau. Oh, hi, Pat. Hey, I thought you were on vacation. I was. I got called back right in the middle of it on account of Ned Grant. You know him? Grant, the Broadway columnist? That's the one. Well, what's he got to do with your vacation? He's heavily insured by one of the companies we represent, and right now he's taking his vacation. Wow. Well, Ned has made a lot of enemies in his time. I know. I read his column. Yeah. And it looks like one of those enemies is trying to make Ned's vacation permanent. Savvy? I'll be right over, Pat. Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. And now, Act One of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Home Office Universal Adjustment Bureau, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the ideal vacation matter. Expense account item one, a dollar twenty for a taxi from my apartment to the office of Universal Adjustment Bureau, where Pat McCracken was waiting for me, his face covered with sunburn and worry. Just when I was beginning to relax and enjoy my vacation. Sit down, Johnny. Thanks. Now, what's the deal about this Ned Grant? When you say you read his column, you know he prints some pretty blunt stuff sometimes. Yeah. I've often wondered how he gets away with it. A couple of years ago, he dug up some evidence on a bad boy named Willie Bemis. Bemis. Bemis, yeah. The stuff he printed helped get Bemis convicted, didn't it? Yeah, but he swore he'd get even with Ned. Oh, well, a fellow in Ned Grant's position hears that kind of threat all the time. Besides, with Bemis in jail, what's the problem? None at all, Johnny. If he were in jail, he broke out last night. 
Oh, I see. Does Grant know that Bemis is on the road? No, I told you, Grant's on vacation, probably as far from a newspaper as he can get. So you think he's in danger? Well, what would you think? Oh, but if Bemis has any sense, he's heading in some other direction as fast as he can. We can't afford to take the chance, Johnny. Well, look, Pat, I still don't see where I figure in this. Why not just arrange for police protection for Grant until Bemis gets picked up? (laughs) Want to protect the guy, you got to find him first. Find him? Yeah. You mean you don't know where Grant is? Apparently nobody knows. Oh, great. And I'm supposed to find him. That's right. Oh, and do me a favor, huh? Like what? Find him before Willie Bemis does. Well, I know enough about Bemis to realize he wouldn't hesitate to gun down anybody who got in his way, including me. So I headed for New York. That's item two, $23.40. I located the apartment house where Ned Grant lived and had a talk with the manager in his office at the rear of the first floor. I'm sorry, Mr. Dollar, but I really don't have the slightest idea where Mr. Grant went on his vacation. Well, didn't he leave a forwarding address? No, he just told me to hold all his mail for him here until he got back. And he didn't say anything at all that would give you a clue as to where he might have gone? Mm, None at all. Oh, great. I don't know if you know Mr. Grant very well, but... uh, Well, he's unpredictable, let's put it that way. Of course, the kind of life he leads would make a character out of anyone, I guess. You mean batting out that column every day, huh? Yes, and his phone ringing every ten minutes and strange people traipsing up to see him at all hours. Really, I can understand his not telling anyone where he went on his vacation. He just wanted to get away from it all. He kept saying that this time he was going to have an ideal vacation. Ideal vacation. That could mean anything from a trip to the moon to... Oh, Lord knows what. Tell me this. Did he take much luggage? Well, I don't even know, but he hadn't been gone ten minutes before my phone started ringing with calls for it. Your phone? Yes, Mr. Grant had his disconnected before he left. Uh, Tell me, Mr. Dollar, what's so uh, urgent about finding Mr. Grant? There's an escaped convict named Willie Bemis who has it in for him. Oh? He could be looking for Grant. If so, I have to find Grant first. I see. Well, I wish I had more information for you. Oh, I tell you, you might try Miss uh, Anthony. Huh? Possibly she could help you. Well, who's Miss Anthony? Uh, Doris Anthony. Uh, well, uh, a close friend of Mr. Grant. Oh. You know where I can find her, where she lives? Well, as I understand it, she has a small apartment somewhere on uh, East 73rd Street. Good, I'll find it. Thanks, Mr. Crothers. I walked outside and hailed a taxi. But then, just as I was about to step into it, I froze. Because I caught a glimpse of somebody walking quickly into the service entrance at the side. And there was just enough light to tell me it was none other than Willie Bemis. I headed back in fast and straight to the door of Crothers' little office. The door of it was locked. Crothers, open up. Crothers. Okay, then I'll open it. Hey, Crothers, what happened to you? Oh, um, Mr. Dollar. That's right. What happened? This man, right after you left, he came barging in. That was Willie Bemis. What did you tell him, Curtis? Only, only what I told you. And it looks like he and I are starting out even. Huh? But this is one race I don't want to end up in what you'd call a dead heat. Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. And now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, and the ideal vacation matter. I looked up Doris Anthony's address on East 73rd and took a cab. That's item three, $1.75 to her apartment. She was tall, rangy, dark hair. And somewhere along the line, I'd seen her before, but I couldn't remember where. Ned Grant? How would I know where he is? He isn't exactly the sort of guy that lets you in on his plans. Hey, listen, Doris, this may be the oldest line in the book, and I know it, but haven't I seen you somewhere before? Could be. I've been around a while. Like where? Oh, I used to sing in a couple clubs around town. That's where I met Ned. He liked me, so he helped me. In his column, is that what you mean? Yeah, that's what I mean. His apartment manager says you're a very good friend of Ned's. He has a lot of girlfriends. My main claim to fame is I'm always handy. Well, look... Grant told the apartment manager he was going to take an ideal vacation. Any idea what that would mean? Or where? Sure. Wherever there are girls. What do you want him for? Somebody's out to get him. 
What do you mean? Who? Willie Bemis. That name mean anything to you? Bemis is in prison. He was. He's out now. What? When? You didn't know? Uh, I haven't read the papers today. Does that change your mind any about helping me find him? Look, really, I don't know where he is, honest. There is one thing that might help, though. Yeah, what? Well, a week or so ago, while I was out with Ned, he stopped in at a travel agency. Uh, Davis, I think the agent's name was, on 50, 51st Street, around there. Okay, I'll follow it up. Johnny, if Ned doesn't know, Bemis... Yeah. Will... And if I don't get to him first, he's in for a real nasty surprise. <laughs> There was still something about Doris that stuck in my mind, but I couldn't quite peg it. So I decided to do a little quick research on her. I dropped in to see an old friend who worked in one of the newspapers. We dug through a lot of clippings in the morgue. Doris had sung at half a dozen spots around town, and there were a lot of pictures on her. Then I came to one that rang a large-sized bell. It was a shot of her sitting at a nightclub table. And a man sitting there with her was Willie Bemis. <laughs> I headed back to her apartment fast. But she was gone. The manager told me she'd left in a hurry and with a suitcase. Now I didn't know where I stood. If Doris was still friendly with Bemis, it could very well be that she knew where Grant was and was helping Willie Bemis find him. In that case, the lead she gave me on the travel agent was only a bum steer to throw me off the trail. But the way things stood, I didn't have anything else to go on at the moment. So I had to take a chance she'd been on the level. I headed for West 50th Street and the travel agent she'd tell me about, a man named Davis. Ned Grant. Plus, customers like him I can do without. What do you mean by that? Here, I'll show you. Here we are. A reservation at Nassau. Here's one in Bermuda. Oh, and here's one for the Virgin Islands. He had you make all those for him? Every one. That sort of thing doesn't make me very popular at those resorts, believe me. Well, it's a sense you can't be at all those places. If you ask me, he's not at any of them. He's always doing that sort of thing. Well, that's a lot of help. Just the same, I'm going to call those places. Where's your phone? Right there on the desk. But I tell you... Excuse me. Hello? Who? Oh, yeah, just a minute. Uh, it's for you, Mr. Dollar. Oh, thanks. Johnny Dollar. It's Doris Anthony, Johnny. Wow, well, I didn't think I'd be hearing from you again. Why not? After I found out you were an old friend of Willie Bemis, I went back to your apartment. You'd cleared up. Johnny, I'm no longer a friend of Willie B. Oh, now, wait a minute, sister. It's the truth. But I was afraid he might come to see me. That's why I left. Oh, sure. Johnny, the reason I'm calling, I think I know where Ned could be. Where? Well, I'm not sure, but a few days ago, he went to see a friend of his named Mike Hastings. Mike owns a ski lodge up in Vermont. Ski lodge? There's no skiing this time of year. I know. The lodge is closed, but Ned's gone up there once or twice before when he wanted to get away from everything. <sighs> okay, where is it? It's called Hastings Lodge, about 20 miles beyond Bradbury, on a little country road. Now, look. I have no choice but to go on up there. Have you told anyone else about this? No, of course not. Okay, Doris. Don't. <laughs> Expense account item four, $38.50. Transportation by plane and rented car to Hastings Ski Lodge. As I jounced over the bumpy road up in the Vermont woods, I couldn't help thinking this might be strictly a wild goose chase. But at the moment, I couldn't afford to pass up any lead. It was after dark when I finally drove up to the lodge. It sprawled on the side of a hill way out in the middle of nowhere. There were no lights on, no sign of life about the place at all. The door was unlocked. Inside, the room was pitch dark with all the curtains drawn. I couldn't find the light switch, but I had a real funny feeling, like maybe there was somebody else in the room with me. Grant? Grant? Sorry, buddy. You got the wrong party. Bemis. That's right. Willie Bemis. Just hold it right where you are, boy. How'd you find out about this place? What difference does it make? Yeah, I guess you got a point there. Except I have a nasty little idea who might have tipped you off. Well, where's Ned Grant? He hasn't shown up yet. So what happens now? So I'll wait for him. What about me? I'll give you three guesses about you, but I figure you're only going to need one of them. Act 
three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. It is... And now, act three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, and the ideal vacation matter. <laughs> My gun is on the left, if that's what you're looking for, Bemis. Oh, thanks. So Doris tipped you off, huh? I had a little talk with her. And I thought she was a friend of Grant's. You never know, do you? I guess you're right. Dollar, I'm afraid you're in my way around here, and that means... Well, you get the message, don't you? Yeah, I get the message. You see, you made just one mistake. What's that? You should have stayed at home. Yeah. I should have stayed at home, all right. And if it weren't for Ned Grant, I could have. And then it hit me. Sure. Suddenly I knew what the ideal vacation meant for that crazy Broadway columnist. The answer had been right under my nose from the start. Yeah. I'd finally figured out where Grant was. But it wasn't doing me much good. I had to get out of here, and at the moment my chances didn't look too good. You know, Dollar, you got a very funny look on your face. Have I? Yeah, like something just rang a bell with you. Oh, uh-huh. sorry, Bemis. It's just my normal delirious expression. Okay, funny boy. Play it your way. Over against the wall. Move. Hold it. Listen. There's a car outside. A friend of yours? I don't know. I'm not taking any chances. Now you answer the door, Dollar. I'll be right behind it, and this gun will be staring at your back. It could be Ned Grant who'd driven up, in which case I'd have to warn him somehow. Or it could be somebody else, in which case I had to grab their car and get out of here. One thing's sure, whoever it was, I had to move fast. Johnny? I pulled the door open wide, then threw my weight against it. It slammed into Bemis and flattened him against the wall. He was off balance, so I couldn't. Oh, and his gun went flying. But I couldn't see where, and I couldn't take time to look. I grabbed Doris. Come on. Come on. Come on, I'm under the car. Now, you're going to help me for a change. That was Bemis. Don't tell me you're surprised. You're the one who tipped him off about the ski lodge. But, Johnny, I had no choice. He pushed me around. Yeah, sure. Johnny, where are we going? New York. Do you think Ned's there? Doris, I think he's been there right from the start. We stopped at the nearest town to call the sheriff. I wanted his boys to try and intercept Bemis. He was a cinch to be following us by now. Then we headed for the city. The sun was rising when we pulled up at Grant's apartment house. The manager didn't answer. Maybe he's still asleep. Looks like I have to take another chance on you, Doris. I tell you, I'm on the level, Johnny. I sure hope so. I got to get up to Grant's apartment fast. Now, there's a payphone over there in the lobby. Call the police and then meet me upstairs. Go on. Okay, John. I went upstairs and pounded on Grant's door, but no answer. I went to the end of the hall and out onto the fire escape. Yeah, there was a ledge. Carefully, I worked my way along it to a window. It was Grant's bedroom, all right. And there he was, sound asleep, with an empty bottle on the bed table. So my hunch had been right. Sure, it was the ideal vacation for a guy who was pestered by everybody in town. Tell everyone you're leaving the city, then disconnect your phone and hole up in your apartment for some real peace and quiet. I went to the front door. Doris? Yes, Johnny, let me in. Okay, just a sec. Well, Doris, I was... Well, well. Well, well. But ain't Johnny Dollar. Hello, Bemis. Now, ain't this nice? So you did it again, Doris. Honest, Johnny, I couldn't help it. He has a gun. He made me. Yeah, sure. Pretty smart, huh, Dollar? Finding Ned Grant for me? You know, I don't think I'd ever thought of looking for him here. But you did, so you're a smart boy. Okay, now look, Beeman. Don't interrupt me while I'm talking. Like I was saying, I'm much obliged to you for helping me find Grant. Now that I got him, okay. So I don't need you around anymore. No, don't! <laughs> Slowly and with a smirk on his face, Bemis raised his gun until it pointed straight at my head. It flew out of his hand. The shot had come from outside, down the hall. 
Suddenly, the corridor was swarming with police. Bema still for his gun. Where are you okay? Instead, he collected the butt of one over his left ear. Oh, oh. thank goodness they got here. So you did call the police after all. You bet I did. Now, do you believe I'm on the level? Yeah, Doris, I guess I do. And you took a mighty good way to prove it. Uh, what's going on here? Ned! So you finally woke up. Or yeah. sobered up. What? Hey. That's Willie be, Mr. Cardioway. It sure is. Well, what's he doing here? What's going on, huh? Hey, look, Bright Eyes, you better go on back to bed. But I don't understand. Just write the whole deal off as a bad dream, huh? <laughs> Expense account total, $115.25. And look, the next time you send me out to protect a guy, don't pick one who's going to sleep all the way through the deal, huh? I don't know. It, it kind of takes the sport out of it. And, Pat, since I didn't find a man who ran away for you, on account of he never really ran away, well, how about sending my fee on this one to the community chest? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Our star will return in just a moment. How? And now, here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, an old, old racket comes to light and nearly cost me my life. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood. Written by Robert Wright, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in our cast were Mary Jane Croft, Lawrence Duncan, Joseph Kearns, Jack Edwards, Barney Phillips, and Byron Kane. Be sure to join us next week, same station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> This is Dan Coverly speaking. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Peter Hardy at Tri-Western Property and Casualty Insurance. Hi, how are things in the Golden West? You still in Reno? Sure I am. Good boy. What goes, Pete? A little trouble with a big dairy farm out here, Johnny. The Menian Dairy. Okay, Pete, tell me all. A year and a half ago in a fire, a Menian lost one of his silos. You know, one of those big towers where they store and cure a lot of chopped up corn and stuff. Yeah, yeah, I know. Cost us $21,000. Twenty-one thousand for a silo. This time it's a compound silo, and the claim is for fifty-six thousand. Oh! But I don't want to pay it. I don't blame you. Sure, because Johnny, I think it was arson. <laughs> Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. And now, Act One of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Tri Western Property and Casualty Insurance Company, Reno, Nevada office. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the doubtful dairy matter. Expense account item one, $141.20. Transportation and incidentals, Hartford to Reno, Nevada. It was about 9 a.m. when I arrived, so I checked into the Mapes Hotel, then walked over to Pete Hardy's office. Armenian dairies are just north of here, Johnny, in Warm Springs Valley off Route 33. Well, then I'd better rent me a car. Or you can use mine. Now, now, Pete, how can I run up my expense account unless I have something to run it up with? Johnny, for once... Uh-uh. 
Anyhow, the reason why these silos Amenian has are so expensive. Is that the owner's name, by the way? Yes, Aram Amenian. And I take it he's Armenian? Strangely enough, no. Now, he's had all his silos very specially built. Oh, how specially can you build a silo? Just a concrete base, a lot of long wooden staves to get the circular shape, and a good roof on top. Well, he has some trick with them inside. Like what? That's his deep, dark secret. But he claims it makes better silage for his cattle than is possible anywhere else in the world. And one of these things burned up a year and a half ago. The word exploded best describes it. Yeah. And as I said, cost us 21000 And now the replacement has gone up in flames. Right? Yes, day before yesterday. He filed a claim the same day. Well, why do you suspect arson? Did the local authorities find anything suspicious? No, but you go out and talk with Amenian, Johnny. And if you don't end up with the same kind of feeling I have, well, I'll leave my shirt. <laughs> Expense account item two, fifty dollars deposit on a drive your own car. Finding the Amenian Dairy and Ranch some twenty miles north of the city was easy. It was spread out all over the countryside. Hundreds of acres of well irrigated lush green pastures. Square in the middle of the ranch sat one of the cleanest, most modern dairies I ever saw. Aram Amenian gave me the grand tour, and I must say I was impressed. There was close to two hundred well kept Guernseys in the main barn, which was clean as a whistle. The milking machines, coolers, separators, clarifiers, and so on were the same. Yep, a prosperous-looking setup. Finally, Mr. Amenian took me out to where a small group of workmen were cleaning up what was left of his compound silo. As you can see, Mr. Dollar, only the concrete base is left. That must have been a pretty big silo, Mr. Amenian. That's the largest and most efficient in the entire West. Still, $56,000. Oh, the size had nothing to do with that. It was the inner construction, known only to Barnwell, the man who built it for me, and to myself, of course. Oh, what was so special about it? Principally a method of venting. Venting? Yes. It increases the phosphorus and lactic acid content. Well, I thought the point in the silo was to keep it pretty well sealed up. Venting within, Mr. Dollar. But that's all I'll tell you about it. It cost me 56000 to have Barnwell build it. And I wish the company to pay my claim as quickly as possible. Because I'm starting construction on new and immediately. Of the same type? Oh, vastly improved type. Oh, then it was to your advantage to lose the old one. Just what do you mean by that? Your loss came at just the right time, didn't it? Well, just a minute, though. With the insurance money, you can build a new and better one. And when it gets out of date, I suppose you'll have another fire. Oh, I see. You, uh, you think perhaps these last two were deliberately set? Were they? Ridiculous. Is it? But if they were... Yeah. If they were, uh, I certainly wouldn't know it. Oh, come on now. After what you've just said. And what's more, Mr. Dollar, I'm sure you'll never be able to prove it. Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. We sometimes wonder... What is the life of a human being really worth? Not too much? Or maybe a great deal? Does it depend on whose life it is? Whatever the answer, one thing is certain. Fred Hargesheimer, since World War II, has felt that his life is worth quite a lot. Quite a lot of gratitude. During the war in the Pacific, about June of 1943, Lieutenant Hargesheimer had his P-38 fighter plane shot out of the sky. Badly wounded, he bailed out over a tiny island, New Britain. It looked pretty small from where he hit the silk, but he found it much bigger when he hit the ground. It was bigger, and in complete control of the enemy. But Hargesheimer was lucky. After a month of lonely hiding, he was found by a group of friendly natives from the village of Nantambu. They cared for him and successfully hid him from enemy patrols for the next four months at the risk of their own lives. Then Hargesheimer was able to make it back to civilization. For the next 17 years, Fred Hargesheimer thought about those wonderful people of Nantambu. 12,000 miles away in the United States of America, Hargesheimer put a great plan into effect. He made speeches, took up collections, sold jewelry belonging to his family, and worked out a way to bring a bit of civilization and happiness to the little village of Nantambu. Needless to say, the villagers gave him a spectacular welcome upon his return. Fred Hargesheimer showed his gratitude to the people who had saved his life. But life is worth little without freedom. The right of all men. Everywhere. Everywhere.
And now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Doubtful Dairy Matter. By what he said and the way he said it, Aram Amenian was practically challenging me to find out how arson was involved in the destruction of his $56,000 secretly constructed compound silo. Expense account item three phone call from a gas station on Highway 33 to Reno Police Headquarters. But Lieutenant Brady of the arson squad assured me he'd fail to find anything indicating the fire was set. So dead end. Until I remembered a little trick that had worked for me before and might work again. Item four, 27 cents for a loaf of white bread at a grocery store along the highway. Then I drove back to the Amenian Ranch. If I'd known you were hungry, Mr. Dollar, I should have had something provided for you at the ranch house. In spite of your rather nasty attitude about this loss of mine. Food is the last thing I'm thinking of, Mr. Amenian. Then why this loaf of bread, if you're not... Whoop. Now, oh, let's oh. see. Oh, now, surely you're not going to eat the piece that dropped in the ashes. No. Nope. No. Then get it out of your mouth, man. Well, mm-hmm. Whatever in the world are you doing, Mr. Dollar? Yeah. Yeah, I knew it. You knew what? A sure, a sure test for kerosene, Mr. Amenian. What? Yeah, fresh bread dropped in the ashes of a fire even days after the fire is out. I don't understand. I can still taste the kerosene. And, mister, it makes things look pretty bad for you. Me? Oh, good heavens, man, you can't... Dollar, I resent this this completely unfounded accusation. Go right ahead and resent. Or better still, let me get hold of a stenographer and you can dictate a confession. Get out of here. Want to do it the hard way, huh? Get off this ranch, Dollar. Now leave. Immediately. Sure. I warn you, don't come back. Because if you do... Better be careful, Mr. Armenian. The kind of a threat you're about to make wouldn't sound very good in court. Get out. Get out! Out on the highway, I stopped at the mobile gas station again and made another phone call. Item five, another 20 cents. It was to my old friend, Herb Carlbert, cashier of Reno's Farm Trade National Bank. It was past closing time, but he promised to leave a door open for me. So I grabbed a sandwich and a Coke along the way. That's item six, 80 cents, including tip. Then at the bank, Herb led me back to his private office. Oh, sit down, Johnny. Tell me all about yourself. Yeah, later, Herb. We'll go out on the town and talk our heads off. Right now, I need some information. I hope you can tell me where to get it. Oh? Information about what? The Armenian Dairy. Or better still, Armenian himself. You know him? Oh, I certainly do. We're his bank. His happens to be one of the best accounts we have, especially in our investment department. You mean it's big? <laughs> Funny big. Like how much? Well, now, Johnny. I'll tell you this. If I had a quarter of his net worth, I'd have retired long ago. No big outstanding debts on his place? Anything like that? Not a penny. Aram's financial condition is... is... Now, wait a minute. Yeah? That fire and explosion of his compound silo? Yeah, that's right. Herb, I've found evidence indicating our... Well, certainly aren't accusing him. Who else? Oh, no, 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 you're wrong. Oh, now, look, Herb, he filed that claim so fast. It's the most natural thing in the world for him. It's the way he does everything. Like paying his bills immediately on receipt. He works that way. You expect everybody else to. Well, he gave me the impression he wanted to collect quickly in order to have money for rebuilding. Of course. Rather than cash in some of his blue chip investments. Herb, somebody fired that silo. Well, it certainly wouldn't be Aaron. Ah, you sound like you're in cahoots with him. <laughs> what about his employees? From my impression of the man... They seems... love him like a father. Every one of them. And if every employer was as generous as he is, there wouldn't be any labor troubles in this country. Well, the fact remains that somebody somehow stood to profit by destroying that silo and the one before it. Well, I can't imagine who. Even his competitors like and respect the man. Oh, so they say. No, 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 they do. He's helped them stay on their feet during hard times, develop new ideas and methods, then pass them on to them. Oh, the fact remains... Well, Johnny, Johnny, I've had a rough day. How about a nice, cool, casual drink? Then we'll have dinner and take in the town. <laughs> Item 7, 21.30, for drinks and a good dinner back at the Mapes. But I didn't enjoy either. Because Herb and his defense of a median was no help at all. Except perhaps for giving me a list of all the people he could think of who did business with him. I decided to check them all first thing in the morning. Finally, about midnight, having lost our share at a couple of nearby gambling clubs, we parted. Herb drove away to his home on the outskirts of town. I went back to the Mapes. Uh, take Mr. and Mrs. Kenworthy to room 314, boy. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. What's your... Oh, Mr. Dolly. Uh, oh, just my key, please. Certainly. 
Here you are, sir. And I hope you enjoy a pleasant night's rest. Thanks. Oh, by the way, there was a gentleman here looking for you earlier this evening. Uh, hung around quite a while. Said he'd be back. Well, who was he? He didn't give his name, sir, nor did he wish to leave a message. Mr. Armenian? Mr. Armenian the dairyman? Oh, no, sir. I'm quite sure. Okay, thanks. Yes, sir. Good night. Good night, sir. Oh, Mr. Dollar. Yeah. There he is. There. Huh? Going out the door, the dark brown coat. You're sure? Yes, sir. The same man. I wonder. Yeah, so do I. But, but if he knows you, sir, and saw you, sir. By the time I get out the front door, the man in the brown coat was halfway down the block and walking fast. Faster and faster, as a matter of fact, as I gained on him. He turned the corner, and by this time, both of us were running. Hey! Hey! Were you looking for me? By the end of three or four blocks, it was a real foot race. Then suddenly he turned into an alley, and like a darn fool, I plunged into the darkness of it after him. Hey! Hey! Right here! Oh, no, you... Act three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. Our flag now numbers 50 stars, and behind each star, there stands yet another flag representing one of the 50 states. New Hampshire state flag carries its state seal on a field of dark blue. The seal is surrounded by a wreath of laurel leaves, the symbol of peace, interspersed with nine stars because New Hampshire was the ninth state to join the Union. The heart of the state seal is a representation of the frigate Raleigh, recalling the glory of the early days of sail. New Hampshire state flag, the flag of the ninth state to enter the Union, was adopted on April 29, 1931. And now, Act Three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Doubtful Dairy Matters. If it hadn't been for a big interstate moving van that drove into the alley where I'd been waylaid, well, I have a strong hunch I wasn't supposed to have lived through that beating. The truck driver, who absolutely refused a tip, incidentally, half walked, half carried me back to the mapes. And the desk clerk had a doctor in my room within a few minutes. A terrible thing. Terrible thing, Mr. Dollar. You're being attacked like this? And, of course, I'll have to make a report of it at the police. Oh, do anything you like, doctor. Just, oh, just get me patched up with you. And you eat me now. Yeah. You, uh, you have no idea who could have done this to you. Believe me, I intend to find out. Judging by this swollen hand of yours, you've got in some good licks, though, and whoever... <laughs> What's the matter? Well, this is a very unusual ring, you know why? Oh, some kids in the YMCA gave it to me a couple of years ago. I helped them with a the softball team. Oh, yes, of course, that's the Y insignia. Yeah, one of them made it. And the three raised points stand for spirit, body, and mind. Yeah, that's right. Well, now, if you just... Oh, wait, what's that for? Make sure you get plenty of rest. Oh, no, no. Now, wait, I'm the doctor. Roll up your sleeve, please. Yeah, I'll do it. Look, if this shot leaves me groggy in the morning... You wake up feeling fine. There you are. Incidentally, that ring... Listen, before you notify the police... Oh, hey, this... This shot works pretty fast. Yep. As I started to say, uh, if that ring of yours didn't leave a mark on whomever you defended yourself against out there in the alley, I'm very much surprised. In a few seconds, I was out like a light. But then a whole set of weird dreams began to plague my somewhat battered mind. And questions about who would attack me and why. Only the why was only too obvious to keep me from finding an arsonist who, yeah, yeah, who probably bore the mark of my ring on his kisser. I thought of the names Herb had given me and his insistence that none of them could be guilty. Wait a minute. There was one name he hadn't mentioned, but a median had, of one man who stood to gain a lot by the destruction of the silos. Or maybe it was just a crazy hunch, part of the wild dreams that came from the beating I'd taken. In any event, in the morning, as soon as the bank was open, I was in Herb Carlbert's office again. Well, yes, he has an account here, too, Johnny. At least he did before. How about loans? Has this man we're talking about taken out any loans? Well, yes, but, oh, Johnny, you know I can't... Yeah, I know, I know. The fact remains, he's pretty hard up for dough, isn't he? Well, I didn't say that. 
Although, of course, if that's the conclusion you choose to draw... Tell me this. He owes the bank money now, doesn't he? Yeah. All right. Did he also owe the bank a lot of money about a year and a half ago? Johnny. Yeah. Well? Johnny, you're right. But who would have suspected? And when you consider that Aram Armenian is the one man who has given him money for all the work he's... I can't believe it. Herb, it started out as a pure hunch. But right now, I'd bet my... Where can I find him? Well, if Aaron plans to go ahead with new construction, sure, he's probably over. Sure, out there at the dairy. You want to come along? Well, maybe I'd better after the way Aaron threatened you. I guess I owe him an apology for the way I tore into him. Let's go. Johnny. Yeah? What? What if we're wrong? What if this man we think is the arsonist... Will you agree that the firebug is the same man who attacked me in the alley? I suppose so. Then we'll soon know. Because believe me, he's a marked man. We made the Amenian Terry in 30 minutes flat, and we're told at the gate that Aram Amenian was in the pasteurizing plant. Maybe you better let me talk to Aram first, Johnny. It's not Aram that I'm interested in, Herb, and you know it. Oh, just a minute. Huh? What's the matter? Hold it a second, will you, while I tie my shoelace? Yeah, sure. And I've been thinking, Johnny, on the way out, you know, we could really be terribly, terribly wrong. Herbert, old man. Aram, we're just looking for you. Well, when I heard the car pull up, I thought it was Joe Barnwell. He's due here to show me final plans for the new silo he's gone to. Well, Mr. Dollar. Yeah, that's right, Mr. Meaning. I want to apologize for... Well, what's the matter? That dressing on your cheek. What about it? Just what is that little bandage hiding, Johnny? Well, Amenian? As a matter of fact, I cut myself shaving this morning. Well, I'm sorry, mister, but that bandage is going to have to come off. Look, Johnny. Now, just a minute, Dollar. Ah, here you are, Aram. Here's the final blueprint for it. Why, what's wrong, Joe? Oh, uh, gentlemen, this is Mr. Joseph Barnwell, Herb Calbert. We know each other. And uh, Mr. Johnny Dollar. Yeah. I think we know each other, too, Barnwell. Huh. Oh, do we? Joe, did you have an accident of some sort? Your face. What's going to happen to him now won't be any accident, Mr. Amenian. And I apologize for doubting that you cut yourself with a razor. What? I'm afraid I don't understand. But that bandage on your face doesn't hide any razor cut, does it, Barnwell? Well, I, I don't know what you're talking about. All right, then let's rip it off. You certainly won't. Good heavens, Johnny. Yeah, look. The mark from the ring on my hand where I struck him last night. Okay, Barnwell. Now, now stop. Don't, don't touch me. Start talking. <laughs> Tell a median how you burned up his fancy, expensive silo so you could build another one. <laughs> How you burned the other one up. Talk. I swear I... Talk. 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 Yeah, he talked all right. Funny. About a rank it's so old, I hadn't heard of it in years. A crooked builder who burned out his own plants to get himself more work. And in this case, a natural. Because he was the only one who shared Aram's secret construction plans. And by the time I was through with him, he blabbed about some of the other clients he'd taken the same way. Expense account total, including incidentals and the trip back to Hartford, $418 even. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Our star, Bob Bailey, will return in just a moment to give you a hint about what's in store for you on next week's program. Meantime, listen carefully. There is a biblical verse which promises life is going to be better for everybody in the world when mercy and truth are met together and righteousness and peace have kissed each other. When the people of the United States of America express that thought, it is not in idleness, but in deeds. Today, it is common knowledge that when the gigantic earthquakes and tidal waves struck the Republic of Chile and South America not too long ago, thousands of lives were lost and tens of thousands were left homeless, hungry, and suffering. Immediate aid in the form of food, medicine, clothing, supplies, and professional and technical help were flown to Chile by the United States Air Force in a Mercy airlift. When the work was done and the suffering people made happier and more comfortable, American servicemen received such grateful thanks from the people of Chile that they felt increased pride in being able to wear the uniform of the United States of America. 
This same pride has come to other Americans in uniform when mercy and truth have come together to follow the wake of disaster in other parts of the world. After the earthquake in Agadir, Morocco, after two devastating cyclones swept across the Bay of Bengal into East Pakistan, after a typhoon rocked and battered Japan, as mercy and truth got together, so did peace and righteousness to form a pact for freedom, the right of all men everywhere. And now, here is our star to tell you about next week's intriguing story on yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Next week, while I get into cattle country again, and a heifer steer solves a case for me. So join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote tonight's story. Heard in our cast were Paul Duboff, Will Wright, John Daner, Harry Bartell, Harley Bear, and Boris Lewis. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Dan Coverley speaking. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. <laughs> Hollywood. It's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Uh, howdy, Mr. Dollar. My name is Jake Denham. I own a cattle ranch out here in Craig, Colorado. How would you like to come out here and see me? Colorado? That's right. I have a policy with one of your companies, Tri-Western, office over in Denver. Well, what seems to be the trouble, Mr. Denham? Uh, trouble? Oh, oh, nothing like that. Not at all. Then why have you called me? Well, you see, the brand I use in my beef cattle is a Lazy J.D. Yeah, you said your name is Jake Denham. That's right. But J.D. is your initials, too. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And the lazy part fits me to a T. But now, why have you called me? Well, you see, I listen to your radio program every week. All those insurance cases you handle all over the country. Glad to hear it. And I just... Well, I thought the lazy J.D. being your initials, too, and and uh, all the local color out here, and... Well, maybe you'd like to come and uh, get some local atmosphere for one of your stories. Oh, now, wait a minute, Mr. Dunham. If you have some insurance matter you'd like me to investigate... Well, no, no, no. I told you why I thought you ought to come. So can you, right away? You sure there's nothing wrong out there? No, like I said, a lot of local color. Nice place to stay here at the ranch. Now, how about it? Well, I have a couple of days' work on some reports to finish up. Then right after that, huh? Well... Good, good. I'll be waiting for you. Goodbye. Oh, uh, look. And everything's really okay, huh? Goodbye. Hmm. Mr. Denham, I think you're lying through your teeth. Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar.
And now, act one of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Tri-Western Life and Casualty Insurance Company Home Office, Denver, Colorado. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the bum steer matter. <laughs> Expense account item one, 370, long distance call to Hal Bersky, my contact at Tri Weston in Denver. Johnny, good to hear from you. You out in this neighborhood? Nope, still in Hartford. Hal, I want you to okay an expense account for me. Well, now that depends. Listen, do you know a client of yours by the name of Jake Denham? Call. He owns a big cattle ranch over near the little town of uh, Craig. Uh-huh. Carries a straight life of something like forty, fifty thousand. Well, look, I got a phone call from him begging me to come out there and see him. Oh, something wrong? He says not, but I don't believe him. Well, have you any reason to think something is wrong? Well, only the half-baked excuse he gave me for wanting to see me. Look, Hal, I realize this is just a hunch, but it certainly sounds like it to me. But my hunches have saved your company a lot of dough on occasion. So how about it? Okay. Put it this way. If you run into something out there and clear it up, we'll pay the freight. If not, well, you just go ahead and have yourself a vacation at your own expense, okay? Oh, now, why don't you relax that iron grip on the purse strings for a change, huh? Why? What would you do? Okay, okay, but I warn you, Hal, if this does turn into a case for your company, my expense account is going to knock you right off your feet. Oh, now, wait a minute. Bye-bye. Johnny! It took me nearly four days to clear up the reports I had to finish. I wish now it hadn't, that I'd left Hartford immediately. Expense account item two, $133. Plain fare and all the incidentals I could think of, Hartford to Denver. I got there shortly after 7 a.m. Item three, $50, deposit on a drive-your-own car, in which I promptly headed north and west on Highway 40. That is, after getting out of the traffic in Denver itself, and believe me, that town has it. The 200-mile drive to Craig was routine. Except for the lush green hills, the snow-topped mountains, the vast meadows and forests. Colorful Colorado, they call it. And it sure is. Finally, about noon, I pulled into Craig and stopped at the Cosgrove Hotel for lunch. That's item 4, 350. From the waitress, I got directions to the Lazy J.D. Ranch. About eight miles south on the Yampa River, just off Route 789. You want some dessert? Oh, no thanks. This is fine. Hey, you, uh... You one of the relatives? Relatives? Oh, of course not. You're too late. Too late for what? It was real beautiful, though. Half the town turned out for it, and most of the big ranchers. What are you talking about? Oh, my gosh, it's after 1.30. Look, I'm not supposed to be on duty now, and I got a date with my boyfriend. Hey, well, now, Excuse me, now wait a go. second. Just pay the cash here in the lobby. Well, but look, I... Okay. <laughs> I paid my check to the cashier, went out to my car, climbed in, and headed for the Lazy J.D. There must have been several thousand acres to the ranch. All rich, green, healthy-looking pasture land. Lord knows how many head of beef cattle. The main ranch house was a rather small but well-kept affair near the gate to the road from the highway. And then I saw it. A long piece of black crepe hanging on the door frame. Yes? I, uh... How do you do? My name is Dollar. Johnny Dollar. Oh, Johnny Dollar. Why didn't you come before? What? He begged you to come, didn't he? To come right away? Mr. Denham? Yes, but I then told why him... why didn't I... you? You might have saved him. Saved him? Yes, saved him. We buried him this morning. And I think he was murdered. Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. The American writer Christopher Morley once wrote, When you sell a man a book, you don't sell him just 12 ounces of paper, ink, and glue. You sell him a whole new way of life, unquote. Now, that goes double when you give, not sell, a book. But the gift 
of 550 books to little children increases the legacy tenfold. Near the end of 1960, the employees of the Chase Manhattan Bank started a people-to-people -people program with such a gift to school children of a town in Tanganyika. That's on the southeast coast of Africa. And to give you an idea how the books were received by the children, let me first quote from Francis Bacon. He's an English writer of a few centuries back. He said, Some books are to be tasted, others to be swallowed, and some few to be chewed and digested. In the past, Children in Tanganyika may have done a little tasting and chewing and a little swallowing and digesting, but there's one certain thing. They wound up devouring the books they received from the United States. And they did so much of it that they, the ones in high school anyway, were able to reach the level of English children their age and pass the exams at the same time. That takes a lot of book learning, as they say. Well, the gift of these books from the United States of America may have seemed a small thing to the senders, but the boys in Tanganyika who received them know that they've opened a whole new way of life. They've greatly increased understanding in the classroom of freedom, the right of all men everywhere. And now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Bum Steer Matter. The tall, beautiful girl standing in the doorway of the ranch house at the Lazy J.D. outside of Craig, Colorado, was dressed in black. The red about her eyes showed that she'd been crying. But there were no tears in them now. Jake Denham was my father, Mr. Dollar. I'm Virginia. And you think he was murdered? Why do you think he called and begged you to come out here? Any idea who might have done it? Yes. Big Mike. Mike Craven. Who's he? He owns the Sea Lucky Star and wants to own every other ranch around here, and he will unless somebody stops him. How did your father die? Anthrax. That's what they said it was. I thought that was a disease of cattle. People, too, if they get infected from the cattle. And that's what happened to your father? That's what they say, but there's no anthrax around here. Our ranch is clean. Look, let's go inside and sit down and talk about this. Sure, I'll talk about it. If only somebody will listen. In here, John. Oh, thanks. Are you, uh, all alone? Now that Dad's gone, he and I ran the ranch. Now it's up to me. Sit down. Thank you, Virginia, were you trying to tell me out there that you think somebody tried to infect your herd with anthrax? What would you think? Who is your father's doctor? Dr. Regis Ross from in town. Who are you? Well, my name is Dollar, insurance investigator. Say, so you fellows act pretty fast, don't you? Sometimes. Feeling all right now, honey? I guess so. I told the hands that you're in full charge now. They'll take their orders from you. Or from me. Or from... Sure. Oh, sure, I guess that's best. Thank you, Pete. They might as well get used to it, because after we're married... Look, honey, why wait any longer? I know this is a bad time to talk about yes, it. But please. I also know, and you know, that this is no time for you to try to go it alone. But what about your medical school? I'll give it up. This is a lot more important than... You're a lot more important. Oh, look, Jenny, you stalled me for a long, long time. I know, Pete, because I... Don't you see I can run this ranch alone? No. You need me, honey. And I'm here to help you. Do you know how Dad felt? Sure. That all I wanted was this ranch. The same as he felt about anybody else who ever came here. Just who are you, Pete? This is Pete Kermer, Johnny. My fiancé, I guess. That's right. Didn't I see a Kermer ranch on the way out here, a small one? That's right. My pa's. He's Carl Kermer. Well, what do you think caused the death of Virginia's dad? Just what everybody says, Mr. Dollar. Galloping anthrax. From that Hereford. Then why did he send for Mr. Dollar to come? I'm afraid we'll never know, honey. Well, I do. It's because he knew something was going to happen to him. Where is that steer now? Buried. On orders from the vet and the state inspector. Uh, Mr. Dollar. Yeah? You said investigator. Hadn't you better talk to Dr. Ross? Yeah, I guess so. Want to let me have his address? Sure. I'll write it down for you. And, uh, while you're at it, Tell me where I can find the veterinarian. And that state inspector, too. Huh? Sure. Why not? When I left them a few minutes later, Pete was still making a quiet, but I must say effective pitch for Virginia's hand. Expense account item five, ten cents for a phone call to the state inspector. 
He told me he'd never seen the infected steer on the Lazy J.D., that he was confined to his bed at the time. I called the vet's office, and he was expected back shortly. So I sat around the hotel lobby and glanced over some magazines. And then, in one of them, I found an article that made my eyes fairly pop out of my head. Item six, I called the vet again. He was in. You caught me just in time, Mr. Dollar. I was about to drive over to the Sea Lucky Star Ranch for dinner. Mike Craven and I are old friends. That's all? Yes, ever since we roomed together at college. Oh, I see. I understand you're the man who spotted the anthrax out of the Lazy J.D. Yes, sir, that's right. Just that one Hereford. How it ever got to him, I'll never know. The rest of that herd is absolutely clean. That poor old Jake Denham, too. You think he became infected from that steer? Well, how else could it be? Galloping anthrax. Just like that. Doctor, where is that steer buried? Do you know? Yes, I had it buried myself. It's some miles out in the far corner of the lazy J.D. property. Then phone the Sea Lucky Star and call off your dinner date. You and I are going out to take a look at that carcass. Oh, no, just a minute, young fellow. <clears throat> Investigator, did you say you oh, That's right. Uh, well, uh, I suppose you have some authority. What I don't have, I can get. Tell me, Doctor, is there some reason why you don't want me to see the carcass of that steer? No, 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 no. Well, let's... Uh, <clears throat> Let's go. Along the way, we picked up two fellows who were handy with pick and shovel. It was almost dark now, so I bought a couple of powerful flashlights at one of the local hardware stores. That's item 7925. It took a couple of hours for the two men to dig down to the carcass of the steer, but they finally exposed one flank of the unfortunate animal. Yeah. You, you sure planted this critter deep, Doc. There's part of him. Give us a few more minutes, and we'll have... Uh, no, wait. Huh? Uh, Mr. Dollar, come down here into the hole. Sure. Oh, what's the matter, Doc? The color of that carcass. The... I don't understand this. What are you talking about? Well, this doesn't make sense. The deterioration and putrefaction that always occurs when it simply isn't here. You mean it's possible it was an anthrax killed this steer? But I'm sure that all the symptoms, the swellings in the subcutaneous connective tissues, in the interstices of the muscles and lymphatic glands, and in the membranes of the mouth and tongue, they were all there, and they were edematous, too. I Could some just... poison have possibly produced those poison. symptoms? Poison? Yeah, look, I read in a magazine this afternoon that strychnia often produces symptoms very much like those of tetanus, lockjaw. Yes, that's true. But a poison that would... Good heaven. Yeah? Why, I haven't heard of it since my college days. Quintanogen sulfide. But why? Good question. Uh, no, Dollar. Because it wouldn't explain the death of old Jake Denham. If it was anthrax. What? Huh? Or was he poisoned too? Good heavens, you mean you wait think a minute, that he... Wait a minute. Doctor, the brand on the rump of this animal. Well, that's Denim's own brand, the Lazy Jade. Yeah, but it looks to me like it was put on over another brand. Yes. Yes, you're right. Any way of finding out what the original brand was? No, no. Yes. Yes, Mrs. Dollar. The other side. The inside of the hide might show it. Then, Doctor, you got a skinning job to do. All right. Uh, hand me my bag there, please. <laughs> Okay, here you are. Go to it, Doc. Thank you. Is that poison? How much to infect a man? Well, even a, even a small scratch on the skin could absorb enough to be fatal. No wonder the Dr. Ross... Ross was the one who treated Jake Denham. Yeah. No wonder we couldn't understand why death came so... Well? No. Can you see what the original brand was? Yes. Yes, I can. I'm afraid so. Let me hold the light a little Oh, I see. But I can't believe it, Mr. Dollar. Pretty clear, though, isn't it? See Lucky Star. Act three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. A couple of thousand years ago, the ancient sage Diogenes remarked that all things are in common among friends. Well, he didn't mean that only material goods were in common among friends, but that they shared their troubles as well. For a long time, the United States Armed Forces have been a friend in time of need. 
during fires, floods, and pestilence all over the world. Many peoples of the earth have come to believe in the friendship which the U.S. military personnel have spread for so many years and the calls for help they answer in time of personal emergency, a response which has always been immediate. Not long ago, a Korean Buddhist nun was suffering from beriberi, an advanced form of acute malnutrition. But she was living in an isolated monastery deep in the Korean hills and valleys. Her sister nuns contacted the nearest Army Signal Corps relay station, and wheels began turning. In no time, an Army helicopter landed at the station's helipad. American soldiers carried the stricken nun to the copter. She was flown to a waiting ambulance and whisked away to the hospital. Her recovery was rapid, thanks to the United States Army, her newfound friends. Army helicopter men helped in many other ways. Over the 108 islands of the Ryukyus that spread from southern Japan to northern Formosa, Army helicopters are constantly whirling their blades as they hop from one island to another on missions of mercy. They bring food donated by American women on Okinawa, or they bring vital medicine to save a life. They also bring friendship and understanding and freedom, the right of all men everywhere. And now, Act Three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Bum Steer Matter. <laughs> Pretty bad, doesn't it, Mr. Dollar? Yeah, Doc. It looks as though this Herbert Steer was brought over from the Sea Lucky Star, was rebranded with a lazy JD, was given the poison to make it look like it died of anthrax. Yeah, but Mike Craven who owns the Sea Lucky Star. I know him, Dollar. I've known him ever since our college days. Medical college? Oh, no. Just during the preparatory years. But, but Big Mike couldn't have done a thing like this. Big Mike has wanted to get his hands on the lazy JD for years, well, has he? Of course, over a lot of other big ranches, but. I'd take my life on it. He'd never do it. Hey, wait, wait. wait. Yeah. You should have taken that left turn to get to the Sea Lucky Star. That's not where we're heading. Yeah. Well, then where? If I remember correctly, it's this road to the right, here. Well, you mean the K-Bar K? Got any better ideas? Well, I'll be... <laughs> the ranch house is dark. It won't be for long. Would you call this a good ranch, Doc? No, old Carl has been just a hanger on. He hasn't made the place pay for quite some... What's going on out there? Who is it? Johnny Dollar, Pete. Oh? I want to talk to you. Oh, uh, sure. Door's open. I'll be right down. Come on, Doc. Let's see if I can find the light switch. This flashlight will do. And we're going on upstairs. Huh? Wait down there. I'll be right down. We'll be right up. Well, now, wait a minute, if you don't mind. Wow, wow, wow. Nice place you have up here. Look, I asked you to wait down. Dr. Cummings. Uh, I'm sorry, Peter, but... This... How'd you make out with Virginia Denham, Pete? Convince her to marry you? That's not your business, Mr. Dollar. Now, just what do you want? Pretty nice ranch to get your hands on that lazy J.D. I beg your pardon. Hmm. Combination bedroom and study, huh? As Virginia told you, I've been going to college. Yeah, medical school. Nice set of books you have here. Of course, I'll have to give that up now. Well, you're going to have to give up a lot of things. What? Where did you get it, Pete? What was the name of that stuff, Doctor? Quintanagen sulfide. What do you know about... Well? I don't know what you're talking about. Then why the marker in this book on toxicology? Marker? That was a foolish thing to do, Pete, a dead giveaway. Yeah, I told you. I, I don't know what you're talking about. Yep, right here. Intelligent sulfide. I, I... I never heard of it. You're lying, Pete. Uh, no. Giving it to that Herford was probably a cinch. Listen, you... But how did you give it to Jake Denham? Dollar, that's something you'll never live to know. Oh, look, now wait a minute. Put the thing away. No! Now stand back! I said look out, you... Thanks, Doc. I I guess he'd forgotten all about you until you landed that chair on his head. Yes. 
Now I suppose I'll have to patch this... Uh, patch him up a bit. Oh, absolutely. He'll have to look nice for the trial, won't he, Doc? Mm -hmm. Expense account item eight, fifty-five ninety-five. Living expenses in Craig while waiting for the autopsy on Jake Denham. Mm -hmm. And yes, the same drug was used on him as on the Herford steer. A small bottle of the rare drug was found in Pete Kermer's trunk. So Pete's not only lost a chance for a nice ranch, but for living very long. Expense account total, including incidentals and fare back to Hartford, six eighteen fifty. Um, on second thought, how's about just sending that check to the community chest? Then I'll feel a little better about this case. And about myself, too. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. And now, here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, an old ghost town out in Montana. But one of the ghosts carries a 38 Colt. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote tonight's story. Heard in our cast were Virginia Gregg, Gene Tatum, Will Wright, Jack Edwards, Howard McNear, Sam Edwards, and Forrest Lewis. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Dan Coverley speaking. <laughs> This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. Hollywood. It's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Randy Singer, Johnny. Oh, hi, Randy. How's the New York City Police Department these days? Well, the department's fine. Me, I'm not so sure. Well, then maybe I'd better run on down there and cheer you up a bit, huh? Yeah, you'd better come down here on account of Mary Grace Marshall. Hey, how do you know Mary Grace? The point is, you do. Well, matter of fact, I just got back from a weekend in that town of yours. Yeah, Mary Grace and I had a ball. We took in a couple of shows, did the nightclub routine. Yeah, I know. Even spent Sunday afternoon together out at the... What do you mean, you know? Johnny, your little girlfriend's been murdered. What? Yeah. Randy, have you got any leads, anything to go on? Yeah, Johnny, plenty. Then I'll grab the first plane. Yeah. You'd better. <laughs> Bailey in the exciting adventures of a man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Well, act one of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Mid-Eastern Life and Casualty Insurance Company, Home Office, Hartford, Connecticut. 
Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Mary Grace matter. Expense account item one, ten cents. Phone call to the airport to reserve a seat on the first plane to New York. Item two, phone call to Ben Perrin at the Claims Department of Mid-Eastern Life. Ben, this is Johnny Dollar. Oh, hello, John. Now, listen, I'm on my way down to New York at your company's expense, though the expense part is beside the point. Oh, uh, no, no, just wait a minute. Mary Grace Marshall has just been murdered. Marshall? Your company holds a policy on her, and I'm going down there to investigate. Well, now, wait, John, until we issue proper authorization for you to conduct the investigation. Don't give me that, Ben. I'm going down there now. Well, then it's completely without sanction from this or any other... Okay, okay, forget it. I was trying to save time, and I thought I was doing you a favor. Well, I suppose you are, but until a request for your services can be registered... I said forget it, didn't you hear me? I gotta go, gotta catch a plane. Well, for heaven's sake, man, what are you so up in arms about? Why are you so concerned about this particular... Because that girl was a personal friend of mine. A very dear friend. Oh. John, I'm... John, I'm sorry. I can see now why you're so upset. Yeah, I'm upset. By all means, go ahead, officially. And if there's anything I can do... Yeah, there is. You can stop all this yammering so I can hang up and get out of here. Goodbye. John. Yeah, what now? You really cared for that girl, didn't you? Yeah, Ben. I cared. <laughs> Expense account item 3, 920. Cab to the airport and plane ticket to New York. The trip down there gave me time to think. And thinking about it hurts. Mary Grace Marshall. Tall, brunette, and very beautiful. And as straight a girl as I'd ever known. There was a time a few years ago when I'd hoped she might marry me. But she wanted to stay with her successful career as a fashion designer. And she was right. I'm not the marrying type either. So we just remained friends. We had a lot of fun together. It is dancing. An occasional nightclub. Sometimes the long hair stuff, a recital or the opera. Or we go to the zoo or the circus or a boxing match or a baseball game. Or just go for a quiet walk in the park. And often, just a long, quiet evening in her apartment over a tall, cool drink and good conversation. A good night kiss? Sure. But that was all. Now she was gone. And believe me, somebody was going to pay. Item four, six dollars even for a fast taxi to the 18th Precinct Headquarters and Sergeant Randy Singer. Come on in, Johnny. Close the door. Sure. Hi. Better uh, sit down, huh? Yeah. All right, when did it happen, Randy, and how? You said on the phone you have some leads. Clues all over the place. They all point toward one person. Oh. Toward the one person known to have been with her at about the time the coroner says she was killed. How was she killed? Struggle. Fell and struck her head on the base of the fireplace. Cigarette, Johnny? Oh, yeah, thanks. Incidentally, so far I've been able to keep this thing out of the papers. Oh, hey, give me a light, will you? I seem to have forgotten my lighter. Yeah, you have. Here. Thanks, now, the coroner says she was killed Sunday night, late. What? By somebody who must have spent several hours with her. You said late Sunday night. That's a... Go on, Johnny. Hey, look, stop snapping that lighter and... Wait a minute, where'd you get that? According to all the evidence, it was left behind by whoever murdered Mary Grace Marshall. Here. Look familiar? Are you crazy? This lighter is mine, I... Yeah, Johnny. I know. And now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Mary Grace Matter. Mary Grace Marshall, an old friend, a very dear one, murdered in her New York apartment on East 77th Street. Sergeant Randy Singer, my old friend at 18th Precinct Homicide, had called me immediately. And when I got there, showed me a very damning piece of evidence. Presented to Special Investigator Johnny Dollar by the International... Sure, Report. of course it's my lighter. And I must have left it in Mary Grace's apartment Sunday night. 
But that certainly doesn't mean that I killed her. The coroner says she died about the same time you were there. Oh, how do you know what time I was there? Wife of Charlie Walker, the building superintendent, Johnny. She saw you leave. That isn't enough evidence to convict a fly, and you know it. There's plenty more. Yeah, like what? Your fingerprints all over the place? Well, sure, I told Cigarette you. butts, same brand you smoke. So what is that? A point? lot of them, Johnny. Like a very nervous smoke. Pipe. Well, I was with her all evening. Doing what? Oh, now look, Randy. Surely you can't be serious. You can't think for a minute. You look, I... Johnny. This is my case. Nobody else's. I'm keeping it that way. I've kept it out of the papers. I think you know why. Oh, sure, sure I know why. Because we've been buddy-buddy for so long, you want to be sure that if anybody hangs me, you will for old times. Sake. I asked you what you were doing. Well, let me tell you something, Randy. That girl meant a lot to me. What were you so doing Sunday night? shut up and night? tell me what other evidence you have, what you know that can help me find out who... I'm sorry, Randy. Sure, it's it's your job. I'd probably do the same thing to you under the circumstances. If you didn't, I wouldn't have any use for you. But don't you see? Okay, look, look. We spent Sunday afternoon at the zoo, the Bronx Zoo. Went up on the subway. We walked a lot, got pretty tired. I promised her a dinner at the Shambord over on 3rd Avenue. But she said she had some food at the apartment, so we went back there. Then we just sat around and talked, played some music, that's all. And had some drinks. Yeah, I picked up a bottle of scotch on the way. How many drinks? Oh, one or two light ones is all. Sorry, Johnny, that bottle was nearly empty. But that's him. Who discovered the body? Mrs. Walker, wife of the apartment super. The one who saw you leave shortly after hearing the screams that made her... Screams? Yeah, that made her finally go up and look in the Marshall girl's oh, apartment. she's crazy, Randy. You're lying. Can you prove it? I'd like to talk to that woman. I think you She's off her rocker if she told you she... What'd you say? I think you ought to see her. Huh? But if I'm your big suspect... Well, sure you are. Until you can help me prove I'm wrong. <laughs> drove over to the place on 77th Street in a prowl car. Everything was exactly as it had been when I'd left Sunday night, except that there were signs of a struggle, as Randy had said. A chair and a lamp had been knocked over, the hi-fi shoved aside when she'd fallen at the fireplace. Even the bottle of scotch from which I'd poured a couple of small... Hmm. What's the matter, Johnny? Well, I'm not sure, Randy, but... Well, I'd have sworn I left this bottle out in the kitchenette where I... Huh? Hey, are you making more pranks? Yeah. Look, this bottle of soda, three quarters full. You don't kill most of a bottle of scotch with only this much soda. Unless you're drinking it straight. Oh, who drinks it straight these days? An alcoholic? Or somebody who needs a jolt for his nerve? Maybe. Want to go downstairs and talk to the super's wife? Yeah, let's. The superintendent's wife turned out to be a living doll. Young, pretty, with too much makeup. The sort of looked like she decided to get out of the chorus line for a quieter life as the wife of a building superintendent. I noticed a peculiar, spicy kind of odor when she first let us in, but thought nothing of it at the time. Now, you sure this is the man you saw leaving Miss Marshall's apartment, Mrs. Walker? I was standing right here in this doorway. It was after I heard her screaming up there around midnight. You sure you heard her scream? Well, my husband heard it first. He woke me up, pounding on the wall between our bedrooms. Well, didn't he get up to investigate? Oh, no, the lazy... Well, he's been sick. He's still sick. But then I heard the screaming, so I run into his room and ask him what to do. Go back to bed and forget it, he says. It's probably just a party upstairs. Then you went up and found the body, huh? Well, first I tried to sleep, but I kept thinking I heard noises. From upstairs? Well, no. You're sure? It was like maybe my husband was getting up or something. Go on. Well, finally, about 2 a.m., I went up to her apartment. When she didn't answer my knock, I let myself in. And there she was, dead. Who called the police, you or your husband? Him? Uh, Besides, I told you he was sick. He still is. I'd like to talk with him. Oh, sure. If he's sober enough. Come on. That was a funny crack. If her husband really was sick. She led us toward the rear of the apartment, and I mistakenly started to enter her bedroom. That peculiar odor again, only more pronounced. And believe me, it was an arpege. Here, mister, this way. Her husband's bedroom was pretty much of a mess, untidy, with pictures of bathing beauties, calendar art, 
and some striking pictures of Mary Grace Marshall plastered all over the walls. This room had an order about a two of stale booze. Here you are, Charlie. No. No, I, I tell you, I don't want any more of that stuff. Well, you seem to think it'd make you feel better. I did. What did you... Oh. Oh, the cop again. That's right, Mr. Walker. And this is the guy seen coming down from your girlfriend's apartment after all the screaming. His name's Johnny something. You actually heard screaming up there, Mr. Walker? Yeah. Yeah, awful racket. Woke me up. Scared me. What do you mean? That poor girl up there, all alone. Only she wasn't alone. But then it stopped. I figured maybe I'd been wrong. Had a nightmare or something. Yeah, sure. A dream about her. You think about me for a change instead of dreaming about shut, that day. Shut up. Talking about her, dreaming about her, sneaking around to have a look at her when she came shut in. Shut up, I tell you. If you wasn't sick, I'd think you'd sneaked up there and done her in because you couldn't have shut her. Up. Will you take her out of here? It wouldn't be the first time a drunken bum has killed somebody. Shut up. It. Shut up. Mrs. Walker, I thought I told you this man was supposed to be kept quiet. Oh, well, now, look, doctor. I'm... Doc, yet I walk in here and find this sort of thing going on. Go on, all of you. Out of here while I attend this man. Just a minute, Doctor. Out immediately. This is a heart case complicated by a very serious virus infection. Doc, if I can have just one Later, minute. officer. I must save this man's life. Come on, Randy. You too, Mrs. Walker. Yeah, sure, sure. He's been getting alcohol again, strictly against my order. Now, look here, Mrs. Walker. No, no, wait. Huh? Come on upstairs with me again. Oh? What'd you think of? A couple of things, Randy, that I believe will clinch this case so fast. Come on. Act three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Mary Grace Matter. What do you mean, clinch the case, Johnny? Didn't you hear enough from Charlie Walker and his wife? Yeah, I heard plenty, Randy. Well, then what's the point of coming back here to the dead girl's apartment? Let me show you something here in the kitchenette. A scotch bottle. Uh, you shouldn't pick that up, Johnny. Print. Yeah, prints. And where your boys dusted over them to show them up. But look. Yeah? Right here they're smeared, see? By a piece of cloth. Sure, he tried to erase them when he killed that bottle. Now, come on back to the living room. And here, take a look at this. Well, what's the hi-fi set got to do with I it? I told you Mary Grace and I sat here Sunday night talking and playing records. So? This record on the turntable is the same one we were playing just before I left her. Look at it. Hmm, Dolorima by Vingetti. Never heard of it. We shut it off because it got too noisy in the death scene from that opera, huh? Listen. be done. Sure. The screams that Walker and his wife said they heard. And that record's what gave him the idea. And now it's a matter of pin it on him. All right, what have you got for his motive? Motive? Are you kidding? Didn't you see those pictures of all those beautiful half... Those, those babes he has on the wall of his room? And the pictures of the Marshall girl? All right. He was gone for Mary Grace, talked about her, dreamed about her, had her pictures all over his room, but she wouldn't give him a tumble. All right. All right. So he hits the bottle heavier than ever on account of this frustration over the Marshall girl. Wouldn't be the first time that sort of thing has happened. It happens all the time. So if he can't have her, he's going to kill her. You see my point? Yeah, and it's well taken, Randy. All right. Last weekend, you're taking his dream girl out on the town, having a good time with her, doing all the things he wished he could do. Go on. Well, it's too much for him, driving him out of his rum-soaked mind. Then he hears that screaming on that opera record. It gives him the idea. He wakes up his wife so she'll hear it, too. So his wife will think somebody's getting killed up there. But he doesn't let her go up there, right? Sounds good, Randy. After his wife goes back to bed, that's when she saw you leave, he goes up there and kills the girl. But if he was as sick as he appears to have been... John, the time like that, a man gets superhuman strength. Strength of a madman, they call him. And listen... I'm listening. His wife said she thought she heard him walking around, remember? I remember. So that's it. She finally got up, came up here and found the body. So naturally, she tied it all in with the screams her old man woke her up to hear. And that suited him perfectly. She couldn't help but alibi for him. Come on, let's get downstairs again. 
I realize, Johnny, it's all circumstantial, and I still have to pin it on him. Or her. But I'll hold him on suspicion. Or her. The same circumstances would work just as well for Walker's wife if she were the killer. Yeah, but what about the motive? Jealous wife. Jealous of somebody taking that drunken bum out of her head. That funny odor I noticed about her when I first stepped into this place. I finally remembered what it is. Hey, I noticed that like a uh, like a cooking spice. Well, it is sometimes. Cardamom seed. Cardamom? Yeah, they used to call it the drunkard's friend. A man could booze all night, chew a couple of cardamom seeds, kiss his wife goodnight, she'd never be the wiser. Well, I'll be... That odor was so strong in her bedroom that... Well, maybe she's the lush, huh? Hey... And tried to make the same thing out of her husband. On the excuse it would make him feel better. You you mean he isn't a heavy drinker, Doctor? No, he is not. Doctor, you said he has a heart condition. A very serious one. Complicated by a... Yeah, yeah, I know. Could he possibly have got out of bed, climbed those stairs Sunday night, struggled with and killed someone... The odds against his surviving such a thing are a million to one. A hundred million. All right, I heard it all. That means you're going to start accusing me of killing that girl up there. Mrs. Walker, I told you to stay out of your husband's room. Yeah? Well, he's dead, Doc. Dead? I don't know what you give him, but he's dead. Did you give him more liquor? No. But you gave him enough before I came to... Wait here, all of you. Well, you're going to try to pin that Marshal Dame on me now that Charlie's gone? You've already pinned it on yourself, Mrs. Walker. What? You thought you'd left no fingerprints on that bottle up there. Why well, didn't? I used a handkerchief. Yeah. I. That's what I thought. Look, no, 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 wait a minute. I, I, I didn't mean that. Too late, I'm afraid. Oh, no, it ain't. Put down that gun, Mrs. Walker. All right. So I kill that dame on the second floor. And if I have to kill you, I... Oh! Ooh. Thanks, Doctor. It's, it's quite all right, sir. Well, Randy, there's your killer. Happy? Yeah. I guess I ought to be. You? It doesn't bring back Mary Grace. <laughs> Expense account total, including transportation back to Hartford? No, no wait. I took on this case myself because of Mary Grace and, well, whatever she may have meant to me is none of the company's business. Oh, sure, you'll have to pay the claim on her policy. But let it go at that, will you? The rest is on me. I want it that way. Understand? For old time's sake. Yours truly... Johnny Dollar. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Dan Coverly speaking. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. Johnny Dollar. Johnny, this is this is George.
George Reed. Well, nice to hear from you, George. Especially when I have no assignment. That, uh, that's fine. What's fine about it? No expense account to pay it means how do I keep the wolf in the door? Unless, of course, Floyd's of England has a case for me. Huh? Well? Uh, Johnny. Yeah? I, uh, well, a few weeks ago, you were kidding at the time. Oh, now, George, how could I ever kid you? I'll, uh, let that one go. Yeah, you better. The point is, you, well, you rather jestingly asked me if instead of selling life insurance... Oh, no. Don't tell me. I'm afraid so. I'm afraid the company is saddled with what you might call a death insurance policy. You mean, instead of insuring somebody against dying, you've insured him against living? Yes, John. Okay, Georgie, say no more. I'll be right over. Bob Bailey, in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Act one of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To Floyd's of England, American office, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the hope to die matter. Expense account item one, a dollar ten, taxi from my apartment to George Reed's office, where I found him pacing the floor and wearing an even more worried expression than usual. And believe me, that's something. Oh, this thing has me so so riled up, Johnny, I can hardly see straight. Well, you should have known better than to issue a policy like that, George. I it was Harry Baxter. Baxter? He filled in here for me while I was on vacation. I should have known better. What do you do? Sell a lot of policies that you shouldn't have to handle? No, just this one. And I swear I don't understand it. He of all people. All right, you said on the phone that it was kind of life insurance in reverse. That's exactly what it is. Explain, please. Well, usually, of course, we pay the face value of a policy when the insured dies. Right. In this case, however, the company will have to pay the $250,000 that the insured doesn't die. 250000 Yes. How under the sun could a man be crazy enough to issue a policy like that? John, you know how it is. The company prides itself on the fact we'll insure anything. Not only life and property and health and so on, but the voice of a singer, the feet of a dancer, hands of a pianist, even the dimples on the knees of a chorus girl. Yeah, and singing mice, an old alley cat, a sick whale. Of course, I can't say that Harry wasn't in position to do it, but... Johnny, you've got to help me. First, you'd better tell me who and why and what it's all about. It's just the trouble. I don't know. Well, in that case, you don't know. I only got back here to the office this morning. I found our copy of the policy lying here on my desk. But if you don't even... Oh, look, I've handled some pretty screwy cases for you, George. Yes, but they've all finally made sense one way or the other. And Johnny, we have paid you some very nice fees. You can't deny that. George. Tell me, have I ever questioned your expense account? But death insurance, it doesn't make sense. Have I? Insuring somebody against living. Have I? I'm sorry, but this time the answer is no. Listen, if you take this on, I'll okay your expense account without even reading it. Death insurance. Expense account unlimited. Johnny? George, there are some things even a conniving, chiseling, unprincipled rascal like myself won't even... Unlimited? Johnny? Okay, George, I'll take it. Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. And now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, and the hope to die matter. Lloyds of England insure anything. At least that was their boast. And now it looked as though it had finally backfired on them. Because somebody in the organization, some character named Harry Baxter, had issued not life, but death insurance. If it hadn't been for my friendship for George Reed, <clears throat> well, plus his promise of unlimited expense account, I'd have thrown the whole problem right back into his face, as it was. Thanks, Johnny. From the bottom of my heart, I'll never forget you for this. Believe me, George, I'll never forget you for this. And if you can get us off the hook... All I can do is try, so come on, give me the dope on it. Yes. Now, here. The name of the insured is Miss Mary Ellen Markham. Oh. Yeah, I got it. Where does she live? 514 East 52nd Street, New York City. Oh. Pretty fancy address. Yes. 
Okay. Now tell me why this Mary Ellen has insured herself against living. Well, that's the point, Johnny. She hasn't. Well, now wait a minute. You, Albert Schwinner has. You mean somebody else took out this policy on her life? Or rather death? Yes. Holy. Well, what is this guy, a professional gunsel who's going to wipe her out and then collect? I suppose he's the beneficiary, too. Yes, he is. Oh, fine. Well, come on, who is it? I don't know. As I told you, the policy was lying here on my desk when I got back this morning. I do know this much about him. It's Dr. Albert Schwinner. Doctor? What kind? Well, those are the things you've got to find out. Who he is, what he is, why he's bought insurance against this woman's living beyond November 10th. The 10th? Well, that's only a few days from now. Oh, George, this gets worse and worse. Well, if only Harry Baxter hadn't issued that policy. But he has. Oh, boy, you sure picked a dilly to fill in for you while you were away. Picked him? What else could I do? After all, he never did anything like this before. You've known him before? Are you serious? Of course I have. Why, Harry Baxter... All right, now, look. Times are wasting and we haven't got much of it. I take it you want me to see if I can find some legal grounds for canceling this policy. Yes, immediately. Now, have you got an address on the beneficiary, this uh, Dr. Schwinner? No, I've been so upset about this whole thing, I haven't even looked. And yeah, let me see. According to this, he lives at... Hmm. What's the matter? Dr. Albert W. Schwinner, C.L. C.L.? What kind of a doctor is that? I don't know. The address is 14327 E Street, Union City, New Jersey. C.L.? Well, I'll soon find out. Where can I reach this uh, Harry Baxter who sold the policy? In New York at the... Uh, here, I'll jot down the address. <laughs> I still don't see how Baxter could get away with this. Well, after all, when you consider his position... Here. He offered no explanation at all. Well, I'm afraid I didn't give him much chance. I practically threw him out of here. Oh, I can't say that I blame you. And that's another thing. Look, Johnny, perhaps you can reason with... Oh, don't worry, George. He's number one on my calling list. I'll be talking to you. <laughs> Expense account item 2, 785, fare to New York and taxi to Harry Baxter's address. A real snooty one over near Sutton Place. And people don't live in that joint unless they've earned or chiseled a lot of money from somewhere. In the case of Baxter, I suspected a big chisel. My suspicion was considerably heightened when he opened the door. His apartment was luxury from stem to stern. As for Baxter himself. Dollar? Well, of course, old boy. I've heard a great deal about you from my dear friend and colleague, George Reed. Dear friend, huh? Well, you say that as though who doubted it. Oh, I know, that filling in for him while he was away. Well, I really should have done better for the old thing, but I've had so many social obligations to meet these past few months, and after all, one must keep up with those things. Oh, I'm sure one must. Well, I did so one policy, you know, a real dilly. Ah, oh, that's the understatement of the week. I suppose I can't really blame him for being a bit excited about it, but he gave me no chance to explain why I assumed the policy. Why did you? Oh, now, really? Well? Well, I made it very clear to George that I would tell him when he calms down enough to be reasonable. Really, Mr. Dollar, he was in quite a tizzy. Brother, he still is. That's why he sent for me. But when he calms down, he'll be sorry he bothered you. Suppose you tell me why you issued that policy. You? No. What? No, I'll tell George when he's ready and when I'm ready. Oh, now, just a minute. And you may tell George I said exactly that. Goodbye, Dollar. You'll tell me, Baxter, right now. I'll do nothing of the sort. And what's more, since my plane for Europe is leaving shortly, I have no time to do, to, to... Would you kindly remove your foot from the door? Not until I get an answer from you. Now start talking. If you can show some legal cause... Legal why, cause? Uh, furthermore, your behavior at the moment constitutes trespass, illegal entry, uh, call it what you like. And believe me, unless you leave here immediately, I shan't hesitate to ring up the police. All right, all right. Now look, just tell me one thing. I might. What? What is your connection with the beneficiary of this policy? Dr. Schwinner. That's right, Albert Schwinner. But Albert happens to be a very close. Personal friend. Oh, I might have guessed as much. All right, then tell me this. No, I'm sorry, just one question. I've given the answer. Goodbye. Hi, sir. Are you hard of hearing? Look I here now. Goodbye. Well, there was no point in trying to batter down the door of Harry Baxter's apartment, so I left. Downstairs in the lobby, I put in a phone call. That's item 355 cents to George Reed's office in Hartford. Dollar, but he seems to have stepped out for a few minutes. Oh, well, uh, then please tell him when he gets back that I want a complete rundown on Harry Baxter. Well, that shouldn't be difficult. Right. Having hired him, George shouldn't have much trouble getting that for me. Well, that isn't what I meant, Mr. Dollar. 
Now, as a matter of fact, I think I can tell you just Now, let George do it. I'll call him back. Item 4, 65 cents taxi to Mary Ellen Markham's apartment on East 52nd Street. A uniformed nurse met me at the door, told me I could stay with Miss Markham only a very short time, then led me into the bedroom. And there, carefully propped up in bed, lay a pale, wan, tired woman who looked to be 65 or 70. The room was full of flowers. You may leave us, Mrs. Haskell. I'll ring when I need you. Yes, Miss Markham. Sit down, Mr. Dollar. Thank you. I'm sorry. I won't be able to speak with you very long. But as you can see... Yes, yes, I can, of course. I'll get right to the point. You must know, I'm sure, that someone has just taken out a policy on your... Well, an insurance policy on you. Yes. And you're so smart. And so... And so helpful with Harry Baxter. Oh. You see, I am suffering from a rare, incurable... Disease of the blood. I'm sorry. I don't have long to live. A few days, perhaps. A few weeks at the most. Excuse me. This is such an effort. Well, you, you're getting the best of care, I trust. Yes. It's the very best. Now, now what do you wish to know? You know a Dr. Albert Schwinner, don't you? I have known Albert for many years. He's been great friends. Then why does he take out a policy that... Well, that indicates he hopes that you'll die. Hopes? I'll die? Yes. What else could it be? Oh, you don't understand. Don't you see? Schwinner has bought insurance against your living beyond November 10th. Yes. Yes. My 50th birthday. You mean to say you're... The reason... The reason so. Yes? I'm sorry, you You mustn't. Oh, I know. I'm tired. Yes, yes. But just one more thing. Your doctor. The doctor who's taking care of you. Albert. Albert? This same Dr. Schwinner? Yes. Now... Now you must leave. <laughs> of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. Now, act three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, and the hope to die matter. The little that Mary Ellen Markham had been able to tell me left me more puzzled than ever. I've never been given such a runaround in my life, deliberate or otherwise. But I didn't dare tax her strength further, so I left. Item five, another 55 cents for another call to George Reed in Hartford. This time he was in. Yes, Johnny, I must confess I'm calmed down a bit, but the first shock of learning that Mr. Baxter had issued that seemingly absurd policy... What do you mean, seemingly absurd? George's whole thing has been a tizzy, now a double-barreled one. Well, I tried to call Mr. Baxter a few minutes ago, but got no answer. I wanted to apologize, of course... Apologize? For well, after all, since he's chairman of the board... Chairman of what board? The company, this company... What? I tried to tell you that this morning, but you didn't give me a chance. Harry Baxter is also the majority stockholder. Oh, brother. In any event, as I'm sure you can see, he must have had some good reason for that policy. And as soon as I can get him by phone... You won't. What? He just left for Europe. Where? I don't know, and right now I don't care. But if I can't contact him, Johnny, I don't dare cancel this policy until I've talked to him. And if Miss Markham should die before the 10th... Yeah, 250 G. You've got to carry on. Would you like to tell me how... If Mary Ellen Markham dies on or before November 10th, Floyd's of England pays Dr. Albert Schwinner $250,000 on a policy taken out by him. And he is her doctor with her life in his hands. And if there isn't something wrong with that setup, Expense account item six, eight dollars for a taxi to Schwinner's address in Union City, New Jersey. And there at last I learned what the CL meant behind his name. It was an abbreviation, 
for this was the Albert Schwinner Clinic, devoted to the study of rare diseases of the blood. But Schwinner wasn't there. He'd gone to New York to see Miss Markham. Item seven, ten dollars even for a fast taxi ride back there to Manhattan. As the nurse led me into the unfortunate woman's apartment, he was just coming out of the bedroom door. Oh, Dr. Schwinner, this is Mr. Johnny Dollar. Oh, Mr. Dollar, Harry Baxter told me I might expect you. Oh, he did, huh? Yes, he phoned me just before his plane took off for you. You're pretty smart. You're an insurance investigator, aren't you? That is right. Oh, you may go in to see Miss Markham now, Mrs. Haskell. Very well, Doctor. How is Miss Markham, Doctor? Much better, thank God. Oh, why do you say that? What? If she dies before this week is out, you stand to collect a cool quarter of a million, don't you? I? No, the clinic. Isn't that the same thing? Hardly. Uh, Sit down, Mr. Dollar. Now, you're concerned about the rather unorthodox insurance policy that Mr. Baxter issued. I certainly am. I think you'd better let me tell you the reason for it. I think you'd better. At the onset of her illness some 15 years ago, the best doctors in the country gave her five years to live at the most. And that's when you came into the picture? Yes. Because of the devotion, the concentration of all our efforts to this one field of medicine, the clinic was able for the first time to give her hope. Her hope was justified. We have given her years of life. But now, wait a minute, Doctor. She told us then that if she could be helped to live until she was 50... And that'll be on the 10th. Yes. That would prove beyond the shadow of a doubt that our methods, our practices were right. That we could prolong and possibly ultimately save not only her own, but thousands, perhaps millions of lives. Therefore, she agreed that if she reached 50, she would make an outright gift of $250,000 to the clinic and its work. Money which is much needed, by the way. But then it began to look as though she might never reach 50. Yes. And she suggested this unusual insurance policy on her death rather than on her life. I see. But why Harry Baxter, chairman of the board of the insurance company, its biggest stockholder, whatever? I don't get it. Baxter's own mother died of the same disease, Mr. Dollar. Oh. Of course. Then... He knew how necessary this money is to the clinic. Yes. And let's face it, Baxter is something of uh, an eccentric. And that's the reason he chose this... this offbeat way to make sure you get the financial help you need. Exactly. Then, if I try to get this policy canceled... A great many lives in the future may depend on its remaining in force. Of course, if you feel it your duty. Doctor, my duty as I see it is to do just exactly nothing. Mary Ellen Markham did live to see 50, but only for a few days. Just long enough to make her gift to the clinic. Harry Baxter and the company? Well... Harry came back from Europe, and he said he found some, quote, mistake, unquote, in the policy that requires the company to pay off on it anyway. (laughs) Eccentric? We should have more of them like that. Expense account total? Are you kidding? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar.
from Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Mr. Dollar, the investigator? That's right, insurance investigator. Yes, well, uh, my name is Frank Skinner, Mr. Dollar. Yes? You see, my wife and I run the Sunny Dream Home up here at Buckland Center. Old folks home it is. Oh, I see. Well, now, what can I do for you, Mr. Skinner? Well, I'm... I'm afraid there's something wrong here, Mr. Dollar. You see, we've never had anything like this before. Like what, sir? Well, to begin with, all our clients are pretty well insured. Yes. All right. We've been having a lot of deaths here at the home these past months. Too many, Mr. Dollar. Well, after all, if your clients are all very old people... Yes, sir, they are. But you see, these have all been accidental deaths. Yeah, well, don't forget, sir, that older people are very often quite prone to accidents. Yes, sir, that's true. But, well, if you want the truth, I don't think... They've been accidents. Oh? No, sir. And if something isn't done to stop this, well, I think maybe you'd better come up here and see us. Mr. Skinner, I think you're right. Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. And now, act one of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Universal Adjustment Bureau, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Sunny Dream matter. Expense account item one ten cents for a phone call to Pat McCracken, my old friend and contact at Universal Adjustment Bureau. Oh, say, I'm glad you called, Johnny. Yeah, well, Pat, I just want you to know I won't be available for a couple of days. Oh, yes, you will. And it isn't because of any insurance matter. Yes, it is. What's happened is that I've just received a phone call that's aroused my curiosity. And, well, at any rate, any assignments you may have for me will have to wait until I get... Uh, that's where you're wrong, Johnny. I said we'll have to wait until... What? Just happens you have an assignment right now. As a matter of fact, I was just about to call you. Well, can I wait a couple of days? Oh, no, no. Johnny, I want you to run over to Buckland Center. Huh? I think you heard me. The sunny dream home for the aged? That's right. How did you know? Never mind that. What's wrong over there that you know about? Well, the number of deaths over there within the past few months have made our actuarial tables look like a big, fat mistake. And the companies that have carried the insurance on them are getting a little worried. All separate companies, huh? Yeah, but they all cleared their policies through us, fortunately. Otherwise, we'd never have gotten wind of this. Anyway, I promise to send you over there. Any particular reason for thinking something's wrong, aside from the unusual number of deaths? Yes. What? The beneficiary of the policies that have had to be paid. Who? The sunny dream home for the agent. I gassed up my jalopy at the sign of the Flying Red Horse, that's item 2, 425, and drove some 30 miles south and east on Highway 2. I found the Sunny Dream home just north of Buckland Center. It consisted of a huge old frame house surrounded by trees and well-kept gardens. In comfortable chairs scattered here and there on the wide porch and lawn, nice-looking, well-dressed older folks sat around reading and chatting, playing cards, enjoying the late afternoon sun. The whole place looked clean, quiet, and restful. After parking my car, I walked slowly up the long, flower-bordered walk under the trees toward the entrance. And as I did so, a little wizened old man in a wheelchair detached himself from a group of the old folks and wheeled over to me. Mr. Dollar? Yeah, that's right. I'm Frank Skinner, the one that called you. Oh, how are you, Mr. Skinner? Uh, Come right along in the office where we can talk. Yeah, sure. Oh, may I give you a hand with that chair? Nope, don't need it. I must say you handle it well. Sure, but haven't been on my feet in over five years now. Uh, You uh, can help me up this little ramp, though, if you don't mind. Oh, sure. Here you are. Walter, my stepson, built me that ramp. Good idea. Yes, sir. It's a big help to a man that can't use his legs. Now, right around the side of the porch, yeah. Oh, evening, Miss Baker. Good evening, Mr. Skinner. Ah, uh, here we are. Uh, if you just open the door. Sure. You just sit down there, and I'll get right to the point. Okay, fine. 
Now, you listen to me. I'd appreciate it if you'd let the folks here think that you've just come to look over the place like maybe you've got some old relative you'd like a nice home for. In other words, you don't want to alarm your clients. Guests, Mr. Dollar. They're honored guests, all happy and with no worries. Uh Uh-huh. Well, I must say that those I saw outside looked perfectly content. But now, about those so-called accidents. Five of our people have died within the last six months, Mr. Dollar. Five of them. Terrible. And like I told you on the telephone, they looked like accidents. What kind of accidents? Well, now, the first one. Well, maybe it was. That was old Miss Epp. Lived in the little guest cottage out back. What happened? Small fire. Must have started in the wastebasket or something by the time we got to her. Well, she suffocated. And I suppose Mr. Perley might have been accidental, too. Food poisoning it was. At least that's what the doctor called it. But nobody else got sick on them. All those canned peaches, Mr. Dollar. Who was the doctor? Oh, Dr. Cherry from town. Of course, Mr. Perley was the only one that had three helpings of them. But my wife never had trouble with her canning before. Well, go on, Mr. Skinner. Well, old Miss Sharmley fell down the main stairs to the living. Look through the door there. You can see the stairs. Well, that's a long stairway for elderly folks. Then Miss Lizzie Bell. We called her Miss Lizzie Bell, though her real name was... What happened to her? She fell out the window of her bedroom. And Mr. Dollar, she just wasn't strong enough to get her window open that wide. She was 94. Then poor old Miss Betzler. She fell down the stairs, too. Well, Mr. Skinner, if those people aren't able to negotiate a stairway like that, you're at fault for requiring them to do it. Well, most of them are. The others have their rooms here on the first floor, like I have, too. How about Miss Lizzie Bell, who was 94? Well, she never left her room until she fell, or until she was pushed by somebody younger and stronger than she was. Well, unless you can prove something like that. I have to prove that those others were pushed down the stairs. Right so. You see, from what you've told me so far, Mr. Skinner, there's no reason to suspect those deaths weren't accidental. Even so many of them, all within a space of only six months. Unless, as I say, you can come up with some concrete evidence to indicate otherwise. All right, then. You can tell me this. Why did all those things happen late at night when those poor old folks wouldn't have any reason to be up and around when there wasn't anybody around who could help them until it was too late? Well, so far as that's concerned... Boy, sure, sure. Folks have got to get up at night sometimes, one reason or another. But they all had their own private baths, and if they want anything from downstairs, like something to read or some hot milk, something like that, why, all they have to do is ring the push button in their room, and my wife gets it for them. We do that all the time. Where is your wife, by the way? Martha? Why, she's right... Right here, Frank. Who's this you're blabbing off your mouth to? Why, uh, Martha, this is Mr. Johnny Dollar, insurance investigator. Investigator, huh? Well, you can march yourself right out of here. Well, now, just a minute, Mrs. Skinner. Just a minute, nothing. You get out of here and leave us alone. Mrs. Skinner. And if you don't, I'll throw you out. And if you don't think I'm young and strong enough, then I'll show you. Strong enough to throw a little old lady out of a window? Or shove a couple of people downstairs? Get out. Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. And now for another episode in the life of Sergeant Donald Bellwether, my husband. Ah, That's what I call a good dinner, Reba. Oh, that was delicious. Well, I'm glad to hear that, dear. More coffee? Uh, Yeah, just uh, about a half a cup, please. All right. There you are. Thank you. Now, tell me all about your safety class. Did the boys enjoy your speech? Oh, yeah, they sure did. Thanks to you, I did quite well. My lieutenant complimented me afterwards. Oh, good. Yeah, but that same lieutenant threw me a curve, too. How, dear? Well, after I gave my talk, he asked the men if there were any questions. <laughs> well, I did it. One of the guys stood up and said, uh, said, uh, look, Sarge, uh, you claim there were over 95,000 deaths and over 9.5 million people injured in accidents in the U.S. last year. Uh, looks to me like all those safety campaigns and slogans are doing no good at all. Well, how did you answer it? I didn't. I, I couldn't think of an answer. I, I got out of it by saying I'd have more facts and figures at the next meeting. All right. Let's see now. Oh, yeah, here it is. Now, first, Sergeant Bellwether, you start off by telling the boys that since 1913, the accidental death rate has been reduced 35%. 
Mm-hmm. Or, in other words, if there hadn't been campaigns and safety measures put into effect to reduce accidents, almost a million more people would have been killed in the last 46 years. Hmm, isn't that right? It certainly is. I'm reading it right out of the National Safety Council record book. Oh, and another thing. Accidents in the farming areas are much higher than in the city. But you know why? Why? Because in rural areas, there are fewer policemen enforcing safety laws and less traffic signs and signals to guide the motorists. Mm-hmm. You know, many more cars travel the city streets, and yet the per capita rate of accidents is much higher in the rural areas. Of course, the reason is obvious. In the city, more safety measures are instituted and obeyed. <laughs> Reba, you are wonderful. That's a good logical answer. <laughs> I don't know what I'd do without it. Oh, oh, that's my Donald. That's my Donald. <laughs> And now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Sunny Dream Matter. Martha Skinner, co-owner and the real manager of the Sunny Dream Home for the Aged, was a big woman. Tall, muscular, and a lot younger than her husband. I don't want your kind snooping around, Mr. Dollar, so get out of here and leave us alone. Your husband seems to think those deaths here in your home for the aged weren't so accidental, Mrs. Skinner. Oh, he does. Yes, I, uh, that's what I told him, dear. If you'd keep that mouth of yours shut, Frank, we wouldn't have this sort of thing. Why don't you and that wheelchair get out of here? You sound as though you have something to hide, Mrs. Skinner. I have nothing to hide. Don't you see what your coming around here will do to our nice place? It'll give us a bad name, that's what it'll do. Folks come here on the recommendation of the folks that live here. If your sort starts prowling around, it'll make our nice home for them sound like a murder factory, and I won't have it. Oh, now, just calm down a moment. Those poor old folks, Miss Lizzie Bell and Mr. Pearly and the rest, were accidental, that's all. You got any reason to think they weren't? Well, I didn't have until a minute ago. What do you mean by that? If they weren't accidents, well, it certainly took somebody younger and stronger to push them down those stairs. You mean me? Well? No. No, Mr. Dolly, you're wrong. And if anybody started that talk about not being accidents, I guess I did. Yes, you did, Martha. Oh, I was was so upset, those fine old people passing away. Why, they were like family to me. I guess I said a lot of things that didn't make sense. Until the doctor and the police came around and told me I was wrong. The police investigated? Yes, and they made quite a stir. I guess that's why your being here has uh, upset Martha. Well, of course, if they found nothing. Mr. Dollar, do you think that I could do anything like what you're... that I could harm a single hair of any of these nice old people? What possible reason could I have? And what sense would it make? Why, we're being paid for their living here. And if anything happens to them... Yeah. Yeah, if anything happens to them, you collect a nice, big, fat hunk of insurance money. You know about that. Insurance investigator, remember? No. No, you're wrong. It was their idea to name us in their policies. Now, wasn't it, Frank? Yes, Martha, it certainly was. Well, let's not talk about it anymore now. It's getting late, so I think I'll drive back to Buckland Center and have some dinner. Well, you'll do no such thing. You'll have your supper, your dinner right here. And if you wish to stay overnight... Oh, no. You mean I'll have another room to fix up? Well, I'll help you, of course. Walter, this is Mr. Johnny Dollar. Dollar? The insurance investigator I hear about all the time on the radio? That's right, sir. What's your business here, Dollar? Frank, call him, son. Yes. About those accidents? Yeah, that's right. What do you think about them, Walter? Look, Dollar, Mother's got enough trouble without you coming around. Walter. Here. Well, it's true, Ma. You know it. First, it's the police making a big racket. We've been through all that, Walter. I asked you a question. Well, why don't you get out of here and leave us alone? I'm sick of all this nonsense. I'm sick of this whole place. Oh, Walter. Year after year, working like a dog for a lot of old fogies. Are there only the three of you to take care of this place? That's right. Oh, and of course, Frank here is a lot of help tied down to that wheelchair. Well, I do all the office work. Oh, sure. Big deal. Handle all the money, too. Well, what about the talk that as soon as we get enough money, we can sell out and get away from here? Hey, look, Dollar, what difference is it to you who keeps this place up? Hey, you're a pretty husky fellow, Walter. Yeah. 
Yeah, would you like a little demonstration on you? Now, what do you mean by that? Well, maybe I'll tell you after I've had a look around. Then you will stay. Oh, yeah, I'll stay until I'm satisfied. Well, you won't be here for long if I've got anything to do with it, understand? Is that a threat, Walter? Take it any way you like. I'm sorry, Mr. Dollar. I'm sure he didn't mean that the way it sounded. Yeah. Well, tell me, do you two have joint ownership of this place, you and Mr. Skinner? Well, uh... Well, it's really in my name. And if anything were to happen to you? It would go to Frank and Walter. I see. Walter said that you've talked about getting enough money to sell out and leave this place. He certainly did. Is that what you plan to do? Yes, sir. Well, I'm not so sure. Of course you are. I've grown to love this place. All the nice people who... Mr. Dollar. Yeah? Enough money, you said. Like a lot of insurance money from... Oh, no. You, you can't think that Walter would... Oh, oh, no, no. He's spoiled and fresh and impetuous and talks a lot, but... Surely you don't think... Mrs. Skinner, what would you think? <laughs> Act three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. Do you know who said, Eternal vigilance is the price of liberty? Those famous words were written by Thomas Jefferson. Jefferson knew that human nature tends to cause us to take for granted the freedoms for which others have fought valiantly. He knew that Americans had to be alert, or the essential freedoms of democracy would be taken away. That's why Jefferson gave his warning to the Americans of his era and to their descendants. He set the price for liberty as eternal vigilance. And Americans through the years have heeded Jefferson's warning. They have been alert to detect and resist the enemies of liberty. Remember the words of Thomas Jefferson. They are part of your American heritage. The price of liberty is eternal vigilance. And now, Act Three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Sunny Dream Matter. At dinner that evening, I made a point of chatting with as many guests at the Sunny Dream home for the aged as possible. Sweet old Mrs. Baker, who must have been in her 80s, pretty much summed things up as we talked together on the porch in the cool of the evening. You're all really kind of sorry for Walter, Mr. Donner. Young man like that doesn't really have a place here among all of us old ones. Yeah, I, I wonder why he doesn't go out on his own then, Mrs. Baker. Because in spite of his brash, noisy way, he loves his mother, Martha. And since she has so much to do taking care of us, why, he just stays and helps her. Isn't she one of the loveliest people you ever met? Well... She certainly seems devoted to you folks. And she is. Makes us toe the line. Balls us out sometimes, just like a mother hen. But she's all heart. And Mr. Skinner? Very nice. Handles the business affairs of the home real good, too. It isn't generally known, but he's the one who gave us the idea of making out our insurance to the sunny dream. Oh, of course, we never told Martha. Oh, there you are. Evening, Miss Baker. What a nice young man this is, Mr. Skinner. We've been having a wonderful time talking away about this and that. Yeah, that's fine. They make you a comfortable room upstairs, Mr. Dollar? Yeah, right at the head of the stairs. Very comfortable. Good. Well, don't let me interrupt you. I, I'd like to talk to you a minute, if Mrs. Baker will excuse us. Why, of course. Thank you. And we'll talk again tomorrow, won't we? Sure, of course we will. Good night. Mr. Skinner, when was the last accident when someone fell down those long stairs? Huh? Why, uh, that was Miss Betzler earlier this month. Why? Well, at the head of them, as I came out of my room, I found something that... Well... They were marks that looked to me as though they'd been made by some kind of struggle up there. Oh. And a tiny piece of cloth from a man's suit caught in a splinter on the new post. Well, uh, what are you going to do about it? Oh, just leave it there. Tomorrow I'll get somebody from the police, the police laboratory, over here to look at it. Mm -hmm. Well, whoever's suit that was 
must have a tie. Oh, no, not necessarily. It was really just a few threads that had been pulled out. But they might be the clue to a killer. I see. Hmm. Well, good luck, Mr. Dollar. Yeah. Thanks. In my room, I waited until long after the big home was quiet and wondered. Wondered if my hunch was going to pay off. Hunch? Sitting there on the porch talking with old Mrs. Baker, I'd suddenly remembered something Pat McCracken had told me in the very beginning. He had notified the home I was coming here to investigate. That meant he'd notified Frank Skinner. Could that have been why Skinner phoned me? Do I lay any suspicion the insurance companies might have? Yeah, I wondered. Finally, about midnight, I heard a noise at the head of the stairway. Quietly, I opened my door. And there at the top of the stairs, armed with a flashlight and standing solidly on his own two feet, was the man who said he was confined to a wheelchair. Where? Mr. Dollar! You won't find anything there, Mr. Skinner. Because there isn't anything. See? You lied to me. It got you up out of that phony wheelchair, didn't it? To see if you left some trace of your last murder, didn't it? Uh, now, listen, Dollar. Pretty rotten racket, Skinner. You and only you handle all the finances of this place. You persuaded the old folks to name you as beneficiary of their insurance policies. Then you proceeded to shove them down those stairs. Would you like to see how? Yes, yeah, Skinner. Then I'll show you. Oh, no, you don't. <laughs> He'll live to go to trial. And whatever sentence they hand him will be much too short. The Sunny Dream home, well, I hope it'll be the quiet, peaceful place his wife wants it to be. Expense account total, including incidentals, $12 even. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood and is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote tonight's story. Heard in our cast were Virginia Gregg, Peggy Weber, Junius Matthews, Larry Dobkin, and Bert Holland. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Dan Coverly speaking. Dollar has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. Mm-hmm.